The Alpha's Untamed Human Written by Zoe Sauten Narrated by Laura Lambert Chapter 1 Taylor! Breakfast! shouted Emma while flipping the scrambled eggs and pouring two cups of coffee. Emma was already in her black blazer and pants, her long strawberry blonde hair styled in a high ponytail and her makeup done while Taylor emerged from her room with her hair all over the place, her jeans on but still wearing her pajama top. Jeez, Emma, you sound like my mom. Well, after being your roommate for five years now, I do understand your mom, and she deserves a medal for surviving your bad morning moods, replied Emma, giggling. Both of you can expect a medal for Christmas then, said Taylor, laughing, before taking a sip of coffee. You should know by now, Emma, that I am not a morning person. Oh, I know, Taylor, but I cannot let you miss work, and I can't leave to my work without waking you up. Otherwise, you would sleep through the day. What would I have done without you, Emma? teased Taylor. Probably not much, my friend, Emma said, laughing. Looking at her watch, Emma gave Taylor a quick hug and took her laptop bag, heading to the door. Must go to work. See you tonight at my parents' for dinner? Uh, yeah, sure, I wouldn't miss our traditional Thursday family dinner. As Emma left, Taylor finished her cup of coffee and breakfast, thinking about this nice routine they have established together in the past five years. Emma and Taylor have been friends since they were 10 years old. They met at school when Taylor's parents moved to this town for a new start, and they have been inseparable since then. Teenage aches, boys, problems, school, they shared everything. And after high school graduation, they stayed in their hometown and decided to become roommates. It was not easy to convince Emma's family, who lived in the mystic moon-gated community, and wanted Emma to stay there. But together, the girls managed to convince everyone. If opposites attract in friendship, they were the definition. Emma was the grounded one, always the voice of reason, always liking consensus. With her tall figure, delicate facial features, and alabaster skin tone, she could be taken for a model. But she was instead a software engineer, a brilliant one, as she got promoted to head of the department just recently at the age of 24 years old. Taylor, on the other hand, was a free-spirited girl. Unlike Emma, she did not finish college. She dropped from college after her first year because she decided that she wanted to become a carpenter. She opened her own wood shop with a couple of friends, and her small business has been booming ever since. She never followed rules and is never afraid to pick up a fight to defend her friends. With her chocolate caramel hair, big hazel eyes, and her strong energy for life, she always attracted attention wherever she goes. Even though she was shorter and curvier than Emma, and just a human, she was physically stronger than Emma. Later that evening, Taylor was enjoying dinner with Emma's parents and brother. So how was work today, Taylor? asked Patricia, Emma's mom. No, Mom, you should ask her how is her love life, teased Peter, Emma's brother. Or, rather, ask which number she reached now. Mrs. Jackson shushed Peter. Behave, kid. I have reached number 21 and counting. I do not despair, and I will find Mr. Wright. Taylor did not miss Peter rolling his eyes and immediately replied, yeah, yeah, I'm not like you. I don't believe in this first-sight mate stuff, so I have to work hard to find my soulmate, said Taylor, ironically. Even though Taylor and Emma are best friends, Emma has been keeping one big secret from her, that she is a werewolf, that all the residents in the mystic moon-gated community were werewolves, that this gated community is actually a werewolf's pack. It is forbidden to reveal the existence of the supernatural world to humans. This is one of their most sacred laws. 
If a werewolf disclosed intentionally or by accident their existence to a human, the human is killed on the spot to preserve the secret. As for the werewolf, he or she is shunned away and becomes a rogue. When you are a rogue, it is like a death sentence. You will die either killed by another rogue or just by another pack when you trespass on their territory. But the Jackson family considered Taylor as one of their own. They welcomed this friendship between Taylor and Emma, a friendship that started at the public school where Mystic Moon Pups went as well. Taylor started hanging out after school at the pack house. She had sleepovers at the pack. She made friends with all the kids there. The residents of the Mystic Moon Pack were happy to have Taylor in their territory even if it meant they needed to be extra careful to make sure their secret is safe. Taylor was oblivious of the true nature of the Mystic Moon community. However, as she would regularly visit and even participate in their activities, she did notice their peculiar customs and rituals, especially the soulmate ritual, when people would look at each other in the eyes and shout, Mate! And just like that, they became a couple. Taylor has grown to believe that they uphold some cultural traditions of their ancestors or maybe are part of a somehow weird sect as all those living in this gated community shared the same beliefs and special traditions. But she loved them all very dearly and she learned to respect their traditions. When it comes to love, Taylor believed that the probability of just randomly meeting her soulmate is very low, and the probability of love at first sight is even infinitesimally small. She knows what she wants, and unfortunately, it is not the guys she went out with. Usually, she gives them a chance over two dates, and if she does not see a fit, she just moves on. The longest relationship she ever had was a five-month relationship. Peter was like a brother to Taylor, and he knew everything about her dates and misfortune. That is why he liked to tease her and call her serial dater. How are your parents doing? asked James, Emma's father, changing the subject. They miss you all, but they're happy with their decision to move to Miami for an early retirement. They promised me that they will come for Thanksgiving and Christmas to keep the tradition of celebrating with the Jacksons. Dinner was animated with small talk. While laughing and talking together, Emma's mom asked the girls whether they bought new dresses for the party. What party? asked Taylor, looking at Mrs. Jackson and Emma with inquisitive eyes. Emma looked guilty. What did you do, Emma? asked Taylor warily. Well, it is just that you got an invitation from Derek to attend our ball. You know, the one organized every three years, where our communities in the U.S. come together, where young members of our community between the ages of 20 and 35 meet up? Oh, Emma, it is a definite no. You know me, I do not like such formal parties. Plus, everyone is oogling each other, waiting to scream, Mate! Come on, Emma. You will not decline an invitation from Derek. You know he is our community leader, and he treats you like family. He will not take it well. If you wanted me there, you would have told me earlier. Actually, I didn't tell you because I want you there. Last time I told you a month in advance, and you nagged and nagged and nagged to no end knowing that afterwards you still attended the ball. So by telling you last minute this year, I don't get to hear your nagging for long. Sometimes I wonder whether you understand what best friend means, teased Taylor. You know what? I have nothing to wear since you did not tell me, so I have a good excuse, she continued. Yeah, right. You have enough cloth to choose from, and anyway, we can go shopping tomorrow during my lunch break. I need you there with me, Taylor. What if I meet my mate? Please, say you will come with us, begged Emma. 
Taylor looked at Emma's pleading eyes and sighed. She nodded her head. Yes, screamed Emma, so happy to go to this important party with her friend. Oh, by the way, Taylor, I need to remind you. Yes, I know, Taylor cut her off. I have to just talk with you and the members of this community. I am not allowed to talk with the others. Some of the invitees might not be happy that an outsider to your communities is in attendance, and I should not engage in any dispute with them. I know the drill. This isn't my first party at your gathering. So, Peter, looking forward to also settle down and meet your mate? You are getting old. It's time to settle down, added Taylor, trying to change the subject. Peter's face turned blank. He was a hopeless romantic and has been looking forward to finally meeting his soulmate. I hope this time I will finally meet her. It's not that easy to meet our soulmate. Some never run into them, and this is why we organize those balls and meetups, said Peter, his voice laced with sadness. Well, I hope you do find your mate, Peter. She will be lucky to have you. But don't worry. If you both don't find your mates, we will open the three of us our own retirement center for mateless people. We'll even keep the famous self-defense and fighting courses. It's going to be a challenge after a certain age, but definitely funny, she said, giggling. Chapter 2 Taylor ran her hands smoothly and slowly on the wood. She bent over and blew the wood dust off of her creation, a modern dining table. She ran her hand delicately on the right edge and said, My baby, welcome to the world. She was startled by Emma asking, uh, How many babies do you have? 2,552 babies scattered everywhere, worldwide, Taylor said proudly. If you already have that many babies, can you explain to me why you are still here at your wood shop? I told you to meet me at 4 p.m. at my parents' house, Emma scolded her. Well, what time is it? asked Taylor, while still working on her latest creation. It's 3.45 p.m. Well, technically I'm not late. Let me do the finishing touches, and I am all yours. Where are the others? Why can't they do that? Never! I am the only one who finishes the latest touches. Emma rolled her eyes and dragged her friend out of the office. Come on, we have a lot to do before the ball starts. Calm down, Emma. You were not that excited last time. Last time, we were young. I was not ready to meet my mate yet. I was just 21 years old. I hadn't even graduated yet. Now, I am ready. I have my career all set, and I am ready for love. Now I am rolling my eyes at you. Hey, you don't get to judge me. You have been looking for love for three years now. You went out with all those guys hoping every time that one of them would be the one, as you say, replied Emma. You know that I'm not judging you, Emma, but I do think God has a checklist for you, and he is going through it in chronological order. Let's see. Emma Jackson. Graduation? Check. Work? Check. Promotion? Check. Good. Now it's the time for love. And poof! Your boyfriend materializes at the party. Emma couldn't stop laughing at Taylor's take on fate and how Moon Goddess would operate. I love your sense of humor, Taylor, Emma said as she wiped her tears. Now, back to the serious stuff. Did you bring your clothes with you? No, I didn't, but no worries. I'll drive by our apartment and get my stuff, and I'll meet you at your parents'. No way. I don't trust you. You'll come back late, or worse, you'll skip the event altogether, stated Emma. I already brought you one formal dress, two jumpsuits, and some underwear, so you can pick and choose. You'll drive first, and I will follow you closely. Only acceptable destination is Mystic Moon, she continued. Damn it, Emma, you read through me every time. 
huffed Taylor, realizing there is no escaping this ball. Emma and Taylor entered the ballroom with their friends. The room was beautifully decorated and buzzing with people mingling and chatting. Emma looked like a ballerina with her strapless slate gray midi dress, displaying a draped bodice and a layered tulle skirt, and she went with a boho hairstyle. Her long, wavy hair sideswept and gathered in a web of different fishtail braids. Taylor had opted for an elegant black, full-length sleeveless jumpsuit, perfectly hugging her curves, and she simply kept her long, wavy hair down. Taylor was mingling and laughing with Peter and their childhood friends when they heard the first, Mate! of the party. They all turned around, trying to see whether they know the lucky couple. Taylor was not tall enough to see above the crowd, so she turned to Peter. Do you see who it is? Peter was frozen. What's up, Peter? It's Emma. What, Emma? You mean she found her mate? Are you sure? He nodded his head, not removing his eyes from the scene unfolding in front of his eyes. Taylor found her way through the crowd to find Emma. When she reached her friend, she saw Emma standing there, her mate holding both her hands and looking at her. Yet she did not look happy. She looked terrified. Taylor did what she was told not to do, which is interfere when mates first meet. She put her hand on Emma's shoulder and asked her, Are you okay, Emma? The guy growled at Taylor. The sound was almost animalistic, like a wolf. Step away from my mate, human. He threatened her with anger and disgust in his tone, especially when he pronounced the word human. Thank you for acknowledging that I am a human, replied Taylor, all annoyed. But she is my best friend, and she looks overwhelmed, don't you think? Human, step away from my mate. The third time you will not hear it because you will be dead, the man said to Taylor with an ice-cold voice that sent shivers down her spine. He did not break eye contact with Emma even when talking, or should we say menacing Taylor. I am all for respecting your culture, but this is not how you talk with people, especially when you supposedly just met your soulmate. Taylor was worried. Emma was a bubbly girl, always smiling, and she was looking forward to this ball. The woman standing in front of her, there was only fear in her eyes. Alpha Liam, Taylor means no disrespect. She is like a sister to Emma, and she does not fully understand our culture. Let's go in my office to calmly discuss this, said Alpha Derek as he made his way to them. Taylor was a bit relieved now that Derek was involved. He was the manager of this community, and he had always treated Taylor and Emma as his kids. She was hoping he will put Emma before their traditions. I will not move without my mate, replied Liam. Derek looked at Emma and asked her whether she is okay and whether she accepts to come with them to his office. Then he moved closer to Emma and whispered something in her ear. Taylor could swear that he told Emma to go with them to spare Taylor's life. This party is becoming weirder by the second. Hearing that her friend's life might be in danger, Emma spanned out of her scared trance. Yes, of course, Alpha Derek, said Emma. Taylor, don't worry for me. I will go with them and then I will talk with you. Taylor watched Emma, Derek, and this Liam guy head all together towards the west wing of the community hall. She was still looking in their direction when Peter came to her. Go home, Tay. I will keep you updated on what happens. There's no need to worry for Emma. She was just taken aback. Her mate is a very respected member of our community, so you do not need to worry. But for now, you need to leave. I am not leaving, Peter. Something is definitely wrong. Did you hear him threaten me? How is someone like that a respected member of your community? 
You were there, Peter. This is not okay. This is not love at first sight. Emma was terrified. Taylor, you know Emma. She could have been a bit emotional. It's a big thing to finally find your mate. No, Peter. I know the guy who was in front of him. I know this type a lot. He is a jerk, probably with anger management issues. He could be an abuser or wife beater. I want to respect your beliefs, Peter. I really do. But this guy is not good for Emma. The situation is already tense enough, Tay. You are my sister, just like Emma. I would protect you both with my life. And to protect you now, I need you to go so that I can focus on protecting Emma. Some of her mate's friends are already pissed off, if you haven't noticed. Taylor was so focused on Emma and her mate that she did not notice the people in the ballroom. Looking around, she saw some aggressive gazes. Some people were looking at her as if they want to cut her into pieces. They don't scare me. I will not run away because of this Liam and his gang, hissed Taylor. This is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about both of you, Emma and you. You are my sisters, and I want you to be safe. She will go to my parents' home tonight, and I promise you can FaceTime and you will talk with her. Please go home for now. Taylor looked at Peter and noticed that he was very concerned and worried. She looked around and saw her friends, their eyes pleading for her to listen to Peter. Peter, what is going to happen? asked Taylor, her voice breaking. I don't know. We all love Emma, and we're going to take care of her. But please, for now, please go home. Chapter 3 as Taylor was driving away from the gated community, she noticed a car following her. She couldn't see the driver, but it wasn't a coincidence that this car left the Mystic Moon community at the same time as her. She was convinced that this is linked to the commotion at the ball. She changed from her usual route and noticed that the car was sticking to her even when she did unnecessary detours. It's official. She is being followed. When she reached home, she peeked from her kitchen window and noticed that the car was now parked a few meters away from her condo, with the driver sitting there and looking at her building. Taylor spent the next hour pacing in her living room. After an hour, she sent a text to both Emma and Peter asking for news and updates, but no one replied to her. She waited an additional hour and even FaceTimed her friend, but Emma did not answer. That was it. Taylor could not take it anymore. She sent a message to Emma, If you don't call me back ASAP, I am driving back to your parents' house to see you face to face. A few seconds later, Emma called Taylor, and she immediately picked up. What's wrong, Emma? You do not want to talk to me? Are you mad at me? Did he hurt you? Did this bastard hurt you? No, of course not. It's just that I've been crying. Switch to video call, Emma, requested Taylor. Taylor was horrified when she saw her friend. Emma's eyes were puffy, probably from all the crying, and her eyes were just lifeless, as if Emma lost her joie de vivre. I was overwhelmed. I didn't expect to meet my mate and didn't expect him to be my mate. I was also scared. Suddenly, everything became real. I found my mate. I will settle down and build my family with him. I was scared from this change, although I wanted it so bad. But I had a long talk with Derek and my mate, as well as my parents, and I am more open to this change now. And they all told me it's normal to fear change. But change can be good, especially if we're blessed to finally meet our mate. What are you telling me, Emma? I am going with him. Go where? To his place, in Idaho. Excuse me? You are going to move to Idaho just like that? You just met him. This is crazy, Emma. I know you do not want to do it. Fuck traditions. Fuck this crazy belief of mate. 
just don't do it i can't please taylor understand this is for everyone's sake pleaded emma when will you leave tomorrow noon what yelled taylor he gave me until tomorrow noon to pack and bid good-bye to everyone do you want to come and see me before i go so generous of him mocked taylor of course i will come and spend time with you but i will not help you packing she added no worries about packing peter is going to pass by our apartment now and he will pack my essentials i am sorry if i cannot be supportive of this but i will be there for you i will even come at eight a m and we can have breakfast all together you taylor smith waking up early and coming to my parents house by eight a m i would like to see that miracle said emma with a small smile on her face while talking with emma taylor noticed that the car that followed her was still parked there but no one was in the car she needed to solve this problem as well emma please think it through do not do something that you don't want just to please other people whether it's for your parents or your community for your beliefs or for whatever reason this is your life we're talking about i love you bestie said emma me too sweet dreams and see you tomorrow said taylor hanging up she sighed looking at her smartphone then took her taser her keys and went down to unleash her wrath on the idiot who naively believed he can stalk her and scare her so easily when she reached the car she did not see the driver he must be hiding she smirked thinking that she has the best solution to draw the driver out of his hiding place taylor took her car keys and she scratched the front door she dragged her keys and drew swirls on the back door frame when she saw someone coming out from behind the bushes screaming what the hell are you doing the stalker yelled oh this is your car oh well sorry you are parked in a handicap spot so i decided to give you a lesson there is no handicap parking spot here oops my bad they must have changed this recently said taylor with a smirk so are you going to tell me what you are doing here in my neighborhood and do not try to give me any crap i know you followed me from the ball what do you want are you with this maniac liam don't you talk about alpha liam what do you call a man that supposedly met his soulmate yet everything that he did was scream since that moment not one single smile on his face well he screamed at you and only you not at her touche man admitted taylor but still this doesn't explain why you were following me because i asked him to taylor heard a voice behind her answer her question as she turned around to see where this voice came from she spotted liam coming out of the shadows behind the bushes she tried to hide her surprise seeing liam here with this man and said mr maniac himself is here i am honored mocked taylor smirking and with one hand on her heart pretending to be moved why did you ask your minion to follow me are you here to teach me some lesson because i will not go down without a fight i am not here to teach you a lesson taylor i asked him to follow you because i wanted to know where you lived i want to have a talk with you go ahead talk immediately replied taylor here in the street gestured liam what are we insects no i think you emphasized it already back at the ball that we are humans although it didn't seem like a compliment back then but back to your suggestion i don't trust any of you to invite you into my home weren't you confident that you will be able to fight us off mocked the car lover guy liam was visibly tired it has been an emotional roller coaster of a night for him he had almost lost hope of finding his mate and stopped searching years ago 
he had a lot of responsibilities and problems that required his entire attention and did not believe he could provide a safe life for a mate and even less build a family. He accepted Alpha Derek's invitation not for the ball, but to meet with the Alphas and talk business. He was overjoyed when he smelled his mate's scent and when he locked eyes with her. He was happy and mesmerized by Emma's beauty, until he saw the fear in her eyes. His mate was not happy to see him. She was scared, paralyzed by fear. His ego and his wolf could not accept that, and they were both fuming. Add to that this human interfered and made him feel like a worthless man. It was too much for him. His bad temper took the best of him, and he snapped. He would not dare snap on his mate. So this human was the ideal person to take on all his frustrations and anger. When Alpha Derek only managed to convince Emma to join them in his office by implying that otherwise Taylor's safety is on the line, at that moment it became clear to Liam that this human is particularly important to Emma and that the key to Emma's heart will be through this human. Therefore he asked his man to follow her, and he intended to meet with her and clear up all this misunderstanding, convincing her that he will protect Emma with his life. And as soon as his discussion with Derek, Emma, and her parents ended, he shifted to his wolf form and ran to the location shared by his Delta, who was vigilantly keeping an eye on the human. Little did he know that this human is feisty, and winning her over will not be easy. Liam started massaging his forehead. This human is causing him a headache with her insolence and snappy retorts. He was tired and felt that at any time he could lose his self-control. He needed to get over this discussion and go back to planning the move of his mate to his pack. Who do I have to call to convince you that... I mean you no harm, asked Liam. Taylor didn't even pause. She quickly replied, Derek! Liam pulled his smartphone from his pocket and dialed Derek, putting him on speaker. Alpha Liam, any problems? said Derek as soon as he answered the call. Taylor felt that Derek was on edge. He sounded tired and worried. Alpha Derek, I am with Taylor, Emma's friend. You're on speaker. I came to talk with her, but she does not trust me. Can you reassure her that I mean no harm and that, unlike what she called me, I am not Mr. Maniac? That I will not kill her, harm her, nor do anything that will put her in harm's way? Yes, of course. Honey, can you hear me? First, please tell me you did not call Alpha Liam a maniac. And I can promise you that nothing will happen to you. Alpha Liam gave you his word, and this is worth a lot in our community. Derek paused before adding, Please make sure this conversation is cordial. The situation is already complicated enough. Okay, uh, thank you for clearing things up, Derek. I will have to talk with Liam. But Derek... Taylor paused. She hesitated before continuing. I am really disappointed in you, in all of you. Good night. Taylor hung up the phone, looked at the men standing in front of her, sighed, and said, Mr. Maniac, car lover, please follow me. And she walked back to her building, followed closely by the two men. Chapter 4 Do you want some water? offered Taylor once inside her apartment. I won't propose alcohol, as I don't know how much you already had to drink at the ball, but I can offer you water, tea, cocoa, or a soda. I would take a coffee, said Carlover. Uh, not possible. I don't know how to make coffee. What is there to know? You have a machine right there, said Carlover, pointing to the kitchen counter. "'Technology and I don't get along that much,' replied Taylor, throwing her hands in the air. "'I have already destroyed three coffee machines, and I'm not allowed to touch them anymore.' "'Well, 
You are more dangerous than you seem, said Carlover, laughing. I will make three cups of coffee, he added, as he headed to the kitchen counter and switched the machine on, looking in the cupboards for three mugs. Taylor and Liam sat on the kitchen stools, looking at each other with scrutiny. This woman has insulted him numerous times since they first met. She is oblivious of his standing in the supernatural world. Otherwise, she would never have dared to talk to him like that. He was the leader of one of the biggest and strongest packs. The reputation of his warriors crossed borders, and no one dares to stand in their way. No one except for the rogues who have been a plague in his state and a difficult problem to eradicate. And this was another reason why Emma was scared when she discovered that Liam was her fated mate. She knew about the ongoing war with the rogues, and she knew that she will be thrown in a foreign land and in the middle of a battlefield. Not only is she mated to an alpha known for being irascible, but also she will have to be the Luna of a pack at war with rogues. This is a huge change for her, and she had the right to be dismayed. He did not read the situation from her point of view at first. He was hurt by her reaction, and he took it out on her friend. But the discussion with Derek and Emma helped them talk openly and acknowledge the complexity of the situation. He was somehow relieved to see that her reluctance, her fear, was not because she wanted to reject him, but rather because of his pack situation and his reputation that preceded him. Now he needed to clear the air with Taylor, his mate's best friend. The woman seemed tenacious. If she is not convinced with their relationship, she will try to sabotage it. It was written all over her face during their altercation at the ball. After a few minutes of heavy silence, Liam decided to speak. I am sorry, Taylor, for how I reacted and scared Emma. I was angry and lost my self-control. Taylor's jaw dropped and her eyes were wide open as she did not expect an apology from him. You seem surprised, said Liam, amused by Taylor's reaction. Well, you can't blame me. You do not seem like a man who acknowledges his mistakes. I am not a person who does a lot of mistakes, but when I do, I admit it, he simply stated. And what proves to me that you will not do those mistakes every day? That you will not lose your self-control every day and hurt her? I can never hurt her. She is my... Yeah, yeah, she is your soulmate. I heard that song before. Taylor cut him visibly annoyed. You don't believe in love at first sight? Of course not. Building a relationship takes time and commitment. A couple needs to know each other, to find affinities and common ground to build a solid foundation for their relationship to grow. And despite all the efforts we put into a relationship, we can destroy everything just like that. You see it every day. Couples falling madly in love, and then they split, and it is all over again. I respect your culture and your beliefs. I really do. But I do not believe that a violent man will just change. Taylor did the air quotes, emphasizing on the change part. Liam furrowed his eyebrows, shocked that Taylor would think of him as a domestic abuser. He wondered whether she had suffered firsthand from domestic violence. As if Taylor read his mind, she continued, I come from a loving home, so does Emma, but we both have seen friends getting hurt by men who loved them dearly one day, and then the next day they would lose their temper and hit them so hard, sending them to the hospital. And do you know what the worst part is? Those men get off from jail on technicalities. You seem to be powerful, and that is why I do not trust you. I think if you hurt her, you will find a way not to be punished for it. I am not a violent man, Taylor. I never hit a woman, 
and I do not plan on doing it any time soon. And I would never hurt Emma. I cannot hurt her. She is my soulmate. I know that I need to learn how to express my love in a better way. I know that I must understand Emma's point of view, as we have two different upbringings. And I know my reaction at the ball was not the perfect first impression, neither on her nor on you. But why did you react that way? I didn't even see you smile. Because the moment I told her she is my mate, she froze. I saw only fear, and I was taken aback. She is my mate, and instead of being happy, she was afraid and scared. Doesn't that mean that maybe your system is broken, and you are not really soulmates? No, absolutely not. She felt it. She felt the mate bond. She told me so. But she was scared because of what she heard about me. And what exactly did she hear about you? That I am short-tempered. You definitely proved her wrong with the way you reacted, Mr. Maniac, said Taylor sarcastically. Liam laughed. This woman just says everything on her mind. Something tells him that she is never afraid to speak her mind. But especially when it comes to his mate, she would do everything to defend her. Liam was happy that Emma had a friend like Taylor growing up, a friend that had her back and probably protected her in the human world. And he was determined to provide the support and comfort for his mate. I will do my best to prove to her and to you that I am not this kind of person, that at work I might be hard and tough, but not in my personal life and not with my mate. Liam looked Taylor straight in the eyes and continued, I love her, I love her with all my soul, and I will make sure she lives a happy and fulfilled life by my side. Wow, you've got an upgrading from Mr. Maniac to Lover Boy. That was a fast upgrade, Taylor taunted Liam. Liam was shocked. This woman does not have a filter. Lover boy? Seriously? He clenched his jaw to control his anger and irritation. Car lover, on the other hand, could not stop laughing at the new nickname for his fearless alpha. Liam shook his head in disbelief. You know, Taylor, I understand why you are Emma's best friend. You are one hell of a woman said Liam, raising his mug as if to toast his mate's best friend. And that, lover boy, might be the only rational thing you've said tonight, stated Taylor, raising her mug as well. The rest of the evening went smoothly, with Taylor asking Liam many questions on his gated community in Idaho and the future of Emma there and Liam listening to Taylor's and Emma's childhood adventures in Mystic Moon community. Those girls were partners in crime, and boy, did they make Derek's life difficult with all their pranks and crazy games. He could relate a bit. At least, the first years of his childhood were similar, carefree and happy, until his teen years when life drastically changed back home. And he had to grow up too early, too fast, and had the fate and lives of his pack in his hands. When Liam and car lovers stood up to take their leave, Taylor shook their hands and told Liam, A lover boy, Emma, was terrified tonight. She was crying tonight while talking on the phone. Let's make sure this is the last time it happens. If I see her crying again, I will become Miss Maniac, and you will report to me. Straightforward, no veiled threats, no reading between the lines. She wanted him to understand that, and he did. He knew by now that Emma is as important to Taylor as she is to him. He nodded his head and left, followed closely by Carlover. Chapter 5 the next day, at 8 a.m. sharp, Taylor was knocking on the Jacksons' front door. Mom! Dad! Emma! shouted Peter as soon as he opened the door and was met with Taylor's sleepy eyes. It's Taylor! 
Come quick, Taylor is here, we've got a problem. Everyone came running, worried, sick, and wondering what happened. Taylor is at our doorsteps at eight in the freaking morning. Something is definitely wrong, continued Peter, laughing. You little doofus, said Taylor, while his mother playfully hit him in the back of his head, laughing. Taylor joined them in the kitchen and helped them set the breakfast table. When they all sat down, breakfast was not as animated as usual. The first ten minutes, everyone was quiet at the table. You could hear a pin drop. Can we address the elephant in the room? asked Taylor, determined to break the heavy silence. They all sighed simultaneously and looked at her. We have a problem, don't we? Taylor continued. Taylor, honey, there is no problem. Emma was just emotional yesterday evening, said Mrs. Jackson. You know that lover boy paid me a visit yesterday evening? Who is lover boy? inquired Peter, all confused. Your sister's soulmate, said Taylor coolly. What? exclaimed Emma as she snapped her head looking at Taylor with eyes wide open. Liam went to our apartment? How did he even know where we live? What happened? Did he do anything to you? Yes, he got me followed. We just talked and he apologized. Oh, and no, he didn't do anything to me, replied Taylor, counting on her fingers to make sure she answered all of Emma's questions. They all looked at Taylor as if she had grown a second head, and to Taylor's surprise, Mrs. Jackson looked at her, scrutinizing her face before asking, Taylor, sweetheart, did you overdrink last night at the ball? Mrs. Jackson, I would have expected this comment from Peter, not from you, laughed Taylor. He really visited our apartment. He apologized and promised to treat Emma well. He wanted to talk to me and address my concerns. Emma was relieved. For a moment, she was worried that Liam went after Taylor for a fight. After all, his pack members were not happy with Taylor's interference last night and considered it a disrespect to their alpha. Peter and the guys had to use all the diplomacy in the world to calm them down while Liam and Emma were meeting with Derek. But, indeed, when they came out of the meeting, Liam immediately dismissed his people's issue with Taylor and left with them, allegedly to the hotel, to rest. Little did Emma know that he was planning a surprise visit to Taylor. Emma was not only relieved, but she was also happy that her mate understood the depth of her friendship with Taylor and that he wanted to mend the relationship with Taylor. She could not believe her ears. Alpha Liam is not known to be a person to care about other people's feelings. What, what did you think of him? asked Emma. I think he generally cares about you, Emma. His apologies seem sincere as well. And he definitely is a smart guy. He knew that I would be a pain in the ass if I am not convinced of his true feelings. So he came with an olive branch to plead his cause and convince me that he will treat you well. The apocalypse is coming, people. Run for your life, screamed Peter at the top of his lungs. First Alpha Liam apologizes, then Taylor is at our door at eight in the freaking morning. The end is near, I'm telling you. They all laughed, pleased that the situation between Liam and Taylor is no longer tense, and that Taylor somehow approved of Emma's mate. I expected you to say he threatened you, not that he apologized, muttered Mrs. Jackson. If I'm being honest and fair, I would say I'm the one who threatened him. You what? They all screamed. Uh, calm down, people. He is just a man, chuckled Taylor. You threatened Liam? asked Emma flabbergasted. She could not believe her ears. No one threatens an alpha and lives to tell the story. And when this alpha is Liam Carter, all hell breaks loose if anyone dares to offend him. Yep, said Taylor, popping the pea. He knows now that if he hurts you in any way, I will hunt him down and kick his ass right in the middle of Idaho. 
You are one crazy, yet fearless woman, Taylor. I will give you that, said Peter, laughing. So, Emma, Idaho, are you sure about that? You were crying yesterday, said Taylor. I am 100% sure, Taylor. I was emotional yesterday. I was scared because Liam is, well, particular. He is a strong leader, respected by his peers and feared by his enemies. And to be honest, I was also scared for you, Taylor. No one ever stood up to Liam in front of anyone. Maybe this is what he needed, a crash course in humility. And I am happy to be his teacher, given that his parents clearly didn't do their job, smirked Taylor. Don't ever mention his parents, Emma cut her off in an aggressive tone. Taylor was startled and looked at Emma with probing eyes, trying to understand this sudden burst of hostility. His parents and sister were murdered when he was a kid, brutally murdered. He had to take care of his brother and took early on the responsibilities of his community. He never got to avenge them and bring them to justice as the murderers were never arrested. But I heard that to this day, he is still searching for the murderers, added Peter. This explains a lot, murmured Taylor, lost in her thoughts, thinking about what Liam had to go through at such a young age. As tension was resurfacing, Emma stood up, took Taylor's hand, and dragged her out, informing her family that they're going for one last walk. Peter and her parents proposed to go to the girls' apartment and pack Emma's stuff, giving them more time together. The girls were walking hand in hand in silence when Emma stopped. Her eyes glazed over, as if in a trance. She was actually using her mind link and talking telepathically with Alpha Derek. But for an outsider like Taylor, who is not aware that werewolves exist, and that werewolves from the same pack can mind link, it can seem odd. Oh, I, I forgot to tell you, Alpha Derek wants to see us. Let's pass by his office first, Emma informed Taylor. Derek welcomed them with open arms when they reached his office. Nice to see you, Taylor, said Derek with sadness in his eyes, not forgetting the words Taylor told him last night. Surprised to see me in one piece? No, I was rather surprised to see Liam in one piece, although I heard that you attacked their car. A vintage car, I might add. For the record, the attack on the car happened before we talked. After our talk, and to respect your wishes, I was a lovely host, clarified Taylor. Yes, I am aware. He told me about your discussion. Liam passed by this morning before he left. He already left, so how is Emma going to go? I thought he would at least be there to travel with her. She will be escorted by two of his most trusted people. Taylor rolled her eyes, fuming, but Derek did not let her comment as he continued. This is why I wanted to talk to you, because I wanted to tell you that when the time comes at noon, his people will take Emma to the airport, and you are required to act normal. No snarky comments a la Taylor. Derek, I am genuinely doing my best here. I am trying to understand your soulmate beliefs. But come on, doesn't love at first sight require a minimum effort from his side? She is leaving her family and her community going thousands of miles away. The minimum decent thing to do for him is to be there for her, no? Taylor, you know that I love you and Emma as if you were my own. Please humor us with our cultural values. I know it's difficult for you, but do you believe that I would let Emma go if I wasn't sure that her safety and well-being are secured? Taylor rested her head on the seat and looked at Derek. His tone was dead serious, and his request felt like an order. Emma put her hand on Taylor's shoulder and smiled at her, letting her know that she's happy with this arrangement and that everything will be okay. Derek hugged Emma and wished her a safe trip. While walking them out of his office, he also told her to call him if anything happens. 
Taylor furrowed her eyebrows, wondering why something would happen, why the Jacksons asked her whether Liam threatened her, why everyone is walking on eggshells when it comes to Emma's soulmate. Taylor couldn't get over the feeling that something is terribly wrong when Derek snapped her out of her inner thoughts, kissing her on the forehead and reminding her that with Emma gone to Idaho, he still expected to see Taylor as frequently as before in his gated... Chapter 6 Instead of walking back to Emma's home, the girls decided to go to their favorite spot, next to the small lake in the gated community. Emma, Peter, and Taylor used to spend all their free time by this lake with the neighborhood kids, Jeremy, Marta, and Mary. They would play, sit, and dream about the future, until one by one most of them left, mainly the girls, as they met their mates and had to leave with them to their community. As they were walking, Taylor could not discard the weird feeling that they were being followed, they were in the small forest heading to the lake when Taylor shoved Emma behind a tree with her hand on her mouth, signaling that she must remain quiet. Emma looked at Taylor with inquisitive eyes, trying to understand what happened to her friend. In the silence of the forest, they both heard twigs snap and footsteps coming closer. They waited a minute or so until the stalker passed next to them, sniffing in the air. Taylor did not have time to analyze why the guy was sniffing like a hunting dog. She quickly went for a jab cross, punching him with her left arm first, then quickly following with a right arm punch. Once he fell, Taylor hovered over him and gave him a series of punches on the head to incapacitate him. Stop! Tay! Stop! This is Liam's man! yelled Emma as she tried to grab her friend's arm. Taylor looked down and recognized Car Lover. What the hell is he doing here? She did not have time to ask as she heard more footsteps coming their way. She raised her head and saw a man running to catch up with them. Taylor realized that those are the two people instructed to escort Emma to Idaho. Car lover, no one told you that you shouldn't sneak up on women like that? lectured Taylor as she stretched out her hand to pick him up. I wasn't sneaking up. I was just following you for protection, replied Car lover with his hand on his bloody nose. Excuse me? Protection from whom? Now that Emma is the lo I mean, the soulmate of Liam, we need to make sure she is not in danger. When the second man reached them and saw his friend all bloodied, he grabbed Taylor by her collar and raised her up to his eye level. Taylor's feet were no longer on the ground and she was gasping for air. This man was huge and she needed to think about her next defensive move because she will not be able to take him down like she easily did to Carlover. Before she could devise a plan, Emma and Carlover both grabbed the man's arm and told him to let her go. He instantly dropped Taylor as if she were a disposable trash bag, looked at her with disgust, and pointed his V-sign fingers at his eyes, and then turned them and pointed them at Taylor, signaling that he will be watching her. After what Taylor considered a dramatic pause, he turned to Carlover. Are you okay, man? Uh, yes, I'm okay. It'll heal fast. How the hell did you get beaten up by a human? A woman human? Hey, I can hear you, you big bag of muscles. I'm standing right over here, yelled Taylor, offended. The man did not even acknowledge Taylor and continued talking with Carlover. She deserves a lesson. I can beat her up for you. Are you crazy? The instructions were clear. Did you forget them already? Gentlemen, could you give us some privacy, please? I don't have much time before I will have to leave, and I would like to spend them with my friend, Emma addressed them softly. Yes, of course, Luna, they both said and moved a few feet back to give Emma and Taylor more privacy. Wow, what was that? The rock is your bodyguard now, Emma, said Taylor to try and lighten the mood. 
They both laughed and moved to sit by the lake. Emma, I am doing my best. I really am, but I am not feeling this. He is moody, bipolar at best, maybe a psychopath. He has two people following you to report on your every move. Something is wrong. What is happening? Please, Taylor, let it go. Can't you be happy for me? Of course, I would go to the moon for you, but I don't feel it. It's just because I'm leaving that you feel this unrest. Don't worry. We will stay in touch and I will visit you often, explained Emma as she gave her friend a side hug. They sat side by side looking at the horizon, too emotional to talk. After what seemed like forever, Taylor sighed and leaned back on the grass, crossing her hands behind her head for support. First Marta, then Mary, and now you. Why the women must leave with their so-called mates? Why can't your mates move here? Emma rolled her eyes. Don't go all feminist on me now, Tay. Liam is the manager of his community, and he has multiple companies established there. He can't move. Well, you have a job here, too, yet you are moving. I am an employee. It's not my company. You know it's different, Tay. Yeah, whatever. Don't tell me that if you had finally found the man of your dreams, you wouldn't move across the country for him if needed. If all the right boxes are checked, yes, I would probably move, but not before securing you a dream job right where I'm moving, or even better, finding you your dream man so you have another good excuse to move with me, said Taylor, winking. Oh, why didn't you tell me this earlier? You want me to find you a nice guy in Idaho? I'm sure Liam has some single friends I can introduce you to, replied Emma, smirking. Hell no! I've seen the type of men around him. During the ball and just now, dates would be organized in a boxing ring, laughed Taylor. Emma laid on the grass next to Taylor, both looking at the sky, reminiscing all the good memories they created right here next to this lake. They sat there for hours, reminiscing and laughing, while Liam's men looked at them from the distance. When the time came to head to her parents' house, the girls stood up, looked one last time at the lake, and then walked hand in hand back to the main road, heading to the Jacksons' house. The rest of the morning went by as a blurry dream for both Emma and Taylor. They finished packing, sat down in the Jacksons' backyard, all five of them cuddled up. There was no room for words. Emotions were raw. Love could be felt in every embrace, in every look. At noon, they all walked hand in hand to the car where Carlover and The Rock were waiting for Emma. After hugging everyone one last time, Emma opened the car door and looked one last time at Taylor. You can change your mind at any time, Emma. I am one call away. I will come personally and get you back home. Carlover and The Rock frowned hearing Taylor, but she didn't care. When Emma got in the car, Carlover closed the door, and before he could sit in the driver's seat, Taylor grabbed his hand. Carlover, if anything happens to her, even if she's just sad and you don't tell me, your car will become my masterpiece, and then your face will become my second masterpiece. The rock growled at her as if he was an animal. Taylor looked at him surprised but unfazed. I can't make your face a masterpiece, Rock. You would squash me like a fly. I am not delusional. But Carlover here is an easy target, so if you don't want him to be hurt, make sure that Emma is safe and happy. We don't need you to tell us that she needs to be safe. We will protect her with our life. She is our Luna, the Rock replied before sliding in the car and closing his car door a tad violently as if to mark his annoyance at Taylor's comments. As Taylor saw the car disappearing into the horizon, a tear rolled down her cheek. Peter, feeling Taylor's pain, put his hand on her shoulder trying to comfort her. 
She is going to be safe. She's going to be safe, Taylor. Peter, I feel you're trying to convince yourself. Something is wrong, you know. Everyone here knows it. Taylor, please, let's put positive thoughts out in the world. This is what Emma needs. Taylor looked at him with tears filling her eyes, kissed him goodbye, and left. She ran to her car, drove to her apartment, and cried as soon as she got inside. She was sobbing on the floor. She felt that she failed her friend, felt that she should have insisted more and convinced her to stay, or at least postpone her move. Chapter 7 The next day, Taylor woke up feeling lonely. The apartment seemed so empty with Emma gone, and adding to her misery, she needed a cup of coffee, and Emma is not here to help her vanquish the coffee machine. She checked her messages while heading to the kitchen and saw a notification from Emma. It was a message with step-by-step -step instructions, and even pictograms on how to activate the coffee machine and how to make coffee. You didn't forget about your technology-challenged friend, Taylor said to herself, smiling and happy that Emma thought about her. She made her coffee without damaging the machine, took a selfie with her coffee mug, and sent it to Emma. Taylor to Emma. Thank you, BFF. Cheers to you. She got another notification, a message from Peter, asking her to come and visit them. Every Sunday, Taylor and Emma would have brunch with the family, but today, Taylor was not in the mood to see the Jackson family, nor anyone from the Mystic Moon community. She politely declined Peter's offer and instead decided to accept an invitation by guy number 21 for a coffee in the afternoon. Foolish mistake! The guy was boring as hell. He was going on and on about his achievements, about his work, his car, his workout. She tried to put her fake smile on, nodded here and there, but she was miles away. Her mind was in Idaho, thinking about Emma, wondering whether everything is all right. She checked her phone every two minutes, hoping for a message from Emma who had not replied yet to her selfie, nor to the other messages she sent throughout the day. When she finally saw a notification from Emma, she immediately checked the text message out, zoning out boy number 21 and his stories. Emma's message was short. Hi, Tay. Great to see the coffee machine survived your lethal hands. Everything is okay here. We had an extensive training session with the community members today and resting in my room for now. Taylor could not take it anymore. She told guy number 21 that she got an emergency at work and needed to head out. After thanking him for the coffee, she left the coffee shop and video called Emma. Hi, Em. Missed you, girl. How have you been? When are you coming back to visit? Grilled Taylor. Come on, Tay. It hasn't even been 24 hours, replied Emma, laughing softly. But yes, I miss you too already. So show me around. I want a virtual tour of the community. Emma raised her smartphone and gave Taylor a quick overview of Liam's community, which looked amazing. It's huge. How many people live there? It seems to me that it's much bigger than Mystic Moon. Yes, indeed, it is much bigger. We have around 600 people in Liam's community, and his brother's community is just next to ours, and he has around 450 residents. Oh, so there are two of them? Is the brother as charming and sweet as Liam? said Taylor, sarcastically. Tay, don't talk like that about my man. Speaking of your man, how is he treating you? It's okay. Don't worry about me, Tay. Well, someone has to. Tay, don't be mean. You know that my family loves me. Yes, of course. Everyone at the Mystic Moon community loves you, Emma. But still, I am worried about you. Keep me updated, and I expect to receive your messages regularly. Deal? Deal, chuckled Emma. Oh, uh, by the way, I'll try to finish my latest design tonight, and I'll send it to you for your insightful feedback as usual. 
The next week went by slowly and excruciatingly for Taylor. Emma's messages were sparse and short, never laughing or commenting back on jokes shared by Taylor or shared in the family group chat. She did not comment on Taylor's new baby, did not comment when Taylor wrote that she went out with guy number 22 and it was a disaster. She didn't even comment when Taylor wrote that she burned the coffee machine. Well, that was not true, but Taylor was desperate for a reaction from her friend. The reaction came at the end of the week when Emma finally replied. Emma to Taylor. Oh, Tay, sorry, I just saw your messages. It was a busy week. What happened? Do you need any help? Should I tell you the model so that you can order it online? Do you want Peter to pass by to help? Taylor to Emma. Well, well, my bestie finally remembered me. Should I wait five days before replying? Emma knew better than to just reply by text message, so she called Taylor. Hi, Tay. Don't be a pain in the peach, please. Hello to you, too. And can you blame me? You simply ignored me the whole week. I needed your support. I had a big order, lots of pressure, and I needed your opinion on my latest creations. I'm sorry, Tay. As I said, this was a busy week. Hopefully next time I'll be more reactive to your messages. So how was your week? asked Taylor, changing the subject as she felt annoyance in her friend's tone. Well, nothing much. Training, walking around, meeting new people, discovering the community. Are you searching for a job? No, not really. Not sure I will be able to work. I have to support Liam and his community. And how is lover boy? All is good. Meaning? Emma sighed. Meaning he is nice to me and everything is all right between us. Yeah, but is he treating you as you want to be treated? Tay, your questions are tiring. Everything is okay. Please trust me. Okay, I do trust you. I am just worried about you. I know, Tay, but really, there's no reason for you to worry. Unfortunately, Emma's lack of communication did not improve over the next three weeks. Taylor would send messages, and Emma would reply days later with short and quick texts. Even Emma's replies to her parents' posts in the family group chat were sparse. No reply from Emma when Taylor asked her for her opinion on her sketches, no comments when Taylor shared about her misadventures with guy number 22. Even when Taylor wrote to Emma about guy number 22, inviting her to a chick flick marathon. In normal times, Emma would have funny banters and would have joked about it for days. And every time Taylor tried to FaceTime Emma, she would not answer. And even sometimes she would simply hang up on her. The fourth week, Taylor was fed up. She sent her friend an upfront message. Tay to M. Hello, Emma. How are you? I notice that you're not answering my calls, so I am coming. I am just going to buy my ticket and will come and meet you. Not even 30 seconds passed by before Emma directly video called her friend. Taylor, what's up? Why do you want to come? What do you think? You've not been answering my messages. You've not been answering the messages in the family group or the friends group chats. It's like we're talking with a stranger. What's happening? Don't worry, I am just too busy. Busy with what? You don't work and I'm sure that you're not busy all day. Yeah, but I have a lot of responsibilities. I have to manage different things in the community. Emma, you had a full-time job that was so demanding, and yet you always found time to answer and chat with us. I'm coming. Taylor, please, don't come. Everything is okay. Emma's insistence for Taylor not to visit only contributed to convince Taylor that something was wrong. Why would her friend beg her not to come and visit if everything were okay? Okay, okay, Em, you're right. I am sometimes overprotective when it comes to you, admitted Taylor. I have to go for now. 
I have to finish my woodwork, but I will talk with you later, and you better answer me when I call, continued Taylor. As soon as Taylor hung up, she decided to pay the Jacksons a visit. Her instincts told her that something was not right with her friend, and she must do something about it. But if she wanted her plan to succeed, she must have them on her side. She picked up her phone and texted Peter. Hi, bro. Up for a pizza tonight with you and your parents? Peter was surprised. For the past month, Taylor has not set foot in their house. She always messaged them and reached out, but she seemed to be boycotting the gated community ever since Emma's departure. Great idea. We'll be waiting for you, Peter wrote back, frowning and trying to guess the reason behind Taylor's visit. It must be related to Emma. Hi, honey. How are you? How have you been? asked Mr. Jackson while hugging Taylor. You forgot about us, Taylor. How could you leave us alone? It was as if you left with Emma, Mrs. Jackson scolded her. So man number what? asked Peter, mocking her. Twenty-two and counting, Peter. All as horrible as the previous ones. Everyone laughed, and Mrs. Jackson asked Taylor whether she wanted a drink. Yes, please, I'll take a lemonade. As they sat down for dinner, Mr. Jackson asked Taylor, What is wrong, Taylor? Are you worried about Emma? Aren't you? she replied. Everyone went silent. So you have noticed, too. You notice that she has changed. Something is wrong, right? Her parents looked at each other, not sure how to answer. Peter looked at Taylor and asked, You're going there, aren't you? I just need an address, Peter, and then I'm on a flight first thing tomorrow morning. You know that we would like to go with you, but we can't. Because of your community? Yes, answered Emma's mom, embarrassed. If you want my opinion, your community rules suck if you can't go visit your daughter and save her if she needs saving. But luckily, this is why you have me. I will be the bad cop. I'll go there and clear things up. The three of them were looking at each other, gazing in each other's eyes as if engaged in a silent discussion, thought Taylor. After a minute or so, Peter broke the silence and said, We'll give you her address, but promise us first that you will use diplomacy, said Peter, after a moment of silence. You know that you are talking to me, right? Diplomacy does not exist in my dictionary, smirked Taylor. But you have to, Tay. This is an extremely sensitive situation. If you go there and you make a scene, this will have huge repercussions on our entire community here. It is going to be war between our communities, Taylor. So what? You don't do yoga retreats together anymore? They don't attend the ball anymore? What a loss, mocked Taylor. This is extremely serious, Taylor, replied Mr. Jackson. We cannot explain it in detail. Come on, it's a gated community, not a gang. Taylor, if you want to go, you need our help, and for that you must promise us that you will behave. You will not insult him, and you will not mock him. And if your gut feeling is right, and you see that Emma is not happy and needs to come back to us, then you must use all the diplomacy that you don't have, but that you will need to learn quickly. And under no circumstances do you tell him that you are bringing her back here forever. You can pretend that her mother is sick, and I can convince Derek to confirm this, added Emma's father. Why bring Derek into this? Because Liam will definitely call Derek to confirm your story and make sure that you are not lying. Okay, you've got yourselves a deal. Now, give me the address, and I'll travel first thing tomorrow morning. I already set things up with Simon in the... Chapter 8 Taylor was patiently waiting for her turn at the rental car booth. She headed there as soon as she landed at the Idaho Falls airport. She was in a khaki tank top and a boyfriend's jeans. Her sweater tied around her waist, and she was using her car rental confirmation paper as a fan to stay cool. "'Your first time in our city, Miss Smith?' asked the receptionist with a smile and continued. "'Are you here for business or leisure?'
Hmm, neither. I'm here to get back something very precious, replied Taylor with a smirk. Oh, what is it, a treasure? whispered the receptionist with her eyes lighting up. Uh, yeah, you could call it a treasure. Where are you planning to find this treasure? You know, we had a lot of gold mines in the mountains. It's on the land of a gated community, replied Taylor. Which one? Blue moon or river moon or silver moon or red moon? Which one? How many moon communities do you have in this place? Yes, we have a lot in the whole state, laughed the receptionist. Probably built by the same real estate promoter, as they all have the prefix moon in the name. So, which one, you said? she asked. Uh, the silver moon. Oh, the silver moon community. And they agree to let you in? They usually don't accept visitors. What do you mean, they don't accept visitors? It's a highly secured community, and the residents are very secluded. They don't come to the city often, and they don't mix with the rest of us. After a few minutes of small talk, Taylor got her rented car and entered the GPS coordinates shared by Emma's family. Two and a half hours. Acceptable, but I will definitely have to stop for a bite. Airplane food portions are ridiculously small, said Taylor to herself. One hour later, Taylor spotted a gas station with a small adjacent diner. She decided it was time for a lunch break. The diner was almost deserted, if not for the two clients sitting at the end of the counter and eating two burgers. It had a rustic vibe with wooden chairs and tables. The bar, on the other hand, was all metallic and didn't go well with the setting, noted Taylor. Welcome to Sam's Diner, said the waitress. Do you want to sit at the bar or get a table? Good morning, miss. Uh, thank you. The bar will do. I'll take a burger platter, please, with extra fries, as I'm starving, replied Taylor with a smile. Had a long drive? Not really. I'm just always hungry, said Taylor with a wink. The waitress laughed and went to the kitchen to make sure Taylor's order is processed. Touching the bar, Taylor couldn't help but think that a wood bar would look better and compliment the tables. She asked the waitress for a pen, grabbed a napkin, and started drawing. Deep in her thoughts, she heard the doorbell and saw three guys come in and sit next to her at the bar. Howdy, said the three men. Taylor gave them a quick look and a nod before going back to her napkin and focusing on her drawing. Wow, you're quite an artist, said one of the men who was sitting just next to her and eyeing her drawing. I know, replied Taylor without giving him a look. He laughed. Okay, this one is modest. What brings you here? He continued. For business. Oh, really? What kind of business? Top secret, huffed Taylor, visibly annoyed. You're not from the region. Do you come from far away? Are you a policeman or something? Do you ask everyone you meet such personal and inquisitive questions, burst Taylor? I, I didn't mean to make you uncomfortable, miss. We're not used to seeing strangers here, and... We wanted to be welcoming to visitors. The reputation of our city is at stake, after all, he said with a smile. If you want to visit us, don't hesitate. We live not far from here in the Rouge Moon community. It's a bit down the road, and we could use someone like you, he added. Someone like me, repeated Taylor, furrowing her brows. Uh, yes, someone that annoys the shit out of people, he continued, smirking. You got me. That's my secret weapon, but I am fully booked. How about I offer you a drink and afterwards we continue our disgust back at my place, insisted the guy. Uh, clearly, you cannot take a hint. I am not interested. Now leave me the hell alone. He was fuming and clearly offended by Taylor's rejection. Listen, miss. If you want to survive here, you must know how to respect people, and specifically me and my people. Respect is owned and deserved, replied Taylor, and with that she went back to her drawings. How about I offer you lunch instead of just a drink? Seriously? Listen carefully. I am busy, and I won't have time for you and Douche Moon Community. Douche? What the hell? It's Rouge Moon Community. Are you insulting us? yelled the guy. A loud laughter broke. 
The two guests sitting at the far end of the counter were laughing out loud. Rogues, you got schooled. Time to drop it and go home to your douche community, said one of the guys, bursting into laughter again. The annoying guy did not like having an audience to his humiliation and was enraged. Taylor was smart enough to know when a ticking bomb was about to explode, and she didn't have time for a fight. She put the money on the table and was about to take her leave when the waitress saw her drawing on the napkin. Oh, my God, miss, did you draw a lunch counter and a bar? Yes, I got inspired. By how ugly ours is? <laughs> you said it, not me, laughed Taylor. They are amazing and fit perfectly in our diner. Can I keep the drawing and show it to my boss? He was talking about doing some renovations. Uh, yeah, sure. And I'll give you my business card. I'm not based here, but we ship throughout the whole country and even worldwide. Uh, tell him to give me a call if he's interested. Taylor signed her drawing, took a picture, and then handed the napkin and business card to the waitress. Have a nice day and thank you for lunch, said Taylor, heading to the door. As she was about to get into her car, surprise, surprise, Mr. Douche put his hand on the door, blocking it, and got close to Taylor, whispering, You know, we might have a job for you. It'll require a lot of sweating and a lot of handwork, but you are definitely perfect for this job I have in mind for you, he said, smirking at Taylor. Oh, come on, you again? Those sleazy sexual innuendos are just stupid and know your place, lady. You are a stranger in this land, not in a position to challenge me. You're just a human. Seriously, what is it with people calling me human? Is that a new slang I missed? muttered Taylor, her patience running out. What do you want me to call you, a whore? That was it. The punch landed on Mr. Douche's nose at the speed of light. Next time you want to disrespect a human, think twice, said Taylor, using air quotes for the word human. And believe me, I've been indulgent here. I could have sent you to the hospital if I wanted to, she added. Oh, you pathetic human! He did not have time to continue his ranting. She went for his crotch, and he was on the floor, unable to breathe. Don't you ever underestimate a human woman, said Taylor, kicking him away from her car. She got into her car, and while driving away, she noticed that there was an audience to their fight. The douche's friends and the other diner guests were standing outside the diner, mouths open and a dumbfounded look on their faces. Taylor drove nonstop for the remaining one hour and a half until she reached the Silver Moon gated community. Gated was an understatement. This was more of a fortress. Huge metal gates, three armed guards, CCTVs everywhere, and the whole territory's border, which goes as far as the horizon, is covered with barbed wire fence. Okay, people are serious about security over here, thought Taylor while driving towards the guard. How can we help you, miss? asked one of the guards. I'm visiting a friend, Emma Jackson. The guard was surprised and looked suspiciously at Taylor. He looked at his phone, then told Taylor, We do not have any registered visitors for Ms. Emma. Yes, that's because this is a surprise. You can call her and she will confirm that I'm her friend, Taylor, Taylor Smith, explained Taylor. Sorry, miss, but we can't let in unannounced visitors. You'll have to turn around and leave. The hell I... Chapter 9 Listen, I drove three hours to come and see my friend. I am tired and hungry. So we are going to have a problem if you don't call Emma this instant. Taylor did not want to call her friend herself because chances are Emma will not answer. And she definitely didn't want to lose face in front of uptight guard number one over here. The guard gulped, worried that he might be offending his Luna. After giving Taylor one last look, he grabbed his phone and moved to the side, making sure Taylor cannot hear him. He talked for a few seconds before hanging up. Taylor did not get a chance to question with him because her smartphone started ringing. It was Emma. 
Taylor, are you really at the gates? Why did you come? asked Emma with an alarmed voice. Well, hello to you, Emma. Yes, I missed you too. Yes, I was sure you were going to like my surprise, replied Taylor playfully. Yes, of course I missed you too. I am just surprised. I didn't believe the guard when he told me that you're at the gates. I had to call you directly to confirm that it is really you. Yep, I noticed your soulmate runs a tight ship over here. I will tell Ray and Charles to let you in. Then you go to the big house. Follow the road sign, Pack House. Okay, will do. See you in a jiff, said Taylor before hanging up. The Silver Moon Gated community is huge. Taylor passed over six low-rise buildings before reaching the Pack House, and she estimated that this community hosted a minimum of 30 buildings. Taylor was stunned as soon as she laid eyes on the Pack House, which looked like a resort hotel and could fit hundreds of residents on its own. As Taylor parked her car, she noticed a group of heavily armed people coming out of the main entrance of the Pack House. Quite a welcome party, thought Taylor. Taylor, Taylor, I am so glad you're here, Emma was screaming as she ran past the welcome committee and landed in Taylor's arms. I missed you so much, I can't believe you're here, continued Emma. You can give your car keys to Clive, he'll park it for you and get your luggage. Taylor turned around following Emma's gaze and saw car lovers standing there. Oh, he is Clive? I know him as car lover, smirked Taylor. Car lover, are you a vengeful guy? added Taylor. Clive looked at Taylor intensely for a few seconds, then he burst out laughing. Emma was confused and looked at Clive and Taylor laughing. Back in Dallas, I keyed his car, apparently a vintage car, because he was following me, so I wanted to make sure he'll not do the same with my car now. I would not dare upset you nor my Luna, I, I mean, Miss Emma, said Clive, taking the keys from Taylor's fingers. Come, let me show you around, said Emma, walking hand in hand with Taylor back to the pack house. The lobby of the pack house was spacious with panoramic windows providing a breathtaking view on the surrounding mountains. Lounge areas were scattered here and there, and a large wooden yet modern bar was the focal point on the right, with different beverages available to grab on the go. Taylor noticed on the left a large dining hall decorated with long wood tables and contemporary velvet chairs. While Taylor was still looking around, amazed by the beauty of the place, Emma was giving orders to prepare a guest room for Taylor. Then she grabbed two cups of coffee, and they crashed on a couch in the lounge area to talk. Unfortunately, they didn't get the chance to talk, as Emma suddenly became tense, looking at something in front of her. Taylor did not need to follow her look. She immediately guessed that lover boy was coming their way. He looked handsome and composed as ever, but Taylor noticed that he was not alone. A tall, handsome man was walking by his side. He had short blonde hair, a strong jawline, and light stubble. But what captivated Taylor were his forest green eyes. He was staring intensely at her as he approached with Liam. Taylor was completely lost in his eyes and felt a shiver go through her spine. She could not understand why this stranger had such an effect on her. She noticed he smiled as if aware of his power over her. Arrogant much, thought Taylor to herself silently. She forced herself to look at Liam and try to ignore this man. Good afternoon, Miss Smith. When did you come? Why did you come? Liam said. It has been a month, so I am doing quality control to make sure you kept your word. Seriously? Do her parents know that you're here? Or Derek? No, I don't need their permission to come and see my friend. I don't need anyone's permission. Liam looked back at Taylor as if he is processing her answer and trying to contain his disdain at her passive-aggressive response. Then he looked at Emma and asked her, 
Emma, were you aware that Taylor was coming? What? No, no, of course not, replied Emma, stuttering. Taylor furrowed her brows. Emma's body language and voice depict fear, and Taylor did not like that one bit. Emma, I am starving. Do you think you can get me a nice chocolatey dessert? I didn't see any at the bar. Uh, yes, of course. I'll check with the chef. He makes a killer chocolate mousse. We'll see if we have any left and bring you some, replied Emma, as she left to go to the kitchen after looking cautiously at Liam and Taylor, wondering whether it's a wise decision to leave those two alone. Lover boy, we need to talk privately, said Taylor seriously. We can go to my office. After you, gestured Taylor. As they reached his office, Taylor noticed that the handsome guy was following them. Excuse me, this is a private conversation. This is my brother, Dean Carter, said Liam. Nice to meet you, miss. Taylor, Taylor Smith. Oh, you are the Taylor from Dallas? The one who screamed at my brother in the middle of the ball? I am definitely not leaving, smirked Dean. I see my reputation preceded me. Nice to meet you, Dean, but I still prefer to have a private conversation with Liam. I have no secret from him, snapped Liam. Oh, really? Do you discuss sexual position with him? Taylor, I have no time for such childish behavior, huffed Liam angrily, while Dean was hardly containing his laughter. Okay, okay, if you have no problem to be scolded in front of your brother, as you wish, said Taylor, raising her hands as if she's giving up. Liam closed the door, and they all took a seat in his office. Lover boy, it seems to me that you broke your promise, so I am here to collect something that you don't deserve. What is that? Emma, of course. Are you fucking kidding me? She is my mate, and you can't take her, yelled Liam, with his fists clenched, hardly containing his anger. We had a deal, Liam. You were supposed to take care of her. And I did. How dare you pretend otherwise? I was always extremely polite with her, provided her with everything, never raised my voice on her. Why am I justifying myself to you? I don't have to. Her smile disappeared as soon as she saw you coming towards us when we were in the lobby. She was scared when you asked her whether she knew I was coming. She hardly talks with me on the phone while we used to talk for hours on the phone, even though we used to live together. Taylor, this is my brother, and I can reassure you that he never hurt a woman, and definitely not his mate, intervened Dean. Well, you know that you can hurt a person without raising your hand. It doesn't need to be physical. It could be emotional. Something is wrong here. I know it. I feel it. I know her. Get off my back, Taylor. You are unbelievable. Why do you put your nose where it doesn't belong? hissed Liam. Emma is my sister, and I'm worried about her. I'm sure you would have done the same for your brother. You are not her sister by blood. Family isn't only about blood. You will not take my mate, Taylor, warned Liam. You want me to believe that you never lost your temper with her, that you never yelled at her like you just did at me? Of course I did not yell at her. She is a kind and lovely woman, unlike you, he spitted. Before Taylor could reply, Dean tried to mediate again. Okay, Liam and Taylor, you both need to calm down. Taylor, why don't you stay for a few days with us, and you can see firsthand how happy Emma is here. What? No, she will leave immediately. Chapter 10 I actually like that proposal. Good idea from the brother. I'll be staying for a few days. If I am not convinced, I will leave with Emma. If I am convinced, I will admit defeat and leave empty-handed. Liam and Taylor stared at each other. No one was talking, or at least this is what it seemed to Taylor. Liam and Dean were mind-linking each other, talking telepathically, or rather fighting telepathically. What's wrong with you, Dean? Why did you propose that she stays? She considers Emma as her sister, 
she believes something is wrong. Let her stay to see with her own eyes that there is nothing wrong. But did you hurt Emma? What? Of, of course not. So what are you afraid of? She stays a few days and then that's it. And you want to convince me that this is the only reason? You didn't negotiate this lame agreement because you want to get into her pants during her stay? Liam, you know me. Of course I want her in my bed. After a couple of minutes, Liam sighed and broke the silence. Okay, you can stay. Yes! Happily screamed Taylor while raising her fist in the air. She did not have the time to celebrate this small win as the office door opened abruptly and Emma came running in. What is happening here? And why are you in Liam's office in the first place? I have been searching for you, said Emma as she walked in Liam's office. Oh, nothing much, Emma. Your husband and I were just setting the terms of my stay here. Oh? Yes, and we'll shake on it said Taylor, extending her hand. Liam stared at her hand for a few seconds before, reluctantly, shaking her hand to seal the deal. Taylor winced when Liam shook her hand. What's wrong? said the three of them at the same time. Nothing. Emma grabbed Taylor's hand and noticed that her knuckles were bruised. What's that? Okay, don't panic, Emma. I just got into a small fight on my way here. Unbelievable. Wherever you go, trouble follows, mumbled Liam. Seriously, is it my fault? I was sitting in a diner minding my own business. A guy started hitting on me. He was inappropriate and wanted to take me by force to his house. Somewhere in his rogue moon gated community. Did you say rogue moon community? Liam cut in on edge. Yes, why? Do you know them? Liam, Dean, and Emma exchanged concerned looks. Then Dean asked Taylor, Can you describe them? Taylor complied and provided a thorough description of the men. It was their leader, stated Dean. Leave it to Taylor to pick a fight with the rogue's leader on her first visit here, muttered Liam. What is a rogue leader? He said rouge. As in the color red, no? asked Taylor, confused. What happened then? Did he beat you because you told him off? probed Dean, who was getting angrier by the minute, imagining Taylor in the hand of those filthy rogues. Beat me? I'll stop you there, Liam's brother, replied Taylor, laughing. I beat people up. I don't get beaten. Dean was amused by Taylor's comebacks, but a human fighting and defeating a rogue? That is unprecedented. And a petite human like Taylor would have zero chance against a werewolf, especially this rogue leader. Taylor, don't tell me you attacked him, gasped Emma. No, of course not. I didn't want any trouble on my first day here. I was extremely patient, and I didn't hit him. That is, until he followed me to my car and harassed me sexually. It was self-defense, and honestly, I was lenient with him. A sexual predator like him should be taught a lesson. But I practiced restraint, and I just freed myself from his grip and left. And yet your boyfriend here says I am the problem. Liam ran his hand through his hair, visibly upset. He was pacing back and forth in the office, not liking anything he just heard. Did they know where you were headed? that you were coming to Silver Moon Community? Did they know that you are Emma's friend? Yes, of course. I am so naive that I tell the story of my life to every stranger I meet, especially to the perverts, mocked Taylor. Can they link you in any way to the Silver Moon Community? insisted Liam. Well, let me think. If they got my license plate number, they could hack or bribe someone at the rental car company and see Silver Moon as my local address here. Also, they can see my address in Dallas, and if they push their search, they'll find both my name and Emma's on the rent. But still, why would they go through all that trouble? Fuck, Taylor, you are a loose cannon. You put everyone around you in danger because you act and don't think yelled Liam, his voice shaking with anger. 
Seriously, I am the problem? What was I supposed to do? Let him molest me, maybe, or beg him for mercy? Liam opened his mouth to reply, but Taylor did not let him continue. You know what? I am done with this discussion. I'm tired and hungry. I'll let you think about how offensive your words were, and I expect an apology later in the day. Now it's time for dessert. Shall we go, Emma? I need to eat my dessert in peace and have a private chat with you. We have a lot of catching up to do. Emma can take you to your room, but she'll have to come back here as we have work to do together, said Liam, emphasizing together. Taylor clenched her jaw and tightened her fists at her side. He was clearly not going to let Emma spend any time alone with her. She will need to plan carefully in order to secure some alone time with Emma. She decided to let it slide for now and didn't complain. After both girls left the office, Liam looked at Dean, concerned. A rogue moon community. They're getting arrogant. They are no longer hiding. They have increased their attacks on all neighboring territories, and now they're even attacking humans. This cannot be tolerated. I know, Liam. They are well organized and trained. Most of the attacks are hit and run. They just kill a few of our people and then leave. They're taunting us. And if they can link Taylor to my mate, they might increase their attacks on our packs. Don't you think you're exaggerating here? He hit on a human. She sent him packing. End of story. I hope so. Check with your pack whether they've seen or heard of this altercation with Taylor at the diner. I'll check with mine and maybe our guys saw it and managed to track them to their hideout. Okay, will do, said Dean. He looked at his brother, hesitated a bit, and said, You know that she did the right thing, Liam. It was self-defense. You cannot blame her for that. I know, it's just that she is so frustrating. I find her refreshing and extremely attract. Dean, stay away from her. She is trouble. I am sure I can handle her. Anyway, you are a player, Dean. She's a serious girl. I don't want you near her. Oh, I see you're protective of her. Despite all your banters, you respect her. Dean laughed, teasing him. Of course I respect her. She's my mate's best friend. I don't like her, but I respect her. Also, I don't want trouble with my mate if you go after Taylor and break her heart. Speaking of Emma, how is everything, brother? What do you mean? Taylor was not wrong when she said that Emma's face changed completely when we approached them in the lobby. Actually, when I saw her from afar, I noticed how relaxed she was with Taylor. She was smiling. I haven't seen her smile before, Liam. Dean hesitated, then asked, Liam, you never... Of course, Dean, I never hit her. How can you think that? I'm just asking, Liam. I must ask this question because something seems off with Emma. If you didn't notice it, it means you are a bad mate. Now that I think about it, I have never seen you hug Emma or be affectionate since you brought her here. I... Dean, I don't have time for lovey-dovey crap. You know the problems I must deal with. The pack. The rogues. I hear you, brother, but don't forget you brought your mate with you here. This means that you have a responsibility toward her, just like you have a responsibility toward your pack. Liam sighed and ran his fingers through his hair, frustrated and wondering whether his brother and Taylor are both right. Was he neglecting his mate? Taylor was lying on the bed, staring at the ceiling. She was utterly frustrated because she did not get any private time with Emma. When they left Liam's office, Emma walked her up to her room, gave her the chocolate mousse, and left in a hurry. She promised Taylor that they will get to talk later in the afternoon, but never came back. Tired of waiting, Taylor decided to go and search for Emma. Yet, when she opened the door of her room, she came face to face with Clive. Car lover, what are you doing standing at my door? Are you plotting your revenge? teased Taylor. 
No, of course not, Miss Smith. Water under the bridge, all forgotten. I have been assigned as your personal guard during your stay here. Please, call me Taylor, Clive. But why would I need a personal guard? Oh, Liam wants to keep an eye on me. Good to feel trusted. Anyhow, can you take me to Emma? Unfortunately, no, I cannot. Emma is busy with Alpha Liam. Okay, I see. Since you are here, it means that I cannot do whatever I want, nor go wherever I want. So tell me, Clive, what are the acceptable options? Because I can't stay one more minute in my room. Hmm. We have a nice rooftop bar. I can take you there to enjoy the view and a nice drink, proposed Clive. You get me, Clive. You get me, said Taylor, smirking. Let's go and drink. The alfresco bar was lavish with a contemporary design, ethereal green lighting and amazing trees and greenery. It also provided a magnificent panoramic view on the surrounding mountain and a stunning view on the forest in passing river at the horizon. Taylor was stunned by the rooftop and happily took a seat while waiting for her drink. She sent a text message to Emma, letting her know that she is at the rooftop and waiting for her there. Clive, this place is amazing! The view, the decor, even the company, she winked at him. Cheers, Clive, she continued raising her glass. Clive blushed at the compliment and raised his glass. I love it, too. I try to come every other day to enjoy the view and unwind after a long day at work. As she was chatting with Clive, Taylor noticed something coming their way. It was Dean, who was staring at her like an animal hypnotizing his prey. Damn, he is so handsome. Those abs, those eyes, thought Taylor. What the hell? Get your act together, woman, she scolded herself. She is here on a mission, no time for fooling around, even less with Liam's brother. He probably has the same genes of uptightness. Oh, hi, Taylor. I see you found your way to our rooftop. Hope you're enjoying your stay. Well, given that I don't have much freedom to roam around, the rooftop seems to be the only pre-approved location on the list provided by your brother, replied Taylor sarcastically. Taylor, it was great spending time with you. I have to go for now, but I leave you in Dean's company said Clive, with a more serious tone, as he excused himself and left. Oh, it's the shift change. Now it is your turn to be on guard duty, Taylor asked Dean. It's my pleasure. After all, it helps me get some alone quality time with you, said Dean, flirting with her. Damn, this man is a tease. He knows the effect he has on women. Do not blush. Do not blush. Act cool said Taylor to herself. How was your first day at our community? It went well. To be honest, I am frustrated because your brother is blocking me from seeing Emma. I didn't have much time with her yet. You will get all the time in the world since you'll be staying here for a couple of days. He paused, then asked, I wanted to ask you about the Rouge Moon community members you met earlier, Taylor. Yes, what about them? Can you let me know exactly what happened? Why? I'm going to be honest with you. Those are extremely dangerous people and are one of the reasons why security is tight over here. Taylor explained to him everything that happened, leaving nothing from the story. The douche guys, the other customers who wanted to help, the nice waitress, even the bar drawing she did. You are a fearless and funny woman, commented Dean after hearing the whole story. Yes, I have been told that, but not by any of your family members, though, Taylor laughed and replied teasingly. Dean chuckled. Cheers to family. May we protect them, said Dean. And may we teach them to take care of each other, continued Taylor, raising her glass. That I will drink for, agreed Dean. As they were toasting, Liam and Emma entered the bar. Liam was holding her hand and Emma seemed more relaxed, although her eyes looked a bit worried, especially when they landed on Taylor. 
Great to see you're enjoying our rooftop, Taylor, said Liam. Uh, shall we move our table, he continued. The party of four walked to a secluded table surrounded by jasmine plants and candlelight. So how long have you been living in this gated community? Taylor asked Liam and Dean while waiting for their order. We were both born here. This community is over 100 years old. Wow, you done great work modernizing this place. I would not have guessed that the foundations are that old. The guest room is equipped with the latest high-tech gadgets, and I even notice solar panels when enjoying my drink and the panoramic view here. Well, we both have tech companies, and renewable energy is one division in our company. We also cover robotics, software development, uh, Internet of Things. Wait, you have a software development company? Emma, are you helping there? Why would Emma help in the software development company? asked Dean. Seriously? You don't know that your sister-in-law is a software engineer? She was top of her class, and she was recently promoted head of the UX UI development department back in Dallas. Oh, given the look in Liam's eyes, I suppose that neither of you knew. Uh, come on, guys, this is the minimum you should know. Both Liam and Dean were embarrassed, to say the least. Emma was blushing and tried to change the subject, asking Liam and Dean to talk about the innovations they're leading on renewable energy generation, storage, and processing. Taylor let it slide and listened attentively. She was genuinely impressed by the accomplishments and vision of the brothers. And for more efficiency, all our employees live and work here in the gated community, continued Liam. That explains why this community is so huge. It is not only residential, but your company's campus, exclaimed Taylor. And my company's HQ as well, as my company is adjacent to Silver Moon, a bit further to the west by the river. Oh, you don't live here? No, I have my own community. Really? So, which one? Red Moon? Crescent Moon? said Taylor, amused. No, no, I bet it's River Moon. How do you know about all these communities? Well, when I got my rented car, I got a crash course on the numerous moon-related communities in the state. She must have mentioned a dozen gated communities with the prefix moon in the name. The conversation was pleasant and light throughout the night. By the end of dinner, Taylor decided to talk with Emma alone. How about we let you finish your drinks while Emma and I go for a walk, ventured Taylor. Great idea. Let's go for a walk all together, countered Liam. Taylor was not fooled. She knew Liam did not want her to talk with Emma without supervision. Both brothers were looking at her with innocent eyes but devilish smirks. Taylor had to admit defeat. Okay, I will lose this battle but will win the war, she whispered, making sure the guys heard her. They all went for a walk, Liam holding tightly to Emma's hand, and Taylor sandwiched between Liam and Dean. So, Taylor, do they know back home that you're here? asked Liam, not so innocently. I already told you, Liam, I decided to come here on a whim and didn't have time to tell anyone. I just texted Simon that I would be out for a few days, lied Taylor. She had to lie because she knew that Liam would unleash his wrath on Emma's family and even Derek if he knew they helped her out. Who is Simon? asked Dean, not happy to hear that Taylor only informed that guy specifically. He's my business partner. We started our wood shop and interior design business together. And how is work? asked Emma. Great! We won the huge contract with the multinational shipping corporation. Remember the designs I shared with you? They were for this proposal. I'll be redesigning their headquarters and, if they're satisfied, all their branches. I am so proud of you, Tay. You worked hard for that one. And I have no doubt you will do a magnificent job. So what's the plan tomorrow? asked Taylor. Shall we have a girl's day? Liam cut in. Emma's had a super busy day, starting with the training in the morning. Oh, you do trainings here as well? I will definitely join. 
Taylor, our trainings are for a very advanced level, not suitable for you. Who are you calling a beginner lover boy? Liam, Tay can definitely keep up with the trainings. This is not why she won't come. Then, looking at Taylor with a smirk, Emma continued. She will not come because it is too early for her. Tay, the trainings are at 6 a.m. What the hell, 6 a.m.? What, what are you, roosters? They all laughed. Tay is not a morning person, clarified Emma, although it was already crystal clear given her reaction. I am definitely not, but you know what? I will make the effort and join you tomorrow. Wow, really, Tay? Are you sure you can make it that early? Apparently, this is the only option to spend some time with you, said Taylor, while giving Liam a stern look. Emma, let her join. It will be a good lesson for her, said Liam, with a strong emphasis on lesson, as if he's promising Tay to kick her ass on the training field. Challenge accepted, lover boy. Good. Let's go to sleep then, and if you don't wake up early, I will come personally to drag you out of bed threatened Liam. I don't wear pajamas, retorted Taylor. As she saw Liam's nostrils flaring like a warning, she immediately added, laughing, See you tomorrow. I need my beauty sleep. She kissed Emma goodnight, waved to the brothers, and ran towards the pack house to flee Liam. The next day, Taylor woke up at 5.30 a.m. and was on the training field by 5.45 a.m., before everyone else. She was extremely tired, but for her plan to work, she must attend their training session. As she was stretching, she saw Emma heading her way with Liam in a group of residents. Tay, I cannot believe it. Me either. I deserve a freaking medal for that, replied Taylor with a sleepy voice. Good morning, everyone. Liam spoke loudly so that everyone can hear him. Before we start our daily training, I would like to introduce you to Taylor Smith. She is Emma's friend and will be staying with us for a few days. I count on you to make her feel at home. Then he looked at Taylor, a smirk on his face, before continuing. Now, before starting with the training, let's do a warm-up and start with 100 push-ups. Taylor looked at Emma and laughed. Your man thinks that 100 push-ups will scare me? Taylor completed the 100 push-ups, but she did them slowly on purpose, as she wanted Liam to believe that she was not as fit as his community members. He might have a plan of making this training a living hell for her, but her plan was to finally get private time with Emma, and to reach this goal, she had to pretend that she was struggling. After 15 minutes of warm-up, Liam decided to move to the next phase, and they were up for a long hour of gruesome training. Now it's time for the one-on-one -on -one fight training. As usual, you'll team up with a partner to start this section, said Liam. Taylor could not contain her joy. She was hoping that, like in Dallas, they would have a one-on-one -on -one fight training. Now she could put her plan into motion. Today you'll team up with the partner on your right, continued Liam. Taylor looked at her right and she saw the rock. Liam had everything planned as well from his side and he wanted her ass to get kicked hard. She rolled her eyes and moved to Liam. How about I team up with you, Liam? He scrutinized her, knowing that this suggestion is not an innocent one at all. Come on, I'm your guest. How about you humor me? Liam did not want to kick her ass. Emma wouldn't let him hear the end of it, and that is why he teamed her up with The Rock, who is not fond of Taylor and would gladly fight her and defeat her. Okay, why not, he sighed. How about we make it more interesting? What do you mean, Taylor? If I win, Emma will share my room during my entire stay. Girls' slumber party, like in the old days. No. Oh, so you believe I can beat you? taunted Taylor. Of course not. Then what do you have to lose? Okay, but if I win, you leave tonight, stated Liam gruffly. 
Actually, no, not tonight. If I win, you leave immediately. You pack and you leave. Or are you scared? He continued looking at Taylor with challenge and malice in his eyes. You've got yourself a deal, replied Taylor. But she was concerned with how confident he was. Is she taking a big risk by accepting his conditions? Will he be able to kick her ass? I should believe in myself. I've trained with Emma's community in Dallas for years, and I've always won all the fights, and they never went easy on me. I should be able to do it now as well. It's my only chance to get private time with Emma, said Taylor to herself silently. What the hell, Liam? yelled Dean through the mind link. What are you doing here, Dean? Shouldn't you be at your pack training? I came to watch Taylor train. Well, you will watch her leave. Liam, I already told you that I want her. How is this going to happen if you ship her back to Dallas on the first plane? Well, sorry, brother, but she is committed to ruining my life with Emma. You can take her to your pack if you want, but she is leaving my pack today. Damn it, Liam, you're not doing your relationship with your mate any good by kicking her best friend out. Emma will get over it. Taylor has trouble written all over her, and the faster she leaves, the better. Liam, but Emma... Stop pretending you give a damn about Emma and her relationship with Taylor. Oh, okay, you're right. I told you I want her. Why... Listen, Dean, you can have any girl you want. Why do you want her? Why are you so obsessed with her? She is just a human for Moon Goddess' sake. Hey, Liam, I'm talking to you yelled Taylor, waving her hand in front of his eyes. He had zoned out for a few minutes while Taylor was discussing the terms of the fight. Uh, what were you saying? asked Liam, all annoyed. I was stating the rules of the fight. Since I do not want to repeat everything again, here is the short version. Everything legal is allowed, and the first fighter to hit the ground loses. Okay, let's finish this, said Liam. And the fight began. At first, the fight was relatively easy for Taylor. Liam was strong, but he was adopting the same fighting techniques used at Mystic Moon Community. She knows all the defense and counterattack techniques by heart, since she trained with Mystic Moon for years. This did not go unnoticed on Liam, who decided to mix it up with some fight techniques he was sure never were used at Emma's pack. He was surprised when Taylor managed to dodge every single attack. But he was still bigger and stronger. After a few minutes, he managed to grab her training top in one arm lapel and went for the punch. But Taylor was crafty. She tucked her head on his chest, grabbed his arm on her top, and blocked his punch by blocking his elbow with her left hand. She tried to immobilize him by using her whole body to trap both his hands. He tried to throw her, leveraging his larger body, but although her feet were no longer on the ground, she tightened her grip on his arms. Once her feet were back on the ground, she tucked her head under his chin, grabbed him by the waist, and in a swift move, her right foot came out to the side of his left foot and pulled the Kasoto Gari technique, destabilizing his left foot. She pushed him to the ground and pushed her right knee on his left thigh. They locked eyes, him on the ground, her immobilizing him, and Taylor smirked at him, signaling that she won. Yes, I won, I won, in your face, Liam Carter, shouted Taylor smugly as she stood up and started jumping all happy. Liam, still lying on the ground, all astounded, he could not believe how this human managed to win against him in a fight. No one in his pack managed to win a fight against him for as long as he remembered. He underestimated his opponent. Such a rookie mistake, he thought to himself as he was standing up. Taylor was all happy and still jumping. She looked around and they were all shocked, jaws dropping, clearly never expecting her to win. It was then that Taylor noticed Emma. 
all shocked and scared, running towards Liam. Liam, please, please don't hurt her. She doesn't know our pack tradition and the due respect to the Alpha, whispered Emma as she rested her hand on his chest, as if she was trying to hold him back. I beg you, Liam, please, please don't hurt her, please. She Liam could not believe his eyes. Emma, his mate, thought he would attack her friend because she won fair and square against him. His mate was so scared that she was shaking in his arms. She is afraid of him. He cannot deny it any more. He could not understand why, though. He was very patient with her. When he saw how frightened she was at the ball, he decided to give her space and time to adapt to her new life. He did not mark her nor mate with her as he wanted to give her time to know him and get used to his company. Yet here he was one month later and his mate was still as terrified of him as before. As he was standing up, his eyes went from Emma and her petrified look to Taylor and her judging stare. This annoying human was right all along, damn it. Taylor walked to them and took Emma's arm. Emma, you shouldn't go with the loser. You should come with the winners. Let's go. We're going to be roomies. Woohoo! Playfully screamed Taylor. Good fight, Taylor. You are a skilled warrior, said Liam, shaking her hand. I am? You're not even going to add for a human, said Taylor with air quotes on human. Liam laughed. It's only the second time I've seen you laughing, Liam. You should do it more often. I'm sure it would do wonders on Emma, winked Taylor as Emma blushed. Before you take Emma, I would like to talk with her privately, Taylor. No can do. Taylor, don't push it, scoffed Liam. Dean felt the tension building up and decided to intervene. Taylor... Liam will talk with Emma for a few minutes, then she will be with you for the entire stay, said Dean as Liam and Emma stepped aside for their private talk. And what if he's threatening her now so that she doesn't talk to me? Taylor, I know my brother, and he has never threatened Emma. Plus, if he wanted to silence her, he could have done it before. No need to do it now, retorted Dean. When Liam thought that they were far away from everyone, especially Taylor, he looked at Emma and asked her, Emma, do I scare you? Why this question? I didn't tell anyone that you scare me. Emma, I see it clearly now in your eyes. You fear me. Did I hurt you in any way? I thought I've been more than respectful, considerate of your feelings. Did I do anything wrong? Emma hesitated. Should she open her heart? Can she really believe him that he wants a genuine conversation? After a few minutes of inner debate, she sighed and answered him. Yes, Liam, you have been respectful, but you rarely talk with me or spend time together, just the two of us. You are working all the time, and when we have lunch or dinner, it's with all the pack members, or at least with your brother. I feel that you just want me next to you for official duties, and that's it. I still don't know much about you. Do you know anything about me? And yes, this situation makes me sad. I want to feel loved and wanted, and you're equal. Emma could not believe she finally found the courage to pour her heart out and tell Liam everything. Her voice was quivering, but she decided to share everything on her heart. It was now or never. Liam, it, you never yelled at me, but I've seen you scream at your pack members. I've seen how scary your outbursts can be. Your reputation precedes you. You are known as the scary alpha, the short-tempered alpha. I am still petrified to talk in your presence to avoid any risk of irritating you and suffer your wrath. Liam was shocked. His mate was suffering in front of his eyes, and he was oblivious of it all. He ran his hands through his hair and sighed heavily. He looked at Emma, 
cupped her cheeks with both of his hands. She stiffened, worried. Emma, I love you. You are my soulmate. I am sorry for what you have been going through. I take full responsibility for that. To my defense, I wanted to give you space because I did not want to scare you. I didn't want to see fear in your eyes like at the ball when you knew I was your mate. But I understand you felt neglected and lonely. He leaned to kiss her forehead, his two hands still cupping her cheeks. He looked lovingly into her eyes and continued, I can never scream at you. I can never hurt you physically, verbally, or emotionally. You are my mate, my Luna, my equal. And even when I get mad at my pack members, it's only when the situation is too critical and there is no room for patience. You know that an alpha can be tough and strict sometimes. I am not used to that, Liam. Alpha Derek is calm. His leadership style is different. Our pack is different than yours. Yes, honey, because your community is not dealing with a decade-long war. We have been at war with the rogues for over 25 years now. I must protect every single member of my pack, and there is no room for error or negligence. So sometimes I must be demanding and tough on the guys. Also, I have to manage the politics among all the packs in our state, and this is as stressful as the war. You cannot imagine the difficult choices I have to make on a daily basis. My life is not easy, Emma. Let me help you. Let me make it easy. Liam pulled Emma in close for a hug and whispered in her ears, Would you give me a second chance to make this right between us? She tilted her head, looked up at him, and nodded approvingly. Tell me what you want me to do, he asked. How about we try to learn more about each other? You love me because you have to, because of the mating bond, but I want you to love me for who I am. How do you propose we do that? Uh, let's go on a date, only you and I. I like this idea. He kissed her on the cheek and continued, I think it's time you go to our friend. She's still waiting, and she is not known to be a patient woman. He hugged her as they both burst into laughter. Don't worry, I won't tell her anything. You can tell her anything you want, Emma. I don't want you to feel that you can't tell your friend or family what you feel. I know I did everything to sabotage her attempts to talk with you alone, but I think you should tell her the truth, because she is imagining things. Oh, what do you mean? When you were getting her the chocolate mousse yesterday, we had a quick discussion in my office, and she told me that she came to take you away from me. She believes that I am hurting you, and I was blocking you from talking with her and your family. This is why you didn't let me talk with her yesterday? I didn't want her to put ideas in your head and convince you that you are better off back in Dallas. Little did I know that you were already not happy here, he sighed. Emma stood on her tiptoes and kissed him on the lips. Second chance, remember? She smiled. He hugged her back, then held her hand, and together they walked towards Taylor. Your friend must love you a lot to go through all this effort and try to take you away from me. She is my sister, Liam. We share everything and are always there for each other. You deserve such a friend who would travel miles away to check on you, but be careful, Emma, about sharing everything. She cannot know about our world. You know the rules. If a human discovers our world... They are sentenced to death. And if a werewolf divulges the secret to humans, the werewolf will be shunned and becomes a rogue. Don't worry, Liam. I am always careful and would never tell her about us. As they reached Taylor and Dean, Emma kissed Liam on the cheek, then went to grab Taylor's hand. So where to, my friend? she asked. 
Let's start with a shower, answered Taylor with a smile. Okay, and we meet in 30 minutes in the lounge area for breakfast, continued Emma, smiling. Did you go soft on her, Liam? asked Dean, as they watched the two women strolling away hand in hand. Not much, Dean. This woman has power. Maybe I did not use my maximum wolf power because I underestimated her. I think she tricked me to believe she was weak because during the warm-up she didn't display any of this raw power. Damn, a woman who can kick ass. That's hot. Don't want to paint you a picture, but I want to fuck her now, here in the middle of the training field, right here, right now. Go be disgusting somewhere else, Dean, huffed Liam as he walked back to... Thirty minutes later, Emma was sitting in the lounge area waiting for Taylor when Dean took a seat in front of her. Hi, Emma. Can I join you and Taylor for breakfast? What's your game, Dean? What do you mean? Come on, I saw how you look at Taylor since the first time you laid eyes on her, like a predator stalking his prey. Taylor is a great girl, Emma. Of course I'm attracted to her. Don't act on your attraction, Dean. She is not for you. She is my sister, and I will not let you add her to your long list of conquests. You are a player, and she deserves better. I am not a player, Emma. I never lied or abused any of the women I've been with. I do not do long-term relationship. Hell, I don't do relationships, period. But I am always clear about that from the start. Taylor is a grown woman, and if we are both two consenting adults, then you will not have your say, Emma, replied Dean dismissively. Emma was about to respond when she saw Taylor coming toward their table. She decided to put this discussion on hold for now, but she will, without a doubt, keep an eye on Dean. Sorry I'm late, Emma, but I really needed a long shower. Your man didn't go easy on me, said Taylor. Don't worry, Dean and I were having a chat while waiting for you. Let's go and fill up our breakfast plates. The buffet is on your left, and the coffee station is on your right, said Emma, as she stood up and joined Taylor. As they were heading back to their table, a few residents came over and complimented Taylor on her fighting skills. You look cute, all blushing, Taylor, winked Dean. No teasing, Dean, playfully replied Taylor. Hi, Miss Emma, Taylor. Do you mind if we join you? said Clive as he and the Rock stood next to the table. Of course not. Please take a seat, replied Emma. You put on a great fight, Taylor. I was impressed, said the Rock. Wow, that must be the first time you didn't look at me with disdain, Rock, said Taylor, as she covered her heart with one hand, pretending to be moved. He doesn't have a choice but to be impressed, said Clive. Do you know that no one, and I mean no one, had ever won a fight against Alpha Liam, he continued? Until I came along, smiled Taylor as she swallowed a mini croissant. Where did you learn to fight like that? asked Clive. I am a judoka, started when I was six years old. She has a brown belt, and also she used to practice with us in our gated community, continued Emma. Clive, The Rock, and Dean were all equally surprised. They had never heard of humans joining training sessions in any pack. Yet again, they have never heard of humans visiting any pack either. She joined our girls-only training sessions when we were young, and she kicked our asses. The strongest girl in our community couldn't win a fight against Taylor. Then, when my ego got a hit, we started the mixed training. Remember? said Taylor. Oh, yes, you must hear this story. When we moved to the mixed trainings at the age of 16, Taylor could not win any fights against the boys. Yeah, even the skinniest ones were tougher than me, huffed Taylor. You see, she's still frustrated to this day, chuckled Emma. But she didn't give up. She secretly joined fighting and self-defense classes in the city. Well, clearly, if I used the same techniques as them, I would never win as they were stronger. So I wanted to mix my training. Judo helped out, but I joined jujitsu classes as well. Aikido, Krav Maga street fights. 
Every night she had a different class. When she sets her mind on something, she goes until the end, said Emma. And she was a cunning girl. She only told me, and I was sworn to secrecy. During our community training sessions, she never used any of the new techniques she was learning, until eight months later, when she challenged three boys from our community to a fight. You against three of them? What were you thinking? said Clive. She was thinking that she wanted a big show. She dreams big, and if she wants to kick the boys' asses, she wanted it to be grandiose, laughed Emma. So what happened? asked Clive, all impatient to hear the rest of the story. The three boys, of course, accepted the challenge. They were convinced that she would lose in less than five minutes. She started with my brother, and Peter did not stand a chance. In two minutes, he was down on the mat. Toby and Jeremy attacked her both at the same time, and the show was enthralling. They were both so strong, but I was as strong as two men. The fight went for, what, thirty minutes? Until I kicked them to the mat and screamed victory, boasted Taylor while finishing her plate. You would have finished the fight earlier if it weren't for the infamous incident, winked Emma. Emma, don't you dare talk about that. What? What happened, Emma? Tell us. Tell us, said Clive, like a kid waiting for his gift. Ten minutes into the fight, Taylor had a wardrobe accident. Emma, stop it. That's embarrassing. She was only wearing a training bra, and it popped open. She had to fight with one hand as she used her other hand to keep the bra in place. The boys did not stop fighting. Actually, they were in a trance, fighting harder. Those idiots were determined on seeing my breasts. Hormones, huffed Taylor. Suddenly they heard a growl, and Taylor felt something grab her thighs. It was Dean's hand, clutching at her thigh, as if his life depended on it. This weird, animal-like sound was coming from him. His eyes were almost pitch black. Calm down, Dean. I managed to fix my bra with a hair clip, and then kicked their asses. I won, remember? She patted his hand to reassure him and hopefully make him loosen his grip. It worked because he started to calm down. He stared at Taylor intensely, his eyes full of emotions that Taylor could not read. He let go of her thigh, held her hand, and leaned forward to whisper in her ear, I don't like other men touching your skin, even if it's during a fight. I want to be the only one to run my fingers on your skin, Taylor. He brushed his nose on her neck and moved down slowly to her shoulders. Taylor did not move. Her mind was telling her to move away, be offended by his comment, but her body had a different mind of its own. She felt a shiver going through her whole body, a weird sensation that she never experienced before. Her cheeks were on fire. After a few seconds, which felt like an eternity, Taylor gulped, cleared her throat, and whispered back, Dean, you are being inappropriate, and this is making me uncomfortable. She freed her hand and moved away from Dean. Hmm, so, Emma, what should we do today? She said as she turned to Emma and avoided any eye contact with Dean. What do you like to do? replied Emma, pretending that she did not notice the heat and sexual tension between her friend and her brother-in-law. How about we go to the city? Are you crazy? shouted the four of them. What the hell? What did I say? I just proposed to go downtown. They all looked at each other as if talking, rather fighting, telepathically. Then Dean took Taylor's hand and told her, Taylor, it's dangerous to go downtown. It's a small city. What could go wrong? You remember the guys who harassed you at the diner? Those are extremely dangerous people. They probably have you on their target list now, and if you go to the city, you and Emma could be in danger. Taylor was surprised to hear that. Those douche guys were annoying, but didn't seem that dangerous to her. 
but given the serious look on everyone's faces, she knew that Dean was not exaggerating. I understand, Dean. I would never put Emma's life in danger. We can stay here. As long as Emma and I get to spend some time together, I don't care where. How about you come to my gated community, proposed Dean. Really, Dean, don't you have work? mocked Emma. I'll be close to the team, and if there's any problem, they know where to find me. What do you think, Taylor? I don't know. I will go wherever Emma wants to go, replied Taylor. She was not sure it's a good idea to spend the day with Dean in tow. She can't deny that she is attracted to him, but she's not sure it's safe to go down that road. Emma, I can show Taylor around my community, introduce her to some of my friends, and then we can have a picnic in a nice secluded spot. In the afternoon, I'll leave you two together so that you can have some alone time. Emma was hesitant. She knew that Dean was in hunting mode, and she was not comfortable with him pursuing Taylor romantically. Chef Pierre will be happy to prepare a delicious meal for us. You can cook with him, and he can teach you a new recipe, added Dean. He knew Emma loved Chef Pierre's cooking, and she could not resist such an invitation. He would do anything to spend more time with Taylor. He was sure she's as attracted to him as he is attracted to her. Dean is using the Chef Pierre card. He really wants you to go with him, Tay, smirked Emma. Who is Chef Pierre? Only the best chef in the world. Every time I go to River Moon, I beg him to teach me a new recipe. Oh, we can have some nice salads, some mini sandwiches, and a quiche. Oh, we'll cook his famous quiche au poireau, said Emma, clapping her hands all excited. Okay, I think we lost Emma, said Taylor playfully. Perfect, then it's settled. Let's go, said Dean. Dean did not let go of Taylor's hand, holding it tight as they wished Clive and the Rock a nice day and headed to his car. And Taylor did not try to free her hand. It felt good. It felt as if it belonged intertwined in his. Damn it, thought Taylor. I am losing my mind. No man had such an effect on me. I am officially in trouble. Less than five minutes later, they were already at the gates of Dean's community. Same high-level security with banners, Welcome to River Moon, private property, no trespassing, surrounding the perimeter. Dean, why all this tight security in both your communities? In Dallas, the Mystic Moon community is more laid back. The rogues who harassed you are not just a couple of people. They have thousands of members, and they've been attacking all the gated communities in the area since as long as I can remember. We never knew why they've declared an open war on our communities, but this has been going on for over 25 years. What we know is that they are ruthless and well-organized. My parents died from a rogue attack when Liam and I were teenagers. Every family in our gated communities has lost a loved one to the rogues. He paused, clearly overwhelmed by emotions. Taylor squeezed his hand supportively. Liam took over the leadership of the community at a noticeably young age, and he has vowed to protect our people and to avenge our families. He managed to keep at least his first promise as we upped security early on, invested in high tech to improve our visibility on any movement in our lands. We never had any casualties since then, despite the numerous attempted attacks by the rogue. A few wounded when outside our pack, I mean gated community, but nothing life-threatening, he continued. I'm sorry for your loss, Dean. I can only imagine how hard this must have been on both of you. Here we are, said Dean as he parked his car in front of his pack house. Welcome to the River Moon community, Taylor he continued as he helped her and Emma out of the car. Taylor was fascinated by the architecture of the pack house. Those Carter brothers might be into high tech, 
but they got good taste when it comes to construction as well. The pack house was smaller than the Silver Moon community, but was as breathtaking with impressive woodwork on the facades and beautiful greenery and flowers decorating the windows and balconies. Shall we go to the kitchen and see Chef Pierre? said Dean as he escorted the girls inside the pack house. Hi, Dean. Everything is ready. I already briefed Chef Pierre. Hi, Luna, Emma, and you must be Taylor. I am Jeff, Dean's deputy, the young man said as he reached out for a handshake. A few seconds passed by, and Taylor still did not shake his hand. Dean was holding tightly to Taylor's hand and would not let go. After one last attempt, Taylor cleared her throat and looked at Dean. <clears throat> Dean, I need my hand back to shake your friend's hand. Jeff laughed and added, winking, I have never seen Dean possessive when it comes to the ladies. You must be special, Taylor. Taylor blushed at the compliment. She is very special to me, Jeff. Thanks for the help, and we'll see you later at the picnic said Dean as he tapped on Jeff's shoulder with his right hand, while still holding on to Taylor's hand with his left hand. Emma rolled her eyes and followed them to the kitchen. Chef Pierre, Luna Emma, my favorite apprentice, Alpha Dean, greeted the chef. Good morning, Chef Pierre. This is Taylor Smith, Emma's friend from Dallas. Welcome, Taylor, to my humble kitchen. Are you a fan of cooking like Emma? Oh, God, no, laughed Taylor. Emma is the cordon bleu. I am more on the dishwashing duty. She doesn't like cooking and doesn't even know what most of the kitchen appliances are for, chuckled Emma. She looked at Taylor and added, Remember, Tay, when you dated a chef? I, I think he was guy number 15. He almost choked when you told him you didn't even know how to make scrambled eggs. Oh, yes, probably the only guy who ran away from me screaming for his life, chuckled Taylor. Interesting, thought Dean. He was happily surprised to see that Taylor was a serial dater and probably with a laid-back view on relationships. He was not happy to know she had multiple sexual partners, but he won't be a hypocrite. She is his female version on his front. While Emma was all busy choosing the picnic menu with Chef Pierre, Dean decided to get some private time with Taylor. Well, since Taylor is not a fan of cooking, I propose I take her for a guided tour of the community while you prepare the picnic lunch. We can meet up by the lake in three hours, which gives you time to prepare and cook everything you want. Not waiting for anyone's reply, Dean grabbed Taylor's hand and dragged her outside. Dean, although I am determined to spend more time with Emma, I must admit you just saved me. Cooking is torture for me. Glad to be your hero, winked Dean. Uh, let's go for a walk to the river bank. You'll like the view. Dean and Taylor went through a small path towards the forest, enfolding the River Moon community. Taylor enjoyed walking with him as he explained to her his work, pointing out interesting birds and animals as they walked side by side. Suddenly, Taylor heard what she believed was a twig snap, and as she looked behind her, she saw three wolves approaching from their left. She put her hand on Dean and whispered, Watch out! There are three wolves behind us on the left side. Dean looked at the wolves. They all locked eyes for a few seconds before the wolves turned around and walked away. Don't worry, Taylor. Those wolves would never hurt us. Sometimes we have dangerous wolves that intrude on our territory, but those wolves live in the woods and are friendly. Taylor was surprised to see that wild animals could be comfortable around humans, but she didn't dwell on it and preferred to enjoy the walk and Dean's company. When they reached the river bank, Taylor was amazed by the scenic view. Beautiful trees with different shades of green were scattered alongside the river stream. On the other side of the river, a multicolored wildflower meadow extended to the horizon. You didn't oversell it, Dean, she said, looking at him, and then looking all around her. 
I'm happy you like this place. This is one of my favorite places. They sat by the river bank side by side, looking at the river, listening to the water flow. We used to come here with my parents. Every Saturday, we would picnic right here as one happy family. When our parents were murdered, Liam had to step up and lead the community. We dedicated our time on improving the security of our community and hunting down those criminals. And just like that, this tradition died. But you kept coming here. Because my best memories are from those picnics. Because here I feel the closest to my parents, even to my brother. Taylor put her hand on his arm, trying to connect with him, to appease his pain. He looked around at her hand, then wrapped one arm around her waist, pulling her closer. She rested her head on his shoulder, and they sat side by side, together in peace. They opened up, sharing childhood memories, Taylor narrating how she defended Emma from a bully in fifth grade, and they became the best of friends ever since. Dean talking about building his River Moon community from scratch and his business ventures. Taylor sharing how she dropped out of college to open her wood shop and how now she's expanding her business into interior design. When it was time to join Emma and the others for the picnic lunch, they walked hand in hand along the river stream. When they reached the lake, Emma looked at their intertwined hands, then at Taylor, raising one eyebrow. Jeff and Chef Pierre were also there setting the food containers on the blankets. Taylor noticed two other women sitting next to Emma. All eyes were on Dean and Taylor holding hands. Emma obviously did not approve. Whatever was going on between them, Jeff had a smirk on his face, probably imagining things that did not happen. The two girls were just flabbergasted, and by the huge smile plastered on Chef Pierre, no doubt he was already planning the wedding cake. Taylor freed her hand and went to sit next to Emma, who introduced the two girls to her. The blonde petite one was Amy, Jeff's girlfriend, and the brunette was Bella. The picnic went by in a friendly and cheerful atmosphere. Taylor felt Dean's gaze on her the entire time. He did not care whether everyone else noticed. He was attracted to her and genuinely enjoyed her company, as he was captivated by every word she said. As they were eating their dessert, Emma looked at her phone and smiled. Then she told them, "'Well, I have a date tonight.' Dinner for two on the rooftop bar. Great to see that romance is not dead over here, replied Taylor with a wink. Since Emma is busy, why don't you stay here, Taylor, and you could have dinner with my community members. I'll drop you back at the Silver Moon Pack House once we're done. Emma and Taylor exchanged a few glances, then Taylor nodded. Yes, with pleasure. Thank you for the invitation, Dean. When they finished eating, Dean and his friends decided to leave Emma and Taylor alone for some privacy. Dean knew that Taylor was eager to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with Emma, something that Liam did not let her do yet. Taylor gave Dean a grateful smile, happy to spend some alone time with her best friend. So, what is this all about? Emma broke the silence two minutes later. I should be the one asking the questions, Emma, replied Taylor playfully. I'm sorry if I got you worried, Taylor. Things are going well for me here. Emma, please, it's me. We're alone. Time to spill the beans. Emma sighed, and after a few minutes, she found the courage to tell Taylor everything. How lonely she felt when she came to River Moon, how suffocated she felt as she could not leave the gated community because of the rogue's continuous and random attacks. He never hurt me, Tay, but he simply did not have time for me. He told me that he also intentionally gave me some space, hoping that I would get used to my new life. Little did he know that I felt neglected and even a burden, since the only times he talked with me were to check on my safety. 
Why didn't you talk with us? Why didn't you answer our calls the way you used to? Because I didn't want you or my family to know how miserable I was. I knew that the moment you saw me or heard my voice, you would storm over here and fight with Liam, and I couldn't find the will to lie and pretend I was happy, so I preferred to ghost you all and avoid regular contacts. Taylor hugged Emma tight. You silly girl, I am your best friend. My role is to listen to you and help you through the tough times, not just sharing the happy times. I was scared, Tay. Scared of my soulmate. He was always stressed, and he could snap violently on his team. He was always respectful and calm with me, but I always made it my mission to be as invisible as possible. I did not want him to snap at me, and I did not want you to come over. You and Liam in a fight? That is a horror movie I would not want to see. You underestimated us. Look what happened. We handled our differences well, and he is not as stone-headed as I thought. In the end, he listened, and the moment he opened his eyes, he noticed his shortcomings in the relationship. Yes, he was shocked and sad to see that I was afraid of him. He hadn't noticed it before. Isn't it proof that he doesn't know you enough? mumbled Taylor. Tay, please don't question his feelings for me. We are soulmates. Even if you can't grasp this soulmate concept, I can assure you that we do love each other undoubtedly. If you say so. Okay, now it's your time to talk. What the hell is happening with Dean? I never saw you so smitten by a man. There's nothing going on, Emma. Oh, yeah, because you hold hands with every man you just meet, mocked Emma. Hey, he's the one holding my hand and not letting go, not the other way around. Tay, Dean's not a guy for you. He's a nice guy, but he's not into serious relationships. He's a player. I have never seen him with the same woman more than twice. Even if you do not believe in soulmates, you do believe in love. He doesn't do love. I don't want you to have your heart broken. Don't worry, Emma, there's nothing going on. Yes, he is flirting with me. Yes, I find him extremely attractive. Who wouldn't? And yes, I know he wants to get into my pants, but I am not stupid. I will not fall for him, nor will I act on his attraction. I don't do hookups and will not start doing that now. Emma did not look convinced. Her friend might be immune to Dean's charm now, but... Given how he is pursuing her, Tay might give in to temptation. Let's go, Emma. We should head back home. You need to prepare for your date night and to call your parents. They are worried, and you need to have a long talk with them to reassure them, like we just did, said Tay. As they gathered the food and blankets, Taylor looked around and noticed four wolves in the bushes. They were standing up as well. This is weird. What? The wolves. I know Dean told me they have wolves living in the woods, but those do not seem like any regular wolves. I feel as if they're watching us. They just stood up when we did, ready to follow us. No, correction. They're not watching us. They're watching over us, like guards or something. Emma looked at the wolves, then at Taylor. She looked conflicted. Then she just took a picnic basket and moved on, telling Taylor, Let's go, Tay. You have a creative imagination, but no time for that now. I want to have enough time to shower and dress up for my date. Once at the main house, Emma hugged Taylor goodbye and got in the car, not before glaring at Dean. I swear to Moon Goddess, Dean, if you fool around with Taylor, I will have your head, Emma warned Dean as she hugged him goodbye. Say hi to my brother, Emma. Have a safe drive, replied Dean, while helping Emma into the car and ignoring her warnings. Dean wooed Taylor with a romantic dinner by the riverbank. 
They were alone, sitting next to each other on a picnic blanket, fancy food spread before them. Dean also opened a champagne bottle, and they were eating and drinking, enjoying each other's company. I can't believe how the night sky can be so different here from Dallas. You're lucky you don't have much light pollution over here, said Taylor as she was looking at the stars. He leaned closer to her and with his finger softly tilted her chin up. She looked into his eyes and she got lost in his green eyes. She saw so many different emotions going through his eyes, tenderness, passion, lust. She knew that a kiss was coming as he leaned in further and further. She knew he was going to kiss her, but still she did not move. She scolded herself. She was not the type of woman who would kiss someone she just met, and definitely not just because she found the guy attractive and so damn hot. So why on earth wasn't she moving away from him? Maybe I want to prove that I'm not attracted to him. Maybe he's a bad kisser, and then all this built-up attraction will fade away as fast as it came. Her mind was racing with so many lame excuses to justify why she wanted to be kissed by Dean. He tenderly brushed his lips over Taylor's, testing to see if she wanted this as much as he did. Then he kissed her, his lips pressed against hers, one hand cupping her cheek and another holding her neck. Damn it, he's not a bad kisser. Far from that, thought Taylor, as she tries to control the butterflies in her stomach. He was kissing her hungrily now, grabbing her hair gently, sucking on her bottom lip, demanding access for his tongue. How long have they been kissing? Taylor couldn't tell. She lost track of time consumed by his lips, his lips on her jaw, on her neck, on her lips, his hands in her hair, moving down her body. It took all the willpower in her to pull away from his embrace. She opened her eyes and saw him looking intently at her, clearly hungry for more. She blushed and looked away, feeling hot and overwhelmed. She ran her fingers on her lips and sighed before looking back at him. I think it's best to stop, she said with a shaky voice. Dean did not break eye contact, not for one second. He was surprised when she broke their kiss. Hell, even his wolf was frustrated and wanted more. She undoubtedly enjoyed the kiss as much as he did. He could smell her arousal thanks to his werewolf senses. So why stop now? I'm sorry if you felt pressured. No, no, I, I didn't feel pressured. I enjoyed the kiss, but I don't know what happened to me. I do not kiss men I just met. I know you're a player and this is normal for you, but what do you mean I'm a player? Let's say I've been warned that you have a long line of exes, so I'm not looking forward to being used and then thrown away like the others. I am always honest with my sexual partners, and from the start, I inform them that I am not looking for a long-term relationship, but that we can have a nice time together while it lasts. And the moment was gone. If Taylor hoped that there was anything romantic in this kiss, now she knows it was just sexual. Saying that she was disappointed would be an understatement. She might not be a hopeless romantic, but she was looking for love, for a relationship, not just sex. And sex was the only thing Dean could promise. Mind-blowing sex, mentally noted Taylor. Dean could see that Taylor was not happy with what he said. She looked upset, which confused him. She had a long list of exes as well. So why is she disappointed? Why is she judging him? I would like to go to Emma's, please. Taylor broke the awkward silence. They walked side by side to Dean's car and remained silent throughout the drive back to the Silver Moon Pack. When they reached the pack house, Taylor thanked him for the nice evening with a smile that did not reach her eyes and walked, Damn, I'm sore. Why are your morning trainings that intense?
said Taylor as she joined Emma, Clive, and The Rock for breakfast. Liam went overboard with the training this morning, and everyone was exhausted. Taylor noticed that Dean joined them for breakfast today as well. She understood that they have their own training sessions back at the River Moon community, yet here he is again. She hoped that he would not insist on talking about what happened yesterday evening. They kissed, they talked about their expectations, and they left it there. No need to talk about it. It was embarrassing enough for her to have fallen head over heels for him, despite Emma's warning. Luckily, breakfast went smoothly, and the discussion was light and enjoyable, until Taylor's eyes went wide open with surprise, looking at Emma, and then bursting into laughter. Everyone was surprised with Taylor's reaction, and they were all confused. Em, you didn't tell me that your date went that well, teased Taylor. Yes, it went great, but why do I feel there is more to your question, replied Emma cautiously. Was it romantic? Uh, tell me, Em, how romantic was your date? Cut to the chase. What do you want, Tay? I don't want anything, but damn, I did not expect Liam to be so passionate. He grabbed a good bite yesterday, didn't he, Em? Taylor was enjoying this. What? What do you mean? I don't get you, huffed Emma. Em, your neck does not lie. That's one hell of a love bite, added Taylor, who couldn't contain her laugh any more. Emma turned red and touched her neck. Yesterday, Liam and Emma completed the mating process and marked each other. The mark on her neck does look like a love bite, at least for humans like Taylor. When Taylor noticed Liam at a distance, she waved and shouted, Lover boy, we need to talk. Liam gave her a stern look, annoyed by her tone. He walked toward their table, shaking his head. Why, what's wrong? asked both Emma and Liam at the same time. Em, I just need to talk with him. Listen, Taylor, there is nothing wrong between us. We had a great evening yesterday. He was considerate and attentive. I wanted this hickey. Please, everything is going great. Don't ruin it. Taylor put her hand on her heart, acting all heartbroken and shocked. How dare you accuse me of trying to ruin your relationship with lover boy? You broke my heart, dear friend. Then she made a disgusted expression and added, And, ew, I will not talk to him about your hickey, nor his hickey, by the way, pointing to his neck. Taylor, behave, said both Emma and Liam at the same time. Taylor smirked and continued, It's your birthday in three days, silly girl. I wanted to talk with him to plan a birthday surprise for you, and now you ruin the surprise. Emma was taken aback. My birthday? Oh, I completely forgot about it. Enters Taylor, laughed Taylor, making a grand gesture with her arms. Liam softly squeezed Emma's shoulder and planted a kiss on her forehead before gesturing to Taylor to follow him. I'm coming too, said Dean as he stood up with Taylor. Why, you'll help plan my birthday party? taunted Emma. Of course, you're my dear sister-in-law, retorted Dean, laughing. Emma, Taylor, and Liam rolled their eyes at his comment. Once they got to Liam's office, Taylor furrowed her brows and raised an accusatory finger. Lover boy, you forgot her birthday, didn't you? Liam ran his hand on his neck, ashamed to admit that he forgot his mate's birthday date. Taylor scoffed. She loves celebrating birthdays, and you need to prepare a nice party for her. I can help you, of course. I can even cook the cake. Sure, we can invite the pack members, and we can cut a birthday cake in the hall. So original, laughed Taylor, sarcastically. Here's how it will go. We organize a party outside, not the rooftop, because it's your everyday dinner room, and definitely not the hall. We can have it around the fountain in front of the house here. We put candles and string lights everywhere. What do you think? she asked. 
And this is how the next three days were mobilized to plan Emma's birthday party. Dean and Liam surprised Taylor by being hands-on and getting involved in all of the details. Liam was committed to making this party memorable for Emma. Many PAC members volunteered to support in the decorating and cooking for the party. Liam wanted to invite the neighboring PACs as well, but Taylor and Dean convinced him to just invite the Silver Moon and River Moon members. Otherwise, Emma will have to spend her time socializing and acting as the hostess instead of just enjoying her party with people she already knows. Dean was very thoughtful and considerate during those three days. He did not mention their kiss, nor did he try to kiss her. He was treating her with the utmost consideration, helping her in preparation for the party and making sure she did not skip a meal. Taylor felt at ease with him by her side. Even if the sexual tension was still palpable, she was grateful he did not act upon it. She liked all the attention he was giving her. She liked having him by her side. She liked the conversations they shared during that time. It was not forced, and it felt natural, as if they were meant to be together. She just could not explain it. You did a great job, Taylor. Emma is so happy, Dean said to Taylor while handing her a glass of champagne. The party was going well. People were singing and dancing, enjoying the upbeat music. The decoration completely transformed the place to an enchanted woodland theme, with suspended lanterns on trees, twinkling lights on tables, and string lights hanging across the place. The atmosphere was magical, and Emma was so happy when she came out with Liam and saw the place and the people serenading her. We all did a great job, and Emma deserves it. I was happy to see everyone helping in the planning. I feel reassured to see Emma surrounded by people who genuinely care about her and who are eager to plan a great party for her. I know all of this started with a misunderstanding, Taylor, but I can promise you every single person in the Silver and River Moon community would die for Emma. Taylor raised her head, looking at Dean straight in the eyes. She felt as if he meant the would-die part, literally. She raised an eyebrow, scrutinizing him, wondering what he meant. He took her glass and put it on the table next to them. Let's dance. It's a party, after all. And he dragged her onto the dance floor. They danced and rocked to the latest hits. When Emma decided to take a break from all the dancing, Taylor headed toward Liam and Emma, who were kissing. Hey, too much PDA, guys, teased Taylor. Emma turned all red and hid her face in Liam's shoulder, while Liam growled at Taylor. Wow, did you just imitate a dog's growl? asked Taylor, all surprised. As he did not reply, all busy hugging Emma, Taylor continued. I owe you an apology, Liam. I see how happy Emma is now with you. I lost, you won, she said playfully. You didn't lose, Taylor. As hard as it is for me to admit it, your visit was a wake-up call for me. I was neglecting my mate, and it's thanks to your annoying meddling that I noticed the lack of communication in our relationship. Wow, does that mean I can be a marriage counselor? Definitely no. Did you forget how you talked with me? No other man would be as patient as me, stated Liam, laughing. So, Taylor, how about you extend your stay with us? asked Emma. Taylor was impressed. Emma did not feel the need to look at Liam for his approval. Taylor looks at Liam. He smiles as he understood what she is implying. He hugged his mate, planting a kiss on her temple. Taylor is family. She can stay as long as she wants. Plus, Dean would be very happy if she stays, teased Liam. Taylor blushed and looked at Dean out of the corner of her eyes. Liam and Emma laughed and, in unison, teased her. Oh, she is blushing. Taylor is blushing, ladies and gentlemen. This is priceless. I should have taken a picture of that, added Emma. Emma, stop embarrassing me. 
Taylor scolded her friend and threw a peanut at her. Changing the topic, she added, I will see if I can stay a few days longer. You know how Simon and the guys at work are panicking because I'm not there. You will make me a happy man if you extend your stay. We need more time together, Tay, whispered Dean. Taylor didn't get a chance to reply as suddenly the lights were turned off and Chef Pierre came out with a two-tier birthday cake covered with silver marble drip icing. Everyone sang happy birthday to Emma, and when she blew out the candles, they all cheered and clapped for the birthday girl. As Taylor and the chef were cutting the cake to serve the guests, Emma came to them asking, So, who did the cake? Well, of course I did it, like every year. Traditions are meant to be preserved and maintained forever, right? Winked Taylor, hugging Emma. But under my direction added Chef Pierre, laughing. Yeah, I had to compromise. I couldn't do the chocolate cake as I usually do, so we settled on a chocolate and strawberry cake, one for each layer of the two-tier cake. The DJ switched the music to a romantic ballad, and Liam took Emma to the dance floor for a slow dance. Dean took Taylor's hand and walked her to the dance floor as well. They started dancing, syncing with the romantic song. I am amazed, Taylor. Is there anything you can't do? You fight like a warrior. You cook like a chef. You organize parties like a professional party planner. And you dance like a goddess. You are one of a kind, he said, looking at her straight in the eyes. I know, right? She chuckled. I keep saying it to everyone, but they don't believe me. Well, I believe it, and I am saying it, he whispered. Taylor was hypnotized by his eyes and how he was looking at her. She even felt that his eye color changed, as if they became a darker green color. Tay, what do you want in life? Wow, I didn't expect such an existential question. Uh, I don't know. I guess I just want to be happy and to make my friends happy around me. How about we make each other happy? Taylor, the moment I saw you, I felt you were special, and I was attracted to you. I believe there was a fit between us. Why don't we give it a try? Taylor was surprised by how direct he was. She was tempted. What do you mean, Dean? she asked hesitantly. We are two adults. Clearly, there is an attraction and fire between us. Why don't we explore that? I'm not sure I understand. What is there to understand, Taylor? He whispered as he caressed her cheek with one hand and with his other hand pulling her closer to him. They were so close they could be kissing any moment now, Taylor gulped. She could not take her eyes off his. Taylor, let's go to my place. Taylor immediately stiffened. She felt as if he had just slapped her. Uh, let me get this straight. Are you proposing a one-night stand? No, of course not. I am just saying, let's have fun as long as we want. No strings attached. Excuse me? She snapped at him. You still don't understand, do you? God, you are so dense. I am not this type of person. I don't think sexual relationships are something to be taken lightly. Taylor, what is wrong with telling you that I'm attracted to you and that you want me in your bed? Nothing is wrong, right? Let's fuck and enjoy it while it lasts. Or even better, let's fuck until your mate comes along and then you will dump my sorry ass as quick as possible, yelled Taylor, not caring that the people next to them on the dance floor were staring at her outburst. Come on, Taylor, you were joking about guy number 15 with Emma. You're clearly a serial dater, just like I am. Why would you be so offended by what I said? Taylor was shocked. She pinched her nose in disgust. Dean, you are lucky that this is Emma's birthday party. Otherwise, I would have already hit you hard. You're being extremely disrespectful. What is disrespectful? Did you or did you not go out with over 15 guys? I am just stating the obvious. 
No, you are stating your conclusions and assumptions. When you do not know something, you just shut the fuck up. You think I slept with all those men? I didn't even kiss half of them. Hell, I must have kissed five or six men only, she replied sternly. She could not believe him. He thinks that she sleeps around just because she has dated a certain number of guys? After their argument by the lake at Dean's community, she thought that he understood he was being out of line. After that night, he never brought the idea out again. He was back to being caring, just spending quality time together while preparing for Emma's birthday. Wasn't this time enough for him to understand her better? To understand she is not into hookups. To understand that, deep down, she is just a hopeless romantic? Yes, she went out with guys, but she went out with them looking for love, for a deep connection, for a future relationship, for her love story, for her happily ever after. And what a fool she was to think that he might be her love story. She was stupidly falling for him while he was just attracted to her. He just wanted to sleep with her. She was mad at him, but she was more mad at herself. She shook her head in disappointment, looking at him with watery eyes, and then she turned around, wanting to be as far away from him as possible. Taylor, wait, said Dean as he reached to grab her wrist. She pushed him. Just let me go. She walked away, hugging herself, shivering. She was angry that he would think so cheaply of her. She was falling for him, whereas he wanted a booty call. She was stupid enough to believe there was something between them, while he just felt pure physical lust. Emma saw Taylor from afar, and she immediately knew that something was wrong. Her body posture, how she was hugging herself, she left Liam's side to go towards her friend, and she noticed Dean following Taylor, his hands over his head looking frustrated, but also feeling guilty. Oh, I'm going to kill him, muttered Emma as she walked to meet her friend. Emma froze when she heard strident alarms ringing. The CCTV operating room supervisor mind-linked everyone. Alarms activated on the east border, indicating three different breaches. We confirm we are under attack by the rogues. We just spotted over 30 werewolves penetrating our territory. The guards on their east border replied through the mine link. We also just saw a dozen heavily armed rogues penetrating our pack territory as well. Another patrol at the east border shared through the mine link. Liam started giving instructions to his warriors. Head to the east border now. Our patrol teams need support. Children, elderly, and non-warriors go inside the pack house. Now! Liam, my pack just mind-linked me. River Moon is breached as well. What the hell? A coordinated attack on multiple fronts? Never happened before. I'll go to River Moon to protect my pack. Please, make sure that Taylor is safe. Okay, uh, keep me updated with your operations, and don't worry about Taylor. We got this. Taylor was shocked. Since the alarms went on, people were all over the place. She saw many people head to the east. She saw kids running to the main house. She heard Liam giving orders. When Emma reached her, she grabbed her hand and pushed her toward the house. What's going on, Emma? Please, Taylor, just go to your room and lock the door. Emma, what is going on? Listen, we are under attack. Our patrol spotted over 50 intruders across our east border. And you expect me to hide in my room? You know I can fight. Not this fight. Please, Taylor, please stay here. But, Taylor, please stay with the kids and the vulnerable. They need you. They need a good warrior like you to protect them in case some intruders manage to go through our fighters and reach the pack house. Liam reached them and stated that Clive and the Rock will stay at the pack house front. Taylor, you stay with them. No time for arguing. This is serious. Emma is going with me, and if she's worried about you, both of us will be in danger. 
Okay, okay, I promise, Emma. I will stay here with Clive and the Rock. Emma looked at Taylor. She wanted to believe her. No time for arguing. She nodded and left, running after Liam. When they were out of Taylor's sight, they shapeshifted into their wolves and headed to the battlefield in the east. This is going to be a long night. Taylor noticed that Clive and the Rock had rifles in their hands. Clive, where do I get a rifle? Clive looked at her with surprise, but before he could answer, she told him, Clive, I'm from Texas. I learned how to shoot before I learned how to walk. Give me a rifle. Clive nodded and threw his rifle to Taylor before heading back to the house, probably to get another one. The Rock was busy getting everyone inside the house. He then went to the other side of the house to monitor the situation there. Taylor was scanning the premises, trying to spot any suspicious activity, when she noticed a shadow. No, two shadows lurking at the far horizon. Clive, this is the west border, right? Pointing with her head. Yes, why? Do you see something? It seems to me that I saw some movement there. Clive, with his heightened werewolf eyesight, could clearly see, and he did not like what he saw. Damn it, he yelled. The west border has been compromised as well. What do you mean? We didn't hear any alarms from there. I don't know why the alarms didn't work on the west border, but I can see many people penetrating from the west border, Taylor. They looked at each other, and then it dawned on them. It's a trap. It's a fucking trap. They All our warriors are on the east border. We need to inform them, Clive said frantically. Taylor expected him to pull out his phone, but he just stood there as if frozen in time. They did not have a second to waste. Taylor was sure of that. The intruders knew it, too. All the warriors were on the east border. The intruder made sure of it. They must stop them now. They cannot afford to wait for backup. Clive, Clive, snap out of it. A what? He replied. We need to do something now. Backup is coming. They know about the breach here. Hell, how would they know? And how would you know they know? Asked Taylor, all confused. Uh, doesn't matter now. Clive, we cannot wait for backup. We need to do something now, she hastily added. Uh, what do you propose? You see the car there? Yes. We need to drive the car into the attackers, and we need to blow up the car. Are you crazy? Clive, we are just two fighters. If the rock joins us fast enough, we'll be three fighters. Even with our rifles, we will not be able to ward them off, especially if they have 50 intruders on this side as well. However, if we blow up the car, we can injure a huge number of them, and chances are they'll run away since they no longer have the element of surprise on their side. Clive listened to her plan, and had to admit that it was the best plan to block this unforeseen attack at the west border, at least until backup arrives. I'll get the car and drive through the field and get it as close to them as possible. I'll jump and you'll shoot at the gas tank, explained Taylor. What? No way. I will drive the car. Emma and Dean will kill me if I let you risk your life like that. No time, Clive. I am not a good shooter in the dark, but I am an excellent driver. Given that you managed to clearly see the intruders at a distance, I bet you can shoot the gas tank from here. She did not wait for him to react and ran towards the car. Luckily, the keys were inside the car, and she immediately turned on the engine and drove at a high speed towards the west border, where most of the intruders were spotted. She drove past Clive, drove into the field, and zigzagged between the few trees to get as close as possible to the border. She knew she was close enough when she could see the intruders. They had destroyed part of the gate, and she saw dozens of intruders. How the hell did they destroy those walls without triggering any alarms? How the hell did they do that? Looking at the intruders, she realized that they were dealing with over 20 armed intruders, and they had around 15 wolves by their side. She knew it was now or never. 
She blocked the steering wheel, put her rifle on the accelerator pedal, and jumped from the car. As soon as she landed, she stood up, and despite her injuries from the fall, she ran towards the house, away from the car. Clive didn't waste a second. As soon as she was up and running, he started shooting at the fuel tank until the bullets ignited the flammable fuel and the car exploded. Taylor was thrown onto a tree by the blast. Her head was bleeding now, but she had to stand up and run from this inferno. Clive came to her help, and they ran away as she heard screams, animal-like screams from the intruders who were burning alive now. The intruders who were not injured by the explosion were fighting back. Bullets were raining on Taylor and Clive. They had to take shelter behind a tree as Clive tried to shoot back, but with one rifle, the battle was uneven. That is, until backup finally reached them. First, the rock was here firing back at the intruders and helping Taylor and Clive back into the pack house. He was shortly followed by a dozen warriors, probably coming from the east border, to help them on this west front. The rogues knew that the rest of the cavalry will come shortly, so they prepared to retreat and abort their mission. Clive took Taylor to the pack doctors, who were in the hall attending to the warriors' injuries. The battle at the east border must have been difficult, thought Taylor, as she looked around her. Clive, you can leave me here. Go see if you can help. I will wait. My injuries are superficial anyway. Are you kidding me? You are human. Your injuries are more dangerous than those of the warriors. Tay, what the hell happened? Emma was screaming as she ran towards Taylor. I'm okay. What okay? Look at your head. Your shoulder is also bleeding. Emma, calm down. I am okay. Clive, you were supposed to protect her, shouted Emma before punching Clive. She then grabbed him by his throat, growling. Taylor tried to reach Emma, limping as she injured her foot as well. Emma, stop it! Let Clive go! I insisted! It was my idea to drive the car, and he tried to fight back, but I didn't listen to him. Drive the car? You mean the explosion we heard? This is you? You drove the car onto the west gate to kill the rogues? Are you crazy? Liam specifically instructed Clive to wait for backup. Emma, waiting was not an option. If we waited for you to reach us, we would have put the kids and the elderly at risk. Clive saved our lives. Let go, Emma, please, pleaded Taylor. Emma reluctantly freed Clive from her grip and lunged on Taylor, hugging her as tight as her injuries allowed. I was scared, Tay. I can't imagine losing you. Liam joined them after hearing the commotion. He looked at Taylor's injuries, then at Clive. Thank you, Taylor and Clive. The Rock told us what you did to block the intrusion. Clive, go to the west border to help the cleanup. Emma, take Taylor to the clinic. Dr. Skye will tend to her wounds there for more privacy. As Clive tried to walk past Liam, Liam grabbed his arm and said, It's not Emma you should be worried about, Clive. It's Dean. He already got the news, and he's not happy about it. Clive's face turned pale, worried about Dean's reaction. Don't worry, Clive. Dean doesn't care that much, said Taylor. Emma tilted her head, scrutinizing Taylor with her crystal blue eyes, as if she was trying to dig into Taylor's soul. She remembered what she saw just before the alarms went on, how Taylor looked sad and Dean had guilt written all over his face. Emma sighed. She looked at Clive and apologized for manhandling him. Then she took her friend's hand and walked away. Let's take you to the doctor. After the doctor finished cleaning the wounds, Emma and Taylor were left alone. Taylor was getting down off the examination table when Emma put her hand on her shoulder. Taylor, tell me the truth. What happened with Dean at that party? What do you mean? Nothing happened. Seriously, Taylor, this is how it's going to go? You're going to hide stuff from me? 
Well, you did hide a lot of stuff from me since you left Dallas, replied Taylor, with a smirk plastered on her face. Point taken, but still, what happened? Nothing happened. Taylor, come on. Nothing happened. He just wanted us to fuck. Uh, excuse me? Yeah, you know he wanted to shag. And you didn't hit him? I saw you knock out guys for less than that. Well, technically it was your birthday, so I didn't want to ruin the party. But I was planning to punch him the next day. I can't believe him. It was my fault as well. I gave him the wrong idea, especially when I talked about the number of boys I've dated. What? Don't you even dare say that. Well, he said it. What the hell? I'm going to kill him. What's with you today? First Clive, now Dean? I am the hothead, not you. Calm down, Emma. I already gave him a piece of my mind. Let's leave it at that. No need to make more out of it. Of course there is a need. He can't disrespect you like that. Emma, please, this is my situation. I am handling it. If I need your help, believe me, I will tell you. I will not hesitate to ask you for help. But now, I am just tired. It's been a long night. Emma sighed and hugged her friend tightly. You're right. Let's go and get some rest. I will walk you to your room. Emma made sure her friend was safe and sound in her room and stormed in her and Liam's bedroom, pissed with the situation. What the hell is wrong with your brother? she snapped. What do you mean? Apparently, your brother believes my sister is a whore. Not only believes that, but he also had the nerve to ask Taylor to be his fuck buddy. As if she is like those idiots who throw themselves on him. This is Taylor we're talking about. One look at her and people know she is not this type of girl. What the hell is wrong with him? Emma was struggling to contain her anger. Wow, I didn't know he would do that, Emma. I knew he liked her, but I didn't expect him to do that. I genuinely thought he was falling for her. I will talk to him tomorrow. No, correction, I will hurt him tomorrow for what he did to Taylor. Well, she doesn't want us to interfere. I had to nag and beg her to tell me what happened. It kills me, but we have to step aside and let her manage him on her own, huffed Emma. I will make him talk and will drive him to spill the beans, and then he will regret it, said Liam. He'll be here first thing in the morning. He wanted to come as soon as he heard about Taylor's injury. I had to convince him to postpone the visit to tomorrow, stating that Taylor was already resting. The next morning, Taylor came down for breakfast early. She was not in the mood to socialize, but it seems that despite last night's events, everyone was up early as well. Hi, Taylor. How are you feeling today? greeted Clive with a warm smile. Much better. Her answer was cut short by a friendly tap on her back and a loud compliment. You are one badass woman, you know that? She turned around to see who said that, and boy was she surprised to see the source of this compliment. What? The Rock? Two compliments from The Rock in less than a week? Oh my God! I must be dead and in paradise! They all laughed. Seriously, woman, continued the rock. Good thinking. Excellent plan. Risky. Very risky. I don't know what we would have done if anything happened to you. But you saved us. You saved the kids. You saved us all. Taylor blushed. Uh, don't make it a bigger deal than it is. It's uh, Jason, by the way, the rock said. Taylor tilted her head, confused. My name is Jason, he smirked. Well, Jason and Clive, do you want to join me for breakfast? As they sat down to eat, the doors opened with a big bang. Everyone in the hall turned around to see Dean. His eyes were scanning the area, searching for someone, for Taylor. When he spotted her with Clive and Jason, he walked towards them like a predator about to pounce on its prey. His eyes were calling for murder. He wanted to lunge on Clive. But Jason immediately understood what is about to happen and stood protectively in front of Clive. Get out of my face! This idiot will have to be punished!
Oh, really? And for what? asked Taylor in a defiant tone. He put your life in danger, yelled Dean. He looked at Taylor and noticed the injuries on her face. Oh, Taylor, your face. Uh, let me see. Are you in pain? he said as he reached his hand trying to inspect her injury. But Taylor moved his hand away in an abrupt movement. You are worried for me? Now my life and feelings have value for you, she replied sarcastically. Dean was surprised by Taylor's tone at first. He did not expect that she would still be holding a grudge for what he told her yesterday evening. Taylor, you could have died. Well, I am an adult. I know what I did, and I wanted to do it. Jason surprised them all by adding, She does not need permission from anyone to act as she sees fit. She should not be considered as less of a warrior than any of our warriors here. Yesterday, she single-handedly saved our families. Taylor's eyes went wide, her mouth agape. She was surprised and touched by Jason's statement. If she did not know better, she would have hugged him tight, but the rock is not into public displays of affection. Dean clenched his fists, livid. He took a deep breath. You are right, Jason. I am sorry. Taylor, what you did was exceptional. We are all proud of you. He paused, then added, Can we talk? In private? Taylor looked at him and said, No. She sat down and continued eating her breakfast, ignoring Dean. Jason followed suit. Dean sat on her left. What now? It's the silent treatment? Are you going to avoid me? I said everything I had to say to you yesterday evening, and I'm not avoiding you. I just don't want to see you, hear you, or have you anywhere near me. Dean banged his fist on the table, startling her. He stood up, ready to leave, when Liam called him. Good morning, Dean. How is the situation on your side of the border? Everything is under control. No casualties. Twenty-five injured warriors, but no life-threatening injuries. Good. Uh, let's continue our discussion in my office, continued Liam. Dean nodded and followed him, not before giving Taylor a scowl. As soon as they closed the door of Liam's office, Dean lashed out. What the hell happened here? Didn't you give them clear instructions to protect her? She could have died. She is just a human for Moon Goddess's sake. She proved to us that she was strong enough to fend for herself. She was not ambushed. She went to the heart of the battle. So maybe if you stop treating her like a fragile doll, that would be a good start. But what's with her attitude towards you? Nothing, quickly replied Dean, too quickly. Well, Dean, if you want to lecture me about how I should have protected her, I would like to know what you did, because the way I see it, she is mad at you. What happened? Dean sighed and took a seat. He ran his hands through his messy hair, all tensed. The moment he said what he said to Taylor, he regretted it. He should have known her better. He messed up and is not proud of it. He told his brother about their dispute last night. You realize that you disrespected her, right? And by disrespecting her, you disrespected my mate as well. What should I do to you now? What the hell do I know? Hit me? And just like that, Liam punched Dean straight in the face. What the fuck, Liam? You told me to hit you. Yeah, but I didn't expect you to actually do it. You deserved that. Dean wiped the blood on his lips with the back of his hand. I guess you're right. I deserved it. And with that, everything was said and done on this topic between the Carter brothers. So what are we going to do with those rogues? This attack was exceptionally well planned. It could have turned into a bloodbath. Before Liam got a chance to reply, they heard a knock on the door, and Emma and Taylor went in. Hi, Dean, said Emma with the coldest voice ever. Oh, I see you know as well. Know what? Something is wrong? 
asked Emma, feigning ignorance. Never mind. Liam cleared his throat and told Emma and Taylor that they were discussing last night's attack. How did they organize this attack? On the east side, the alarms went on, yet we got zero warning about the intrusion on the west border, stated Liam. Yes, but yesterday your systems were compromised. Maybe a hack? suggested Taylor. We checked everything and tested all the alarms on the west border. They work perfectly fine, replied Liam. Good hackers take control of your system, manipulate it when they want and how they want it, and then they get out without leaving any trails, said Taylor. How do you know all this stuff, asked Dean, intrigued. You were talking a few days ago about how you're technically challenged. Yeah, technically it's not my strength, but it is Emma's. And when she was talking with Corey back home, they mentioned all those modern hack techniques. Who is Corey? snapped both Liam and Dean with a low growl. He is a hacker. Dean put his fist in his hand and was fuming. When did you see him? What is he to you? None of your business. He is just a friend of mine, pitched in Emma. We can ask Corey to do some forensic analysis in our system to verify whether we were hacked or not. In River Moon Pack, I think we're good. The alarms went on where they were supposed to. No, we should run a test on all of the digital infrastructure. Corey used to say that when one element is compromised, everything else has been changed as well, advised Emma. We have pen testers on our team, and they can do the job retorted Dean, not happy with the idea of dealing with this Corey Taylor is praising so much. Well, our teams already did their tests and came back with nothing. It won't hurt to hire Corey for a second opinion, decided Liam. The rest of the day, Taylor and Emma were busy helping the community members in cleaning up the mess generated by the attack, but also the party. They also helped in building the fences at the west border. At dusk, the girls decided to enjoy a drink at the rooftop and relax while watching the sunset. Liam gently hugged Emma and kissed her neck. Taylor looked at their affectionate embrace, happy for her friend. Meanwhile, Dean took a seat next to Taylor, too close for her liking. She was mad as hell at him, but that did not mean she was no longer attracted to him. Her body and her brain need to agree on a course of action. Damn physical attraction, she scolded herself. Corey accepted to help as soon as we talked with him. We gave him remote access to our infrastructure, and he confirmed that we have been compromised, both the Silver Moon and River Moon systems, updated Liam. This is not the only news we've got, added Dean. We talked with the other communities, and over 20 of them experienced similar attacks. What? All by the rogues? asked Emma, surprised. It went down through the entire state, not only the neighboring communities. The attacks on our packs were the largest ones, but yes, every pack in the state had a rogue-related incident yesterday, said Liam. What are we going to do? asked Emma. We're going to organize an alpha meeting. We will host the leaders of all the neighboring packs, all 12 of them, and put together a joint defense plan, stated Liam. We'll have representatives from each of the 12 communities in the area, so I would expect we'll have around 120 people. Honey, can you please make sure that they're welcomed properly and prepare the necessary accommodations for those who would stay overnight? Liam asked Emma. Yes, of course, you can count on me, she said, nodding her head. Liam looked at Taylor, embarrassed. Taylor, since you are an outsider of our communities, I will have to ask you to stay in your room until our meeting is finished. Believe me, if it were up to me, I would not request that. But the rules in our communities here are sterner than in Dallas. Of course, I fully understand... Just let me know when this is going to happen, and I will be out of your hair. I expect the first visitors to arrive around 9 a.m. Okay, perfect. I have the time to train with you, have breakfast, and then I would head to my room. How long are they staying? 
We'll have lunch with all the visitors, then we'll kick off our meeting in the early afternoon. I think most of them will leave by 8 p.m., unless some would like to stay the night here. We'll let you know. The next day, Taylor participated in the Silver Moon Pack training. Liam did not spare them. Given the current situation, he made sure everyone was in good shape and ready for whatever the rogues will attempt next. He mixed their training with new techniques and even asked Taylor to lead part of the training session to teach them new offensive and defensive moves. They finished their training at 8 a.m., two long and excruciating hours. As they were walking away from the training field and heading to the pack house, Liam tensed up and looked at Emma. They are here. Already? Yes, and it's Alpha Adam. Alpha Adam hates human. His mother was murdered by human hunters when he was a teenager, and since that day, he has loathed humans. Emma looked at Taylor, but before she could say anything, Taylor stated, I got the drill. I'll skip breakfast and head straight to my room. Thanks, Tay. I'm sorry to put you in this situation. I'll make sure we bring you a breakfast tray to your room. No worries. After this intense training your man put us to, I'm happy to spend the day in bed, said Taylor. She winked at them and sprinted to the pack house, avoiding by a few seconds Alpha Adam's convoy. However, as soon as Alpha Adam stepped out of his car, he looked at Liam, disgusted. You are hosting enemies in your pack, Liam? What are you talking about, Alpha Adam? I smell human, he snarled in disgust. Emma immediately jumped in to ease the building tension. Good morning, Adam. It's a pleasure to host you. We have a visitor from Dallas, an honorable member of our Mystic Moon community in Dallas. She, of course, is not aware of our nature and traditions, and she will not be in eyesight during our meetings. So now I have to walk on eggshells and watch what I'm doing because of this human? This is unacceptable. I can assure you that she will remain in her room as long as we need to, and... You can behave as freely as you want. Good to know, he hissed. Let's go inside, Alpha Adam. My pack and I are looking forward to sharing breakfast with you, stated Liam, as he guided Alpha Adam to their table. While everyone was getting seated, Alpha Adam mind-linked his third in command. I want you to investigate a human who is staying at the Silver Moon Pack, do a thorough investigation and send me the information before our General Assembly this afternoon. The rest of the morning went by smoothly. Emma, Liam, and Dean were busy welcoming the pack's delegations, and Taylor was resting in her room. She was served delicious food around the clock, and Clive would check on her every hour to make sure that she was fine. By the time the meeting was supposed to start, Taylor had eaten everything that was delivered to her room. Needless to say, this meant she ate a lot and felt that she needed to exercise and burn all those calories off. She went to the gym, which was far away from the pack house, and she was sure that she would not run into anyone. In the pack house, the meeting started with Liam's welcome message. Thank you, Alphas, for coming. As you know, we are facing a big threat. The rogues are getting well organized and more aggressive. Their latest coordinated attacks are proof that they have acquired new skills and are adamant on targeting all of us. We need to find a solution. How will we fight them back? Allow me, Alpha Liam, to express my concerns, said Alpha Adam. Liam nodded and gestured with his hand to give him the floor. What we experienced is not the same as before. They are organized indeed, have tech skills, but most of all it seems that they are after something, or might I say, someone. Emma, Liam, and Dean tensed up and knew where he was going with this. Liam stepped in to interrupt Alpha Adam, but the latter raised his hand and continued, Alpha Liam, I am not finished here. This is serious. 
you are harboring a human in the middle of your community. The other alphas looked at each other astonished. Dear alphas, you should have caught up with her scent. It might have faded since she is locked in her room, but this stinky human smell is still in the air. Who would have expected that Alpha Liam would host a human in the Silver Moon Pack? Yet here we are. There are no rules against that, Alpha Adam. As long as our existence is kept a secret, we can fraternize and host humans in our packs, snapped Liam, annoyed with Alpha Adam's low blow. Yes, there are no rules against that, but a human who insulted the rogues on her first day here? Who attacks the rogues' leader? The message is clear. The rogues want her. She humiliated their leader, and they want revenge. So the best solution to our rogue problem is to give her to them. Emma, Dean, and Liam all stood up and yelled in unison, This is out of the question. Watch out, Alpha Adam, you are treading on thin ice, threatened Dean, clenching his fists. Alpha Dean, she is dangerous, and the rogues are after her. Why would they attack all the packs simultaneously if they are after her? challenged Emma. Because, Luna Emma, they don't know where she is. They knew she was visiting a pack, but they had to attack all packs to find out where she is. This is preposterous. The rogues have been attacking us for decades now. They have killed our loved ones many times in the past. This has nothing to do with a human, replied Dean, grinding his teeth in anger. Maybe, or maybe not, but still, in our negotiations with the rogues, she could be a good bargaining chip to get peace. What type of negotiation sacrifices an innocent life? snapped Emma. It's just a human life. It is my sister's life you're talking about. Excuse me, Luna Emma? To my knowledge, she is not a werewolf. She cannot be your sister. Maybe not by blood, but she is my sister and my family. Well, I would like to hear from the other alphas. What do you think? The other alphas were shocked and confused. Questions were flying from everywhere. What happened? What is this human? Why are the Silver Moon and River Moon leaders defending her? Did she really fight the rogue's leader? How could a human fight the rogue's leader and live to tell the tale? Would sacrificing her really end this ever-present war with the rogues? Liam, Emma, and Dean did their best to answer the questions and handle the chaos that Alpha Adam created. Alpha Adam was looking at the mess, amused by the confusion he brought, and happy to see that some alphas were considering his proposal. After all, many packs have suffered not only at the hand of the rogues, but also of the human hunters. Do you think if it was the other way around, humans would hesitate to sacrifice werewolves for their own gain? said Alpha Adam. I cannot speak for all the humans, but I know that she would never sacrifice any innocent life, countered Emma. As everyone was enthralled in the heated debate, Dean's senses went on full alert. He smelled something sweet, a mixture of evergreen and vanilla. Damn it, Taylor, he whispered. Taylor had finished her gym session and was going through the hall to get a bottle of water before heading to her room. A smirk went on Alpha Adam's face. He smelled her too. This was perfect timing for his plan. He mind-linked his warriors who were standing at the back of the room and told them to bring the human to the conference. Excuse me, miss. Taylor felt someone touching her shoulders. She removed her AirPod from one ear and turned around. Yes, how can I help you? You are requested to join the meeting. I think you're mistaken. I highly doubt that I am requested to be there. Uh, Luna Emma asked us to bring you in. Taylor furrowed her brows. Are you sure? Yes, you can go and check by yourself. I just finished my workout. Can't I go and shower first? No, miss, this is urgent. 
As she approached the crowded meeting room, Alpha Adam's warrior grabbed her hand and pushed her in. Dean was at the far end of the room and could not reach Taylor, but he saw all of the interaction and guessed Adam's intentions. And when he saw Adam's minion push Taylor, he lost his composure. Taylor heard a growl like a wolf's growl. She was so surprised by the aggressive stance of the sky pushing her around and by the strange sound that she did not notice Dean was the source of the growl. Nor did she notice how angry he was, moving threateningly towards Alpha Adam. Alpha Adam did not wait for Dean to reach him. He yelled to the crowd, Ladies and gentlemen, the human is here. Let's hear from her directly and see whether she did offend the rogues or not. Come over here, woman. Emma's face turned white. Liam and Dean looked at each other, but could not do anything. Taylor was uncomfortable with all eyes on her. She was in her workout gear, a tight legging and a tank top, and she just wanted to drink water and go take a long bath. She could not understand how she got dragged into this situation in a matter of seconds. She saw the concern and anger in her friend's eyes and knew she could not ignore this man and go back to her room, nor can she speak her mind freely. She will have to be diplomatic and avoid offending those moon communities. And given that diplomacy is not her strength, this was not going to be an easy decision. She gathered all her patience and composure and moved closer to the man who called her out. He was standing next to her friend and other people who she guessed were the leaders of the visiting communities. As she got closer, Alpha Adams said, We're discussing the mess you've created on your first day in our city. I believe your reckless behavior could be behind the deadly attacks of the previous days. What reckless behavior? asked Taylor, confused by his accusation. Did you or did you not attack and fight with three other people at the diner? Taylor was flabbergasted. How did this man know about the fight at the diner? He was not there, and she doubted anyone from the Silver Moon told him about that. This man is well informed, which made him even more dangerous. She needed to be extra careful in her answers. No, I did not attack anyone. I defended myself. One of them was harassing me. I suppose we all agree that any woman is entitled to defend herself. Do you understand that this is a serious situation, miss? Alpha Adams snapped at her. I know it's a serious situation. Sexual harassment and rape are serious situations. I hope you understand that as well, replied Taylor calmly. Maybe you are a tease. You provoked them with your sassy talk or turned them on in your indecent clothes, gesturing to her workout gear. Seriously? snapped Taylor, all her self-control going out the window. First, nothing is wrong with my outfit. I was not planning to meet any of you, so yes, I did not dress for the occasion. This is a normal workout outfit since I was at the gym minding my own business. Before anyone could interrupt her, she continued, fuming. Second, no means no. The dress code does not have a room in this discussion. With your logic, if a man felt provoked by my wardrobe, then said man has the right to sexually harass me, to rape me? This is madness. She ended her rebuttal, raising her hands in the air, not believing her ears. You might think this was self-defense, but your self-defense had repercussions on all our communities. People died in the last attacks. And she saved a lot of lives yesterday, someone from the audience shouted. She put her life in danger to save our pups, yelled another one. She's a hero, and we protect our heroes in Silver Moon Pack, stated another man. And we protect our heroes in River Moon Pack as well shouted more people. For the Silver Moon and the River Moon Pack members, there is no doubt that they would defend and protect Taylor from whatever evil plan Alpha Adam was laying down. The representatives of the other communities were confused. 
Did this human fight with the Silver Moon and River Moon pack against the rogues? Was this human the catalyst behind the latest and largest rogue attacks? Are the rogues really after her? If yes, should they hand her to them and end this war here and now? The room was buzzing with people's whispers and questions. People were agitated. My view is that we need to take action, and this action could be as simple as negotiating with the rogues. We know what they want, and we can give them what they want, roared Alpha Adam's voice as he looked at Taylor intensely. And what do they want? Oh, we are talking about me here? You are going to hand a woman to such criminals? And you naively believe that they will not attack you again once they're done with me? You know that this is the stupidest plan ever, right? Silence, despicable human, roared Adam, lunging on Taylor. Dean was faster and stood in front of Taylor, shielding her. Out of my way, Alpha Dean. She is disrespecting me. She's questioning the sanity of an Alpha. Her question was legitimate. Do you think they will not attack again once they get their hand on her? Asked one of the Alphas. It will give us time to prepare and improve our defenses, said Adam. She is not a bargaining chip. She is under my protection, stated Dean. And mine as well, added Liam. Our pack members have vowed to defend the woman who protected their families and fought by their side. Don't be ridiculous. She was just fighting to save her own ass. All humans are egocentrics, huffed Alpha Adam. Alpha Adam, drop it. Taylor's life is not on the table. This is non-negotiable, snapped Dean. You do not get to decide for all of us, Alpha Dean. I say we vote. There will be no vote in my pack about handing innocent people to rogues, period, roared Liam. Do you want us to fight? Because if you want, we can fight, threatened Adam. Alpha Adam was referring to a full-blown war between their packs, but Taylor misinterpreted it as a one-to-one -one fight. Actually, that's a good idea. Let's fight, said Taylor as she moved from behind Dean. Taylor, please step aside, said Dean. He raised his hand to grab her wrist, but she evaded his grip. Taylor, let us manage this, added Liam, without removing his eyes from Adam. No, he wants to fight, so let's fight. It's my life on the line here. If he wants to fight, then he will have to fight me. If you win, you can offer me to your enemy, added Taylor, using air quotes and emphasizing the word offer. If I win, I get to kick the ass of a misogynist, and we will not hear about this any more, she finished. The beta of the Shadow Moon Pack looked at his alpha and said, This is one hell of a human. His alpha shook his head and replied, You mean one hell of a woman. Many attendees were impressed by Taylor's confidence, courage, and comebacks, but everyone, well, except for the Silver and River Moon Pack members, believed she had zero chance of winning a fight against such a powerful alpha. She was just a human after all. Come on, you don't believe she can win, asked the third in command of the Crescent Moon Pack. He was standing next to Clive and other Silver Moon Pack members. We sure do. But she is just a human, a female human against an alpha werewolf? We have seen her fight, and she can win, said Clive proudly. Did you notice how Alpha Dean was looking at the human, and how he immediately stepped in to protect her from Alpha Adam? asked the Beta of the Dark Moon Pack. Yes, I think Alpha Dean is infatuated by this woman, replied a visitor from the Red Moon Pack. Who wouldn't? If she survives this fight, I'll hit on her, added the beta laughing. Dean growled at them from the distance. With his werewolf superpowers, he heard everything and was not happy with how they were talking about Taylor. He could not help but be possessive of her. No way in hell would he let anyone hit on her. But he should focus on the bigger problem at hand, Taylor's fight with Alpha Adam.
He was impressed with her fighting skills, and he believed she had a chance at winning this fight. And this will be the bigger problem because Alpha Adam will not accept to be defeated by a woman in front of all his peers and so many pack members. Damn it, Taylor, why did she have to propose a fight? This made everything even more complicated. Taylor, meanwhile, stood her ground glaring at Alpha Adam. Alpha Adam was pleased with this turn of event. He had no doubt that he can win this fight, quick and easy. He was happy to fuel his hatred of humans and to throw this human to the rogues, who will, no doubt, torture her and rape her to no end. This is how much he hated humans. Shall we start? The sooner I'm done with you, the sooner I get to take a shower, mocked Taylor. Alpha Adam ignored her and looked at the crowd. You all heard the conditions of this duel. Everyone will have to accept the results, he said, looking penetratingly at Dean, Emma, and Liam. Everyone witnessed the discussion with Taylor, and no one will be able to stop him from throwing her to the rogues. Then he turned to Taylor and continued. Let's go outside for everyone headed outside and gathered around Taylor and Adam, but still giving them enough space for the fight. Taylor adopted a defensive stance at first to analyze his fighting skills. They started walking in a circle, taunting each other for a few minutes until he lunged at her. Taylor easily ducked the blow. He was surprised with how fast she was. He was using his werewolf powers, and yet she was unfazed. He jumped at her, but she immediately grabbed his hand, blocking his blow and twisting it while in parallel she kicked him in the crotch. He fell on the floor in pain. Twenty minutes into the fight, Alpha Adam did not manage to hit her once, and he was getting frustrated especially that Taylor dodged all his attacks, and she managed to hit him back more than once. The werewolves watching the fight could not believe their eyes. This is unbelievable! A human capable of fighting like that? She dodged every single attack! She is not even tired! Alpha Adam could hear all the comments and was infuriated. This human is humiliating him in front of all his peers. He was planning for a quick and swift win, yet he was losing, and against a human. He lurched at her again. She threw two punches, and he flew all the way around on the floor. She faced the cheering crowd and waved. She was loving it. Suddenly, she heard gasps in the crowd and heard Emma screaming, Watch out behind you, Taylor! She ducked down and rolled to the other side. When she got up, she turned to face the attacker, and she was astonished to see a huge wolf instead of Adam. Taylor did not have time to search for Alpha Adam as the wolf came after her again. This time she was ready to fight back, and she hit the wolf with a jump kick in the air. The wolf was back on its paws promptly and let out a menacing growl. Everything went fast after that. Alpha Adam's warriors transformed right in front of Taylor into wolves and joined him on the fighting ground. Taylor's eyes widened and filled with horror. She was beyond shocked. People just transforming into wild animals? Freaking animals? And now she had eight giant wolves growling at her, ready to shred her into pieces. But before the werewolves could even lunge at her, three wolves jumped in front of her, growling at the menacing wolves as if they were protecting Taylor. Taylor could not move. She could not believe her eyes. This is not possible. This cannot be real. This is a nightmare, a weird nightmare. This is what happens when you are a glutton and you overeat, she tried to convince herself. Suddenly, she heard a commanding voice. It was Liam, and he was raging. Enough! You have violated all our sacred laws. Cheating in battle, shifting in front of a human, this will not be tolerated. Everyone, shift back now! 
And just like that, Taylor saw all those wolves shifting back to human form. The first wolf that attacked her transformed back into Alpha Adam. And those wolves standing in front of her? They were Dean, The Rock, and Clive, who just transformed back into humans. And they were all naked. Full frontal nudity. Okay, so my nightmare just changed into a naughty dream now thought Taylor, shaking her head still in shock. Everyone, put your clothes on and all alphas head back to the meeting room ASAP, added Liam. Emma ran to Taylor all worried. Are you okay? Did he hurt you? Emma, is this a dream? Am I seeing right? Did humans transform into wolves just now? Emma did not answer, but her eyes could not lie. This is all real. Oh, my God! Are they werewolves? Are you all werewolves? asked Taylor. Yes, whispered Emma. I would never have imagined that werewolves actually exist. Then she looked at Emma with her inquisitive eyes. Oh, so all those moon communities? They're werewolves community? Mystic Moon in Dallas is a werewolf community? We call them pack, said Emma. What? The communities. We call them packs. The Silver Moon Pack, Mystic Moon Pack, etc. And yes, we all are werewolves. Taylor nodded, trying to process this unbelievable situation. She looked again at the naked men being handed clothes by other pack members. She suddenly burst into laughter. Emma looked at Taylor all stunned. She did not expect this reaction. Nothing in this situation is funny. Taylor, what are you laughing about? asked Emma. Oh my God, Emma, I just realized something, screamed Taylor, grabbing Emma's hand and looking at her friends straight in the eyes. Does that mean all those nudist resorts are actually werewolves communities? Emma looked at Taylor, eyes wide open, and she started laughing as well. Leave it to Taylor, at a moment of pure crisis, to find a way to laugh and ease the tension, said Emma, tears running down her cheeks. The girls laughed, embracing each other, and under the curious eyes of the pack members who were surprised by their cheerfulness, especially given the circumstances. After a few minutes, Taylor wiped her tears and in a more somber tone addressed Emma. Emma, can I ask you something? Yeah, sure, what? Can I please take a freaking bath? Hand in hand, laughing again, the girls went back to the pack house. Meanwhile, the alphas were in a heated debate. Most of them were infuriated. Some of them had to be restrained from attacking Alpha Adam. No one was happy with what he did, shifting in front of a human. For millenniums, the existing of the supernatural world was successfully kept a secret from any human. And here goes Alpha Adam. Because of a stupid inflated ego, he broke the law and put their entire world at risk. Are you attacking a fellow Alpha, me, the one who stood up for you throughout the years? Do you realize that this human is dividing us? yelled Alpha Adam. No, you divided us just because you couldn't accept losing to a human, roared another Alpha. She cannot be a human. She's too strong for a human, for a woman, said Alpha Adam. Oh, snap out of it. She is a strong human and woman. On her first day here, she beat me in a fight as well. I didn't make a big fuss out of it, and definitely I did not shift into my wolf to try to beat her, snapped Liam. Why do you think we accepted this fight? It is because we knew she was going to win, retorted Dean, smirking, his arms crossed on his chest. So what should we do now? asked the Alpha of Crescent Moon. Well, she won the fight, so handing her to the rogues is no longer an option. We must find another plan to face the rogues. 
replied the Alpha of the Red Moon Pack. I was referring to a more pressing situation. A human knows about our existence. We all know what the law states. What are you implying? You want to sentence Taylor to death? Is that your plan? growled Dean. This is our law, Alpha Dean. We cannot have a human knowing about our existence. And are you going to banish Alpha Adam? No, of course not, even though he put us all in this conundrum, added the Alpha of Red Moon. So what kind of justice is that? Either we apply to law by the letter, or we don't, stated Shadow Moon's Alpha. So what, we let her be? This is a huge risk. We cannot let her roam the earth freely and put our people at risk. We need to focus on the actual pressing situation, the rogues. Those attacks were a preview of what is yet to come. Let's unite our effort to unveil their plans, said Liam. And the human? asked the Alpha of Crescent Moon. She will stay with me, said Dean. Under my direct supervision, my pack protection, and my pack responsibility. But we cannot take the risk. There is no risk. Taylor is a trustworthy person, and I will put my own reputation on the line here, said Dean. Listen, she will stay in my brother's pack, no possibility to leave his pack perimeter. All her communication with humans will be monitored and recorded. Once we solve the rogues problem, we can decide what to do with Taylor and Alpha Adam, stated Liam, leaving no room for discussion. All the Alphas went silent, thinking about Dean and Liam's proposal. That seems like a reasonable decision. The decision from now is that this human will be under Alpha Dean's responsibility. If she manages to communicate our secret to the outside, then I am sorry, Alpha Dean, but you and Pack will be equally held responsible, and this means a death sentence on you and your Pack. As for the human, she will be shredded into pieces, stated one of the Alphas to summarize the decision they collectively reached. I understand the conditions and consequences of this decision, said Alpha Dean, sealing the deal. Okay, now let's talk about the rogues, said Liam, and the rest of the meeting was focused on analyzing how the rogues coordinated all their attacks, understanding their operating model, and devising a plan to defend the community's property. Taylor had finally taken her long-awaited bath, and she was sitting with Emma on her bed, asking endless questions about the supernatural world, with Emma patiently answering every single one. So, does that mean that vampires exist, too? Yes. Fairies? Yes. Witches? Yes. My God, and all those manage to be hidden in plain sight? Yes. Wow, we humans are stupid, chuckled Taylor. Oh, so all those times when I thought people sounded like a wolf, or those times where the guys that beat the shit out of me at practice... I was fighting against supernatural wolves. I'll be damned, added Taylor, who was super excited to discover her friend's world. Okay, so explain to me the mate concept, asked Taylor. We believe in our own deity, the moon goddess. We believe that she created a soul mate for each one of us. If we are lucky to find our mate, we have the freedom to reject our mate or accept them but usually we are happy to find our mate and live together because soulmates are supposed to make us better. I understand what you mean, Emma. This is what you and Liam did to each other. You got out of your shell and you gave him stability. Emma blushed, happy to see Taylor come around on her relationship with Liam. So tell me more. I never attended a wedding ceremony at the Mystic Moon, do you have anything similar? Well, usually when we meet our mate, we mark each other. What is that? You called them hickeys when you saw them on our neck. Oh, yes, the infamous hickey, teased Taylor. By marking each other, 
we mix our scent together and it sends a signal to the packs that we are together. We're not available for another relationship. Your life must be easier than us humans. Everyone knows you're taken and no one will annoy or hit on you, laughed Taylor. Indeed, laughed Emma. So what next? When we meet our soulmate, we immediately smell it, sense it. Therefore, we, the human and the wolf in us, scream, mate, recognizing our other half. Once the mating process is completed, yes, meaning sex, we mate together for life. Are you sure that you are going to meet your mate? We believe that the moon goddess always makes it possible for us to meet our soulmate. Legend has it that if you do not meet your mate in your lifetime, it means you've done something bad in your life and you do not deserve to have your mate next to you. But most people manage to meet their mates, whether they're in the same city or state or country. And this is also why we organize the balls and gathering of all the packs as well. What should I know next? All of the members of the same pack can talk with one another telepathically. This is what we call a mind link. We decide who we want to talk to, and then we can reach out to them. Oh, that explains why sometimes you guys just stare at each other, and it felt to me as if you were in a staring contest. Exactly. We were having a side discussion using the mind link. Wow, is that cool? Whatever the distance? Yes. Oh, the wolves I saw during our picnic. They were werewolves from the pack? inquired Taylor. Yes, they were from Dean's pack, watching over us in case of rogue attacks. And you told me I had a creative imagination when I told you that. Shame on you, BFF, huffed Taylor. Well, I'm sorry, but I couldn't tell you the truth. Why? We have shared everything together, Emma. Please, tell me you didn't think I would look at you differently if I knew the truth. No, no, of course not, Taylor. I had zero doubt that you would still be my friend if you knew my, well, my origin. Then why, Emma? Why? Emma looked away, and an uncomfortable silence fell. For Taylor, this meant one thing only. What are you not telling me, Emma? asked Taylor. Our laws are extremely strict, Taylor. We are not allowed to tell anyone about our existence. If a werewolf intentionally or inadvertently reveals our existence to a human, the human is sentenced to death. So, now that I know, what does it mean? You're going to kill me? Of course not. I would never allow that. Neither would Liam nor Dean. They were discussing the situation with all the alphas, and Liam mind-linked me a few minutes ago to let me know that they have agreed to spare your life for now under the sole condition that you stay in the River Moon Pack under Dean's responsibility. With Dean? What the fuck? You all know that I don't even want to see his face. I don't want you to die, Taylor. So you are going to swallow your pride, and you are going to go with him. And we will see afterwards what we will do. You are on house arrest in this pack. I would come every day to visit you. Okay, if you believe this is for the best, sighed Taylor. Perfect. Now come with me. Liam told me we need to join the Alphas meeting. When they got there, Taylor and Emma walked in holding hands with Emma standing right next to Taylor, sending a clear message that Taylor is under her protection as well. Human Taylor Smith, started one of the elderly alphas. Taylor opened her mouth to reply, but Emma immediately squeezed her hand, giving her a look that said, Stand still, don't talk, and don't disrespect anyone. Taylor got the message loud and clear and decided to follow Emma's instructions and shut her mouth. We have lived for ages among humans by keeping our existence a secret from the outside world. No one should know about the existence of supernatural beings. 
Our laws are clear and uncompromising. Any human who discovers our secret is sentenced to death. Any werewolf who divulges our secret to humans will be judged for treason. However, under the insistence of Alphas Liam and Dean, we took the decision to postpone this trial for now and focus on a more prominent threat, the rogues. For now, you will stay on house arrest in the River Moon Pack under Alpha Dean's direct responsibility. He paused for a few seconds to make sure the gravity of the situation sank in for Taylor, then continued. This means that if you do not keep your end of the bargain, Alpha Dean will share the same punishment as you. His life is on the line as well. Do you understand? Can we trust you, human? Taylor snapped her head towards Dean, flabbergasted that he would put his life on the line for her. She could not believe her ears. What is wrong with this man? He hardly knows her. They had a big fight yesterday evening, and yet, here he is, defying his people, their laws, to protect her. Here he is, trusting her with his life. The Alpha continued. We are trying to put our trust in you, Taylor. Do you understand that it is the fate of all our kind that depends on you? The moment you talk, you doom us all. You have seen how humans react to what is different from them. This is our lives, the lives of our families. Taylor understood his concern, looked at him eye to eye. Not only do I understand, but I swear that your secret is safe with me, not just for the duration of the house arrest, but forever. The elderly Alpha nodded, and he was going to dismiss the session when Taylor spoke again. May I ask you a question, Alpha? He looked at her surprised, but allowed her to proceed with her question. I understood my sentence, but what was the sentence for the other parties involved? Alpha Adam and his pack members are the ones who transformed into wolves in front of me and violated your sacred law. What was their sentence? A heavy silence fell on the room. They were all uncomfortable with her question, yet a legitimate question. Alpha Adam erupted. How dare you! How dare a human imply that me and Alpha and my people are to be judged? His eyes were drilling holes in her skull, but Taylor stood her ground and glared back at him. It is a genuine question. I understood that your law is straightforward. All parties involved are considered guilty. Thus, my question, replied Taylor in a calm tone that only contributed to further infuriate him. Liam felt that the situation was going to degenerate and stepped in. Taylor, we believe that we are facing a big threat, maybe even a war. Therefore, for now, we are putting all sentencing on hold. You will be our guest. Even if it is called house arrest, you are our guest. Emma, could you please help Taylor pack for her move? Please be ready in one hour. This is unacceptable. Seriously, you mock us humans, our laws, how we treat people that are different, but they are doing the same. Adam and his people are not even scolded. Taylor was pacing around her room, furious. She was not packing. She was beating her clothes and throwing them in her bag. Taylor, it's not that simple. It is that simple. I did not spy on you guys to unveil your secret. It's him. He could not accept to lose the fight and put all of you at risk. This is not fair, complained Taylor. Of course it's not fair, and you can rest assured that I admonished Liam and Dean in our mind-link discussion. But I understand this decision. We need Alpha Adam. We cannot afford to have Alpha Adam and his pack as enemies. Not now. Our focus is on the rogues. Taylor threw herself on the bed and focused on the ceiling, trying to calm down. 
Turns out, Emma, that you werewolves are not that different from us humans, scoffed Taylor. It's sad. I was hoping you were an evolved species. Since you had to live in secret and make sacrifices, you know the bitter taste of injustice. Yet here we are. When you are put to the test, you act as foolish and disappointed as us humans. Apparently, all species that walk on two feet are genetically created to be unjust and hypocrite. Emma sighed and laid down on the bed next to Taylor, both of their heads close to each other. No one is perfect, Tay. All the species on this earth are flawed by design, but this is what makes life on earth interesting. We learn from each other. We learn from the animals and the insects. We learn from the trees and the flowers. We learn from the humans and werewolves. But remember, Tay, whatever life throws at us, we can face it together. Look at you. You came straight from Dallas with your cowboy manners, or should I say lack of manners, to make sure I'm okay. We got each other's back, remember? For eternity and beyond, right? Added Emma, while holding tight to Taylor's hand. For eternity and beyond, this has been their creed since the day they met and became friends. They stood by each other through everything and made sure that their friendship would come first and survive any ordeal. Taylor looked at Emma, squeezing her hand. For eternity and beyond, indeed. Taylor had a hard time sleeping that night in her new room, not that she felt in danger or anything. After they had dinner with Liam and Emma, Dean brought her to his pack. She was welcomed with open arms, and everyone was happy to have her here and wanted to make sure that she was comfortable. Dean insisted on taking her personally to her room, which was just next to his. He told her that if she needed anything, she should knock on his door, any time, and that she should not feel that she is on house arrest. He insisted that she can go wherever she wanted, within the boundaries of the community, of course. Yet here she is now, tossing and turning in bed for three hours already. Taylor couldn't take it any more. The only solution was to throw food at the problem. She opened her door quietly and went down the stairs searching for the kitchen. The house was eerily quiet and dark as the night. All the lights were turned off and everyone was probably sleeping. Yet while searching for the kitchen, she got a glimpse of a light that intrigued her. Someone is awake. She got closer and noticed light creeping under a wooden door. Curiosity got the better of her, and she quietly opened the door, wondering who is still awake at this time. It was Dean. This must be his office, thought Taylor. He was sitting at his desk, reading some papers placed in front of him, while both his hands were holding his head. He looked tired. Without even raising his head, he said, can't sleep either? She tilted her head, surprised that he knew who it was at his office's door. You're sent, he continued. What? she asked. Werewolves have an advanced sense of smell. We can smell and recognize people by their scent at a distance. This is how I knew it was you without even looking. Oh, I thought you were saying I smell bad and needed another bath. He laughed. So what do you want to do, he asked her, closing the folder on the desk in front of him. I don't know. I thought maybe eating something would help me sleep. How about we go for a walk instead? Eating at this time will only bring you indigestion. Are you sure? You seem busy. My brain is tired anyway. Let's go for a walk. I have to go and change first, said Taylor, pointing to her pajamas, a camisole top and satin shorts. If you want, you can put on my clothes. I always leave workout outfits in my office in case I want to change quickly and head to the gym after work. He moved to the closet at his left and handed her a t-shirt and sweatpants. I'll wait outside. 
She changed into his comfortable clothing and opened the door. He looked her up and down slowly, smiled, and gently grabbed her waist. This way, my lady. She smiled back at him and they got out of the pack house and headed to the woods. He was still holding her by the waist when he leaned in and whispered in her ear, I love seeing you in my clothes, covered with my scent. Taylor blushed at the compliment and the double entendre. She gulped and cleared her throat before moving away from his hold. So what's keeping you awake? What's the problem? Maybe I can help. We cannot understand why they coordinated their attacks like that. They have always attacked us, but never like that. They got organized. They're using modern technologies. How do they usually operate? Rogues are werewolves who refuse to be part of a pack, or werewolves who got banished because they broke the rules of the pack, or just werewolves who were born rogues. They're usually loners, but all the rogues in our state have always lived in different groups and never really aligned together. Each pack leader can unilaterally decide to banish a werewolf? Usually, yes. If a werewolf broke the laws of the pack in question, then the pack decides on the punishment. However, they can appeal to the Council of Alphas if they believe they've been unfairly condemned. And when a werewolf with alpha blood is banished, this decision should be validated by the Alpha Council. And what happens when werewolves become rogues? They're treated like a lower social class? No, not really. We just don't interact with them because they do not want to respect our laws. They don't have access to our protection or our support. The main rule is that they're not allowed on pack territory, and if they trespass, we reserve the right to hunt them down. But other than that, they're free, and they just fend for themselves. Most of the rogues' attacks were committed by rogues who were seeking revenge because they got banned or were pure vandalism. But yesterday's attacks, they do not fit the classical pattern. Those attacks mean the rogues got smarter and they got organized. Maybe survival instinct, suggested Taylor. What do you mean, Tay? She blushed when he called her Tay and, damn it, she liked how her name sounded on his lips. Look at you, how did you all survive? Because you have your communities, your packs. You have a hierarchy in your packs, rules and laws, and you have a stable source of income. They might want the same thing. Since they are outlaws, they don't want to do the effort, so they're after your riches, your wealth, and probably there's something more personal in the mix. You talked about werewolves becoming rogues because they were banned from their packs, so it's personal for many of them. Maybe they want revenge on the people who threw them out and made them rogues. At Silver Moon and River Moon, we never banned any of our people, and yet we have always been under attack by the rogues. Maybe your parents or grandparents' leadership? Not that I recall, but it is worth checking out. I will also check the Alpha Council's rulings in the past 20 years in case they issued any banishment sentence that could explain this never-ending vendetta. They walked side by side for 45 minutes, further analyzing the current situation and testing different scenarios until they circled back to the pack house. Dean walked Taylor to her door. They locked eyes for a few minutes before he let out a deep sigh, and leaned in to kiss her forehead. Good night, Taylor, he finally said. Good night, Dean, she replied before she went in her room and closed the door. She leaned against the door and closed her eyes, trying to make sense of the situation. She should still be mad at him, not swooned, but she cannot ignore that he saved her life twice today. Staying at the River Moon Pack will be torture, muttered Taylor, before heading to the next day. Taylor was too sore and tired to join their morning training session. She stayed in bed and joined them for breakfast after they finished their training. 
Dean made sure she sat right next to him and was showering her with attention, filling her plate with the delicious pastries prepared by Chef Pierre. Taylor looked at Dean from the corner of her eye as he was engaging in lighthearted discussion with his pack members, Jeff, Amy, and Bella. She was struggling with everything Dean has done in the past few days. She could not understand him. He was physically attracted to her, that she was sure of. But his past actions went beyond physical attraction, didn't they? He was out of his mind when he knew she got injured during the rogue attack. He jumped to her rescue when Alpha Adams and his warriors shifted and attacked her in their wolf forms. And he put his life on the line to protect her from the consequences of a human knowing about their supernatural world. Would someone do all of this if it was just about lust and sex? But if it was more than just physical attraction, why did he just propose a sexual relationship? Twice! She was confused by this man and didn't know what to think. She couldn't stop remembering how he bid her good night yesterday evening, how tender and affectionate he was. A shiver ran down her spine as she remembered how this one kiss on her forehead made her all flustered. This did not go unnoticed by Dean, who put his arm around her shoulder and leaned down asking her, Is everything okay? Do you feel cold? Take my jacket. And this was the exact moment Emma chose to join them. She did not miss the closeness between her friend and her brother-in-law. She cleared her throat. Hi, everyone. Hello, Tay. So I see you are busy and forgot about me already, said Emma, pouting. You are irreplaceable, Em, you know that, replied Taylor while hugging her. But we have good candidates for the position of BFF number two, she added, winking. What do you want to do today? I cleared my day to spend it with you. I don't know. Uh, what do you suggest? Taylor asked, looking at everyone at the table. Day one of house arrest. Is there a user guide with predefined steps? Added Taylor with a teasing tone. Well, day one should be focused on orientation. We can show you around. We can introduce you to more pack members, and then we can have a picnic like last time, suggested Amy. As they were setting their plan in motion, additional pack members were coming to their table to introduce themselves. This has been going on since yesterday evening, and everyone was welcoming. They were all grateful that she fought by their side against the rogues. Hello, Miss Smith, my name is Tristan, and this is Charlotte, my mate. Please call me Taylor, she replied, shaking their hands. As she was looking at Tristan, she had a feeling that she had already seen him. As if on cue, Tristan told her, Yes, we already met at the diner. We proposed our help against the rogues, but you undoubtedly did not need our help. They were beyond frustrated to see a human, a female, kick their boss's ass, added Tristan, laughing. Thank you for proposing to help, Tristan. It was very considerate of you. I suppose since I'm on house arrest in River Moon, you and Charlotte will get to see me more. It would be a pleasure. Actually, if you're free at noon, you can join us for lunch. We'll have a picnic by the lake. Thank you for the invitation. We will join with pleasure, added Tristan and Charlotte. My pack members admire you a lot, Taylor. This makes me happy whispered Dean in her ear. Taylor blushed. Why the hell is she blushing like a teenager? She clutched to her glass of water and drank slowly, trying to control her emotions. I won't be able to join you for lunch. Unfortunately, I have a lot of work to do, but I will join you as soon as I finish. Is that okay with you? Yes, of course. Why wouldn't it be okay? I mean, you don't have to spend time with me, and... Anyway, I'll be in good hands, she replied, smiling. You're absolutely right, Tay. I don't have to spend time with you. 
I want to spend all my free time with you, he replied as he lightly stroked and kneaded her thigh. When they were done with breakfast, Emma said playfully, Okay, I announce Taylor's orientation day open. They did a quick visit of the main quarters, the pack house, and the facilities around it, such as the gym, the pool, the playgrounds, and then they headed to the school, which was impressive. Next stop was the library, where Taylor took some books on interior design. As they were heading to the lake for the picnic, Jeff pointed to the series of buildings on their left. Our offices are those buildings. In that building on the side, we mainly host our R&D and our innovation labs. We'll take you there when we finish our picnic. When they reached the lake, Tristan and Charlotte were already there, and they had set the picnic blankets on the grass. Four picnic blankets were waiting for them, courtesy of Chef Pierre, of course. The picnic went smoothly. Taylor got to know her new friends better, and she was happy to be surrounded by such friendly and lovely people. Amy and Charlotte told her about how they met their mates. Bella told her about the patents she recently filed. That girl is a genius. And now, Tristan was narrating Taylor's adventure at the diner. By the end of the story, everyone was laughing. We tried to follow them that day, hoping to finally find the headquarters of the rogues, but they were smart and hid their trails. Tristan was visibly frustrated that they could not catch up on the rogues. If they did, maybe they could have avoided this latest attack. Anyhow, you really impressed me that day, Taylor. No human can fight and win over a werewolf, and those rogues were strong, added Tristan. But they just dismissed me as a mere human. You should never underestimate your opponent. I always leverage that in my fights against people who are physically stronger than me. Yes, we saw how you overpowered Alpha Liam and Alpha Adam, said Amy. Speaking of Alpha Adam, I want you to know, Taylor, that many of us are appalled by the decision of our leaders to let him walk away free whereas you are on house arrest, said Tristan with a frown on his face. And not only in the Silver Moon and River Moon packs, I have friends in the other packs as well, and many were shocked by the decision. The man revealed our secret because he's a sore loser, and he didn't even get a slap on the hand, added Bella, all worked up. Taylor looked at Emma and noticed that she was getting uncomfortable. Her man was a supporter of this decision. Emma was a supporter of this decision. It was a political decision they deemed necessary for now. I generally don't give a damn about Alpha, Adam. I just hope that the house arrest won't last too long. Well, thank you very much. You cannot wait to leave us, mocked Emma. You know that's not the case, replied Taylor, throwing a cherry tomato at her face. I just can't stay away from my business too long, clarified Taylor. But now that I think about it, it might be better to stay on house arrest than facing the strict implementation of your law, which means the death penalty for me. Don't even think about that. There is no way in hell we would let them do that, said Emma. And all the packs, the River Moon and the Silver Moon, will stand behind Luna Emma and Alpha's Liam and Dean protecting you, added Tristan. An awkward silence fell. They all went quiet, thinking about this whole messed up situation and the consequences of Alpha Adam's foolish behavior. Okay, leave it to me to ruin a nice day, laughed Taylor, trying to lighten the tension. Who wants dessert? Chef Pierre's famous chocolate cake, said Amy, while taking the cake out of the picnic basket. Everyone raised their hands, and just like that, they got back to their cheerful and lighthearted discussions. On their way back, they visited the offices where Tristan introduced Matt, the lab manager, to Taylor. Taylor's eyes landed on something behind Matt. No way! Don't tell me you have that in your lab! She screamed as she almost ran towards the machine. Matt was proud of their innovative labs. 
Of course, we have four 3D printers of different sizes and capabilities. I have always dreamed of building my future with 3D printing. Maybe we can do that. I would love it, but I am not a techie woman. Far from that. I can confirm, said Emma, smirking. She already burned a toaster, a coffee maker, and two printers. Two classical printers, but still, you better watch out. They all laughed as Taylor got closer to Matt in the 3D printer. Matt went on explaining to her how it works, when she felt a hand on her waist as she was pulled away from Matt and landed on a large muscular chest. She looked up and saw Dean. He was looking at Matt with a scowl on his face. Oh, hi, Dean. Matt wa First, I would like an answer to my question. What question? What is happening here? This is a 3D printer, and Matt was showing me how it works. Why? Um, because I asked him? Emma grabbed Dean's hand and said, Dean. Then they stared at each other, probably continuing their discussion using the mind link. Maybe you would like to include me in your discussion, because apparently it concerns me, said Taylor, addressing them both with a sarcastic tone. No, it's okay, said Dean, too dismissively for Taylor's liking. When you're done with the visit of the lab, join me for dinner at 7 p.m. Uh, Emma, you're welcome to join. Oh, I will definitely be joining, especially after what I just saw, she teased him. He shrugged his shoulders and left after glaring at Matt. The look on his face was confusing Taylor. Again, when they finished the visit, Amy excused herself to have dinner with Jeff. Bella and Charlotte had some errands to run, and Tristan had to finish some work, so Emma and Taylor were left alone. Okay, do you mind telling me what happened over there? asked Taylor. You know I don't like to interfere with your love life, teased Emma. First, there is no love life to interfere with. Second, I interfered in yours, so please tell me what's happening here. Do you need me to paint a picture? He was jealous. Of what? Because I was talking with Matt? Come on. Tay, I already told you, werewolves are possessive by nature. This is why marking our mate is important, because everyone would then know that we are taken, and no werewolf would dare to hit on our mate. I am not his mate, so I don't understand his behavior. Oh, wait. Did he find his mate? I don't think it's my story to tell. You should ask him. You bet I'm going to ask him. In that case, maybe I shouldn't come with you for dinner then, mumbled Emma. No, you should come. You're my buffer. You'll keep me under control, said Taylor with a concerned voice. She was not sure she wanted to hear the answer to such a question. Maybe this is why Dean never had any serious relationship, because he's waiting for his mate. And whatever he's feeling towards her, even if it was more than sexual attraction, this will never be as strong as what he will feel towards his soulmate. Why everything must be so complicated, thought Taylor to herself. Okay, Dean just mind-linked me. The dinner is in the rooftop restaurant. Let's go, said Emma as she grabbed Taylor's hand and they headed to the restaurant together. At the rooftop bar, the girls were captivated by the sunset reflecting on the lake, nightfall colors painting the horizon. The view was breathtaking. I see you like the view, said Dean, as he handed the girls two cups of champagne. It's amazing, acknowledged Taylor. Not as amazing as you, said Dean, raising his glass. To an amazing friend, added Emma. To an amazing woman, said Dean. Come on, guys, you're making me uncomfortable, replied Taylor, blushing. The night went smoothly. Taylor did her best not to think about werewolves and soulmate, and they talked about their work. When she told him about her idea to leverage their 3D printers for her work, he promised her he'll mobilize his team to help her in this experiment. 
When Emma's driver came to take her back home, she hugged Taylor goodbye and went her way. Are you tired or are you up for a walk? asked Dean, not wanting his evening with Taylor to end. I'm always up for a walk. Just let me change and I'll join you. At the reception hall? Okay. They walked silently for ten minutes, enjoying the forest's evening sounds. Then Taylor decided to break the silence and ask the question that's been nagging her all afternoon and evening. Can I ask you a personal question? Yes, on one condition. I also have the right to ask you personal questions as well. Okay, that's fair. Tell me, Dean, why did you act like that in the lab? I meant to apologize. It's difficult to keep my wolf at bay, and we can be a bit possessive of the people we like. In other words, you were jealous. You need to put a label on everything, laughed Dean, giving her a side embrace. You know that a woman can talk to a man without any hidden intentions from either of them, right? Yes, yes, I know, and I will do my best to behave, especially since I committed to mobilize resources to help you with the 3D printing. Thank you, Dean. And what did Emma tell you through the mind link? She told me to stop acting like a possessive, jealous boyfriend, because that's the best way to make you run away screaming in the opposite direction. Listen to the woman. She knows me best, she chuckled. They reached the riverbank, the place he showed her on her first visit to his pack. Now my turn. Go ahead. First, I want to apologize for my behavior. Is this a question? Seems to me like this is an affirmation, teased Taylor. First, I need to say something, then I will ask the question, Dean said with a serious look on his face. I am sorry for how I behaved during Emma's birthday party. My intention was not to be disrespectful. I didn't want to offend you. Thanks, Dean. I accept your apology. After a few seconds, Dean cleared his throat. Now, for my question, and again, please don't misunderstand me. Why did you go out with that many men if you didn't feel it would lead somewhere? I can't know if it's going to lead somewhere unless I go out with them. If I feel there are some affinities, I like their mindset, I like their sense of humor, or even as simple as if I find them attractive, why not test the ground and see whether this could lead somewhere? We humans cannot recognize our soulmates just by looking at them, so how can I find my soulmate if I don't go out and try to find him? Did you find the soulmate? God, no. It's extremely hard to find our soulmate. I think your goddess makes your life much easier. For a flick of a second, she saw a shadow in his eyes. Why do you believe the moon goddess eases our lives? He asked. By default, you know there is someone special for you in this world. When you see your soulmate, you know. Done deal. For us humans, we need to search to test. Even when we're sure that we found the love of our life, in a few years, everything could crumble. Do you believe in soulmates, Tay? You mean, if there is a special someone for me out there in the world? I don't know. Maybe. But what I do know is that if my soulmate exists, I won't know it's him just by looking in his eyes or touching his hand. He laughed and pulled her close by her waist in a side hug. He liked her candor. Can I ask a second question? queried Taylor. Yes, yeah, sure, go ahead. What is your story with your soulmate? Suddenly the air around them went thick with tension. You promised that you would answer any question and you would answer truthfully, warned Taylor. Well, there's not much to say. I'd find her, but she rejected me. Why would she do that? I wanted a family, to build a home. She didn't want that. She was pursuing a career in modeling. She wanted to travel, experience the world. So we agreed that was for the best. 
She laughed to live her life, and I moved on. But I don't understand you. You went from someone who believed in long-term relationships, someone who wanted a family, to someone only interested in hookups and one-night stands. Why is that? Because the moment I lost my soulmate, I didn't believe I will find love. So I just wanted to enjoy what comes my way. Taylor nodded her head. She felt a pinch in her heart when he said that. She didn't know why she didn't like to hear that he will not fall in love again. Dean took Taylor's hand in his left hand, and with his right hand, he tilted her chin up and looked her straight in the eyes. This is what I believed before. He paused, his forest green eyes locked on her hazel eyes. Before what? she asked him hesitantly. Before I met you. Taylor was dumbfounded by his words. The only thing she could do was open her mouth and a fainted, Oh, escaped her lips. I believe there is something between us. I like you, Tay, a lot. No woman made me feel this mix of emotion before. And I am not being arrogant or anything, but I feel that you like me too. Let's spend more time together and see whether this chemistry can grow into something more. And to be perfectly clear, I genuinely want what you want, Tay, a serious relationship. What changed? You said that you don't do relationships. You changed me when you rejected me. I didn't reject you, Dean. I rejected your stupid offer. I know, I know. When you rejected my stupid offer, I felt as if I lost you before I even had you. The thought of not seeing you again, not holding you, pained me. I knew that I am not just infatuated by you, that I am not only attracted to you. There is something more happening between us. Why don't we give it a try? We can start by spending more time together to get to know each other. What do you think? Taylor was stunned. She could not take her eyes off him, but she could not answer either. She would never have expected that from him. So many thoughts were running through her head. Should she trust him? Should she give this a chance? But how can someone who's never had a committed relationship suddenly do it? Will he get bored and leave her? Will he break her heart? She felt that she could easily fall in love with him. She already had strong feelings for him, like she never had before, and this scared her even more. Tay, please, say something. Did I say anything that offended you? No, Dean, you said everything I would have loved to hear, she reassured him. But I'm scared, Dean. You don't do relationships. I don't do hookups. How would this work? In a relationship, I need to take my time to get to know you before, before you know, taking it to the next level. You can make me fall hard for you, then leave me because you're tired of waiting. I don't know. This is so confusing, Dean. He softly caressed her cheek with the back of his hand before pulling her in for a hug. I know. I am scared, too. I don't want to disappoint you, Tay. But you can be assured I won't get tired of waiting, as you put it. I am committed in this relationship, and I can promise you that I will always be honest with you. She took a deep breath and tightened her arms around his waist. So what do you say, Tay? Shall we give us a chance? Yes, she simply said, resting her head on his chest, melting into his embrace. Thank you, he replied, leaning down to kiss the top of her head. They stayed like that for a few minutes before he took a step back, grabbed her hand, and told her, Let's continue our night walk. And hand in hand they strolled along the river bank, enjoying the silence of the night and this new intimacy. When they reached her doorstep, she hugged him again and wished him good night. 
When she closed her door, her heart was racing. What are you doing to me, Dean Carter? She whispered with a big grin plastered on her face. Little did she know that on the other side of the door, Dean heard everything thanks to his werewolf hearing, and he was elated to hear her say those words. He could not stop smiling. The next day, she was awakened by heavy knocks on her door. She got up and headed to the door with her eyes still closed. We better be under attack, as this is the only acceptable reason for all this banging and for waking me up so early, she said as she opened the bedroom door. Oh, I see you're not a morning person, said a husky voice, the only voice that sends sparklers down her spine. Yes, my secret is out. Let me know if you can't handle it, she answered while heading back to bed. He was faster and grabbed her by the waist, pulling her to his chest. No, sleeping beauty, you are not going back to bed. You skipped the training session again, but you will not skip breakfast. But I am not hungry. Just go without me. No, I want my girlfriend next to me. She immediately opened her eyes, her heart banging faster than ever. Now she was fully awake and alert. She looked at him. What did you just call me? My girlfriend, what else? Now go get ready, but if you're tired, I will gladly help you shower and put your clothes on. She sprinted to the bathroom shouting, No thanks! I'll be ready in ten minutes! And she heard him laugh as she closed the door behind her. True to her word, ten minutes later she was ready and stepping out of her bedroom. She saw Dean waiting for her, leaning on the hallway wall next to her bedroom door. His hair was damp and he looked dashingly handsome in his black jeans and black shirt hugging his abs. Stop drooling, woman, she scolded herself. He moved closer and gave her a kiss on the cheek. Good morning, beautiful. Missed you already. Let's join the others for breakfast. He grabbed her by the waist and they headed to the stairs before she suddenly stopped. He looked at her, checking that everything was okay. Maybe we shouldn't enter the dining hall together. Might be better if no one knows yet, don't you think? I want everyone to know that we're together now. There is nothing to hide. But isn't it too early? Don't overthink it, Tay. We're together and I want the world to know. Plus... The girls should know that I'm off the market, otherwise they'll keep throwing themselves at me, he added with a smirk on his face. She playfully punched him on his chest. Or maybe you want the men to know that I am off limits now, she teased. Oh, believe me, sweetheart, the day I laid eyes on you, I warned every male in both packs that you are off limits. Taylor's face turned crimson red, and she buried her face in his chest. He hugged her tight. Then, with his hand on her waist, he pushed her gently down the stairs. When they reached the animated dining hall, everyone went silent. You could really hear a pin drop. Dean was unfazed. He tightened his grip on her waist, said good morning to the crowd, then ushered her to their now usual table, where they were welcomed by grins and knowing looks on their friends' faces. Taylor was relieved that Emma was not there yet, because she was not ready for that conversation. Everything was going too fast, but she liked it. Their friends did not pressure them to talk about their blooming relationship, and Taylor was genuinely grateful for that. She needed time to understand all those new feelings that Dean unleashed in her, and she needed time to prepare for the grilling Emma would undoubtedly put her through. Dean was pouring coffee in her mug when she got a phone call. That's work. I'll take the call outside, she said before she excused herself from her friends and went outside to find a less noisy spot. Hi, Simon. So you went MIA on us again? Yes, I'm sorry. I know that Emma is your BFF, but we need you here. Don't forget the huge project we just won. I didn't forget. I put a lot of sleepless nights working with you on that proposal, Simon. So when are you coming back?
we need to start working on the designs for their headquarters ASAP. Well, I cannot come back any time soon, Simon. I have to stay in Idaho for the moment. Are you kidding me, Taylor? Come on. You worked your ass off to win the deal. You're not bailing out on us now. We can't do it without you. You are the creative director, for crying out loud, and the co-owner of this company, might I remind you. Simon, calm down. I'm not bailing out. I'll have to work remotely. From here, I can draw the designs and email them to you. Taylor, we both know that we need your expert's eyes throughout the crafting and production process. What is keeping you in Idaho? What can she tell him? That she's on house arrest because she discovered a mind-blowing secret that would shake the world as we know it? Or that she might be falling head over heels for a werewolf? Telling the truth was out of the question, and she needed a convincing excuse or a diversion. Simon, you won't believe it. I found a 3D printer here in Idaho. I think it would be very useful for our current project and can help us with my current working from a distance situation. I can work on the design and send you a sample so you can follow the design and all the details for the furniture. You? Using a 3D printer? Who are you and what did you do to my friend? Oh, shut up, Simon. You using a 3D printer? I would like to see that and laugh seeing you struggle with technology. Ha ha, very funny. Let's go with this plan. Give me until tomorrow so I can work on my designs and we can video conference in the afternoon to go through the sketches that I would have scanned and emailed to you beforehand. But I can also print a few samples on the 3D printers and send them to you in express mail. Okay, I see I cannot convince you to come back to Dallas, so let's go with plan B. At what time will you call me? replied Simon, sighing and recognizing he will not be able to change his friend's mind. How about 5 p.m.? Okay, it's a date then. You bet it's a date, Simon. I'll be on time. She hung up and turned around to go back inside the pack house, only to find Dean looking at her with inquisitive eyes. It seems that he was also trying to contain his anger. She was confused at first, but after a few seconds, she understood. Let me guess, you heard me talking on the phone and you thought I was going on a date. Well, you said it. She laughed and gave him a hug. You are so cute when you're jealous, but I don't want a jealous boyfriend. She then explained to him the issue at work and the challenge with her big contract that they just won. I am sorry, Tay, that this situation is impacting your work, he said apologetically. You know what? I'm happy to be here. I won't lie to you. I am really happy. I'll make this alternative way of working function, and I think that your genius pack members will help me with the 3D printer and the virtual conference calls set up so that I'll meet the deadlines even from such a distance. We will support you in this, Tay. I just hope the customer will not insist on meeting face to face. Everything will be okay as long as they like the design samples and are okay to go the next steps, the full production. Okay, come, I want to show you. He took her to his office and when she went inside, she was surprised to see that he had installed a second desk. He changed the layout of his office to make room for two desks now. He added a desk for her. I knew that you'll need to work from here, especially after I saw you so happy by the 3D printer options. So I wanted to give you a good space for work, but also still get to see you every day. Taylor was moved by his gesture. He was so considerate. She jumped in his arms and hugged him tight. Dean, this is so, I mean, no one ever... Oh, damn it. Thank you so much, Dean. Thank you. Thank you. She couldn't find the words to express how grateful she was. No need to thank me, Tay. I'm being selfish here. 
I did all this to make sure that you're next to me all the time, even when working, he playfully replied. Are you going to move the 3D printers to your office as well? She teased him. No, silly. When you need to print, you can go see the team. But at least when you're working on your designs, we remain close together. He kissed her forehead, and she shivered. She never felt this way with any other man, and no one was so thoughtful. She looked at him, and she was overwhelmed with so many emotions. She did her best not to panic. This is going fast, so fast. But she was not scared anymore. She was happy. He made her happy. This is all that matters. So I understand you have a deadline. I'll let you work then. And for the rest of the day, Taylor was on full working hard mode. Taylor and Dean took a quick lunch together, and they continued working until late at night. She talked with Emma on the phone during her break, but she was mostly full concentrating and dedicated to her work. Dean was glancing at her from time to time. She was absorbed by her work, drawing on paper, then on her iPad, texting her team in Dallas. He was impressed by her work ethic, and even more impressed when she showed him the work in progress. This girlfriend was talented, and he was proud of her and happy to see her so passionate about her job. With the help of Matt and the lab team, she even managed to print a few samples on the 3D printer to give her carpenters a detailed view on the intricate design she wanted to incorporate in the furniture. Matt promised he'd send the designs by express mail to make sure her team will have them by noon the next day. After she finished her call with Simon and explained the first group of designs she already emailed them, she closed her eyes to rest a few seconds and unwind. This day has been hectic, and she still has a lot of work and sketches to finalize. Suddenly, she felt Dean's lips on her neck, kissing her softly as he wraps his arms around her shoulders. Long day at work, love? He asked her as he softly moved her hair and kissed her shoulders. Girlfriend, love... Those words of endearment went straight to her heart, but calling her love, that must be too fast, no? Could he really already be in love with her? How about her? She could not put a name on all the feelings boiling inside of her, but she felt love-struck, right? All this was too new for her, too different from her other relationships, and she was lost. And it's not finished yet, she replied as she turned to face him, leaning her head on his chest. I have to go have dinner with the pack. Will you be okay? Of course. Don't worry about me. I'm okay, she reassured him as she gave him a kiss on the lips. Five minutes later, the door opened and Dean was back. Forgot something? she asked. Just bringing you some food he responded softly as he put a trail of sandwiches and juice at the edge of her desk. He gave her a quick kiss on the lips and left to join his pack members, not giving her time to recover from this gesture and thank him. She was overwhelmed by his continuous concern for her well-being. It was a simple gesture, but it meant the world to her. At 11 p.m. he came back. He was in his workout gear, and he looked all sweaty and hot. Let me guess, you went to the gym, she said when she saw him enter the office. You already know me so well, love. I'm jealous. Well, tomorrow evening, we can go together once you deliver your first deadline. Have you progressed? Yes, I think I'm almost finished. Do you mind if I look? He checked every paper, every design, scrutinizing every detail. When he finished, he looked at her visibly proud. You know that you are amazing? Every single design, every furniture you created is unique, and like a story that continues and is palpable across the designs. You noticed it! Yes! 
I created this wave-like movement in the furniture from the welcome desk to the bookcases to the desks and the chairs in the offices. I wanted a theme that goes with their industry as the customer is a shipping company, replied Taylor, all excited to see that Dean liked her idea and noticed the storyline in her designs. Once you finish this big contract of yours, I'd like to hire you to redesign the company offices, but also our office here and our room. Did she hear him right? Did he just say, our room? Taylor tried not to blush, but she failed. Her cheeks turned red and her heart was pounding in her chest. He cupped her cheeks with his palms and leaned down, giving her a thorough and passionate kiss on the lips, before saying, It's almost midnight, love. Let's go and rest now. You can continue your hard work tomorrow, he added, grabbing her hand and pulling her up. But, Dean, I still have... You've been working nonstop, Tay. You need to rest. Come, let's go to bed. When they reached her bedroom door, he let go of her hand and said, I'll take a quick shower and join you. And before she could answer, he left. Taylor was a bit nervous. She was not ready for anything else yet. They cannot move that fast. Plus, she was truly tired after this long day of work. She had just finished her shower when she heard knocking on her door. Dean was standing there, shirtless, and with just gray sweatpants on. Taylor gulped, looking at his chiseled chest, his damp hair. Midnight snack, milady? he asked with his most disarming smile. Chocolate? I would never say no to that. Come in, laughed Taylor, trying to compose herself. They sat on the couch, and he put the trail mix on the coffee table. So how was your day, Dean? Mixed feelings. It was great sharing my office with you. I could look at you whenever I wanted. But it was also frustrating because I could not do that whenever I wanted. And before she could reply, he leaned in and crushed his lips to hers. The passionate kiss deepened as the seconds passed by. He plunged his tongue in her mouth, exploring every inch of it. She was melting in his arms, her hands playing with his hair, kissing him back with all that she got. Her kisses sent him over the edge. He wanted to control himself, to just kiss her and take it slow, as she said. But he was losing control as her tongue flirted with his. He trailed kisses down her neck, and his arms played with the edge of her shirt. Her heart was beating like crazy. She was going crazy in his arms. But she had to stop it now, otherwise there is no turning back. She softly grabbed his face with her hands and pulled him up. He was looking at her with hungry eyes. She gently kissed him on the lips and pulled away from him. I'm sorry, Dean, for not finding the time for us, my work. Don't ever be sorry for working and fulfilling your dream. You are so talented, love. Thanks, Dean. Not everyone understands my passion for work. I feel you do get me probably because you had to build your companies from scratch as well. Indeed, it was not easy, but all the sleepless nights, all the hard work paid off in the end. Before she could answer, her smartphone vibrated, indicating she received a message. She looked at the phone and told him, Just one second, it's Emma. If I don't reply in the next 30 seconds, she'll go into panic mode. Tell me about it. She harassed me today. She couldn't come to see you since you're busy, so she decided to harass me through MindLink and text messages. Make sure Tay has eaten. Remind her you are ready to support for 3D printing, otherwise she will not ask. Is she hydrating properly? Am I hydrating? That's the funniest and weirdest thing that she's said, chuckled Taylor as she rested her head on Dean's chest and he wrapped his arms around her. Taylor was standing in the lab looking at the chaos she created, all red with embarrassment. Matt and three IT specialists were trying to bring the computer back on and to repair the 3D printer. 
she had pestered Matt all morning to let her work by herself on the 3D printer, but all she got was a blue screen twice on the computer, and she sent the printer in a continuous reboot cycle. In hindsight, she should not have insisted on using technology on her own, and certainly not today. She was absent-minded all day, smiling stupidly and thinking about her night with Dean. They spent the night cuddling and talking. They must have stayed up until 3 a.m. when they slept in each other's arms. Their relationship seemed to be moving to the next level of intimacy and their bond getting stronger. She woke up in his arms, her head resting on his shoulder. She opened her eyes, yawning, rubbing her eyes with her hands when she heard a low chuckle. She looked up and saw Dean looking lovingly at her. Good morning, beautiful. Why are you laughing? You look like a cute kitten when you wake up. I'm not sure it's a compliment coming from a werewolf. It's a compliment coming from your boyfriend. Taylor, Taylor, earth calling Taylor, said Matt, waving his hand in front of her. What? S sorry, Matt, I didn't hear you. I noticed. You've been out of it all day. What are you thinking about? Um, of the mess I just did in your lab. I'm so sorry, Matt. Don't beat yourself up, Taylor. This type of technical failure happens more often than not. Plus, I have been warned by Luna Emma of the risks, and I accepted them, he winked at Taylor. Actually, Miss Taylor, we've got a new nickname for you. Magneto! said Julian, one of the IT specialists working on fixing the 3D printer. As in the villain in the X-Men? gasped Taylor. No, not because he's the villain. Come on, just because you're like a mutant that has no electromagnetic field power and can damage any electronic device she puts her hands on, teased Matt. Okay, I think I'll be able to bring it back up and running shortly, exclaimed Julian before adding, but I advise Miss Taylor to give the instruction and let Matt do the actual work on the machines as a precaution. Taylor was turning all colors of red and silently praying for the ground to open and swallow her. She was mortified for bringing such extra work on the team, all due to her clumsiness when it comes to technology. She was still thinking about the mess she created when she felt someone grabbing her by the waist and holding her tight to his chiseled chest. I heard my girlfriend is facing some technical problems in the lab, and by the fifty shades of red I see on your face, I get that this rumor is true, whispered Dean in her ear as he planted a trail of butterfly kisses on her neck and shoulders. Oh, my God, please don't tell me everyone is talking about my debacles in the lab, sighed Taylor as she buried her face in his neck. No, kitten, just Matt. He mind-linked me to tell me about your misfortunes and that you're still flustered despite everything they said to reassure you. So he asked me to come and soothe my girlfriend, and I gladly obliged. I am so sorry for all the trouble I gave them, I am beyond embarrassed, Dean, murmured Taylor. I think you have the perfect excuse, love. What excuse? My clumsiness, or should I say my curse? Dean shook his head, his eyes twinkling. No, kitten, no. Your excuse is that you could not get me out of your head, and you were reminiscing how you slept in my arms last night, and how you woke up in my arms this morning. Taylor blushed, for the thousandth time today. She looked at him all confused. How did he know? Is this a werewolf thing? Can he read her mind because she is his girlfriend now? I didn't know, but your red cheeks just confirmed it. Dean teased her as if he read her mind. Taylor froze for a second, her eyes wide open, realizing that she got played by her boyfriend. She then hit him playfully on the shoulder before laughing and burying her head in his embrace. Dean, how could you? And it was my pleasure to tease you like that. You look so cute all embarrassed, kitten. 
we need to talk about this kitten nickname. Why should we? I've also been thinking all day about the cutest kitten who woke up in my arms this morning. But don't worry, I'll also continue calling you love. He teased her as he caressed her hair and kissed her temple. He kept her in his arms until Matt and his team completed the finishing touch on the system. When the lab team was ready to work with Taylor, he gave her a final kiss and said, I see that duty calls. I'll let you work with Matt and the team. I have a meeting downtown today, but give me a call if you need anything. Um, I don't have your phone number. You are a bad girlfriend. I have yours, he added teasingly. How? H how did you get my phone number? Why did you get my phone number? When? He laughed as he grabbed his phone and speed dialed her. He showed her his screen, and her number was listed under the name My Heart Emoji. When her phone rang, he hung up. You better save it under a good nickname. So I understand that Dean Carter is out of the question? Don't disappoint me, kitten. He winked at her before giving her a quick kiss on the nose and heading to the exit door. How about my boyfriend? She almost yelled to make sure he heard her. He raised his thumb down in disapproval as he continued walking out of the lab. Kitten, you can do better, he yelled as he left the building, teasing her. She still had a stupid grin on her face when she turned around to face Matt and the lab geniuses, as she called them. They all looked at her and laughed. It seems we'll be getting a Luna very soon, they teased her. What? Stop it! Um, okay, let's focus on the designs. We lost a lot of time already, and yes, I know because of you, she added ruefully. Yes, yes, future Luna, let's do that, replied Matt mischievously. The rest of the day was dedicated to printing a few additional samples on the 3D printer, focusing on the welcome deck and conference room furniture. Like yesterday, Matt committed to send the samples in expedited mail to her workshop in Dallas, and Taylor spent her afternoon talking with Simon to discuss the new sketches she emailed yesterday evening and to estimate the quantity of materials that will be needed for the headquarters redesign, as well as the cost and timeline. The lab personnel were leaving when she finished her conference call with Simon and her team in Dallas. As she was collecting her drawings and papers, she felt a hand on her hair. She looked up and saw Dean. Done for the day? Do you want to go to the gym? No, I don't think so. I'm a bit tired. Good, because I have planned a romantic dinner for the two of us. Come. They walked hand in hand to the rooftop, where Dean had set a table in a secluded location for more privacy. Emma called me three times today. She believes that I'm trying to steal you from her. Don't tell her, but my pack and I are indeed planning to steal you from her. Taylor laughed. Yes, I know. She told me the same thing. She warned me not to fall into your trap. Didn't you tell her it's too late now? No, this is not a discussion to have on the phone. God, please tell me you didn't update her on our relationship status. Why, are you ashamed of me? Dean, how can you say that? It's just that I should be the one informing her. She is my best friend, after all. I know, love. I'm just teasing you. You are very feisty today, Mr. Carter. Waking up with you in my arms does that to me. He winked at her. She blushed and took a sip of her wine, trying to recollect herself, when he took her hand in his. I am genuinely happy, Tay, more than I have ever been in my whole life. He kissed her palm and then kept their hands intertwined. Those two days were amazing, Dean. The little time we've spent together was already magical. You get me, and I'm happy to see that despite the limited free time I had, you enjoyed it with me. Tay, I have never felt so much serenity and happiness than the last two days with you. Yet we didn't do much. He reached out and tucked a stray hair from her face. 
Just imagine the fireworks of emotions we would have felt if we had had more free time, he murmured as he ran his fingertips on her cheek ever so softly. The romantic dinner was followed by their now traditional evening walk in the forest, enjoying together the silence of the night and staring at the sky. Once they came back home, Dean kissed her goodnight at the doorstep of her bedroom. She looked at him and kissed him on the lips. He was a bit surprised at first, and he kissed her back. The kiss deepened, becoming more passionate. He felt that he had to stop, otherwise he would not be able to control himself anymore. His wolf wanted to go to the surface and make love with her all night, and he had to fight himself and his wolf to take it slow, as he had promised her. It's best to stop now, love. If we continue further, it would be impossible for me to stop. Who said I want you to stop? She opened the door for her room and grabbed him by his tie, gently pulling him inside. Are you sure? I don't want to jeopardize what we've built so far, he whispered. Yes, Dean, I am sure. Limited alcohol in my system, no drugs in my blood. I am not sleepy. I really know what I'm doing. He laughed, and in one swift move, he grabbed her by the waist and pulled her closer to him. He cupped her face in his hand and leaned in, kissing her passionately, hungry to taste her further, to explore her body, to bury himself deep inside her. He ravished her mouth, his tongue exploring deep into her mouth, her tongue flirting with his. The passionate kiss went on forever, until they pulled apart, panting and trying to catch their breath. He looked at her with a hungry gaze and pulled her back into his arms, attacking her neck with open mouth kisses, his hands venturing under her shirt. Love, are you sure about that? Afterwards, there will be no coming back, he whispered as he nibbled her neck, trailing to her collarbone. He heard her sighing, and then she said in a trembling voice, I think you are right, Dean. We need to stop now before it's too late. I am so sorry. Dean froze as if his blood was sucked out of him in a nanosecond. He was mentally cursing and thinking of the cold shower he'll have to take all night to cool his desires down. He sighed and gave her a last and soft kiss on her collarbone before pulling away and meeting her eyes. No worry, love. I promise... He stopped mid-sentence as he saw the mischievous smile on her face. She was teasing him. He could not believe she pulled such a joke on him, right in the middle of their passionate making out. Oh, you did not just mess with me. Have you no mercy, woman? He said as he attacked her neck again. Well, you couldn't st stop talking. I, I thought you wanted an... An excuse to back down. She could hardly talk as he was taking her on a passionate ride, kissing her senselessly, caressing her back, kneading her bra-covered breasts. She moaned in pleasure. Her body felt as if it was on fire. She moved her body closer to him, clutching onto him, grinding her hips against his, and they both moaned. Her left hand frantically grabbed his hair as the other one moved up and down his back. She started undressing him, grazing his neck sensually and slowly at the same time. He grunted. He was on edge. His desire was untamable by now. He wanted her. All of her. As they were taking their clothes off, he moved her toward the bed and gently placed her there, towering on top of her, not breaking their kisses once. They take their time kissing. He explored every inch of her body. She did the same. They were already addicted to each other. After what seems like an eternity, both their bodies wanted more. The heat became unbearable, and Dean made her his, joining their bodies together. 
moon goddess. Love, you feel so good, said Dean, panting and moving inside of her. He intertwined his fingers with hers, pinning her hands deep on the mattress, ravaging her body, and she joined him in this dance of love, both discovering a whirlwind of unknown sensations. Their erratic breathing filled the air, their moans and groans taking over, his husky voice calling her name over and over again, her trembling voice calling him, asking for more, their bodies moving faster, everything increasing crescendo, until their bodies tensed up, and the wave of pleasure flooded through them as they both reached their high. He rested his body on hers, trying not to crush her with his weight, not ready to separate their bodies yet. They are both still panting, his forehead on hers, eyes closed, savoring the intense pleasure they just experienced. After a few minutes, he rolled over, his back on the mattress. Taylor felt cold, suddenly missing the warmth of his body, when he softly pulled her closer to him, wrapping his arms around her body, resting her head on his chest. She could hear his heart racing, clearly still high from their passionate ride. She smiled, happy to know that he was as breathless as she was. He held her tight in his embrace as he kissed her head and whispered, I love you, Taylor Smith. Her heart skipped a beat. Did she hear him right? Did he just say that? Isn't it too soon? She raised her head and looked intensely at his mesmerizing forest green eyes, searching for a sign that all this was real, that she did not dream all of it. He chuckled and reiterated, Yes, I said I love you, kitten, and don't feel compelled to, I love you too, Dean Carter, she promptly replied as she leaned on her elbow and reached out to kiss him fervently. As the kiss deepened, the fire ignited again inside both, and he pushed her softly on the mattress again, abandoning themselves to this burning desire consuming them. Taylor has been on cloud nine since that night. Anyone who saw Dean and Taylor knew that they were deeply in love and closer than ever. Although Taylor was still facing a tight deadline and grueling work schedule, it was not possible to see either of them alone. They would work in the office together, eat together, go on their daily walks hand in hand, with Taylor's head resting on his shoulder. And at night, Dean would sleep with her in her room, exploring their bodies further, becoming one, not just physically, but emotionally as well. It was endearing to watch them together, and the River Moon Pack members were all considering Taylor as their Luna already, treating her with the respect due to a Luna and asking for her opinion and advice. One afternoon, as Taylor was engrossed in her sketches, the office door opened with a bang, and Emma rushed inside with a frown, pleading her forehead. "'Taylor Mary Smith, you have some explaining to do,' she shouted. "'This is my cue to leave,' said Dean as he gave Taylor a quick peck on the lips and rushed outside, closing the door behind him. "'Coward!' yelled Taylor, shaking her head and smiling. "'Seriously, Tay, I must hear the rumors from pack members?' "'What rumors?' "'That my best friend and brother-in-law are an item.' Taylor blushed and cleared her throat. Oh, well, it's not something that I could tell you on the phone, and you haven't been visiting lately. Don't turn that on me, Miss Smith, or should I say Mrs. Carter. Emma, don't get ahead of yourself. We just started our relationship. That's not what I heard. If I remember correctly, they used the words crazy in love and head over heels for each other. And some said that you're moving permanently to River Moon Pack. 
Well, this is definitely a rumor. We have not talked at all about what the future holds. We're enjoying the present for now. Emma narrowed her eyes, scrutinizing Taylor for a few seconds, before opening her eyes wide in realization. Oh, moon goddess, you slept with him already. Emma, please lower your voice. God, you are embarrassing me. Now everyone will know. Relax, I don't smell any presents nearby. Taylor sighed in relief. It is already embarrassing enough that people are talking about her relationship with Dean and spreading rumors. The irony, Tay, you criticized my relationship with Liam, saying we were moving too fast, and here you are, already sleeping with him, already in love with him. I didn't say I was in love. Tay, it's me you're talking to. Um, okay, come sit. I'll tell you everything, said Taylor. When Taylor finished narrating her blooming love story with Dean, Emma hugged her tight. I am so happy for you, Tay. You don't think any more that he's not the guy for me, murmured Taylor. Emma's warnings were always on Taylor's mind, worried that someday she would wake up from this dream and Dean would have crushed her heart. Tay, the Dean you are describing today did not exist in the past. He never said the L word to anyone. He never committed to anyone. But I do know that he has always been honest. He would not express his love for you if it were not true. I know him. I 100% trust him. I just hope it lasts, whispered Taylor. Hey, Tay, trust your instincts and your heart. They never steered you wrong, added Emma, squeezing Taylor's hand in support. Thanks, Em. Uh, how about you? What did I miss? Is lover boy treating you well? Winked Taylor. Yes, our relationship has never been better. I am genuinely happy with him, Tay. Plus, I'm working now in his software company. I'm leading the team developing a new CRM tool. Cool! Great to see you putting your talent to good use, replied Taylor, happy for her friend. Two weeks later... Taylor was anxious. She had a video call with the shipping company, her deal-changer customer. When the customer received her company's sample designs and detailed presentation, he requested a video call with her and Simon. He did not share any other comments with them, which made Taylor nervous. She was worried. Why did the customer insist on organizing a video call? Is there a problem with their proposal? This would have been her big break and would propel her company into a new level. Taylor was pacing around in the conference room, watching Matt and the team as they set up the video conferencing details. They had Simon live already from Dallas, and they were doing the last configurations before the customer joined. Have faith in yourself, Taylor. Remember what I told you about your designs. They are really exceptional. Trust your gut and run this conference as the winner that you are, said Dean as he pulled her in a comforting embrace. We're all sure that you will convince the customer with your creative ideas. Just, um, don't touch anything. You are a computer slayer added Matt, half serious, half joking. Matt made her laugh and forget a bit about her stress. This project meant a lot for Taylor. It could help her expand into interior design and, who knows, maybe open another branch in, say, Idaho? Since her discussion with Emma, she's been thinking about means to stay in Idaho next to Dean. She knew it was too early to think about that, that she was getting ahead of herself, but she wanted to have options when this discussion comes to the table. And expanding her business is a good option and a great excuse to extend her stay in River Moon. At least it's a better option than just being on house arrest forever. Dean planted a kiss on her neck and whispered, 
I have to go to my conference with Liam and the Alphas. Will you be okay, love? Yes, of course. Thank you, Dean. I will come to update you when we finish our call. Dean had an important call with Liam and the Alphas from the PAX in Idaho. They set the call through an encrypted channel to secure their exchange from eavesdropping, and it was a conference room on the same floor as Taylor's. Taylor, we're ready for you. The customer will be online shortly. Taylor took a deep breath and nodded, signaling to Matt that she's ready. Mr. Potter, it's a pleasure to see you. The pleasure is mine, Ms. Smith and Mr. Vaughn. I got your updated proposal with the sample designs and the 3D printings highlighting the logo's shape and the intricate layouts you created. And what do you think, Mr. Potter? asked Taylor carefully. Well, I think you proved me wrong. Oh? I was convinced about your talent, and I knew you would do something good, but you exceeded all our expectations. She sighed, relieved. Even Matt standing behind the web camera did a thumbs-up gesture, all happy for her. I wanted to talk with you personally to thank you for that. I would like you to work on the California and Florida offices. And let's not wait until you finish the work on the headquarter offices. Thank you for your trust. We're already expanding and cover more locations if you wish us to do so. Yes, let's do that. Mrs. Cox will liaise with your team to coordinate the work on both sites. By the way, you should have received an email with a testimony from our PR team that you can put on your website to share our customer satisfaction. It's hard to impress me, Ms. Smith, yet you did it with Mr. Vaughn. Thank you, Mr. Potter. We will prove worthy of your trust, added Simon. They continued their conference call for 30 minutes to agree on the project's milestones and the next steps. When they closed the line, Taylor immediately took the phone, scrolling in her email inbox to find Mr. Potter's email, and she was so happy when she read the write-up of the customer testimony. I need to go and show Dean. Where is he, Matt? She asked, all excited. He is in the conference room, the Newton one, but you can't go now. She was already sprinting down the hallway searching for the meeting room. As soon as she found the Newton conference room, she barged in. Dean, Dean, the conference was excellent. The customer is very satisfied. He wants us to work on two sites already and doesn't even want to wait until we finish the HQ redesign. He even insisted on sharing a customer testimony. Look, look, we exceeded their expectation. Exquisite design adapted to the company culture and mission statement. Highly recommended. Oh, God, Dean, I am so happy. She hugged him tight when she finished her small monologue. Um, Tay, I'm overjoyed, Dean. Oh, I need to go and tell Emma. I'm already here and heard everything. Taylor was surprised to hear Emma's voice. She turned around and saw a giant screen with many people connected. She recognized some of the alphas who attended the Silver Moon and saw Emma and Liam sitting together in one screen box. Oh my God, I am so sorry. The alpha of the Red Moon Pack laughed. Miss Taylor, happy to see you again and congratulations. Once you have finished the design for your customers, we want to see pictures. We might have some work for you in our pack. Yes, of course, with pleasure, replied Taylor, all blushing. Alpha Dean is very lucky, teased the Alpha of Crescent Moon Pack. I am indeed, replied Dean, as he pulled Taylor in for a hug. Now, if you can excuse me, I need to go out to congratulate my girlfriend properly, and I'll be back shortly, added Dean in a lighthearted tone. He grabbed Taylor's hand and walked with her to leave the conference room. She, however, leaned to the side a bit to be in the camera's line and said, Sorry again for interrupting your call, Elphas. See you soon. As they went outside the conference room, Taylor gently jabbed Dean's ribs with her elbow. 
Why didn't you tell me? You didn't give me a chance to say a word, he chuckled. He leaned in and kissed her, a deep and mind-blowing kiss, like the ones he always gave her. Wait for me. We've got to celebrate tonight, he winked before heading to the conference room again. A week later, Emma and Taylor were sitting on the lake shore, reading and chatting. Emma could not contain her laughs. Why are you laughing? asked Taylor, confused. You can't stop smiling. A stupid smile, I might add. You are so smitten and fallen head over heels for him, giggled Emma. Yes, guilty as charged, said Taylor, blushing. Emma raised her brows, signaling to Taylor that she wanted more than this short answer. Taylor was hesitant. She was truly happy, but the past few days she had an unsettling feeling, maybe because Dean was overbooked and driving frequently to the city, and they're not spending as much time together as before. I am very happy, Emma. Those three weeks have been amazing. Dean has been an amazing boyfriend, watching out for me if I'm working too much, making sure I have enough sleep, making sure we spend enough time together. Intimacy is great. Yeah, I have all the rights to stupidly smile. I am so happy for you, Tay. You deserve such happiness. But I am jealous. I don't see you that much anymore, pouted Emma. Yes, yes, I know. It's frustrating me, too. But with the house arrest, I must stay here at the River Moon. And with my work, Dean, and the pack, I've limited time on my hand, replied Taylor apologetically. What do you mean, the pack? I have been socializing a bit with everyone, and I've run several projects for them. I helped build a library for the schools, participated in a career day with them. I even taught a few classes on woodwork. Well, the Silver Moon Pack and I want to see you more often, sulked Emma. When the house arrest ends, I will definitely spend some time with you there. And then what? When all of this is over, when you are free to go, are you going to stay or leave and go back to Dallas? I genuinely don't know, sighed Taylor. She was still considering opening a second branch here, and she even drafted a concise business plan and ran the numbers to see if she could make money from such a venture. And the numbers added up, especially now that her work for Mr. Potter was moving smoothly, and the customer testimony he gave them generated many inquiries from potential big customers. She was convinced that this branching out option would generate good reviews. But the thing is, to this day, Dean never asked her to stay for good. They never discussed the after-house arrest phase. Dean never opened the topic, never asked about where their relationship is going, never mentioned the future. He seemed to be a guy that lived in the moment. At least, this is what Taylor hoped for. Otherwise, it would mean that he didn't care about the future of their relationship. But he did care, didn't he? He seemed to be genuinely invested in this relationship. He was still as thoughtful and considerate as the first day. Well, minus the past three days. Maybe he didn't see the house arrest ending any time soon. From what she remembered, he told her that the rogues are still evading all of their attempts to track them. Where are you all with this investigation, Emma? asked Taylor, praying that the stalling in the investigation would explain Dean's nonchalant attitude toward their future together. We have been exploring the entire region with the support of all the packs, and we've been able to identify many of the rogues' hideouts, but their strategy is to scatter and not have one pack or one location. They're split in multiple areas. And everywhere we've searched so far, we've only found a couple of rogues, and no information, no maps, nothing. Plus, the prisoners are not talking, even when we... Emma stopped abruptly with an embarrassed look on her face. Even when you are torturing them, you mean? Emma is surprised.
You know? Yes, Dean explained to me how difficult it is to get the information you need. You know, Em, if there was a Werewolves United Nations organization, you would have been judged for war crime and torture. Well, there has never been compassion for the rogues anyway. But now with this latest bloody attack, no one has second thoughts of doing anything possible to stop them before they attack us again, said Emma, trying to justify. Dean told me that in addition to raiding rogues' hideaways, you were reviewing the Alpha Council's rulings? Yes, but to be honest, it's mostly Dean who is going through all the rulings. He believes that we need to understand who our enemy is and what motivates him or her. Apparently, a certain human gave him this piece of advice, winked Emma. Taylor laughed as she looked at her mobile to check the time. By the way, Emma, three River Moon members will be joining us soon for afternoon snacks. What? I have to share my already limited time with you? Come on, Emma, they've given us four hours alone, and they're joining us just for the last final hour. They look up to you a lot, the famous Silver Moon Luna. Don't try to get to me with flattery, scoffed Emma playfully, hitting Taylor on the shoulder. Where is Dean, by the way? added Emma. He has a lot of meetings downtown lately. I don't know why, though. It's been going on for the past three days, and he comes home quite late in the evening, so we hardly talk. Oh, I wasn't aware. Maybe they have a new contract with humans. I don't know. Maybe, replied Taylor in a skeptical tone. Tay, is there a problem? asked Emma as she saw worry and uncertainty in Taylor's eyes. No, no, I was just telling you that I'm happier than I've ever been, so no, there's no problem at all. But I don't know. We both have grueling work schedules, but we always manage to find time for each other. Yet the past three days, we hardly spoke. He comes back very late at night. I'm already sleeping. I'm reading too much into it, right? I think you should ask this question to Dean directly, Tay. I don't think there is much to read into, but it would be best for you to communicate openly and clearly any misunderstandings. Don't make the same mistakes I did by keeping to yourself and not talking with your man. Taylor knew that Emma was right. She should talk with Dean directly. Maybe ask him more about this project with the humans. He might be facing some business challenges, and who knows, she could help him. The rest of the afternoon went by smoothly, laughing and bounding with Emma, Taylor, and Taylor's new friends, Tristan, Charlotte, and Bella. At the end of the day, as they were packing to leave the lakeside, Taylor received a text message from a hidden number. You are wondering where your man is going every day? Why don't you go and check for yourself? Tomorrow, 4 p.m., Eugene Garfield Square, downtown. Better be on time if you want the truth. Taylor paled when she saw the message. What could this be about? What are they insinuating? She tried to keep a cool facial expression, but a turmoil was rising on the inside. Bad news? asked Emma as she noticed her friend's face. No, no, it's for work, hastily replied Taylor as she continued packing up, trying to hold it all together. But as soon as she got to her room, she called Dean, unable to hold it any longer. She wanted to talk with him as soon as possible, to question him about the message she received, to get answers for the past unusual three days. Dean did not answer. She called him four times, but he never answered. She tried to find a reasonable excuse. He was in a meeting and couldn't answer. He had put his phone on mute, right? After her fourth attempt to reach him, she gave up and decided to go to the gym to blow off some steam. Unfortunately, it didn't help much as her mind kept racing, imagining the unimaginable. A few hours later, Taylor was sleepless in bed, wondering who the sender of this message is and what could this person mean. They cannot be insinuating Dean was cheating on her. Not Dean. No way. 
By midnight, Taylor had given up on sleep, her mind drifting constantly to Dean. What is happening with him? Her gut feeling told her something is wrong. Dean seemed away, even when he was physically present. For the past three days, he would wake up in the early morning and work out for hours. Then he would go to his conference calls or meetings with his pack or neighboring packs, one meeting after the other, until the time comes to head to the city. She sighed. Did he get bored already? He doesn't do relationships, right? So he might be bored by now. Maybe he's no longer attracted to her. They used to make love almost every night. He could not keep his hands off her, and now he hardly spent time with her. Should she tell Dean about the message, or should she try to leave the pack, despite the house arrest, and go to the meeting point? Or... She froze as the bedroom door opened and Dean entered the room, sporting a tired face. He was surprised to see her awake. Good evening, love. Why are you still awake? I wanted to see you, Dean. Apparently this is the only option at hand since you don't answer my calls, nor do you call me back. She replied bitterly as she sat up in the bed and rested her head on the bed headboard. He looked at her with candid surprise in his eyes as he reached for his phone and checked the missed calls. I am sorry, love. I put my phone on mute and didn't check it since I left for the city. He walked to her and sat next to her on the bed. Had I heard the phone ringing, I would have answered. You know that, right? Why have you been going to the city the past three days, Dean, and coming back so late? He caressed her cheek and rested his forehead on hers. Tay, the past three days have been excruciating. Can we not talk about them now? I promise I will tell you everything tomorrow evening, but now I just want you in my arms. He leaned in to kiss her and she melted in his arms. He kneeled on the bed and pulled at her legs to lay her flat on her back. She gasped, taken by surprise, as he leaned over her, kissing and nuzzling his way to her collarbone. He made love to her that night passionately, as if he were craving her body, as if he had found his way back to her and he had no intentions of letting her go. He buried his head in the crook of her neck, slamming into her, going deep inside her. She was moaning, her body in sync with his. She clung to him tightly, whimpering with the fire he ignited inside of her, ready for the fireworks. The next morning, Taylor woke up alone in bed, again. But this time, Dean left her a red rose and a message on her nightstand. Sorry, love, I have an early meeting with the Crimson Moon Pack, and in the afternoon I'm heading to the city. But tonight you and I are having a romantic dinner at the rooftop, and we can talk about anything, and I will answer all of your questions. Promise. Love you, kitten. Your Dean. Taylor smiled reading his message. Last night was magical, the communion of their bodies and souls. She was convinced that they would not have experienced this level of physical intimacy if he had any doubt of their relationship. Maybe convinced is not the right word because she could not completely ignore the text message received yesterday. She wanted to talk about it today with Dean, but he had to go early. She looked again at his message and smiled as she smelled the beautiful red rose he left for her her Dean. She was smiling all morning, yet from time to time she would also think about the anonymous message. By the afternoon, the message was still eating at her brain. She could not take it anymore, and she went to find Tristan. Tristan, can you please bring my car to River Moon Pack? Yes. Why? I want to do a quick trip downtown. What? Why? Listen, it, it's a surprise. I want to buy a few gifts for Dean and Emma. You can order online. 
No, I can't. For me, part of the gift buying process is putting in an effort, not just clicking on a website. And anyway, I want to buy some good wood samples for the 3D printer. Yeah, yes, I know. I can also order them online. But I need them for tomorrow morning, and I can't wait. But, Taylor, you are under house arrest. You can't leave the packland. Come on, Tristan. Who would know? The house arrest is to make sure I wouldn't flee and run away. I'm not sure, Taylor. What does Dean think of this? Dean is on his regular outings and unreachable. Look, if you want, we can go together. You'll be next to me all the time. You can even tie me to you if you want, she giggled playfully. But I really need to go there before 4 p.m. to avoid the after-work rush, she added. Tristan was a bit hesitant. The decision of their PAC's leaders are sacred. But given everything that Taylor has been doing for their community, a few hours in the city is not that much. And he will be with her anyway. After a few minutes, he nodded. Okay, I will take you. No need to take your car. I'll drive us to the city and stay by your side throughout the outing. When they reached downtown, he parked his car and asked her, So which store do you want to visit first? I have all the addresses, but before we start shopping, I want to visit Eugene Garfield Square. I've been told it's a nice spot. Yes, it is a nice meeting point with many cafes and restaurants, acknowledged Tristan as he walked with her towards Eugene Garfield Square. When they reached the square, Taylor was scanning the area, looking for answers, as the message put it. She was chatting with Tristan and looking around when she noticed that Tristan halted on the spot. His eyes were open wide, and he looked shocked. She even noticed a hint of anger and disgust in his eyes. She followed his glare to understand what happened to him, and then she saw it. And she could physically feel her heart break. Dean was sitting on a secluded bench with a beautiful blonde next to him. They stood up and walked for a few steps. It seemed as if the woman was talking to him before they both stopped. They looked into each other's eyes, and the girl tiptoed, and kissed Dean on the lips. This cannot be happening. Tristan grabbed Taylor's hand and told her to leave, but she could not move. She was looking in horror on what was unfolding in front of her. Dean froze as the girl was kissing him. He smelled too familiar scents. Someone from his pack was here, but it also felt as if Taylor was nearby. He started looking around until his eyes locked on Taylor's eyes, eyes full of anger, disappointment, and sorrow. Are you okay, Dean? asked the woman. Dean could not say a word. This must be a nightmare. Taylor cannot be here. He walked away from the woman, heading towards Taylor and Tristan. Taylor started moving forward, her fists clenched, disgust in her eyes and anger running through her entire body. Taylor, please let me explain, interjected Dean when they were close enough. What is there to explain, Dean? Please, Tay, it's not what you think. What I think? What I saw is crystal clear. If I had not seen it with my own eyes, I would never have believed that you would do that to me. If someone had sent me photos of you two kissing, I would not have believed them. I would have said that the pictures were photoshopped. But I saw you with my own eyes, Dean. Taylor, please. So this is why you've been going to the city for the past several days. What is wrong with you? shuddered Taylor in disgust, pushing him with both her hands as tears were running down her cheeks. What kind of horrible person are you? She spat, pushing at him again. Please listen to me. He tried to hold her hand, but she pushed him away. Let me go, you, you pig, she said, punching him in the face. I hate you. How could you do this? To me? To us? What was I, a joke? A game for you? You played with my emotions, my feelings. Fuck, Dean. You made love to me yesterday evening. She yelled, all worked up. 
Taylor, how could you do this to me, Dean? She whispered between two sobs. She could not believe what is happening. She wished it were just a nightmare, but she knew this was real, too real, too painful. She could not contain her anger any more. She was fuming, appalled by his betrayal. She punched him again, busting his lower lip, and she kicked him in the balls. The blonde came running, worried for Dean. Oh, my moon goddess, Dean, honey, are you okay? This made Taylor more disgusted than ever. She could not stay and see this woman all over him. She could not stay and hear his excuses. She could not stay and let him and this woman see her pain and her tears. So she ran. She ran away as fast as she could. Tristan was too shocked to move. He was looking at his alpha, disappointment in his eyes. How could Dean do this to Taylor? This woman was exceptional, cheating on her and with Savannah. Tristan could not believe this. Dean was still in pain from Taylor's kick. He took a deep breath and asked Tristan, Tristan, she wouldn't want to see me now. Go after her. She does not know this city. She could easily get lost. Find her and bring her back to the pack house. I will meet you there. Do not talk and do not let her talk with anyone. Understood? Tristan nodded and left, following Taylor's scent to find her. Dean looked at Savannah. I have to go. Who is she? Is this Taylor you were telling me about? It is good news that she knows now, right? Now you can give us a chance. Savannah, not now, growled Dean. Dean, I am your soulmate, not her, me. She is a human for crying out loud. You cannot choose her. Wake up. I need to find her. She wasn't supposed to find out this way, damn it. She saw you kissing me. She must have gotten it all wrong. Dean yelled and left, leaving behind a disappointed Savannah. Dean was following Tristan's and Taylor's sense when Tristan mind-linked him. Alpha, we have a problem here. What do you mean, Tristan? What happened? I lost Taylor's scent in a location where there is a prominent scent of rogues. What the fuck? Where are you? Dean was running like crazy to reach Tristan. He mind-linked Jeff, his beta. Jeff, Taylor is in danger. She's here in the city, and she probably was attacked by rogues. Bring some of our best warriors. We need to organize a search party. Also, make sure our teams are on full alert. The rogues might use the kidnapping as a decoy to attack our pack. Once he was done explaining the situation to Jeff, he mind-linked Liam. Liam, Taylor has gone missing, probably kidnapped by the rogues. We lost her scent near the city downtown. Send your warriors to scout the area around our packs, next to the diner, any location possible to find her. I already called for backup from my pack to search the city upside down. What the hell are you talking about, Dean? What was Taylor even doing in the city to begin with? Now is not the time, Liam. Please help me find her, replied Dean with a hoarse voice. Okay, brother, calm down. We will find her. Send me your location and I will join you. Dean and Tristan started searching the area where her scent was lost to try and locate her. They had no clue. It was like searching for a needle in a haystack. Dean, Dean, we located Tay's iPhone, screamed Emma through the mine link. How did you do that? Our iPhones are configured to share our locations. We had done that since our early years at the university to make sure we can track each other, especially at night. She is at the intersection between Johnson Street and Winston Avenue. It seems to be an impasse. Please hurry. Dean Mindling Tristan to meet him there and ran like crazy in the streets of the city to reach the location shared by Emma. When he got there, he found himself in a small cul-de-sac with a couple of buildings there. He searched the street first for any signs of Taylor. When he found nothing, 
he decided to enter the first building to search it thoroughly. Tristan, I took the first building on the left, the one next to the garbage waste bins. I'm checking every floor, every room. Do the same and start with the building on the right. Thirty minutes later, Tristan and Dean came back with empty hands. Damn it! yelled Dean in frustration. Liam and many pack members had already joined them by now. Are you sure this is where her iPhone is? asked Dean for the tenth time. Yes, Dean. Matt checked with Emma as well. Her smartphone is somewhere here. Maybe underground. Look for sewer hatches in the vicinity, ordered Dean. They searched for fifteen minutes in vain. Fuck! Where can she be? Dean was panicking, running his hands through his hair, pacing around, feeling helpless. Where are you, Taylor? Moon goddess, where is she? Please, murmured Dean. What is her number? asked Liam. What? Her number, Dean. Call her. Dean frantically took his phone from his back pocket and dialed her number. Tristan and Jeff were checking the trash bins when they heard a phone vibrating. They started searching frantically. We cannot hear the ring, but we hear the phone vibrating. The sound is from here, they screamed as they continued searching. They finally opened the trash bin and started searching inside. I found it, screamed Tristan, and he pulled a phone from the garbage bin. Dean was devastated. Damn it! We lost time for nothing. They disposed of her iPhone. We have no means to find her, yelled Dean as he kicked and punched the garbage bins. Dean, get a hold of yourself. If we panic, we lose her, said Liam as he grabbed his brother's wrists. Dean nodded. What are our options now? he asked desperately. Guys, you search again every street in the city. Follow any scent of rogues that you capture. Jeff, divide the areas among the search team here and make sure you report back to us every 30 minutes. I am taking Dean home and we will coordinate the rescue mission from there, instructed Liam as he grabbed Dean and forcefully took him to the pack house. Meanwhile, far away from the city, Taylor started waking up. She was suffering from a terrible headache. She tried to put her hand on her head to massage it when she noticed that she could not move her hands freely. She looked down and saw both of her hands tied up with silver chains. She tried to stand up, but again the chains were limiting her movement. She could just sit on her knees. She scanned her surroundings trying to understand what happened when it all came back to her. Dean's betrayal, how she ran away, and how she was vulnerable when the rogues ambushed her. How they shot her with a tranquilizer and knocked her out. She was an emotional mess and couldn't react in time to fight them off. Fuck, I've been kidnapped, she murmured. Ain't you a smart cookie? She turned her head to the left and saw two people standing in the dark. Who are you and what do you want? Well, well, don't you recognize the man you attacked and insulted on your first day in Idaho? He moved forward below the fading light. King of douche, what do you want? taunted Taylor. Oh, I want a lot of things and you're going to help me achieve my revenge. I would never help a scum like you, she yelled back, pulling hard on the chains, trying to free herself. Well, it seems we'll have to first teach you some manners, he smirked and punched her straight in the face. She was in pain, but did her best to hide it. Her jaw and bottom lip were hurting. She probably had a split lip now. But you know what? First thing first, we need to take a picture of you. He looked at her with his evil eyes and added, Um, you're missing some makeup, aren't you? he said before punching her again and again and again. By now her lip was swollen, blood dripping from her nose, bruises all over her jaw and forehead. 
Once he was happy with his masterpiece, he grabbed her by the hair, raising her head up. Time for a selfie, sweetheart, he mocked her. He came closer, still grabbing her painfully by the hair, and took a selfie with his smartphone. Let's see now what your friends do when they receive this photo, he added. Taylor was beyond mad, pulling again on her chains. Be man enough and remove the chains. Dare to face me on equal grounds, you coward, she screamed. I'm not stupid enough to remove those chains. You will not go free. This will be your grave, stupid human. He spat and punched her one last time before he walked away with his friend and left her on the filthy, cold floor of the cell. Dean and Liam went back to the River Moon Pack, where Emma joined them in a meeting room converted now into their crisis management room. While their betas and their best trackers were still in the city and in the woods searching for Taylor, they, on the other side, were trying to put all the pieces together and understand what happened. We need to ask for help from the other packs, suggested Emma. Yes, we will send them a message. They will all support. I have no doubt about that, said Liam. Liam and I will call the Alphas personally to ask for their help, stated Dean, when suddenly Matt barged into the room. Dean, oh, Moon Goddess, you are not going to believe it. What happened? We received an email. He paused and looked at Emma, who was all worked up. Luna, Emma, I think it would be better if you leave. Excuse me, why should I leave? It's just too graph. Matt, so help me, moon goddess. I will cut you into pieces if you don't tell us right now what is in this email you received, shouted Emma. It's not only me. Every email address in both our packs received the email with this picture. He raised his tablet and turned it around so they could all see. The only thing that could be heard was Emma's screams. There was a picture of Taylor, beaten up and tortured, covered in blood. Dean growled a scary roar that could be heard miles away. Emma was shaking, Liam screaming. Liam, we need to save her. They're going to kill her. Oh, Taylor, what have they done to you? Liam tried to comfort his mate while asking Matt for more details. Was there any message with this photo? Yes, Alpha. They wrote, Taylor is going to be under our hospitality. She will have a painful and lethal stay with us, carefully read Matt. Dean could not contain his anger any longer, and he punched the wall next to him. I am going to kill them, to kill them all. Every single rogue in this state is dead, he screamed, punching walls, throwing computers, breaking chairs. Liam tried to contain his brother, holding him tight. Dean, calm down, brother. This will not help us in saving her faster. They want us to panic and not think clearly. Calm down. We will find her. Just calm down. Liam looked at Matt. Matt, make sure this email is deleted from all the inboxes of our pack members. I don't want anyone to see Taylor so vulnerable and hurt. Meanwhile, build a whitelist. Only emails from authorized and known parties will be allowed to reach our pack members' inboxes. All other emails should be redirected to a dedicated folder where only we can view them. What do you mean, Liam? Why go through this? asked a confused Emma. Because they are going to send us more disturbing pictures. They're not only going to torture her, but torture us. And if our pack members receive those emails, they will be vulnerable as well, especially River Moon pack members. They all consider Taylor as their Luna already. What will this do to them if they see the photos? It will destroy them all, one by one. Understood. I will do that with our network engineers right away. Meanwhile, try to find the location. Where did they send this email from? Who sent this email? 
If you need any help, you can talk with my friend Corey for support. Involve any of the white hackers that you know. We need to find her, added Emma. Yes, Luna. Dean was on the floor in his brother's arms. Emma wanted to fall apart, too, to cry for her friend, but she can't. They must control their emotions. The only emotion that should be let out is revenge, full-blown revenge. I am in pain, Liam, physical pain. My face, my body, I don't know what is happening to me, complained Dean. You are having a breakdown, Dean. Please go and get some rest. We all need to rest. There is nothing that we can do tonight. Our best hunters are scouting the area. Matt will be working with the cybersecurity experts to try to locate the source of the email. Now we must rest. Yet no one managed to sleep that night. Not Taylor, who was trying to free herself from the chains. Not her friends, who were trying to mobilize the alphas of the other packs. The next day, they were all in the crisis room. Liam, Emma, and Dean were there with Tristan and Matt. Clive passed by to give a quick update on the search operations they're running in the region. Unfortunately, no leads so far. Dean was still in pain. It was weird as his back hurt, his wrists, his face. This physical pain comes and goes, and it is impacting his concentration. At noon, they received a notification in the special folder they created on the mail server. It was again an email, but this time there was just a link. Matt clicked on the link, and it opened a web page with a live running webcam. The webcam was focused on Taylor, who was fighting against the chains, trying to free herself. Well, 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 we have a good audience turnout a chilling voice said. Taylor raised her bruised head and spat on him. Behave, girl. The show has not started yet, mocked the rogue. He then looked at his computer before adding, Two hundred connections already. Not bad at all. Two hundred connections? What the hell does that mean? How did they do that? Did they bypass our filters? Emma asked Matt. Matt was busy checking the mail server gateways. No, Luna, the filter worked properly. No one in our pack received the link. Those motherfuckers, they sent the link to the other packs, exclaimed Dean. Emma gasped in horror, her eyes locked on the screen. The torture session started again. The rogue was punching her and kicking her all over her face and body. He even electrocuted her a couple of times with a taser gun. This round lasted ten long and agonizing minutes. Do you know that you can make this all stop? suggested the evil rogue. You just need to record a video where you'll inform the world about the existence of werewolves. You share the location of the Mystic Moon, the Silver Moon, and the River Moon packs, added the rogue's leader. Go to hell, said Taylor. This video won't cost you much. Who will believe you? No one. So where's the harm? If you record the video, we stop the torture. Taylor was not stupid. She knew the repercussion of such a video on her friends. She was on house arrest under her friends' responsibilities. If she divulges the existence of werewolves, her friends will be considered traitors. As for her, she would be sentenced to death. But she already felt that she would not get out of this cell alive. So she will at least make sure her friends' lives are not put at risk by her words. Fuck you, she replied, glaring at him with anger and determination. The rogue went ballistic and started a new round of punching that lasted like forever. Taylor did not cry or beg for mercy. She was strong, unlike her friend. Emma was crying by this time as she saw her best friend tortured like that. Matt and Tristan had horrified looks on their faces. The Alpha's phones did not stop ringing. 
the other packs were calling them, probably shaken by the live stream. Liam tried to calm Emma down while keeping an eye on Dean. His brother was eerily calm. He was watching the video with no facial expression whatsoever. Okay, let's diversify the treatment a bit. What do you think, Taylor? I want to hear you scream in pain, beg for mercy, said the rogue with a wicked laugh. He took a whip in his hand and started whipping her on the back. Not a scream could be heard from Taylor. One, two, three, lashes after lashes fell on her back, ripping her skin, turning her back red, blood dripping profusely, and yet Taylor did not scream. Despite the pain tearing through her body, she did not want to give him what he wanted. She resisted as long as she could until the thirtieth strike when she cracked. She screamed in pain and tears rolled down her cheeks. She could not hold it any more. She could not take it any more. Good. Now you're a good girl. You see, maybe if you had screamed earlier, you would have received fewer whippings, you stubborn human. He looked at the camera with a smirk. And now the last treatment of the day. He grabbed a bag of salt and started spreading it in her wounds. She was crying. The screams became almost inhuman. She was hurting so bad that she passed out. This is because of you, Carter brothers. She is suffering because of you, added the rogue, glaring at them. And the live streaming stopped. Silence filled the room. Everyone was horrified. After a few seconds, Dean clenched his fists and turned to look at Matt. Matt, tell me you have something now, a location, anything, asked Dean. No, Alpha, no one could trace them. They are exceptionally good. All the hackers we mobilized told us they hid their tracks very well. Dean clenched his fists and banged them on the table. Okay, let's keep our focus, said Liam, trying to calm down his brother. But Dean would not hear any of it. He grabbed Matt by his collar and shouted, This is your fault. It is your fault if she is being tortured. Every minute that passes by is on you. Every delay is your fault. You are all incompetent. How can you not be able to locate her by now? screamed Dean. Tristan reached out to grab Dean's shoulders. Alpha Dean, please stop. Everyone is doing their best. We all want her back. Dean looked at Tristan. You, he pointed his finger. It is your fault she was kidnapped in the first place. You took her to the city. That's enough, screamed Tristan, blaming all of us when the person that should take blame is you. What the hell? It is because of you she was kidnapped. When she saw you cheating on her, kissing this slut, she lost it and ran away from us. It is because of you that she was isolated and weak, and they could grab her. Otherwise, she could have defended herself. It is Taylor, damn it. She is the strongest person we know. If she were not heartbroken and disoriented, she would have kicked their asses. Everyone was stunned. Cheated on her? What do you mean, Tristan? Answer me, yelled Emma. Emma was shocked. She could not believe her ears. She turned to Dean, hoping this was wrong. Tristan made a mistake. Dean, please tell me this is not true, murmured Emma. Dean, Dean, she started shaking him. Were you kissing another woman? Tell me this is not true, she screamed. It is true. I was with Savannah, and she saw Savannah kissing me, replied Dean, his voice strained. Savannah? As in your soulmate, Savannah? snapped Emma. Apparently, fucking that whore is more important to him than being faithful to an exceptional woman like Taylor, grumbled Tristan. I am going to kill you, said Dean, as he jumped on Tristan. Enough, yelled Liam. Anyone who is not related to me, out. You wait outside and you don't talk to anyone. 
They all left and closed the door. Liam looked at Dean. What were you thinking, Dean? How could you do that to Taylor? Don't judge me, Liam, not when I'm at my lowest, sighed Dean, looking at the frozen image on the giant screen. The image of Taylor passed out in a pool of blood. I made some mistakes. I will not try to find excuses, but it's not what you think. Oh, really? You did not get back with your soulmate? You did not kiss your soulmate? retorted Emma. Oh, moon goddess, this is why you were spending so much time in the city. Taylor had a feeling that something was wrong. She told me about it a day before she was kidnapped. You are disgusting. You were fucking your soulmate in the city and keeping Taylor on the side, she added in outrage. No, I did not do anything with Savannah, yelled Dean. Well, Taylor and Tristan saw you kissing her, so you did do something. Emma, she kissed me as a goodbye. I don't have time to waste on that now. Long story short, we just met at her request, since she's back in the country. She told me that she wanted to start over again with me, that we are soulmates and that we should respect the moon goddess. Typical, you threw Taylor away the minute the soulmate who crushed your heart came back, huffed Emma. I did not. I said no. I met her, but I rejected her offer. Don't lie to me, Dean. We all know that the mating bond cannot be resisted. Well, she did resist the bond years ago, when she declined to start a relationship with me, and I just did the same. She asked for a goodbye kiss, and this is when Taylor saw us. She didn't give me time to explain. She ran away. And you needed three days to reject her offer, Dean? You think we're stupid or what? countered Emma. Liam sighed and looked at his brother in disbelief. Dean destroyed everything with one moment of weakness. I don't know yet, Dean, whether you're telling the whole truth, but one thing is sure, you should have been transparent with Taylor. Hiding this from her made it worse. He didn't wait for Dean's reply. He went to the door and invited the guys back in. Until we find Taylor, nothing of what you heard is to be communicated. I am not asking you that to protect my brother, but for Taylor. They all nodded. From now on, Emma and I will be leading the rescue mission, added Liam. What do you mean? Do you mean that I don't want to rescue her? How dare you? yelled Dean, offended. I am not insinuating anything. You clearly are not in a sound state to lead this mission. But, Dean, Taylor was running away from you. She didn't want to have anything to do with you, which means she is our responsibility now and only ours. If you want to support, you are more than welcome. But you will not lead it, shouted Liam, his alpha aura radiating in the whole room. Liam tried to control his anger before turning to Tristan. How did Taylor know that Dean would be there? asked Liam. What do you mean? replied Tristan. You said that she went to the city and she found Dean there with Savannah. How did she know where to find him? Just a coincidence? We didn't go to the city to see Dean. She asked me to take her there because she wanted to buy gifts for all of you and get some materials for the 3D printer. But she did ask to go specifically to the Eugene Garfield Square and wanted to be there before 4 p.m., shared Tristan, trying to remember his discussion with Taylor. This is where I've been meeting with Savannah the past three days, said Dean. She got a tip-off, stated Liam. What do you mean? asked Emma. She could not have known Eugene Garfield Square. Someone must have tipped her off to go there, to check on Dean. But how? No one in the River Moon Pack knew about these encounters, asked Dean, befuddled. Maybe she got a call, or a text message, or a chat, or email, said Matt, 
thinking out loud. We still have her phone. We can check, proposed Emma. Yes, I still have her iPhone, but we need her passcode. Otherwise, it'll take us a lot of time to crack her code. No need. I know her passcode. She is not good with technology nor with remembering passcodes, so she always shares her passwords with me. I'll get the phone immediately. As soon as Matt came back with the iPhone, Emma entered the passcode, and they gained access to the content of Taylor's phone. Matt plugged the iPhone in a projector so that everyone could see where he's browsing and checking on the phone. It did not take long to find the text message from an unknown number luring Taylor to go downtown to check on Dean. I will ask the team to check and find the sender. We might have to hack into the telco service provider network. I have no problem with that. Do whatever it takes, said Liam. While waiting for the cyber team to track the sender, Liam, Emma, and Dean followed up with their teams on the search mission. Other packs had joined the mission, and they were searching more areas faster now. But, unfortunately, still no sign of Taylor. The cybersecurity team was focused on analyzing the video and trying to identify the location where Taylor's being held. Alas, no leads on this front either. The rogues have gained advanced technical skills and have hidden their steps on the Internet too well. The work on yesterday's email didn't lead anywhere either. Finally, they got a break, and Matt came running to their crisis room. Dean immediately stood up. So, do you know who it was? You are not going to believe it. It was Alpha Adam. It was a burner phone, but by hacking through the telecom provider and the public CCTVs, I can confirm it was Alpha Adam who personally bought the burner phone. That bastard, I am going to kill him, roared Dean. Dean, you are not going to do anything, instructed Liam. I will head to his pack. I will mind link other alphas to join me, and we will confront him. Matt, email me all the proofs you accumulated, added Liam. Liam, please be careful, said Emma as she hugged him. Taylor was still on the floor. She passed out at first from the pain, but after she woke up, she was in too much pain and could not move. She was desperate. She was in pain. She could not find any way out. She was sobbing. She could not find it in her to resist, to fight back. She tried to put her faith in her friends, as she had zero doubt that they were mobilized, trying to find her, that they would do everything possible to locate her and free her from this hell. But would they come to her in time? Can she hold on? Well, Sleeping Beauty, it's about time you woke. You will have to eat, and we'll start our next torture session. Go to hell, said Taylor. I think you're going to go there before me. I wish, so that I'm part of the welcoming committee once my friends tear you into pieces. For a human, you've got resilience, he laughed devilishly. But I know how to break you irreversibly. He smirked as he grabbed her by the hair, forcing her to stand on her knees and to look him straight in the eyes. Don't you want to know what happened to Dean? Taylor gasped. Her eyes went wide in horror. God, no, please, they didn't get to him, no. No, don't worry, we didn't hurt him. We're not that cruel. He just found his lost mate. We will not stand in the way of true love. Taylor did not believe she could feel any more pain. Yet, she did. The woman he was kissing, it was not just a mere affair. It was his mate. She came back for him. No, you are lying. I don't believe you. He smirked, enjoying this new way of torture he was inflicting on her. Why would Dean go every single day and spend the night in the city just for a random woman or for his soulmate? He smirked. No, no, this can't be true, whimpered Taylor. 
This felt like the final and fatal blow. She fell on the ground weeping from the physical pain, from the emotional pain, weeping for her heart being torn apart and shred into pieces. Don't collapse yet. We need to send one last picture. He grabbed her by the hair, forcing her to stand on her knees again. Everything was covered in blood. Her face, her stomach, her back, everything was red. He took a few pictures before throwing her back on the floor. They'll enjoy today's pictures. He laughed and left her there sobbing. And in later in the evening, Liam came back from the confrontation with Alpha Adam. How did it go? inquired Dean as soon as he saw Liam. The bastard had no trouble admitting that he was part of that. For him, she is just a human, no value to her life according to our laws, and he can use her as leverage to protect his pack. Just a human? She was my love. He knew that. Which make his actions an official attack on my pack. Well, thanks to your affair and betrayal, she is no longer your love. And since your sweet soulmate is from his pack, he already knew that she was back with you and that you were giving your bond a chance. Which makes Taylor, the human, open for grabs, said Liam coldly. I was not having an affair, and I was not back with Savannah. If she said that to Adam, she is a cunning bitch, and I will make her pay. After she admits the truth, suddenly the door opened, and Matt came in all agitated. We got an email from the rogues, with pictures, he added cautiously. They all looked at him attentively, not sure they wanted to see what was in that email. Matt hesitated a few seconds, reluctant to share on the giant screen the latest horrible pictures shared by the rogues. Taylor was unrecognizable, covered in bruises and blood. Her eyes were lifeless, and she looked to be in a lot of pain. Dean dropped on the chair and put his head between his hands. He could not suppress the tears any more. His tears were rolling down his cheeks. He grasped the consequences of his actions and how Taylor's life is in danger because of him. Because he poorly managed the situation with Savannah. He was not back with her. He was clear and firm with her. How could she tell Alpha Adam that they were a couple? Sadly, his friends had mixed feelings towards him. They felt sorry for him, but they were also mad at him for what he had done. His pack members, his family, everyone blamed him for what happened to Taylor. And he blamed himself. He knew that, and he could not stop his tears. He failed her and she might lose her life because of him. No, he should not give up. He will do everything possible to save her and spend a lifetime apologizing and making it up to her. We got them! We got them! screamed Matt unexpectedly. What do you mean? asked Liam. My team was working on those files as we spoke. They were trying to identify a source, a location, anything that could help us track Taylor. And? There was a GPS location in one of the pictures. They must have activated inadvertently the location tracking feature in their phone. Let me open a line with Corey. As soon as they got Corey in a video conference call, he confirmed the great news. This is a rookie mistake. After their excellent job in hiding their digital footprint in all their previously shared content, this one seems very sloppy. It is stupid to forget something like that, but at least we got lucky. Thanks a lot, Corey, for your support, said a hopeful Emma. You know, Emma, that Taylor is also my friend. I want to save her as much as you do. Thank you, Corey, for your excellent work. Name your price and we will pay you generously, added Liam. I don't want any money. Go bring her back to us and kill those sons of bitches for what they've done. You have my word, Corey, vowed Liam. And with that, 
they started planning the rescue mission with the support of their allies. Alpha Sam, we will need access to your medical facilities. The Red Moon Pack is the closest to the location where Taylor is being held captive, and Taylor will need immediate medical care when we free her, said Liam, talking with Sam on the phone. We'll prepare everything. I will also hire human doctors specialized in scarring and trauma to make sure Taylor will have the best medical care, and my warriors will join you and help, proposed Sam. Liam, Emma, and Dean gathered their warriors and headed immediately to the location. They moved in stealth mode, leveraging the darkness of the night, vigilant to make sure no rogue scouts could track them. They are counting on the element of surprise to take over the rogue stronghold and free Taylor. At dawn, they were walking in a wooded area when they reached a clearing, an endless field, and at the end of the field, an abandoned farm. This is it. According to the location shared by Cory, they are holding her here, assured Tristan. We are going to be too exposed if we go straight forward, noted Liam. We don't have time to lose. You saw the pictures. She's losing blood. Every minute counts, pleaded Dean. Dean, emotions will lead us nowhere. Let's use proper protocol. Matt, send the drones to scan the area. Fly them at high levels so no one sees or hears them, instructed Liam. Start contouring the forest and reach the farm from the west side so that we got them encircled, instructed Dean to a group of warriors. You remember what Corey said? Emma asked Liam. You mean the rookie mistake? Yes, I was thinking about that, replied Liam, preoccupied by the battlefield layout. Something doesn't add up, said Tristan. I share the same feeling, said Liam. What should we do then? asked Emma. Liam was pensive, thinking about the latest updates. He took a deep breath and answered, Let's wait for the drone scans. You think it's a trap? inquired Dean. Everything is possible. The fact that it got suddenly too easy to track them is highly suspicious, said Jeff. They probably got cocky. Dean, your feelings, your guilt is clouding your judgment. You all believe something is wrong? he asked. Liam, Emma, and Tristan, Jeff, Clive, and The Rock were all feeling restlessness. They were so close to freeing Taylor, but they felt some things were not adding up. Dean said nothing and looked at the farm in the horizon. I am going to save you, Taylor, and will spend my lifetime apologizing for everything that you had to go through because of me and earn your trust and respect and love again, he murmured. Even if it was just a whisper, his friends and family heard him clearly. They felt sorry for him, how he knowingly destroyed his happiness. Taylor didn't know whether it was day or night. She was too tired, probably because she was still bleeding, losing blood. She could not stand up. She could hardly raise her head. When her torturer entered the room, he was surprised to see her still alive. Well, 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 you are still among us. You are stronger than I thought, I'll admit to that. It's good. You'll be able to see the grand finale of my revenge. What do you mean? She whispered, struggling to talk as her throat hurt. Everything hurt. They are coming to rescue you. Not only your friends, but many of their allies join them. Mission Saving Taylor Smith in motion. How moving. But it is very unfortunate for them and for you. For you, because you're dying anyway, and they'll not be able to save you. But also for them, because they're heading straight to their deaths. Taylor looked at him with questions in her eyes. What does that mean? Why is he that confident? If they have the support of the neighboring packs, they can easily outnumber the rogues. Then it hit her, 
and horror filled her face. You, you are bringing them into a fucking trap, she struggled to answer. Bingo, he laughed. Suddenly the roaring sound of a blast was heard. It was followed by multiple explosions. And here's the fireworks. Those are mines. Your friends are stepping on mines that we planted deep in the fields. There's no way for them to see them or detect them. They're not the only ones to master high tech. We build smart mines that get activated only once your friends reach the middle of the field. So they all die in one shot. No, no, God, no, please, this cannot be happening. Emma, Dean, no, sobbed Taylor. He grabbed her by the hair and bent in to get close to her face. They have all exploded into werewolves' pieces. Your friends are gone. My revenge is complete, and you will die here. He kicked her in the stomach and left, snorting. Let's go see the demise of those packs. As he stepped off the farm, he saw the set of explosions still going on. He was laughing wickedly. Happily, he got his revenge. He finally destroyed the Carter brothers and all the other packs who treated the rogues as garbage. He avenged his people, his family. Surprisingly, he started hearing screams from the east side of the farm. He mind-linked his rogues. They're coming from the other side. They're coming from the other side, they warned him. Stop panicking. This is probably just the backup team. Take your positions and end them swiftly. I'm joining you. When he reached the east side, he was shocked by the hundreds of werewolves attacking his base. His rogues were outnumbered. They were losing ground, and werewolves were invading his farm, not only from the east side, but also coming from the west side as well. What the hell? How are they still alive? Unbeknownst to him, the drones used by the Carter brothers were advanced drones capable of detecting underground mines. They saw through his trap and tricked him into believing the mines were activated by the werewolves running through the booby-trapped field. The fight was raging between both sides, but Dean and Liam were moving forward, closing in on him, coming for him. He recognized their wolves, and he was afraid, looking frantically for support from his rogues, trying to find an escape route. As he was panicking, he did not notice another wolf, a white wolf running fast and leaping on him, reaching for his throat and killing him on the spot. It was Emma. She had to avenge her friend herself. While the battle was ongoing, Dean and Emma went inside the farm searching for Taylor. They kept her somewhere underground. There was no natural light in the video and no windows, stated Emma, searching the house. They went to the basement and found a tunnel leading to something that looked like a dungeon. The place reeked with blood and death, but they could still catch Taylor's scent. When they reached her cell, they found her on the ground, unconscious, in a fetal position, her arms chained. Dean shifted to his human form, freed her from her chains, and took her in his arms. Tay, love, please answer me. Look, Emma is with me. Kitten, please open your eyes. Her heartbeats were faint. She was still bleeding profusely. He carried her in his arms and ran outside the farm yelling, She needs a doctor. She needs immediate medical attention. How are we going to transport her? asked Emma with teary eyes. Liam saw them from afar and called them to join him. Quick, we have a car ready to take you to the Red Moon Pack. Alpha Sam is waiting for you. Hurry! Dean sprinted to the car and carefully laid Taylor on the back seat. He looked at his brother and the raging battle. He was not comfortable leaving his pack and his brother alone, but he could not separate from Taylor either. Don't worry for us, Dean. Go and save Taylor. Take Emma with you. We will finish the job here, said Liam, squeezing Dean's shoulder in support. 
Emma got into the passenger seat, and Dean started the car, the wheels screeching. He was driving as fast as possible to the Red Moon Pack, to the doctors, knowing that every minute counts and that Taylor's life is hanging by a... Dean, go home, eat, shower, rest. Please, you have been at this nonstop for two months now. Liam, for the thousandth time, I am not leaving her side until she wakes up. This is non-negotiable. Dean looked disheveled, with unkempt hair, dark circles under his eyes, and a scruffy beard. He never left Taylor's side since she came out of surgery. He still remembered how distressed he was when he brought her to the Red Moon Pack. The long, excruciating hours waiting for the surgery to end. The doctor's dismaying updates, talking about internal bleeding and head trauma, telling them that she went into cardiac arrest twice as they were operating on her. He still remembered how he burst into tears, long and agonizing sobs, when they got the news that her odds of surviving were slim. He had never cried since his parents died, and here he was, weeping, desperately praying for the moon goddess to bring her back to him. He still remembered the bittersweet news they got a week later when they told them that Taylor was out of danger, but that she had slipped into a coma, and there was no telling when or if she would come back. He still remembered when they transported her by helicopter to the Silver Moon Pack Hospital. She looked peaceful despite the still swollen left side of her face and the bandages on her body. He wanted to take her back home to the River Moon Pack, but Emma insisted that Taylor should be airlifted to her pack. Emma. He looked at Emma, sitting next to Taylor on the other side of the bed, working on her laptop. She rarely left Taylor's side as well, just at night and for breakfast and dinner, at Liam's insistence. Emma and Dean were Taylor's companions during this ordeal, always by her side, updating her on their work, on the rogues, even on the most mundane topics. Convinced that by talking to her over and over again, she would find her way back to them. Their voices acting as anchors. Dean, brother, you cannot continue like that. Your pack members need you. We all need you. Liam was met with a wall of silence, as usual. Every time he tried to bring sense to Dean, his brother just ignored him. Damn it, Dean, your wolf needs to get out as well. You have not moved from this room for weeks now. Dean, please, you need to come to terms with the possibility that Taylor might... Liam, if you finish this sentence, so help me, moon goddess, I will kill you, yelled Emma, livid. And leave Dean alone. He's eating here, he is showering here, and he is sleeping here as well. His wolf is as desperate to see Taylor awake as he is. Just let it go, she added, visibly distraught. Liam ran his hand through his hair, looking at his mate, then at his brother, feeling helpless, unable to comfort them. If there is a silver lining in this tragedy, it would be the reborn closeness between Dean and Emma. Liam could not forget how much Emma hated Dean for what happened to Taylor, for his infidelity, for everything. When the doctors told them that they might lose Taylor, Emma's pain was so intense, she lost it. She attacked Dean with the intention of killing him. She blamed him for Taylor's condition and wanted him dead, literally. But as time passed by, both watching over Taylor, never leaving her bedside, they got to talk, and they somehow found common ground. Emma never shared with Liam the details of this discussion. He was not sure whether this was just a truce or an actual peace between the two of them. He looked at Taylor and sighed. With her injuries healed, she had a few mild scars, but other than that, she looked like she was taking a nap, 
although the beeping machines and the tubes were a constant reminder that she was not taking a nap, that she was in a state of prolonged unconsciousness. The situation was unbearable for her loved ones, but at least she was not in pain. Her physical injuries were healed, but how about her emotional scars, her heartbreak? Liam looked again at his brother. Dean was miles away from them, focused on Taylor, stroking her hair, kissing her palm. Then Liam looked at his mate. Emma was busy working on the latest software they were developing. He had to concede defeat. Neither one of them will be leaving Taylor's bedside any time soon, not until she wakes up. He glanced around the room and saw all the tokens of appreciation from the packs. Not only Silver Moon and River Moon, all the packs in Idaho were regularly sending Taylor flowers, delicacies, and get well soon wishes. She became a local hero. The human who stood up to the rogues, despite the torture and the pain. The human who protected their secret, even at the cost of her own life. Her new friends in River Moon and Silver Moon packs visited her every single day. Even Mystic Moon pack members flew to see Taylor as soon as they got the news. They were all praying for Taylor to wake up from her coma. The only ones kept in the dark were her parents and her human friends. Emma told Simon that Taylor suffered from a burnout and needed to disconnect from work, which Simon understood given the sleepless nights she spent on Mr. Potter's project. As for her parents, Emma was sending them messages masquerading as Taylor and was using the excuse of poor telco connection to justify not calling them. Liam did not agree with Emma on this. He harassed her to tell Taylor's parents the truth. Who knows what might happen? Her parents would need to see her first. He offered to fly them from Florida in a private jet, but Emma refused to tell them the truth. Every time she answered that Taylor will wake up tomorrow or the day after tomorrow and will talk to them herself. Dean stared at Taylor lovingly, softly pressing her hand. The doctors are optimistic, love. Your vitals are good. They said there are no complications, no medical reasons for you not to wake up. Please come back to us, Tay. Wake up, sleeping beautiful. Please, I am incomplete without you in my arms. I miss you so much. I miss your big expressive hazel eyes. Won't you open your eyes for me? If you are not waking up because of me, just wake up and you can do whatever you want to me. You can kill me if you want. You know, your friend tried to kill me already. If I were not a werewolf, I would be sporting deep scars on my face and my shoulder. Emma rolled her eyes listening to him. She did not regret attacking him, even if she understood better his situation and why he did what he did. She was convinced that if he had handled the situation differently, Taylor would not be lying motionless in this hospital bed. Taylor, please, if you are late on purpose because you want to make an entrance, believe me, you've nailed it. You can wake up now, he added, trying to lighten the mood as Taylor would have loved to do. He gently caressed her hair, talking to her for hours keeping his eyes on her, looking for a sign, anything that would indicate she was waking up. Emma kept busy, managing her team and her project from Taylor's bedside. She could have delegated part of her work, but she desperately needed a distraction. She needed her brain to be relentlessly occupied, otherwise she would drift into her darkest thoughts, blaming herself for Taylor's fate. After all, if she were not melancholic after meeting Liam and moving to Idaho, Taylor would not have followed her to Silver Moon Pack, and she would now be safe and sound in their apartment in Dallas, probably FaceTiming her to talk about their work and their love lives. 
As Dean was narrating to Taylor where he wanted to take her when she wakes up, he felt an almost imperceptible pressure on his hand. He froze and looked at Taylor's hand, intertwined in his. Did she just move her hand? He sucked in his breath sharply. What just happened? He looked intently at her hands, scrutinized her face. Did he, yet again, imagine it? Emma, he whispered as if he were cautious not to scare Taylor. She lifted her head from her laptop and frowned when she saw the expression on Dean's face. What? He gestured with his hand, cutting her short and pointing to Taylor's hand on the bed. Her hand was moving, pressing lightly on his. Emma examined Taylor's face, studied her hand. They have had false hope in the past. Doctors told them that comatose patients are subject to spontaneous and reflex movements. She held Taylor's right hand while Dean was holding tight to her left hand. Tay, Tay, can you hear me? She paused for a minute and asked again. Tay, it's me, Emma. Can you hear me? Squeeze my hand twice if you can hear me. And here it was, a feather-like squeeze on her hand, followed by another squeeze. This one was perceptible. No doubt Taylor was responding to them. She looked down at Dean with watery eyes. He had an unsure smile on his face, tears rolling down his cheeks. She was coming back to them. Taylor was struggling to stay alert. She tried to open her eyes, but couldn't. It was as if she was drowning in the darkness. She heard voices. She was confident she heard Emma. Emma asked her to squeeze her hand. Taylor could not remember whether she did squeeze Emma's hand. She knew that she tried, but everything felt heavy. She tried to open her eyes again, but could not. As if she was fighting gravity, she wanted to move her body to open her eyes. It felt as if voices were constantly asking her to come back, to open her eyes. She tried again. She was tired, but she still tried. Now the friendly voices are laced with a beeping noise. She tried again, but this time she focused all her energy on her eyes. And after what felt like an eternity, she slowly opened her eyes, only to be blinded by a bright white light, and she closed them instantly. She heard cheers. People were happy with something she did. She opened her eyes, said a voice, a voice that brought joy to Taylor, Emma's voice. I know, oh moon goddess, Tay, love, can you open your eyes, said another voice. Her heart clenched tightly in her chest when she heard this voice. Why? Whose voice was that? Liam, call the doctors and turn off the lights on your way out. The lights are too bright for her. Tay, it's Emma. Can you try to open your eyes again? Taylor struggled to open her eyes. Again, she focused all her energy on this simple task. She could not concentrate because of the beeping noise. She tried again, and this time she opened her hazel eyes to see her friend, looking at her with angst, holding her hand tight. She's back! Oh, Tay, you are back! sobbed Emma. Don't cry, said Taylor, distressed by her friend's tears. Emma wiped her tears with her free hand, chuckling softly. Okay, I will not cry. I will smile, I promise. I'll smile because I'm so happy that you're back. Taylor was trying to move her head, but it felt as if it weighed a thousand pounds. Damn, this is hard. She heard the annoying beeping noise, but it also seemed to her that she was hearing footsteps. Yes, people were running and were now in her room. She recognized Liam, who ran to Emma, hugging her, and Taylor smiled. They both looked tired, but so adorable together. Lover boy, stammered Taylor. Emma chuckled while Liam scowled. 
Okay, I can confirm she is officially back, huffed Liam humorously. Taylor figured that the people who came with Liam were doctors. She was trying to puzzle things out to understand what happened. She remembered just bits and pieces. As the doctors were performing the Glasgow Coma Scale score test, they asked her to move her head to the left, and this is when she saw him. Dean, she whispered, not expecting to see him here holding her hand. Why is he here? Shouldn't he be with his mate, as the rogue told her? Maybe the rogue lied. But even if this woman is not his mate, he was kissing her. It did not matter whether she was his mate or not. He looked like he had gone to hell and back. He was holding her hand, smiling with watery eyes. He couldn't talk. Too emotional. Too happy to see her beautiful hazel eyes finally staring at him. She seemed confused at first, but now he saw sadness in her eyes, and he did not need to wait for the doctors to finish their tests. He knew that she remembered everything. He could not handle the reproach in her eyes, the disappointment. But he did not look away. He has waited two months to gaze into her beautiful eyes, to see her awake. Taylor wanted to glare at him, to be mad, to punch him, but she couldn't. Her body was not responding as fast as she wanted. Looking at him opened so many wounds. She remembered the heartbreak. She remembered the kidnapping. She remembered every single torture. This was too much for her, too overwhelming. She wanted to look away and turn her head, but this required too much energy from her and she was still drained from all the movements the doctors asked her to do. He looked tired, but still handsome as ever. He looked relieved and was holding onto her hand as if afraid she would get out of this bed and run away. She might have done it if she had had the energy. She was not ready to confront him. She was not ready to hear his excuses unconvincing excuses that could never erase what she saw. She was not ready to fight with him, to tell him they are done. Disturbing images flashed before her eyes, him kissing this woman, his mate, his surprise seeing her there, the woman calling him honey, her running away, her sobbing, tears rolling down her cheeks, the rogues ambushing her and injecting her with a sedative. This was too much for her. She did not want to remember. She finally managed to turn her head away and look at Emma. Em, she coughed, trying to talk. Please, Miss Smith, do not try to talk. Not now. Take it easy, said one of the doctors. Em, added Taylor, ignoring the doctors. Please, Em, make him go away, she blurted. Everyone stiffened. They all understood what she meant. Dean was shocked. He could not believe that the first thing Taylor did when coming back from her coma is to kick him out of her hospital room. Out, please, Em, out, out, screamed Taylor as she became more agitated. She tried to pull her hand away from Dean's hold, but she hardly could move it. Emma was panicking. She was worried that all this distress would impact Taylor's health further. She looked at Dean with pleading eyes, and he immediately understood. Taylor will not calm down as long as he is in the room. He nodded and freed Taylor's hand. He wanted to stroke her cheek to give her a kiss before leaving, but he knew that she would not let him. He took a few steps away, looking at her, tried to memorize every single detail in her face, knowing that she will not accept to see him any time soon. He did not expect her to welcome him with open arms, but still, her rejection hurt. I will give you space, Tay. I'm leaving the room. Just please relax, and please do not forget, I love you, Tay. He left her hospital room and sat in the visitor's corner, holding his head in his hands.
The stress of the past two months washed over him, the uncertainty around Taylor's health, the interminable wait for Taylor to wake up, and now her rejection. Everything was too overwhelming, and he cried. For the second time in years, he cried. She will come around, Dean. She is awake. Let's focus on this win for now, said Liam, as he squeezed his brother's shoulders supportively. I know, Liam. I am thanking the moon goddess every second for bringing Taylor back. Believe me, I am so grateful. But still, it hurts. Her rejection physically hurts me. The pain is too much. He raised his head and stared at his brother. Liam, I am afraid I've lost her. The disappointment in her eyes. I am afraid I lost her. Oh, moon goddess, I cannot lose her. I will go crazy, Liam. Dean, she just woke up from a coma after going through a traumatizing abduction. This must be too much for her. We need to give her time to process everything that happened to her, to heal. Everything else is secondary. Dean nodded. He knew that his brother was right. What Taylor went through was unfathomable. He will do everything needed to help her heal. He sighed, leaning the back of his head on the wall behind him. He missed her so much and was hoping to spend more time with her now that she's back. But he will step back for her. He sat there, his eyes closed, and the back of his head still resting on the wall. He needed to think, and as the minutes passed by, the more he thought about it, the more he was at peace with the current situation. It is for the best, especially that he has a few critical things he must do. He had postponed them waiting for Taylor to wake up first. Now is the time. He stood up, resolved. I'm leaving, Liam. Where to? To bring justice to Taylor, replied Dean, as he dashed to the exit with determined footsteps. What? What do you mean? Where are you going? asked Liam, confused as he saw his brother leaving without even answering his questions. Damn it, Dean, wait for me! shouted Liam as he ran after his brother. He hoped that he misunderstood his brother's intentions, but he knew Taylor went through a battery of tests, all imposed by the doctors. They even took her for brain scans later in the day and ran additional tests. She docilely let them perform all the tests they needed. Anyway, she didn't have the energy to complain. She was slipping in and out of sleep throughout the examinations. As she woke up, for what she felt was the hundredth time this day, she saw Emma sitting in a chair next to her bed. You know, for someone who slept for two months, you sure do sleep a lot, teased Emma, looking at Taylor fondly. Taylor chuckled. Weird, right? What time is it, anyway? 10.14 p.m., answered Emma after checking her smartphone. I'm hardly back to the living, and I already lost a day. You will have to take it easy. The doctors will be coming shortly. They asked me to let them know as soon as you wake up. They want to share the results of all the checkups performed. And I suppose you already got the sneak preview, right? Yes, we were here when they came to check on you, and we asked for the results. We? Who was with you? Um, Liam, answered Emma, avoiding any eye contact with Taylor. And? Don't even try to lie to me, Emma. Remember, I don't suffer from amnesia, so I still know you very well, warned Taylor. Emma took a deep breath and stared at her friend. Dean was with us, and before you go on your high horses, you did not want to see him, but it is not the other way around. Come on, Em, I don't want him in my life, and I definitely do not want him to know about my medical condition. This is a violation of doctor-patient confidentiality. Tay, the guy stayed every single hour in this room with you, and in the hospital at the Red Moon Pack. He never left your side since we rescued you from the rogues. 
Why would he stay with me all the time? What are you talking about, M? Last time I saw him, he was kissing a woman who turned out to be his mate. Why would he stay with me instead of her? How do you know she was his mate? The rogues told me. They like to torture me physically and emotionally, replied Taylor. She tried to adopt a detached voice, but Emma couldn't be fooled. Before Emma could reply, two doctors entered the room. Miss Smith, how are you feeling now? said one of the doctors. Taylor huffed in frustration. Those doctors have the worst timing ever. She glared at Emma, signaling that this discussion is far from being over, and replied civilly, Please call me Taylor, and I'm feeling much better, doctor. Thank you. Are you still tired and feeling sleepy? Not as much as before, but yes, I feel worn out, although I slept for hours already. This is normal. You will feel drowsy for a few days. Your body needs time to get back on track. But we can assure you all your test results are excellent. We have never seen such good signs after a long coma, neither in werewolves nor in human medical history. The moon goddess was looking over you, Taylor. Taylor knew that waking up from this coma was nothing short of a miracle, and she was determined to put this second chance to good use. Given the vigils of visitors we've seen during your coma, I doubt the moon goddess had any other choice than to listen to all the prayers, added the second doctor jokingly. Taylor looked at Emma with questions in her eyes. Every single member of the Silver Moon and River Moon packs visited you, Tay, every day. Our friends from Mystic Moon visited you regularly as well. The odds were against you, Taylor, but you are loved and this positive energy must have contributed to your recovery, added Emma. And to make sure your miraculous recovery goes smoothly, we've drafted a recovery plan for you with physiotherapy, psychological assessments, and why would I need a psychological assessment, doctors? I'm feeling good. Miss Smith, uh, I mean Taylor, what you went through is traumatic. PTSD is common in such cases. PTSD? Seriously? scoffed Taylor. Tay, calm down, please. Let the doctors continue, pleaded Emma, although she was not surprised by Taylor's reaction. Taylor hated to show any sign of weakness, and Emma expected that she will oppose PTSD therapy. Taylor, we will do a trauma assessment with one of our best therapists first, and then we will see what her recommendations are said one of the doctors. And as of tomorrow, we can start the physical therapy to help restore movement and heal your body. We'll let you rest for now, and we'll come back and walk you through the plan tomorrow morning. Have a good night, Taylor, and welcome back, said the second doctor supportively. Taylor rested her hand on the pillow and looked at the white ceiling. She was scrutinizing it as if she were looking at the Sistine Chapel ceiling. After a few minutes, she murmured, Em, Em, can I talk with my parents? Yes, sure. It's a bit too late for them, but we can call them. However, just so you know, they're not aware of what happened to you. You never told them? Why? Um, Tay, I wanted to call them once you were out of the coma. I was at first convinced that it was just a matter of days. Even when the doctors were not optimistic, I was sure you would wake up shortly, and I thought it would be easier for them to get the news once you were back on the road to recovery, explained Emma. Taylor noticed that her friend was embarrassed for keeping her parents in the dark, but she understood her reasoning. She might have done the same if she were in Emma's shoes. Okay, I will tell them that I was in a car accident, and I'll skip the kidnapping, the torture, and, of course, the coma. Taylor spent the next hour FaceTiming her parents. Thank God Emma never informed them about her situation. She was awake and with no visible bruises, yet her parents went into panic mode as soon as they heard the word accident. They wanted to grab the first plane to Idaho, but Taylor was completely against this. She will not bring them into the middle of this ongoing war. 
only when Emma and she managed to reassure them and promised to call them every day, the Smiths finally calmed down. I have to admit, you were right not to inform my parents. I can't even imagine what they would have gone through if you called them when I was in a coma with all the injuries and swelling, said Taylor once she ended the call with her parents. It was already so hard on us, Tay. I knew they couldn't bear such horrible news. It was hard on all of us. I'm sorry, Em, for putting you through all this stress. Are you crazy? You are the victim here, Tay. Well, I'm not used to being a victim, Emma. I don't know what happened this time. I was taken by surprise. I should have fought, and I shouldn't have put my guard down. Stop it, Tay. It was a planned operation to kidnap you. They came prepared and determined. This is what I can't put my finger on. How did they know that I would be downtown? Did they trail us from the River Moon Pack? Were they waiting for me to leave the River Moon community? Uh, it's a long story. Might be better to get some rest now, and we'll talk about that in the morning. Yeah, you're right. Sorry, Emma. You must be tired. Go home, and we can talk tomorrow. Go home? I am not leaving you. I'm sleeping here. What? No need. Please, I would feel guilty if you stayed here, Em. Please. Tay, we never left you alone throughout your coma. We're not leaving you alone now that you're awake. What? Are you crazy? Please tell me that you did not sleep in my hospital room for two months. Not me, Tay. Dean. He did not let anyone else spend the night here. We all fought with him to convince him to alternate at least a few days per week with me or someone else, but he never accepted. I imagine the guilt might have been eating him alive, and he thought this would help him atone for his affair, snapped Taylor. Tay, listen, no one was angrier at him than me. I wanted to kill him. No, correction, I tried to kill him. But once we talked about it, He's not all bad, Tay. Taylor was shocked. She expected Emma to have her back, but to try to kill her brother-in-law? Wow! What did you do, Emma? I blamed him for everything that happened to you. I shifted and attacked him. Deep cuts on his face, shoulder, and chest. If Liam hadn't grabbed me, I don't know what I would have done. But we have a lot of things to talk about, Tay. You don't know what happened when you were held hostage by the rogues, or once we brought you back, or since you woke up from your coma. Since I woke up? Meaning something happened today? What? Tomorrow, Tay. Now we sleep and get some rest. Come on, Em. You can't throw those hints on him and ask me just to sleep. Think about how I attacked Dean. Those should be satisfied pictures to get you to sleep teased Emma as she laid comfortably on the couch and closed her eyes. Taylor giggled softly and nodded. You know me so well, Em. Imagining you attacking Dean, this is priceless. And it's unfair I missed all this fun, added Taylor before drifting off to sleep. Oh, God, whispered Taylor, exhausted. Sweat was gradually dripping down her forehead, and she was trying her best to hold it together. Damn it! I can't take it any more, she grunted right before she collapsed on the mat. Taylor started physical therapy two days ago, and it was not going as fast as she wished. It felt as if she had to relearn everything, even the basics. For a woman who was extremely active and fit, this was hard to swallow. Physical therapy sucks. I give up, grumbled Taylor as she laid on the mat and looked at the ceiling. Emma motioned to the physiotherapist and the nurses to leave them alone in the gym, and she walked up to Taylor, looked down at her with a frown on her face. The Taylor I know would never give up, reprimanded Emma. The Taylor you know did not spend two months in a freaking coma only to wake up and see that she lost all her abilities. Don't exaggerate, Taylor. You saw me, Em. I can hardly complete 15 minutes of exercises. Me! 
Tay, you suffered from a severe brain injury. You had multiple rib fractures, your spine was almost crushed from the torture, and you were in a coma for two months. What did you expect? That you would wake up and just go on with your life as though nothing happened? Well, this is what happened in the movies and books. They come back from a long coma as if nothing happened, mumbled Taylor. This is real life, Tay, not a movie or a book. It takes time. The doctors, the physiotherapists, the nurses, everyone told you that it takes time. It's frustrating, Em. I feel like a dislocated doll. I can't move like before. I can't even keep my balance. Em, I'm afraid that... Taylor could not complete her sentence, her voice cracking. Emma pulled Taylor's hand and intertwined their fingers together. Tay, the doctors spent three days running every possible and imaginable test, and their diagnosis was unanimous. You have no permanent neurological damage or injuries. They're positive you will recover, and they prepared the best physical therapy plan for you. Five days ago, you were in a coma, Tay. Please, go easy on yourself. Taylor sighed, shaking her head. She looked at her friend with watery eyes, afraid to say her deepest and darkest thoughts out loud, afraid that if she confessed to her friend, those fears would become reality. Em, I am broken. Part of me, precisely my soul, is broken beyond repair. I need a win, Em, and I was hoping that at least I would be able to be a normal functioning human, said Taylor, her voice hoarse and breaking. Emma squeezed Taylor's hand supportively. Please, Tay, please accept to meet with the trauma and PTSD therapist. She can ha Em, it's not about the kidnapping and torture. It's about my heart, my soul. Tay, please, she can help you. Please don't refuse the help you need. I am begging you. Taylor did not reply. She continued staring at the ceiling, thinking about how her life changed in just a few months, how her normal and boring life in Dallas seemed so far away. Just a few months ago, she was oblivious to the existence of werewolves. And yet, here she was, a collateral damage of a raging werewolf war. And to add insult to injury, she fell in love with a werewolf who betrayed her a few weeks later. They stayed on the mat, engulfed by a comfortable silence. Taylor was struggling with her current situation, while Emma was worried about her friend who seemed to have lost her willpower. Tay, you know that I will be by your side every step of the way. Remember, for eternity and beyond, right? Taylor smiled warmly. Hearing Emma reciting their motto brought back good memories. Of course, Em. We always got each other's back. Never doubted that. Good. Tomorrow you'll meet the PTSD therapist, and we'll go back to her for physical therapy. You are annoying when you don't let go, do you know that? giggled Taylor. Emma stood up and helped Taylor walk back to the hospital room. Well, at least the good news is that I'll be leaving this antiseptic hospital room tomorrow. I think the doctors agreed to discharge you earlier than planned because they could not stand your nagging anymore, teased Emma. Taylor laughed as she changed and sat on her bed. She looked at Emma broodingly. She felt ready to ask the question that was living rent-free in her mind for the past five days. Em, can you tell me everything that happened since I was kidnapped? I think I'm ready to hear the whole story. Are you sure, Tay? She was ready to go through the painful events that led to her long coma. She needed to understand why this happened to her and how they found her. Who was she kidding? She needed to understand why Dean cheated on her. Why was he at her bedside when he's back with his mate? Taylor sighed and nodded assertively. Okay, then. 
your kidnapping was premeditated and organized by the rogues. I don't get it. I just had a fight with their leader in a diner. Why hold a grudge and seek retribution for such a futile thing? It's not what you think. Let me start from the beginning. Savannah, the woman who was with Dean, is his mate, but she is also from Alpha Adams Pack. When he knew that she came back to town and that she wanted to settle down with Dean, he jumped at the occasion and struck a deal with the rogues. Protection of his pack against delivering you to them. You, the girlfriend of River Moon's Alpha, not you, the girl who fought with their leader. Emma paused a bit to let Taylor process this information. It was Alpha Adam who sent you the message and enticed you to go downtown. Stupid Savannah thought that her Alpha was helping her get her mate back, and she went along with him. Well, she did get her mate back, so congrats, it worked, said Taylor bitterly. Tay, you are crazy. She didn't get him back. He never met with her since the day you disappeared. Well, until the day you woke up. Aha! And since that day, he is with her. Tay! scolded Emma. Come on, Em, where is he now? Probably with his mate. Tay, when you woke up and kicked him out, he went to Alpha Adam and Savannah. He officially rejected Savannah and broke the mate bond. And he challenged Alpha Adam to a fight, a fight to the death. What? Why would he do that? Justice for you, Tay. When you were in a coma, Dean promised you that he would bring you justice, but not before you wake up, because he wanted to look in Alpha Adam's eyes and tell him that you are awake and that you will live a long and happy life despite everything he did. He wanted to rub that in his face before killing him. And yes, Dean killed him. Taylor was shocked. Why would Dean go through so much trouble to hide his affair from her and then break up with Savannah, his mate, and then avenge her? I do not understand, Em. He went to her. He kissed her. He clearly wanted her. She is his mate, after all. And now he rejected her? There's nothing rational in this narrative. Tay, it's difficult to explain to you the mate bond. We were created for each other. Every fiber in our body longs for our mate. Our wolf needs our mate's wolf. I don't think you can grasp the implications, but there are many reasons that explain why he met with her. But he was adamant that he did not start anything with her, nor did he intend to start anything. Taylor wanted to interject, but Emma grabbed her hand. Tay, you have every right to be mad at him. I was furious. I wanted him dead for putting you in this situation and for his irresponsible behavior. But believe me, he loves you. He was dying when you were in the coma. He stayed day and night next to you, here in this room. He spent the night with you every single night since we saved you from the rogues, even now. Taylor tilted her head and narrowed her eyes, glaring at Emma. Yes, Tay, even now. He begged me to let him spend the night here, promising to leave before sunrise. Emma, how could you? Tay, he begged me. He begged on his knees, literally. He kept saying that he made a promise not to leave you alone in the hospital, and that once you are out of the hospital, he might not get to see you anymore. I can't explain why he is so desperate when it comes to you. Maybe because he's afraid of losing you. If you were a werewolf, I swear, I would say you are his mate. The guilt is killing him, Emma. He feels responsible for what happened to me. And he is responsible. Taylor rested her head on the fluffy pillows, thinking of all this mess. She then glanced at Emma and asked her, How did you find me? How did you escape the rogue's trap, the mines? Their leader was so sure you fell into the trap. Emma smirked, reminiscing how they outsmarted the rogues and saved Taylor. 
She narrated in detail everything that happened from the day Taylor was kidnapped to the day she woke up. Taylor was listening intently, moved to see everyone mobilized to save her. I can't believe you killed that douchebag. I never pictured you as the Avenger-murderous type, teased Taylor, impressed by her friend. No one touches my family and gets away with it, said Emma, with a mafia boss tone. Harder, asked Taylor. When she saw no reaction, she insisted. Hit me harder, Bella. But, Taylor, you... God, Bella, we don't have all day. Attack me and try to hit me harder this time. Please, insisted Taylor in an exasperated tone. Bella looked at Emma and Clive sitting on the bench. They raised their shoulders in defeat. Taylor has been training hard for the past two weeks. As soon as she completed her first week of physical therapy, she decided to start training again as well. Her friends were training with her mainly to keep her reasonable because she was pushing her limits and they were afraid she might hurt herself or impact her progress in terms of recovery from the injuries in the coma. Bella took a deep breath and complied with Taylor's request. She attacked Taylor using her full strength. And unmistakably, Taylor could not fight back and went flying to the other side of the training ring. Damn it, grumbled Taylor, banging her hand on the mat in frustration. She did not get to continue whining as a loud and frightening growl shook the gym. Dean was next to her in a split second, trying to help her get up while reprimanding Bella. What the hell, Bella? You know that she is still in recovery. Get your hands off me, huffed Taylor, pushing him away and trying to stand up on her own. And leave Bella alone. She doesn't have to answer to you. She is in my pack, and she has to answer to me, especially when I see her training aggressively with you. Dean ran his hand through his hair, trying to calm down. He was scared for Taylor. It was too early to start training and fighting. He knew that everyone tried to change her mind, but she was stubborn. What are you even doing here, Dean? Are you stalking me? questioned Taylor. Yes, I am. This is the only way I get to see you, replied Dean daringly. Well, I do lock my bedroom door at night for safety reasons, said Taylor, raising a brow in defiance. When Emma told her about Dean's night visits, Taylor stayed awake, waiting for him. He came around two in the morning and got the surprise of his life when he saw her wide awake. I was waiting for you, she whispered, trying not to wake Emma, who was sleeping on the couch. He stared at her for a few seconds before sighing and taking a seat next to her bed. Emma told you? Yes, and I would like you to stop those visits. It's creepy. Creepy? Seriously, Taylor. Dean, I already said I don't want to see you, and I would like you to leave me alone. I have a long road to recovery, and I don't need additional stress. When he tried to reply, she raised her hand to stop him. I will be moving to the Silver Moon Packhouse tomorrow. I'll have my private room, and you have to stop these night visits. But also, I would appreciate if you stayed away from me during my stay there. Tay, we need to talk. I want to clarify to you what happened, what you saw. Dean, there is nothing to talk about. Just leave me alone. I want to focus on my physical therapy and recovery. This is the only thing that matters to me right now. And this is also what I want for you, Tay. I want you to get better, to get back to before. Dean, there is no going back to before. Now, please, just leave. Taylor was so immersed in her recollections that she was startled when Dean grabbed her hand, bringing her back to the present. Taylor, you are being reckless. Go and rest for now. You are draining your energy, said Dean. Who do you think you are to tell me what to do? Tay, please, you need to rest. 
This is not good for your recovery, added Emma. M, Dean, you are not my doctors. They aren't, but I am, stated Dr. Reese as she was walking towards them on their training ring. Seriously, who snitched on me? Who? yelled Taylor, pointing an accusing finger at her friends and Dean. I did, answered Dean coolly. You are going to hurt yourself pushing your limits like that. Taylor rolled her eyes and shook her head annoyed. She could not believe him. He called the doctor on her. She sighed and turned to Dr. Reese. Doctor, I... Taylor, you are pushing it. Yes, you have demonstrated exceptional progress in your physical therapy, but all this improvement could go away if you continue like that. Remember, three weeks ago, you were still in a coma. You need to take your time, explained the doctor. I don't have time, snapped Taylor, frustrated. Don't you get it? I don't have time. The rogues aren't all dead. What if they want to come back for me? I can't be defenseless. Not again. And I cannot fall into their hands again. Emma and Dean were flabbergasted. They didn't think that Taylor would feel like that, that she is afraid of being kidnapped and tortured again. They forgot that certain scars don't heal fast. Tay, I won't let anything happen to you. Yeah, right, Dean. You couldn't protect me when I was yours. You sure as hell aren't going to protect me now, snapped Taylor. Dean took a step back, visibly hurt, as if Taylor's words burned him alive. Tay, you are not alone, replied Emma softly. Taylor grinded her teeth angrily. They can't understand her pain or her fears. They can't. She shook her head and threw her hands up in the air in defeat. Okay, you win. I'll stop today, said Taylor as she left the gym. Tay, wait for me, called Emma, running to catch up with her friend. Not now, Emma, please, not now. Okay, okay, I'll leave you alone, but please promise me you will not shut me out, that you will not shut us out. We just want to help you, Tay. I know, Em, I know, I just need to rest. I'll meet you at sunset on the rooftop. Okay, said Emma, as she stopped and let her friends stroll alone to the pack house. At dusk, Taylor joined Emma on the rooftop, although she was still brooding. She had been staring absent-mindedly at her drink for the past ten minutes when Emma broke the silence. Tay, are you okay? You hardly talked since we came here. Sorry, Emma, I'm tired. Emma gently squeezed Taylor's hand, indicating that she's here to support her. I know, Em. I know you're here for me, but I'm suffocating. Tired of fighting to fix my body. Tired of nursing my heart. Tired of fighting to fix my mental health, said Taylor, fighting the tears away. Emma pursed her lips, upset that she can't help her friend. She hugged her from the side and put her head on her shoulder. I am sorry, Tay. All this happened because of me. Had you not come here... Don't, Em, don't you dare think that. They sat like that for some time, until Taylor took a sip from her lemonade. And you know what is more frustrating? I can't even get drunk because of all the medication I'm taking. Emma laughed through her tears and hugged Taylor tightly. You will get over this, Tay, and I'll be next to you every step of the way. You'll see everything will get back to normal. Emma, what normal are you talking about? Nothing is normal anymore. Everywhere I look, I'm reminded of what happened to me, of Alpha Adam, of the rogues, of Dean. I can't anymore, whimpered Taylor with a cracked voice. Here you are. I have been searching for you, said Liam as he was striding towards the girls. He gave Emma a kiss and added, What's with your faces? What's the problem? Your brother. Your brother is the problem, retorted Taylor. Why, what happened now? They exchanged words at the gym, explained Emma, visibly upset. Your brother is stalking me. 
Can't you put him on a leash? added Taylor with scathing mockery. Taylor, this is my brother you're talking about, scolded Liam. Whatever, I'm tired. I'm going to go to bed. Taylor, before you leave, the Alpha Council members want to visit tomorrow to see you. Me? Why? They want to check in on you. They were constantly asking about you during your coma. Yes, Emma told me, and I noticed all the flowers and gifts. They are... We all are indebted to you. You kept our secret despite the torture. No one here will forget your sacrifice. Now, let's not exaggerate. You'll see tomorrow how grateful they are. If you are okay to meet with them... Yes, of course. But all Alphas will be there? asked Taylor cautiously. You mean Dean? Usually they are all there, but we can ask him not to join the visit. Yes, please. I prefer not to see him. Liam wanted to add something, but Emma discreetly pinched his arm, code for don't talk. Okay, see you tomorrow then. Good night, added Taylor as she stood up and walked away. Why did you pinch me, Emma? I don't like to be silenced. Liam, you are going to defend your brother, and it's just not the time for that. So I understand the truce ended between you and my brother? You are joining Taylor's crusade? Come on, Liam. Taylor has every right to be mad at Dean. Emma, for how long is she going to torture my brother? She's treating him like a criminal. Yes, Dean screwed up but he spent the last three months atoning for his error. She needs to give him a break. She's not the only one suffering here. Liam, what's wrong with you? She has been kidnapped and tortured because of him. No, Emma, not because of Dean. Because she left the pack territories, despite the house arrest. She brought this on herself. Excuse me? She wouldn't have had to leave the pack if he had been honest with her. She wouldn't have had to go to the city and follow the lead she got from this SMS text if he had not changed. And how dare you say she brought this on herself? Seriously. This is not what I meant. I... Save it, Liam. I'm tired and I'm going to go to bed as well, yelled Emma, storming out. Liam put his hand on his forehead, frustrated by this situation. He did not mean to blame Taylor... Of course, she is a victim. But his brother was also played by Alpha Adam and his mate. And he could not stand seeing his brother in pain like that. He was not sure his brother would be able to withstand this painful situation any longer. He was sure Dean was on the verge of collapsing, and he felt helpless. He sighed and went after his mate to apologize. This was going to be a long night. It is such a relief to see you well, Miss Smith, said an Alpha as he firmly shook Taylor's hand. Taylor remembered him. He was the eldest Alpha, Alpha David, the one who informed her of the sentence, the house arrest, after Alpha Adam's meltdown. Thank you, Alpha David. Thank you to all of you for the attention and the good wishes you sent me during my stay in the hospital. We are the ones who should thank you, Miss Smith. You preserved our secret. I just protected my friends and family, added Taylor, with a small smile. You seem well for someone who spent two months in a coma. I trust Alpha Dean is treating you well and nursing you back to health, added Alpha James teasingly. Emma and Liam stiffened at this comment, but Taylor was oblivious at first. Dean? Why would he? Oh... Um, Dean and I are no longer together, replied Taylor once she understood what Alpha James meant. The Alphas in the room were stunned. They all heard about Alpha Dean's fight with Alpha Adam and how he killed him in retribution for what he did to Taylor. They also heard and saw how Alpha Dean never left her bedside throughout her coma. Why would they split up after that? That explains why he's not here today, said Alpha James with a baffled expression on his face. Oh, so the rumors that he got back with his mate Savannah are true, murmured one of the Alphas thinking out loud. 
Dean officially rejected Savannah on the same day he killed Adam, avenging Taylor, replied Liam, putting an end to such offensive rumors. Emma noticed that her mate was getting worked up, and she immediately intervened to change the topic. Alphas, please take a seat. Dessert and tea will be served shortly. Alpha Zane, the leader of the Shadow Moon Pack, extended his hand to Taylor. May I help you to your seat, Taylor? he asked in a husky voice. Taylor accepted his hand and they walked together to the comfy couch. Emma was amused by the young Alphas who were roaming around Taylor, proposing their services. Alpha John sat on her right and poured her a cup of cocoa, while Alpha Zane was at her left and prepared a plate of mini sandwiches. Another man sat nonchalantly on the couch's head and occasionally tapped her on the shoulder, asking her whether she needed a cushion. Emma mind-linked Liam. Now that Dean is out of the picture, admirers are coming out in the open. This is funny to watch. I don't find that funny, Emma. Look at them, shamelessly hitting on her. She is my brother's Luna. Oh, so cute to see you protective of Taylor. But unfortunately for Dean, she is no longer his Luna. Emma, you know damn well that he is determined to win her back. We should help him and discourage those horny alphas. Otherwise, with all those alphas sniffing around, his task will become more difficult. Liam, language, and don't worry, Taylor is not impressed at all. Look at her. She's pleading for me to free her. Then what are you waiting for? Come on, let's have some fun. Emma wanted to keep the game going for a few minutes, but Liam's continuous nagging through the mind link gave her a headache, and she gave up. As she walked towards Taylor to free her from the Alphas, Alpha David stood up and raised his champagne glass. Alphas, let's raise our glasses to Taylor, the human who protected our secret with her life. They all stood up and raised their glasses, cheering for a blushing Taylor. Taylor, we are all indebted to you forever, and we mean it. You can come to us for help any time. Taylor observed the Alphas surrounding her. They seemed genuinely grateful for what she did. She hesitated for a few seconds before declaring, Thank you, Alphas. You warm my heart. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. She raised her cocoa. Um, Alpha David, can I collect on the debt right now? Alpha David tilted his head, intrigued by Taylor's request. Yes, of course. My word is my bond. Taylor took a deep breath before asking, I want the end of the house arrest, Alphas, and an immutable pardon for breaking your law and discovering the existence of your world. Yes, of course. This goes without asking. You have demonstrated that you will keep our secret safe no matter what. We lift the house arrest immediately, and you are free. Taylor was happy. A bittersweet happiness. She felt that a weight was lifted off of her chest. She knew what she had to do now. She spent the rest of the day with the Alphas and Emma. Their company was pleasant although some of them were clearly hitting on her and she was not interested at all. As charming as they were, she had no interest in starting a relationship with anyone. After the Alphas left, Emma grabbed Taylor's hand and dragged her to an isolated hiking trail. You aren't leaving, are you? You didn't ask for the house arrest to be lifted just like that because you want to leave. Emma, please, I can't take it anymore. Everywhere I look, I see him. I see them. There on your left is where the rogues attacked on your birthday. The hallway, the rooftop. In every corner, there's a memory of him. Of us. I need to go, Emma. I need to heal my heart and my body. Where do you want to go? asked Emma. To Florida, to see my parents and spend time with them. I am coming with you. No, I can't ask you to do that. You are not asking. I am doing it. But Liam, your pack. Liam will understand. They will understand. Em, 
Tay, you are not going alone. I'm not leaving you until I see that you're okay. Emma and Taylor spent the next two days preparing for their travel. The doctors organized the continuity of her therapies in a human hospital next to her parents' house. Liam talked with a pack in the vicinity to make sure they provide protection to both Emma and Taylor. He also insisted for Clive and The Rock to accompany them, despite Taylor's objections. She was feeling bad already for separating Emma from her life in Idaho. Taylor, we proposed and insisted to come with you and Luna Emma. Don't feel sorry. We're happy to go with you, explained Clive, trying to reassure Taylor. And even if Luna Emma weren't going, we would have proposed to go with you. We want to make sure you have the proper protection, added The Rock. On her last night in Idaho, her friends organized a farewell party. Everyone from River Moon and Silver Moon were there. They showered her with gifts and made her promise to stay in touch and come visit again. And she made them promise to visit her in Dallas once she goes back to her home. After hours of drinking, for them, not Taylor, and laughing, Taylor said her final goodbyes and retreated to her room as she still had more packing to do. When she got into her room, she was startled to see Dean there, waiting for her. Dean, what are you doing here? I came to see you. Dean, please, I am tired and, Tay, I am not giving up on us. You gave up on us the moment you went behind my back to meet your mate. No, Tay, I never gave up on us. I failed you, I failed us, and I take full responsibility, but please believe me, I never cheated on you. I saw you kiss her, Dean. He ran his hand through his hair, perturbed. She asked for a goodbye kiss. We had agreed that we will not pursue anything, and she asked for a goodbye kiss. Taylor raised her hand to stop him. I don't want to hear anything, Dean, just stop. But Tay, I am broken, Dean. My body, my heart, my soul. And you know what? The rogues are responsible for only one of those things. Her voice cracked. You broke me first, Dean. If you were not acting evasive, I wouldn't have had to give the SMS a second thought. If I hadn't seen you kissing this woman, I wouldn't have been devastated, and I would have been alert enough to fight back the rogues when they attempted to kidnap me. You broke me, Dean. You broke me. She could not contain her pain any more. She started sobbing softly as tears flew down her cheeks. Dean tried to hug her, but she pushed him away. What wouldn't I do to turn back time, to go back and change this? I am responsible for everything that happened to you. I should have protected you. I put you in harm's way. You were tortured because of me. I will carry this guilt forever. But I am not giving up on us, Tay. I am leaving, Dean. I know. So there is nothing left. I love you, Tay. Always have. Always will. And I will wait. I will give you space to heal, although it's killing me. If leaving makes you happy, then so be it. If moving on will bring back your smile, then so be it. But know that I am not moving on, never. And I will do everything to redeem myself. I'll do everything to prove to you that I deserve a second chance. Go find your peace, Tay, but know that I am here waiting for you. I love you. I will always love you. He cupped her cheeks with his hands and tenderly kissed her temple, inhaling her scent. He took a few steps back to look at her, all of her, and engrave her in his mind. With moist eyes, he mouthed, I love you, Tay, and left, closing the door behind him. Woke up early again, honey? Taylor was sitting on the front porch, curled up under a blanket. Yes, Mom, I enjoy watching the sunrise from here. Taylor's mom kissed her daughter's head and took a seat next to her. She handed her a warm coffee mug. How are you feeling, honey? I'm good, Mom. You don't need to ask me this question every day. 
Look at me. I've almost fully recovered all my cognitive and physical capabilities. I'm not talking about that, honey. Taylor put her head on her mom's shoulder and sighed. She has been in Florida for four weeks, and with her parents and Emma's support, she has been able to regain almost all of her physical functions. Since she never liked to lie to her parents, she told them about her love story and breakup with Dean. She still had to keep the accident lie going on, but other than that, she told them everything. Her father, always so protective of his girl, was furious. Taylor thanked God that Dean lived far away because she wasn't sure what he could have done. He wasn't happy to see her still crying over Dean, and as soon as she progressed in her physical therapy, he made it his mission to find her another guy. Taylor and Emma tried to convince him that it was too early. Her mother tried to bring some sense to him as well, to no avail. And just like that, Every Saturday night, her parents would invite a couple of friends and their sons for dinner. Taylor dreaded Saturday nights. The small talks, the lingering looks from her suitors. Thank God for Clive and the Rock, who scared half of the guys away with their growls and murderous looks. Although Taylor knew that Clive and the Rock were scaring the men away out of loyalty to Dean, she was thankful that she didn't have to go on a date with any of them. You know, honey, you should be careful out there in the early morning. Our neighbors reported sightings of wolves in the area. Oh, really? Did your neighbors have a hangover when they saw the wolves? teased Taylor. Ha! Ah, I have a funny daughter. No, I am serious. I just saw one from my bedroom window. Taylor was intrigued. Clive and the Rock were still sleeping in the guest room. So was Emma. Who were these wolves? Probably from a neighboring pack, looking after them at Liam's request. Unless they were rogues. Don't worry, Mom. I am always careful. When her mom went back to the room for a shower, Taylor decided to take a walk and check on the wolves. She took her dad's baseball bat and walked into the forest, searching for any trace of wolves. As she was walking around, she heard a twig snap to her left. She swiftly turned to the left and raised her bat, ready to fight if needed. Wow, put the bat down, Miss Smith. We're not rogues, a voice warned her. The man was standing next to five wolves, and he had his hands in the air. Who are you, and what do you want? I am Grant. We're from the Blood Moon Pack, and we're here for your protection. If you don't believe us, you can ask Clive and Jason. You know Clive and Jason? asked Taylor, all surprised. Yes, we introduced ourselves when they first came with you and Luna Emma. Taylor put her bat down, relieved. So you are here at Liam's request? No, his brother. Our Alpha is a close friend of Alpha Dean, and Alpha Dean asked us to protect you from any harm and to make sure that there are no rogues wandering nearby. Taylor sighed. This man will not leave her alone. You can go back to your pack and tell your Alpha that I refuse your protection. I don't need it. I am sorry, Miss Smith, but this is non-negotiable. Your wolves are not that good at this. Neighbors already saw some of you. If you continue like that, animal control will come here. Just leave me alone. Yes, we noticed that some of our wolves were irresponsible. This won't happen again. It just happened this morning. My mom saw one of your wolves from her bedroom window. The man was embarrassed and looked angrily at one of the wolves. Yes, I noticed that as well. Some of our wolves got overly excited to see the famous human up close. Famous human? Yes, your story already crossed the borders of Idaho. How you fought the rogues, how you protected our secret. No wonder Alpha Dean insisted on guarding you. A gray wolf sauntered closer to Taylor, rubbing its fur on her legs. Taylor was startled at first. Uh, don't worry, this is our youngest hunter, Elsa. 
She's 17 years old and a big fan of yours. She keeps saying that she wants to be like you when she's older. Taylor smiled at the wolf and crouched down, caressing its immaculate fur. Believe me, I am overrated. I easily fell into the hands of the rogues. It was an embarrassment, really. Just be the best version of yourself, Elsa, murmured Taylor, with sadness in her eyes. If I can't convince you to go back home, can you maybe shift into your human form? This will be less scary for the neighbors. We already have scouts in human form. Seriously? How many pack members are mobilized? Uh, let's just say that a lot of people are mobilized, but this is totally normal. We are protecting two Lunas. Wow, there is only one Luna here, and it's Emma, Luna of the Silver Moon Pack. And you are the Luna of the River Moon Pack. This is what Dean told us. This man, unbelievable, he will not back off, muttered Taylor to herself. And before she could answer him, he added, the dedication he puts into your protection is commendable. When he comes here, he stays with us all the time, watching over you. When he comes? Oh, please don't tell me that he's flying to Florida. The man realized he said too much. He rubbed the nape of his neck with his hand, embarrassed. Um, I meant, slip of the tongue, you can't go back now, teased Taylor. Well, yes, he comes every week and stays two or three days here in the woods with us. And the next time he visits, please let me know. I would like to introduce him to the end of my father's bat, snared Taylor, annoyed by Dean's persistence. He told us you would say something like that if you discovered this arrangement, laughed Grant. If it's any consolation, he was angry and green with jealousy when he learned about the long queue of suitors lining up every Saturday night, added Grant, smirking. Believe me, I don't want to make him jealous. But he is. He comes on the weekends on purpose to be here and see the outcome of those dinners, and he mind-links Clive and Jason incessantly. Those poor guys must suffer from migraines now because of him, chuckled Grant. No need to worry. They're scaring the men away, as per Dean's orders, I suppose. Not that I mind. Really? Some of them are hot. Taylor raised her eyebrow, surprised and amused by his remark. We don't have much to do here, so we rate your suitors, and honestly, most of them got good scores. Over eight to ten, he clarified. And you are rating them in front of Dean? Hell no! We don't have a death wish, he replied, laughing. Taylor glanced at her watch and noticed that it would be time for breakfast soon. It became a tradition to her to have breakfast with her parents and friends before each of them head to their different occupations, Taylor and Emma focusing on the therapy sessions, her parents visiting friends at their clubs, Clive and Jason looking over them or just going out for a break from their duties. Sorry, I have to go home before they worry about me. I'll join you tomorrow at dawn, with hot coffee. Maybe we can chat then, Elsa. Bye. She waved goodbye and headed home, although she was composed while talking with Grant. But now, with every step she took toward the house, her anger was increasing. She stormed Emma's room and startled her friend. Moon goddess Tay, what's happening? Did you know... Know what? That Dean mobilized an entire pack to watch over us? Yes, Tay, of course. I knew. Liam told us before we left Silver Moon, and Clive and Jason met with them as soon as we arrived here. Honestly, do you think I'm a lousy werewolf and can't smell all the werewolf scents in the neighborhood? And did you know that he comes here every week? What did I just say? Of course I knew. I smelled his scent. I never meet with him, but he mind-links me when he's here, especially during those crazy Saturday dinners. And before you get on your high horse, I'm not sharing any information with him. He just nags the three of us, asking us to scare them away, especially when the visitors are too good-looking, she laughed, 
remembering how insecure Dean was when he saw the visitors and especially when the dinners lasted way too long for his liking. Emma stared at her friend. Taylor was still fuming, and Emma could not understand her friend. Dean was doing everything possible to protect her while giving her space as promised. Sure, he is still checking on her, but from afar, not bothering her at all. Deep down, Emma was rooting for them to get back together. Yes, Dean did make many mistakes, and it's good that Taylor is not forgiving him yet. But for Emma, Dean did not cross the line of no return. Cheating is unforgivable, but he did not cheat. She was not ready to open this discussion with Taylor any time soon. Taylor must first focus on her health. This is the priority. Tay, he's not bothering you and he's giving you space as you requested. He wants to come every week and watch from a distance. So be it. Hell, if I were you, I would drive him crazy by going out with all those admirers your dad is collecting. Am, I'm not petty and I won't play with those guys' feelings. And definitely not with D Once Taylor learned about this entire pack mobilized for her security... She badgered her friends day and night until they accepted to go back to Idaho. Taylor was grateful for what they had done for her, and it is precisely because she was grateful that she wanted them to go back to their lives. They have put their lives on hold for her, and it was time for them to leave, especially since she had over 30 werewolves looking out for her 24-7. Taylor was preparing the coffee for her new friends and going through the mail when she saw a postcard from Emma. Her friend decided to go old school, and in addition to the numerous DMs she sent her every day, she also was sending her postcards. For eternity and beyond, read Taylor, smiling. She was so thankful to have Emma in her life. Emma and all the werewolves, friends she made along the way. She will make sure to stay in contact with all of them, her friends in Idaho as well as here in Florida. She was striding to the nearby woods, allegedly for her morning jog, when a gray wolf came running toward her. Hi, Elsa. Are you in your wolf form today? Enjoy the run, but be careful. Hi, Taylor. How are you today? Grant and his team greeted Taylor. They were waiting for her to have their morning coffee chat a new routine that they got going a few weeks ago. I'm fine, although I think my parents are expecting me to run a marathon soon since they think I'm going for a run every morning, she giggled. I see your father increased the frequency of his dinners, teased Guy, a young hunter in Grant's team. You notice, too? Where does he find all these single men? My parents have not been living here for that long, joked Taylor. Also, I think he's taking advantage of the situation. Now that Clive and the Rock left, there's no one to scare the men away, she added. We hear that you're scary on your own. No need for Clive and Jason, teased Grant, before continuing when he noticed the interrogation in Taylor's eyes. People talk in this small city. Apparently, you're viewed as a challenge by the bachelors here. They call you the Ice Queen and they're all competing to be the first to win you over. Men are stupid, huffed Elsa, now in her human form as she joined them for coffee. Tell me about it, laughed Taylor, giving Elsa a hug. They sat down, drinking their coffee and talking all together. Taylor got used to this early breakfast gathering and was sad because she'll miss it. So are you leaving, said Grant, more like an observation than a question. Taylor was surprised that he could read her so easily. From all her protectors here, she got the closest to Grant and Elsa. She even went with them to a nearby pub for drinks at least twice a week, enjoying each other's company. She nodded, looking back at her parents' house, remembering how her parents tried vainly to change her mind. Yes, Grant, I finished my physical therapy. I am almost back to being my old self. I can't run away from my life any longer. Plus, my business partner Simon is on the verge of a meltdown. They need me in Dallas. 
Florida's bachelors will miss you dearly, winked Grant, and we will also miss you. I count on you to visit me in Dallas. I have a spare room, so you can even crash there. Yeah, right. Dean will rip our head off if we do that, said John, another warrior from the Blood Moon Pack. Let's not talk about Dean, please, scolded Taylor. Um, Taylor, I will have to report to my Alpha that you're going back home, and he will tell Dean. Don't worry, Grant. Emma already informed Liam and Dean, and she asked the Mystic Moon Pack to mobilize warriors to look out for me, although I don't see the need. I've been here for two months already, and you didn't see one rogue. It doesn't mean that they're not still after you. We shouldn't let our guard down. I'll talk with my Alpha and request to travel with you to Dallas and maybe stay a few weeks with you as your personal bodyguard, he said. Grant enjoyed spending time with Taylor, and throughout the weeks his feelings grew stronger, and he wanted to be more than a friend for her. He knew that she wasn't over Dean completely, but she didn't forgive Dean either. Taylor didn't know what to say. She didn't want to sadden her friend, but it was obvious now that Grant was interested in her, more than a friend, and she didn't want to lead him on. He was a great guy, but he was not for her. He was not... She immediately stopped her train of thought, not happy where she was venturing. She patted Grant's hand and said, My Mystic Moon friends will be offended if they hear that someone else was responsible for my security. Well, then, I'll visit as a friend. Good idea. You can come with Elsa. She wanted to see my wood shop and was interested in an internship. Yeah, great. Thanks, Tay. My internship would be in December if it works for you. Any time, Elsa. And Taylor managed to shift the discussion to her wood workshop and Elsa's future career choices. Grant was sporting a disappointed face but he was still determined on wooing Taylor. He managed to convince his Alpha to let him travel with Taylor and spend a few days in Dallas to scan the area and make sure the Mystic Moon security team are ready to take over. I don't get it, Tay. Why is this Grant traveling with you? Peter and Jeremy will be waiting for you at the airport. If you prefer, we can send you a private jet. Tell Grant there's no need to bother him, Emma nagged. Em, I already told you he's just a friend. A friend who will be staying for three days in your apartment with you. Em, he is just a friend, Huff Taylor. A friend that has the hots for you, and you know it, Tay. Everyone in the Blood Moon Pack noticed. Taylor, I had to hear Dean complaining for three hours about your close relationship with Grant, about your escapades with Grant, about your coffee breaks with Grant. You can tell him it's none of his business, and voila, problem solved, Em. Grant knows I'm not interested in any relationship. Now you are not interested, but eventually you will start dating again, and I'm sure the poor guy is waiting for that day impatiently. Em, I'll talk to you when I get home to Dallas. Have a nice day. Taylor cut her off and hung up. She could not understand Emma's reaction. Taylor was clear with Grant that she is not interested in any relationship. Not now, not ever. She was not leading him on. But even if she was open to a relationship, why is Emma so against it? She can't be still hoping that Dean and she will get back together, right? Taylor got her answer when she landed in Dallas, with Peter and Jeremy waiting for them at the gate. From that moment, Grant and Taylor did not get one minute alone. Peter and Jeremy decided to crash at her place every night, for security reasons. They decided to spend every minute with Taylor and Grant, even when they were sightseeing, again, for security reasons. Clearly, Emma was doing everything possible to keep Grant away from Taylor. Grant was seething. His plans for private time with Taylor went down the drain. Even when he bluntly invited Taylor to a dinner and insisted that he wanted to go out only with Taylor, Peter and Jeremy dismissed his request and tagged along. Taylor, unlike Grant, 
was amused by her friend's protectiveness and somehow relieved to have them around, avoiding any potential uncomfortable discussions with Grant. The day Grant left, Jeremy proposed to drive him to the airport. Taylor suspected he wanted to make sure Grant will board the plane and leave. Mission accomplished, sis. Taylor heard Peter talking on the phone. Give me that, she scolded him as she grabbed the phone from his hands. So, Em, are you happy? You ruined Grant's weekend. Are you sad, Tay? Because if you said there's nothing between both of you, then you had no problem in spending time with your other friends, Peter and Jeremy. Em, I already told him he is just a friend. Tay, he did not fly to Dallas just for your protection. He clearly was planning to change your mind. God, Em, do you think that I am stupid to start a relationship with a werewolf and then have my heart stomped to pieces when his mate comes around? Do you think I want to go through this again? yelled Taylor with a cracking voice. Tay, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to... Peter saw the distress in his friend's eyes. Therefore, he gently tugged Taylor from behind and took the phone from her hand. Em, I got this. Don't worry. Love you, he coolly said as he hung up. Let it go, Tay. I'm here, he softly whispered in her ears. And this is all she needed to let go of all the pain and cry in Peter's arms. Taylor sobbed for hours in Peter's embrace. They were now sitting on the couch, Taylor resting her head on Peter's chest, crying silently. You know that M only wants what's good for you, Tay, softly explained Peter. Taylor nodded silently. She couldn't talk just yet. The Blood Moon packs are very traditional. They're extremely attached to our werewolf traditions, and this is why M doesn't want you to fall for Grant, even though the guy is genuinely infatuated with you. The mate bond will always prevail, ventured Peter, trying to explain why Emma and he were meddling. I know, Peter, and it's not just the blood moon pack. I now know that all of you will always put your traditions first. And I don't mean it as a bad thing. This is in your blood. I know that now, as I said, I won't make the same mistake twice. I am sorry, Tay, for everything you went through. I wish I were there to help you through all of this. You are here now, and I'm grateful for that. Peter stared penetratingly at Taylor for a few minutes before sighing. I met my mate, he simply stated. What? Really, Peter? I am so happy for you. Where did you meet? Where is she? How could you leave her for three long days, you idiot? Taylor said playfully, smacking his hand. Hey, calm down. You're family. Of course, I will stay with you as long as needed. Invite her to dinner. I would like to get to know her, and we could celebrate this great news, said Taylor, as she wiped her tears and smiled happily for her brain. Hey, beautiful. Taylor was busy with the finishing touches on her latest creation, Baby number 2604, when she heard Peter's familiar voice, she raised her eyes, still working on the furniture. Hey, Peter, how are you? And Ciara? We're good. Do you know what time it is, Tay? Don't tell me they called you again, replied Taylor, rolling her eyes. Tay, it's 9 p.m. It's time for you to go home and rest, and let our poor friends rest as well. As if you ever let them go home. They'll have to follow me and watch over me at home as well. But at least you'll be in a more urban neighborhood. Your offices are in an industrial area, and past 6 p.m. it's too deserted. And this can put you all at risk, more exposed to full frontal attack. Okay, I got your point, Mr. Military Strategist. Just give me 20 minutes, because I have to finish this diner bar counter. It's very aesthetic. Which restaurant? asked Peter as he sat on a couch waiting for his friend. It's for a diner in Idaho. I visited the diner on my first day in Idaho and drew my version of a bar counter. The owner liked my design and reached out a few weeks ago. Cool. And you'll be going to Idaho to install it? Hell no, Taylor almost yelled. I mean, 
No, Simon will be going there and supervise the installation. Peter nodded, staring at Taylor, trying to assess her state of mind. He was still worried for his friend. The moment she got back to Dallas, she threw herself into her work. And when she's not working, she's training. Gone the tailor who would enjoy girls' nights out. Gone the tailor who spent her time at Mystic Moon Community. Gone the tailor who would join Thursday night dinner at his parents. Gone the tailor searching for love. It took him a lot of begging and nagging to convince her to loosen up a bit and at least spend one night with him, Ciara, and Jeremy. Again, he observed his friend. She might not look happy, but at least she looked healthy. But this persistent sadness in her eyes was worrying him. She lost her lightheartedness. He can't remember seeing her laugh or joke since she came back to Dallas. She's been here for two months now. Not one laugh, not one joke. But at least she looked healthy, healthy and strong and beautiful as before. He could not contain a lopsided smile when he remembered how Emma tried to set Taylor up with a few guys. Taylor was so angry that she blocked his sister's number for three days. The Grant guy from the Blood Moon Pack didn't give up either, visiting Taylor every now and then. Peter had to play dirty and get him to back off. He called the Blood Moon's Alpha and informed him about Grant pursuing Taylor. It didn't go well for Grant since his pack is super committed to the soulmate tradition and the Alpha is Dean's close friend. Grant still visited Taylor in Dallas, but he stayed at a hotel and never tried anything ever again. And even if he wanted to try, he had Peter and all of Taylor's Mystic Moon friends on his back. Earth to Peter, yelled Taylor, waving her hands. Did you finish? Ten minutes ago, mocked Taylor. Okay, let's go. Ciara will meet us at your place. Also, Emma wants to talk with you when we reach home, he said, grabbing her hand and heading to her car. And she had to go through you to let me know that she wants to call me? What is she planning? Didn't she learn her lesson from last time? Smirked Taylor. Peter didn't know the topic Emma wanted to cover, but he knew it was not an easy topic because Emma asked him to be there with Ciara as a buffer and for support. As soon as they got home, they called Emma and put her on speakerphone. After a few minutes of generic exchange, Emma decided to address the touchy topic head-on. Tay, you know that Liam and I are coming for Thanksgiving next week. Yes, of course. Looking forward to that. My parents will also join. They want to keep our tradition going, answered Taylor. Well, um, Tay, I'm sorry, but I just found out that Dean will be joining us as well. Are you kidding me? Tay, Liam and Dean always spend Thanksgiving together. I know we could spend it in Idaho and let you enjoy Thanksgiving with our parents, but I really missed my parents, and I have a lot of things to talk with them about. Taylor took a deep breath. She was not ready to see Dean again. Plus, having her father and Dean in the same room will lead to a bloodbath. Okay, I understand, Em. Don't worry. I'll talk with my parents, and instead of them flying to Dallas, I will join them in Florida. Wait, no, Tay, I don't want you to cancel Thanksgiving with us. Emma, please, I don't want any drama. I don't want to worry about talking with Dean or my father fighting with him. Well, not only your father, I have a beef with him, too, added Peter angrily. Great, you see, Emma... I want to relax and celebrate low-key. It's not a problem if I miss Thanksgiving with you this year. Tay, please, I need you there. Please, please, please. I have, I have an important announcement to make, and I need you by my side. What announcement? I is everything okay, Em? Asked Taylor, suddenly worried for her friend. Yes, everything is okay. Super okay, even. Please, Tay, promise me you will be there. Peter, Ciara, and I will act as a buffer to make sure Dean doesn't come close to you and that your father doesn't murder him. Please, say you will come. 
Emma, please don't ask me to do that. This is too much for me. Tay, I'm pregnant, screamed Emma. What? yelled Taylor, Peter, and Ciara at the same time. Really? You're pregnant? Oh my God, Emma, I am so happy for you, smiled Taylor, delighted for her friend. I am going to be an uncle, yay, yelled Peter, jumping with Ciara in his arms. I have not told my parents yet. I wanted to inform you all at Thanksgiving dinner, and I need you, Tay, by my side. I can't make this announcement without my child's godmother. Okay, Emma, I will come, but you'll have to manage my father. You'll inform him that Dean will be there, and you'll have to keep them apart. I don't want to be involved in any of this drama, sighed Taylor, while Emma squealed in happiness. Thanksgiving dinner went surprisingly well. Sure, Peter and Taylor's dad gave Dean murderous looks throughout the day, but at least Emma, Liam, Peter, and Ciara successfully managed to keep Dean far away from Taylor and her dad. As for Dean, he never took his eyes off Taylor throughout the day, but he didn't try to talk with her, which was a relief for Taylor. By dessert, just when Taylor started to finally relax, her father decided to bring out the big guns. Taylor, honey, uh, Peter told me that Grant visited two weeks ago. He is such a gentleman. You look good together. Taylor almost choked on her cake and furrowed her brows on Peter. But Peter's pleading eyes indicated that he had nothing to do with this discussion. Taylor did not get a chance to answer, as the sound of breaking glass surprised everyone. It was Dean who broke his glass, visibly angry. Great, drama ahead, mumbled Taylor. Her father, unfazed by this interruption, decided to continue his provocation. Tay, I forgot to tell you, you remember Dr. Jonathan? A handsome and successful boy, he added, looking at Emma's parents. Well, Dr. Jonathan has a seminar in Dallas next week. He asked about you, and I gave him your phone number, he added. Great, Dad, replied Taylor, rolling her eyes. And I told him you have a spare room, so no need for him to book a hotel room. Dean growled loudly, shocking Taylor's parents, whose eyes were wide open. Oh, my goodness, what was that? asked Taylor's mom. Emma started to panic, trying to find an explanation. Peter was laughing. Ciara was trying to hide her smile. Liam was shaking his head, annoyed, and Emma's parents were surprised. Dean stood up abruptly and stared at Taylor. He wanted to say something, but Emma cut him off and blurted, I'm pregnant! And a different type of shock and chaos filled the air. Everyone was happy, congratulating the happy couple. Questions kept on coming and everyone forgot Dean's outburst. Dean couldn't stop staring at Taylor. She looked breathtaking, her wavy caramel hair flowing freely on her shoulders, framing her beautiful face. He missed her a lot. He was looking forward to this dinner, hoping to talk with her. But everyone was conspiring to keep them far apart, and it was irritating him. Her father was not a fan, clearly. He was taunting him all day, talking about that idiot Grant and some other guy. He still remembered the speed dating dinners her father organized in Florida, inviting every single bachelor in town. He wanted to break the legs of all those guys one by one but his friends didn't let him. Taylor never seemed happy to meet those single guys, and he held on to his tiny hope that maybe she rejected them all because she still loved him. He scrutinized her all day. The melancholy in her eyes was clenching his chest. He was responsible for that, undoubtedly. Finally, by the end of the day, he could not hold it in any more. He stood up and looked at Taylor. Tay, can we have a word, please, in private? Hell no, yelled Peter, standing up as well. Leave my daughter alone. Haven't you done enough? screamed her father. I understand your apprehension, Mr. Smith, Peter, but I am not leaving tonight before talking with her. 
What will it take for you to let me talk with her? Taylor's dad punched Dean twice. Then Peter took over and punched him again. Dean stood still, taking the punches one after another. Once they finished, he wiped the blood from his face with the back of his hand and asked, Now can I talk? Taylor closed her eyes and shook her head in disbelief. She could not believe what she just saw. Her father, the most peaceful man on earth, did not think twice and just like that punched her ex. And Peter gladly joined him. She did not want to talk to Dean, but she knew that he would persist until she accepted, so she might as well get it over with. She took a deep breath, opened her eyes, and stood up. Let's go for a walk, Dean. They walked for a few minutes in complete silence until Taylor couldn't take it anymore. You wanted to talk, Dean, huffed Taylor. Tell me, Tay, are you happy? Taylor jerked her head, looking at him confused. What type of question is that? Because I know I'm not. I need you next to me. I need you in my arms. I need you, Tay. I am addicted to you, and every minute away from you is torture, he continued. Dean, please stop. No, answer me, Tay. Are you happy? Because if you are, if you moved on, then... I will leave you alone. Are you happy, Tay? Damn it, Dean. No, I am not happy. I didn't leave you because I stopped loving you. I left you because you broke my heart into a million pieces, and I'm still trying to put those pieces back together. Now was his time to be shocked. I can't be with you, Dean. When I look at you, I feel the heartbreak. I feel the physical pain I suffered by the rogues. Don't you get it? You betrayed me. You lied to me. You cheated. How can I be happy after all this pain? No, Tay, I never cheated. I didn't have an affair. I didn't do anything with her. I didn't say anything romantic to her. I just met with her and listened to her. I felt that I owed it to her and our mate bond and to the moon goddess to meet with her. You fucking kissed her. No, I did not. She kissed me. She asked for a goodbye kiss. Taylor couldn't listen to this. She did not want to remember this. She stormed away, and Dean ran after her, grabbing her arm. Tay, please. Did your wolf make you do it? What? Did your wolf make you go and see her because her wolf is his soulmate? What do you mean? Peter and Emma told me about the fated mate, how the bond between mates is strong, and how your wolves and your human forms both feel the mate bond. Did your wolf make you do it because he wanted and needed a wolf soulmate, something I can't give him? Dean ran his hand through his hair, something he always does when he's nervous. He kept the eye contact while saying, I will not lie to you. We both accepted her request for a meeting to see what she wanted. I hoped I would have the force to officially reject her, and we did not want to let you know since we were not sure how this meeting would go. So he is as cowardly as you are? You keep me on the side as a backup in case she rejected you again? No, this is not what I mean. I did not want to scare you, to make you worry. I never went to her thinking I want to start something with her. She was my fated soulmate, and she asked me to meet with her. I can't explain it to you. I am engineered to long for her, to love her. It is in my DNA. Yes, last time we met, we agreed to go our separate ways, but we never officially rejected each other. She was still my mate, as the moon goddess defined it. What the hell, Dean? Do you hear yourself? You just said that you went to see her and did not want to start over with her, and now you say that you're engineered to love each other and that you're still soulmates. He takes both her hands. It is not black and white, Tay, moon goddess. This is so hard to explain. She was the woman created to complete me by the moon goddess. Yet I had zero doubt that I loved you, Tay, that you were my life. But I was raised, since I was a pup, 
to respect the mate bond. It is in my DNA. I was raised to believe that my life is never complete without my mate. I was happy with you, Tay. I had never been so happy in my life before, yet I was compelled to accept her request and meet with her. She begged me to accept her request for the meeting. I swear to you, I went there praying I will have the strength to fight the mate bond, to officially reject her, he added. Do you think I'm stupid, Dean? If you really went to the meeting determined to reject her, you would have told me. You would have taken me with you. Taylor, please believe me when I said I was determined to reject her officially. But yes, part of me was afraid I would be weakened by the mate bond, and I could not take you with me because you were on house arrest, remember? How convenient. Tay, and you needed to meet her for four consecutive days to reject her? Stop it, Dean. Please don't insult my intelligence. I don't want to talk about the past. Please just leave me alone. Love, don't call me that. You lost the right to call me that. Please, Tay, please let me tell you what happened. Please give me a chance to explain. We met, and she told me that now she is ready to settle. She wanted to officially accept our mate bond. I said no. I immediately said no and told her that I had someone in my life. She insisted I give her a chance. She said that the moon goddess knows what is best for us, that I should at least respect our goddess, our beliefs. I said no. Without a second thought, I was surprised how easy it was for me to reject her. When she asked for us to become officially mates, I should have felt immense happiness. My wolf should have been dancing in my head, but I felt nothing. My wolf felt nothing. Saying no to her was so easy, he explained. But then she used the mate card. She told me that her wolf craved to be next to mine, that her wolf was suffering. She only asked for us to meet in a public place and just give our wolves time together. Yes, I was weak, weak because of everything we have been taught. So I said, okay. I was sure that spending time with her would not change my mind. My wolf felt the same. And this is why I was so distant with you during those days. Not because I have doubt about us, not because I had any feelings for her, but because I felt bad meeting with her behind your back, even if it was just talking. I couldn't face you because I was confused as hell about what was happening to me. Every time I met her, I felt nothing towards her. She tried to hold my hand, and yet I felt nothing. Usually, soulmates feel sparks every time they touch. We should be eager to hold each other. Nothing. I kept the discussion to basic mundane stuff from my side. Even when she said she missed me, or that she needs me, or that her wolf is dying without my wolf, I never changed my mind. The night I made love to you was the night I took my decision to stop meeting her, to stop wasting time, because there was nothing between her and I, and there will be nothing. He holds Taylor's hands tight. And this is what I told her on that horrible day. I told her we need to stop meeting, that her wolf will have to move on as my wolf and I already have. We were sitting and talking in that square, and as we were heading to our car, she asked me for a goodbye kiss. Later, when I confronted her, she told me that this scene was planned with Alpha Adam, that she had a pack member on the lookout to inform her when you reached the place so that you could see us kissing, and you would leave me. She didn't know Alpha Adam's ulterior motives, nor his deal with the rogues, she just thought he was helping her get her mate back. And this is the extent of it. I swear to you, I never told her anything romantic. I never felt anything towards her, he concluded. Taylor was crying silently, her tears running down her cheeks. He tried to wipe her tears with his thumb, but she moved away from his reach. 
Please, Tay, please give us a chance. Please, I know it's difficult for you to understand what the mate bond does to us, but... You're right, Dean. I don't understand. I will never understand. Because when a man tells a woman he loves her and then says that there is a pull toward another woman because of his beliefs, well, we call that bullshit in my world, replied Taylor, using air quotes to highlight the word beliefs. Tay, don't you see, Dean, I don't belong in your world. Everything in your beliefs instruct you to stay away from humans from me. I don't belong in your world. Every time there's a decision to be made about me, you will struggle, because I defy everything you believe in. Please, Dean, just leave me. Uh, let me forget you and move on. Please, I've suffered enough. No, Tay, please. Dean, just let me go. We come from two different worlds. Everything is telling us we're not meant to be. Just let me go. She turned and headed to the Jacksons' house. Emma was waiting for her on the porch. She hugged her tight and took her to her old room. Later that night, Tay left to her apartment. She could not stand staying in the same house as him and needed some alone time. Is it good? Did I do it right? Elsa asked expectantly. Taylor smiled fondly as she looked at the over-enthusiastic Elsa and her first woodwork, a coffee table made of driftwood twigs assembled in an intricate design. Elsa joined Taylor a few days after Thanksgiving to start her internship at Taylor's workshop, and Taylor was appreciative for this happy break from all the drama. Her last discussion with Dean was still imprinted in her mind, word by word. But she didn't have much time to ponder on it as she was busy coaching Elsa and keeping her company. Elsa was staying at Taylor's place, and every night after work as well as on the weekend, they hit the city with Taylor's friends. This new routine has been going on for seven days now, which means seven days not thinking about Dean, about how she pushed him away, about whether she made the right decision. She genuinely felt that she did not belong in Dean's and Emma's supernatural world. Yet some of her best friends were werewolves, and she knows that they would protect her with their lives. They are protecting her right now, watching over her in her office, at home, on every outing. They are, in a way, defying the supernatural world's laws just by being her friends. Yet they don't care. They never cared. Mystic Moon Pack welcomed her with open arms since she was a kid. They had to adapt their ways and not shift in her presence, yet they all happily did it because they genuinely cared about her and wanted her to stay in the pack, to be friends with their kids, and to be in their daily life. But it's different with Dean. It's different because it is a love story, not a friendship. The soulmate bond is the first challenge of a relationship, and even if Dean said he rejected his mate, what assurance did she have that he wouldn't fall again for her? What would even be the future of their relationship? They probably can't consider having kids, not sure she can have werewolf babies in the first place, and if she does, her babies will be pariahs in the supernatural world, an anomaly half-human, half-werewolf. They might be sentenced to death by the old guard, the conservative werewolves who are staunch followers of the sacred laws. She can't even be his Luna, a human Luna attending their werewolf meetings. If the Idaho packs have adopted her, Taylor was not naive and knew that other packs will still look at her as an outsider, a threat to their secret. All their supernatural laws put her at the bottom of the food chain because she is a human. Taylor closed her eyes and sighed. Just a few minutes ago, she was asserting that Elsa's presence diverted her from her love life drama. And yet, here she is thinking about Dean again. Um, great work, Elsa. The sanding work you did is even and regular. Not an easy task for beginners. The wood was well prepped. 
Congrats, Elsa. You just finished your first solo woodwork, stated Taylor as she was inspecting the furniture up close. Taylor's team clapped, praising Elsa for her work, and then teased her as she heavily blushed because of all the compliments. Now, the least attractive side of the job, cleaning up. But don't worry, I'll give you a hand, laughed Taylor. Elsa was reaching out for a broom when she halted on the spot and sniffed the air. She looked at Taylor, concern and fear in her eyes. Taylor, I smell rogues, and I think your friends are fighting with them. I hear them arguing, whispered Elsa. Taylor was close to the back door, so she ran there and saw her friends protecting the entryway against a large number of rogues. She could easily count twenty rogues. Shit! It's happening! It's happening! She muttered, trying not to panic. Her phone rang as she was running the defense scenario in her head. It was Peter. Yes, I know, Peter. They're here, she said as soon as she answered the call. Jeremy told me you have around 60 rogues encircling your wood shop. Don't panic. You have around 30 warriors on site defending you, and backup is on the way. The only problem is that your workshop is far away from our pack, and we must go through the city and the suburbs to reach you. So we can't shift, and we have to drive to your place. Okay, hurry up, Peter. We'll hold them off for as long as we need. Tay, do not do any... Peter, we already agreed on the strategy in the event of an attack. We are ready. Don't worry. Okay, stay on the line with me, Tay. I can share with you the updates I'm getting from the pack members through the mind link. Taylor put in her AirPods and ran towards her team. Except for Elsa, they're all humans. Guys, we have some inter-gang fights happening next to our warehouse. Please go to the storage room and wait there. She instructed them and escorted them to the room. Simon noticed that Taylor was not going inside with them and grabbed her wrist. Taylor, where do you think you're going? You must come with us. Simon, please, the security of my employees comes first. Stay inside and I'll keep you updated. The police are on the way anyway, lied Taylor. Tay, they are my employees as well. We are partners. I'll stay with you. No way. No, please, Simon, trust me. He hesitated before letting her go. Please, be careful, Tay. Do not make me regret letting you go, he pleaded. She gave him a quick kiss on the cheek and closed the door, locking it from the outside. She took a deep breath and ran to a large box in the main woodshop space. She entered the passcode and opened the box. It's go time. I'm ready this time. I am ready, she murmured, talking to herself. She took a few weapons from the box and handed them to Elsa. Elsa, you know what to do. Stick to the plan. Please be safe. I am the best warrior in my pack, Tay. Don't worry, added Elsa before running to the back, ready to support the troops there. Even though Taylor knew that Elsa was one of the best werewolf warriors, for her, she was still a teenager, and she was not thrilled sending a teenager to the battlefield. She took another deep breath and marched to the entrance and noticed the same scene as at the exit. Some had already shifted into their wolves, and everyone was growling. Give us the girl and no one will get hurt. In your dreams, replied Jeremy. Taylor tried to stay calm. The success of their plan relied on everyone being calm and in control. She pulled back her gun's hammer and walked out the entrance door. Are you looking for me? She taunted the rogues. Come with us and we'll let your friends live. Leave now and we'll let you live, she retorted. The rogues were getting impatient, and by now most of them were in their wolf form. Mystic Moon, now! shouted Taylor, smirking. All Mystic Moon members shifted back to their human form, and they threw ultrasonic bombs at the rogues, incapacitating every single wolf. Jeremy and Taylor exchanged eye contact and initiated phase two of their plan. 
One team lunged on the weakened wolves to fully immobilize them with shackles. The other part of the front line pounced on the rogue still in human form. Taylor was in the second line of defense, encircled by five of their best warriors. She had to comply with this plan, although she staunchly objected at first. She wanted to be with her friends fighting off the rogues, but in the end she accepted to stay in the back. Better than hiding in the storage room, as her friends initially wanted her to do, Taylor was on full alert, scanning the battleground. Jeremy was fighting two rogues when she noticed a third one sneak up on him from the back. Without any hesitation, she shot him in the knee. Her friends growled, clearly displeased with the usage of weapons. Another werewolf rule. Taylor didn't give a damn. She'll put all the chances on her side. She continued to shoot at the rogues, targeting their feet to avoid any life-threatening injuries. She was not a murderer like them. Taylor, I'm hearing gunshots. Is everything okay? asked Peter, worried. For now, everything is okay, but Peter, they keep on coming. I think their number's doubled by now. Oh, shit! Tay, what happened? Tay? shouted Peter. Taylor was busy fending off a group of rogues who passed through the first line of defense and leapt on her and her bodyguards. She had to fight, no other option by now. They were clearly outnumbered, and her bodyguards had their hands full. She ran out of ammunition, but still used her gun pistol-whipping the attackers. There was clearly a breach in their defense strategy, as the rogues kept coming at her and her bodyguards. During the fight, a rogue knocked the gun out of her hand as a wolf jumped on her. She pulled a taser from her pocket and tased the wolf, sending him falling headfirst on the ground. It hurts like hell right now. I know firsthand thanks to your sadistic leader, spat Taylor as she dodged another wolf. She didn't have time to catch her breath. More rogues were coming at them. They were in full body-on-body -body combat. She was busy fighting two rogues when she saw two wolves leap at her, aiming for her neck. She opened her eyes wide in horror. She knew she didn't have time to fight them or avoid them. This is... Taylor knew that she needed to move. Just a few inches would be enough to avoid fatal injuries. But she couldn't. The rogues had her almost immobilized, and the wolves were leaping at her at high speed. Damn it! It can't end like that, thought Taylor, trying to find a way out when she saw a big black wolf jump at the wolves. Peter, murmured Taylor, relieved. Peter's wolf got a good hold on one of them, while the other one managed to evade the black wolf's grip and landed on Taylor. However, this distraction was everything Taylor needed to dodge the lethal bite. The wolf's teeth landed on her shoulder, and she fell on the floor, knocking her head on the concrete floor. The wolf was biting deep. It hurt as hell, but Taylor powered through the pain and fought as much as she could with just one free hand to pull the wolf off her. She had to punch the damn rogue five times until he finally let go of her shoulder. She immediately stood up, ready to fight him and his friends. It would not be an easy task, given that her right shoulder had a deep open wound and was bleeding profusely, not even talking about the pain. But the cavalry was here. Peter's wolf and many of their Mystic Moon friends were finally here now, giving them back the advantage on the battlefield. The rogue wavered as the situation changed. It was no longer an injured human in front of him. Peter, Jeremy, and Elsa, all in their wolf form, were standing next to her. And they didn't give him a second to think. Peter and Elsa jumped at him, while Jeremy shifted back to his human form and held Taylor tight. Jeremy, let go! The fight is still going on! Tay, you stubborn girl, we must stop the bleeding. Let me stop the bleeding, he shouted at her as he tore her top and used it to apply direct pressure on the wound. The wound was too large and too deep. 
he had to tear another part of her top and stuff the cloth down the wound. He continued to apply pressure on the wound. We've got to take you to the hospital. Are you crazy? They're fighting for me. I won't leave them and run away. It would be ludicrous if you die from this bleeding wound while our friends fought tooth and nail to protect you. Stop saying no and move your ass. But, Jer, please, I can't... Look around you, Tay. The battle is over. We won. They are subduing the last reluctant rogues and the others are running away. Let's go. Taylor was so engrossed in the fight that she didn't think about checking the situation around her. At Jeremy's insistence, she scrutinized her surroundings and finally felt relieved. Jeremy was right. The battle is over. She collapsed in his arms, resting her head on his chest. Is everyone okay? Please tell me we didn't lose anyone. Everyone is okay, I swear. We have a few injured warriors. Now let's take you to the pack hospital. Taylor spent the next three hours in the hospital. She didn't need surgery, just stitches. She had to go through various tests to make sure there was no internal bleeding or a concussion. They had to be thorough given her medical history and her long coma. When she finally got discharged, she was met with her friends. Elsa ran toward her and hugged her tight. Ouch, Elsa, shoulder, injury, grumbled Taylor in pain. Oh, I am sorry. I am just so thankful that you're okay. Your wound was scary. I'm okay, kiddo. How about you? Those rogues are weaklings. They didn't stand a chance against us, said Elsa, all excited. Someone had the time of her life, laughed Peter. You scared us, sis, he added, as he side-hugged Taylor and kissed her forehead. Don't exaggerate. It's nothing. How is everyone? Light injuries here and there, nothing to worry about. We captured a few rogues to interrogate them. Taylor nodded her head, relieved that her friends were okay. But she was still worried. What's next? Those rogues are not letting go. This obsession is worrying her. They'll attack again, no doubt. She can't spend her life with this sword of Damocles hanging over her head, and she can't put her friends' lives at risk every time. Tay, Alpha Derek is waiting for us in his office, stated Peter as he took her hand. As they got closer to Derek's office, the door burst open and Dean rushed to her side, fear and worry in his eyes. Tay, thank Moon Goddess you're okay. How is your injury? He softly inspected her shoulder and held her in his embrace. She didn't fight it. She rested her head on his chest and closed her eyes. She had so many questions to ask him, but for now, just for a few seconds, she wanted to feel safe, to feel safe in his arms. She thought about how much she missed him, how she missed his forest green eyes staring at her, as if reaching her soul. She was tired from all the fighting. She just wanted to rest in his arms. Dean softly kissed her temple, sighing in relief. She is safe and in his arms. She is safe. He kept repeating this in his head. After a few seconds, she asked, What are you doing here, Dean? I was informed about the attack and came as fast as I could. That is too fast, no? Um, not really. I was in Dallas on a business trip. How are you doing, Tay? asked Alpha Derek as he joined them outside his office. Taylor moved away from Dean's hold, flushed as she realized that everyone was looking at her in Dean's arms. I am good, Derek. Minor injuries. I am sorry for putting everyone's life at risk, she added with a cracking voice. You are family, Taylor, and we protect our families here. They aren't going to leave me alone, are they? she asked, her voice breaking. Dean held her hand tight, and with his thumb, he tilted her chin up. Their eyes met, and Taylor shivered at the intensity of his gaze. 
Don't worry, Tay. We will stop them. But for now, we need to take you to Idaho to River Moon. What? Wh why? I don't want to leave, Dean. I'm staying here. Tay, I'm sorry, love, but this is non-negotiable. The rogues hunted you down to Dallas. You can't stay in your apartment and live your life as if nothing happened. Taylor was panicking. She was not ready to go back to Idaho. Too many memories. The wounds were still too fresh. Derek, can't I move to Mystic Moon? Tay, Emma, and Liam want you back in Idaho as well. Let's not drag Mystic Moon into this conflict. The rogues' war has always been concentrated in Idaho. Let's not export it to Texas as well. Plus, Mystic Moon is not equipped to protect you, said Dean. As if they protected me at River Moon Pack, replied Taylor bitterly. This time we will not disappoint you, asserted Dean, a double entendre that he intentionally meant. But it is Christmas soon, and I spend the holidays with my family, said Taylor, using every possible excuse to stay in Dallas. Emma called them already, and she invited them to Silver Moon. Are you crazy? That's too dangerous. We have amped up our protections. Taylor was hesitant. She didn't want to burden Mystic Moon with her protection. They were lucky no one died in this attack. But what about next time? It was unfair of her to drag them into this war. No doubt Silver Moon and River Moon packs were better trained, and after the breach on Emma's birthday, both packs improved and amplified their security controls. After all, the rogues had to lure her outside the pack to kidnap her. But was she ready to go back to River Moon? She was not sure she could resist Dean if she were in his turf. A few minutes ago, she melted in his arms. She sought his embrace. Taylor was having a headache now. Why everything had to be so difficult, she decided to massage her temples with one hand, thinking about the pros and cons of this decision. Tay, we will join you as well with my parents. We'll be celebrating Christmas all together in Idaho. If you prefer, Sierra and I can go with you right now. Taylor looked at Peter and Sierra standing next to her. I'll ask my parents and sisters to join us at Silver Moon Pack as well. You'll see, Tay, we can still celebrate Christmas as a big happy family, reassured Ciara. Taylor looked at all her friends. Everyone was convinced that she would be safer in Idaho. She sighed and finally said, Okay, I will go, but I'll stay at Silver Moon Pack. Dean didn't hide his disappointment. He was looking forward to bringing her back to River Moon. He hoped being back where it all started could help reignite their relationship. Okay, fair enough. I'll drive you back to your place and help you pack, he said. And we all meet up at the airport in one hour. The private jet is ready to fly us back to Idaho, he instructed. Stop being stubborn, Tay. Please, let me help huffed Dean as he gently but firmly grabbed Tay by the waist and forced her to sit on the bed. I'm not stubborn. I can pack my luggage on my own. With your injured shoulder, this is the definition of stubborn, challenged Dean, raising an eyebrow. I don't want you going through my clothes, grumbled Taylor. What are you afraid of? I have removed your clothes, torn your underwear, and helped you put your clothes on hundreds of times. Dean, don't talk to me like that, scolded Taylor as she turned crimson red. Dean had a lopsided smile when he saw Taylor blushing. Moon goddess, he missed her so much. He took immense pleasure at teasing her as he slowly packed her underwear piece by piece. You know what I just noticed? He said after examining every piece of underwear and folding it in the luggage. What? That you are getting redder every time I pick up a lingerie from your drawer. You, you... Taylor was fuming and couldn't find the proper retort. She threw a shoe at him, but to her disappointment he easily caught it.
It took them 45 minutes to finish packing, and then they drove to the airport, where they were met by Peter, Ciara, and her two sisters at the tarmac. Hello, I'm Sienna. Hi, Taylor. Nice to meet you. Good afternoon, Alpha Dean. It's an honor to meet you, said Sienna, Ciara's oldest sister. Taylor's eyes popped out of her head when she saw Sienna fluttering her long eyelashes at Dean seductively. And I am Lucia. Hi, Taylor. Alpha Dean, it's a pleasure to meet the legendary Alpha. I heard so many stories about your battles against the rogues and your business ventures and your prowess. I would love to hear it all from you, said Lucia, winking. Kill me now, muttered Taylor, rolling her eyes. Those girls are nothing like their sister, thought Taylor. Shamelessly flirting with Dean and prowess? Seriously, who, who talks like that? Taylor shook her head and walked towards the airplane. Tay, wait, called Dean, running after her. Is there a problem, Tay? He asked her when he caught up with her. I'm only tired. I'll wait for you in the plane until you finish your talk, she replied, stressing the word talk. Dean laughed. She was jealous, and he liked that. He grabbed her by the waist, carrying her bridal style. Dean, what are you doing? Put me down. You just said you're tired. I won't let you walk up the stairs, he said, kissing her on the temple. She gave up and put her hands around his shoulders for support. As she looked back, she saw Sienna and Lucia's eyes and mouths wide open, and that view was priceless for her. They were greeted by a hostess who said, Welcome on board, Alpha Dean. The bedroom is ready as requested. Good afternoon, Jade, and thanks, replied Dean as he walked to the back of the jet with Taylor still in his arms. He gently lowered her to the bed and added more pillows around her for support. Thank you, she murmured, avoiding eye contact. She was sure that one glance would be enough for him to see that she is already missing his embrace. She spent months trying to forget him and move on. Clearly, that was futile. Her feelings for him are as strong as ever. Tay, did you hear me? Are you okay? asked Dean with a worried voice. Um, sorry, you were saying? I was asking you whether you wanted me to stay with you. Oh, no, I don't want to keep you from your guests, she added, focusing on her fingers, as if she were seeing fingers for the first time in her life. My only guest is you. The others are Emma's guests, he replied. Dean leaned and with his thumb tilted her chin up, forcing her to look at him. And to be perfectly clear, I want to stay with you here, if you let me. She got lost in his forest green eyes. She missed this, how he looked at her as if she were his world. Did she still have the same effect on him as before? She couldn't believe that after all these months he was still as affectionate and considerate as before. She couldn't believe that with one hug he could make her feel so much better. She was conflicted. She missed him so much, but he hurt her so much as well. Should she forgive him and start over? He came as soon as he heard about the attack. He looked so worried when he first saw her at Mystic Moon. All this drama was giving her a headache. She raised her hands to massage her temples, and she winced. Damn, she forgot about her injury. Dean was immediately sitting next to her, massaging her temples for her. After a few minutes, he rested his back on the bed headboard and softly pulled her by the waist to his chest. She didn't resist. She even rested her head on his chest and closed her eyes. He knew that she was tired and needed to rest, and this might be the actual reason she didn't fight back. But still, he considered this a win. He had been waiting for months to have her in his arms. He hugged her as tight as possible given her injury and inhaled her scent. She is intoxicating. Taylor slept in Dean's arms the whole flight, 
and Dean wished that the flight would never end, to keep her in his embrace forever. When they landed, he carried her to the car which was waiting for them on the runway. Is she okay? asked Jeff, worried. He was waiting for them next to the three black SUVs and a heavy security team. Dean was not ready to take any risks. He even had warriors scattered along the road back home for additional security. Yes, don't worry, Jeff. She's just sleeping, answered Dean. He got in the car with Taylor on his lap, and as he moved to close the door, Lucia held the car door open. Alpha Dean, do you mind if I ride with you? Dean growled, displeased with the persistence of those girls. He'll have to talk with Emma and let her take them off his back. There is no room in here. Beta Jeff will take you to the other two cars mobilized for your transportation. Taylor moved in his arms and again winced. He stared at her shoulder, a frown on his face. He'll ask the pack doctor to examine the injury when they reached home. Home. He couldn't believe it. He was going back home with Taylor. He wished it happened under different circumstances and that she was coming back to River Moon Pack. But still, Taylor was back in Idaho. And he will do everything to convince her to start over again. Convincing her was not the only challenge at hand. He must solve this rogue problem once and for all. They took it too far hunting Taylor down in Dallas. This determination and hatred can't be explained, and by now he was not sure he cared for an explanation. He wanted to eradicate this problem, and if it means a preemptive attack on every rogue in the state, he will do it. If Mystic Moon were not ready for this attack, he could have lost Taylor. He can't let her life be in danger ever again. You're frowning. Why are you frowning? whispered Taylor, still yawning. He looked at her, waking up in his arms, an indescribable feeling. Hey, kitten, did you sleep well? he asked her, while tenderly running his fingers through her wavy hair. Yes. He continued staring at her, still not believing that she is in his arms, that she is not fighting this pull between them. You didn't answer me. He sighed and brushed her cheek with his hand. I was thinking about the rogues. Everything is leading us into dead ends. We still don't know who the leaders are and why they are so determined in this personal vendetta. You were researching the past condemnations, no? Yes, I went through every single one. Nothing out of the ordinary. The pack members who were exiled and sentenced to become rogues were all criminals and deserved the sentence. Rapists and murderers, mainly. There were a few human traffickers. We thought this could be a potential lead since some werewolves believed humans are a subclass. But we got nothing. Those human traffickers were long dead and had no family members. Taylor winced and tried to set up. Everything okay? Is your shoulder hurting? No, I didn't wince because of my shoulder, she replied, her voice laced with sadness. He stared at her, trying to understand what she meant. After a few seconds, it dawned on him. I did not mean to say that you are a subclass, Tay. I know, Dean. I know that you don't think like that, but your people do. No, we don't. We sentence those human traffickers harshly. Do you need a medal for that? We're talking about human traffickers here. Of course you would sentence them harshly, but still, your beliefs entrench discrimination against humans. You look at us differently, as a threat, as a subspecies, as people that you can't live with. Dean stroked her cheek with his thumb, looking at the pain in the eyes of the woman he loved. He never forgot her words from a few weeks ago. I don't belong in your world. Everything in your beliefs instruct you to stay away from humans, from me. Every time there is a decision to be made about me, you will struggle because 
I defy everything you believe in. He didn't know how to address those insecurities. He knew that he would always put her first, irrespective of his beliefs. He would kill anyone who might imply she is a subclass. He looked at her attentively. The problem is that she knows he will put her first. He can see it in her eyes. She knows that she is his world, and he would fight anyone who would insult her. And this is exactly why she was sorrowful. She didn't want him to fight with his people for her. He pulled her softly into his embrace. This is how selfless Taylor was. And now he must convince her that this is a fight he will gladly lead. Any time Taylor was fuming as her eyes narrowed at the scene unfolding in front of her. And she was not being subtle about it as Peter leaned in and whispered in her ear, You know that you are responsible for this. Pointing with his head towards Lucia hanging onto Dean's arm with both hands. And what was further infuriating Taylor is that Peter was right. When they reached Silver Moon a few hours ago, they were surprised by a welcome back party thrown by Emma with the help of Taylor's friends in Silver and River Moon packs. At the start of the party, when Taylor was chatting with her friends, Lucia came over to Taylor and asked her whether there was anything going on between her and Dean. And when Taylor said no, Lucia took it as a blessing to hit on him. Shut up, Peter, huffed Taylor, taking a sip of her orange juice. Peter laughed and gave Taylor a side hug. You know how you can end this, right? I march in there and tear your sister-in-law's head out, mocked Taylor, getting wild laughs from Peter. Moon goddess, jealousy is not a good color on you, Tay. It makes you scary. No, I just meant let him know that you want to get back together. I am not... Oh, stop fooling yourself, Tay. You want it as much as he does, so why waste time? Because it can't work between us, Peter. I shouldn't even be aware of your existence. And yet, now you are aware. One less obstacle. Come on, Peter. Your laws don't allow humans and werewolves to be together. If you really believe that you don't fit together, then why the hell did you date him in the first place? You knew he was a werewolf back then. The kidnapping was my wake-up call. I won't make the same mistake again, whispered Tay, trying to hide her watery eyes. Tay, I did not mean to upset you, said Peter, regretting opening the topic. Don't worry, Peter. This was an emotional and stressful day. I'll go and get some rest. She kissed him good night and headed to her room, where she removed her shoes and threw herself on the bed, her back on the mattress. When did her life become so complicated? Oh, yes, right, since I met a devilishly sexy man with forest green eyes, murmured Taylor, frustrated at herself. You think I am sexy? Taylor was startled and sat up fast to see Dean leaning on the doorframe. What the hell, Dean? You scared me. And are you eavesdropping on me? She berated him. No, of course not. Sorry, the door was open and, well, werewolf hearing, he said as he closed the door and sat next to her on the bed. What do you want, Dean? I want to sleep here next to you. Excuse me? Are you out of your mind? You just scored with Lucia, and now you go on to your next hookup? yelled Taylor as she stood up, clenching her fists. Wow, Tay, calm down. Don't punch me, said Dean, raising his hands. First, I did not score with Lucia, and I'm not interested in scoring with her. You could have fooled me. Tay, this girl is too clingy. I couldn't get her off my back. I had to mind-link all the unmated males in my pack to free me and distract her. I needed fourteen guys. Fourteen, Tay. Fourteen. Taylor unexpectedly burst out in laughter, imagining the scene. With one swift move, Dean pulled her in a tight embrace. I missed your laugh, he murmured. 
I missed laughing, too, admitted Taylor, as she looked Dean in the eyes. I just want to sleep next to you, Tay, ideally with you in my arms, like in the plane. I had not felt so much peace as when I held you in my arms. Since when can you have me in your arms and not have this lead to sex? challenged Taylor, arching one of her eyebrows. Since I know that I can lose you forever if I don't behave properly. They stayed like that, staring at each other for a few minutes. Okay, I am tired fighting anyway, but any wrong move and you're out, she threatened. Yes, ma'am, replied Dean playfully. And you leave in the morning. I don't want anyone to know that you spent the night here. Are you sure? It would help me if everyone knew. It would get Lucia off my back. Taylor rubbed the back of her neck, all embarrassed, and broke eye contact with him. She felt responsible for Lucia's assiduous flirting. I know, said Dean. What? asked Taylor, looking at him, confused. I know that you gave your blessing for Lucia to hit on me, a very mean way to punish me. I didn't give her my blessing. She asked whether there was anything between us, and I answered truthfully. We are not a couple, and there's nothing between us anymore. Um, I don't agree with your interpretation. So you owe me one, winked Dean. Anyway, I'll take the bathroom first to shower and put my pajamas on, stated Taylor as she opened the top drawer to get her stuff. I wouldn't mind if you put on the sexy red negligee we packed, teased Dean. Oh, you, yelled Taylor, throwing her shoe at him, but he caught it again. Taylor woke up to an empty bed. Dean kept his promise, and he left before sunrise. But then why did she feel a weird weight on her heart? Damn it, she missed him already. Taylor scolded herself and decided to be more level-headed and avoid going down that road again. She took a long shower to clear her mind and met with Emma and her friends for breakfast. As soon as she sat down, Dean and Liam joined them. Early morning meeting, whispered Taylor as Dean sat next to her. No, just hiding in Liam's office from the two glues, winked Dean. Oh, the big mighty alpha is scared of two small girls, mocked Taylor, smirking. Emma did not lose a second from the private discussion between Dean and Taylor. She must have missed the memo where those two got closer again. Actually, when did they get on speaking terms already? So, did you have a nice night, Tay? asked Emma. Yes, thank you, Emma. I had the best night ever, stated Dean with a big grin on his face. Oh, really? smirked Emma. Best sleep for the last eight months, he added. Taylor was feeling uncomfortable under Emma's intense scrutiny and Dean's oversharing. Stop teasing, Tay, Emma, scolded Dean through the mind link. Oh, the big mighty elf is protecting his lover, teased Emma. Dean shook his head, amused by Emma's repartee. Tay, can we spend the day in River Moon? asked Dean as he looked at Taylor. Taylor almost choked on her food. What is he doing? Inviting her to spend the day together. Now everyone will think they're back together. My pack members missed you a lot. It's been almost eight months since you last visited them, and not everyone could join the welcome party yesterday. Taylor missed them, too. Matt and the geeks, Bella, the school. It would be rude of her not to visit them. They've always been by her side, and they shouldn't suffer from her messed-up relationship with Dean. But before she got a chance to reply, Lucia shrieked and stated, Oh, Alpha Dean, can I come, too? I am dying to meet the famous River Moon Pack. Emma, take those girls off my back growled Dean through the mind link. Okay, Dean, I'm on it, sighed Emma. Peter, mind linked Emma. Yes, Em, I'm on it, replied Peter. Ciara, sweetheart, if you care about your sister's lives 
make them back off and stop flirting with Dean. Oh, moon goddess, he could become that violent? asked Ciara, worried for her sisters. Oh, sweetie, I'm not worried about Dean, but Taylor, chuckled Peter, looking at Taylor, who was red with rage. Suddenly, all eyes were at the entrance of the dining hall, intrigued by the commotion coming from there. They saw ten young men hurrying inside and running toward their table. I called back up, winked Dean, but not sure whether ten is enough. The four others are at work. I genuinely feel sorry for those guys. Look at them. They're terrorized, whispered Taylor. I told you they're leeches, winked Dean. He grabbed Taylor's hand and forced her to stand up. We need to run for our lives now, he whispered. Bye, everyone, Dean and Taylor said, and they ran away laughing. Liam, she is laughing. Oh, moon goddess, she is finally laughing, Liam, murmured Emma with a cracking voice as she grabbed Liam's forearm. I missed her laugh. She's back, Liam. I am positive she is finally back, added Emma as Liam wiped the tear running down her cheek and hugged her tight. So? asked Emma. So what? replied Taylor, confused. Seriously, Tay, don't you think this past week seems like deja vu? Taylor and Emma were decorating the offices in Silver Moon for a Christmas party planned in a few hours. It was the first time Emma managed to finally have some private moments with Taylor. Taylor knew what Emma was hinting at. She has been spending her days between Silver Moon and River Moon Packs for the past seven days. If she is being honest, spending most of her time in River Moon, spending time with the River Moon Pack members, going with Dean on their evening walks, as if they traveled back in time. Although she knew that spending time with Dean would raise a lot of questions, she just didn't care. She has toyed with death twice already, and she was tired of overthinking everything. There is really nothing to talk about. If you want to dissuade me from restarting a relationship with him, rest assured nothing was started. I still have the same fears as before, and I genuinely don't believe this relationship will be able to survive the supernatural world's constraints. Why would I discourage you about going out with Dean? Are you serious? You were against it in the first place. That was a long time ago. You tried to set me up with guys in Dallas. I tried to set you up because you were adamant that you didn't want to get back with Dean. But now that you're open to the idea, I ship Dean and Tay. The guy worships you, Tay, winked Emma. Well, my parents don't ship it at all, frowned Taylor, remembering her discussion with her dad two days ago. Oh, yes, I saw the murderous looks your dad was giving Dean, and he would turn red whenever asked about you, and we told him that you were with Dean. Yeah, the moment my parents set foot in Silver Moon, my dad has been moody. I think it didn't help that he saw me with Dean all the time. Dad sat me down two days ago, and I got a lecture about how I am being blinded by my feelings. You know, the usual. He is worried about you, but don't worry. My parents are brainwashing your parents, and by New Year, everyone will be happy with your blossoming relationship. Nothing is blossoming. Yeah, right. So have you thought about a baby name? teased Emma. You are impossible huffed Taylor as she walked away from Emma and went to give Peter a hand. Need any help, Peter? Yeah, can you pull the decorations out of the boxes here? We need to finish the decorating by 3 p.m. The party starts at 4. Why do you celebrate Christmas or even Thanksgiving? You don't believe in those traditions. Hey, Grinch, don't try to steal Christmas from us. We deserve the fun, the mistletoe, the family dinners, and the gifts, guffawed Peter. Oh, and speaking of mistletoe, look what I found, stated Peter, and he pulled a plastic mistletoe from one of the boxes. 
he raised his hand and hung the mistletoe in the air between Taylor and him. We should respect traditions and kiss, Peter teased Taylor, and before she could even reply, she heard two menacing growls fill the air. Ciara and Dean were red in anger as they moved towards Peter and Taylor. Wow, calm down, sweetie, I was joking, Peter explained. Seriously, Ciara, you are jealous of me? asked Taylor incredulously. Sorry, Tay, it's the mate bond. We can't really control it. We are very possessive of our mate, said Ciara apologetically, running her hand on her neck and hugging Peter. Okay, so you did what you did because he's your mate. But, Dean, you don't have any excuse. I am not your mate. Dean shook his head as he got closer to Tay and hugged her tight, inhaling her scent. Oh, Tay, can't you see? I choose you, Tay. I choose you as my soulmate. Um, what? We are meant to be, Tay, because we chose each other. Because I can guarantee you that you are my soulmate not just according to the human definition of the term, but to the supernatural world definition. We defied all the cosmic forces in this universe and chose each other. I choose you to be my soulmate, Tay. You challenged our thousands-year tradition. We challenged them. And I chose you, me and my wolf. We both chose you as our soulmate. Dean, you know that this is impossible, right? Everyone here knows that this is not possible. Your soulmate was Savannah, and you get one faded soulmate, and definitely not a human one. You all told me that. He laughed softly, still looking in her eyes. And yet, we did it. Call it free will if you want, but we did it. I know what I feel, and you are my soulmate. Can't you see, Tay? Yes, Savannah was my fated mate. Yes, the mate bond was supposed to be strong between us, because we had never officially rejected each other or severed the bond. Yet, when I met with her last time, I didn't feel the mate bond. I didn't feel anything. I feel sparks when I hold your hand, Tay. I feel electric jolts when I touch your skin. I ache to be next to you. Hell, yes, I go crazy when men get close to you, even Peter. Dean, this means you didn't get over me. It doesn't make me your soulmate, reasoned Taylor. I felt your pain when you were tortured, Tay. I felt your pain and tears when you left me. I felt your wound on your shoulder during the last rogue attack. This is how I knew you were under attack. No one told me. I felt you, and I came as fast as I could. But, Dean, you can't choose your soulmate. You know that better than me. Team free will, baby. Dean! You, the technology-challenged woman, you did it! You re-engineered me. You re-engineered every cell in me, and now, in my DNA, I am your soulmate. Only yours, Tay. Dean, even if this was possible, I don't fit into your world. I am a hu- You are my world, Tay. Living away from you has been torture. Please, give us a chance. We're made for each other. Don't give up on us, please, Tay. I love you. You are the alpha of one of the strongest and most respected packs in the country. You can't have me as your mate. They can't have me as their Luna. You know how detrimental this would be to you and your pack. Detrimental? Are you kidding me? You are the best thing that ever happened to me and to the pack, Tay. Don't you ever call yourself a liability, roared Dean. Dean, let's be realistic. If tomorrow an alpha leader of an important pack in the USA wants to visit your pack for business, you won't be able to introduce me, the human, to them. They wouldn't agree to have me in the room during the negotiations. Tay, Tay, you are so oblivious. I have five packs already who want to meet with me and my human Luna. They want to finally meet you face to face, 
and thank you for your courage during your kidnapping. Five packs that aren't even from Idaho. Tay, you are already respected beyond the borders of our state. You are the human Luna. Everyone is talking about you, Tay, about the human who refused to divulge our secret, even under heavy torture. The human who protected our kind, said Emma as she held Taylor's hand. The werewolf community in Idaho has sworn to protect you from any harm. Mystic Moon community as well. Actually, all the packs of Texas are with you thanks to Alpha Derek. The Florida packs are also on your side thanks to your friends in the Blood Moon Pack, added Dean. And yes, I know not all of the werewolf packs in the U.S. will be friendly. Yes, some might want to question our relationship. And we will fight them together, Tay. But let's not destroy our happiness because of some hypothetical hostility. But, Dean, Tay, you are my soulmate. I choose you as my soulmate. There's no going back. My pack chose you as their Luna. There's no going back there either. We're all in this together, and we have a lot of allies ready to defend you. What more do you need to see that we can do this? You and I, together, Team Free Will, Tay. This is not good for my pregnancy hormones. Tay, for Moon Goddess's sake, kiss him already, said Emma, crying and laughing at the same time. Taylor locked eyes with Dean. She only saw love and determination in his eyes. He was not going to back down. Not that she wanted him to. He gave her courage. His words and Emma's words gave her the reassurance she needed to take this giant leap of faith and trust that their love can prevail. Even by defying the werewolf's ancient laws, she knew that Dean and the werewolf friend she made along the way will protect her and protect this love. She put her hand on his cheek, gently caressing it. She closed her eyes, tiptoed, to rest her forehead on Dean's. Team free will, baby, she whispered, as he leaned forward and their lips joined in a passionate and long overdue kiss. Dean could not believe it. She chose him. She chose their love. He turned to the right and kissed her palm. Then he swiftly picked her up and spun her around. Their friends clapped and cheered, all happy for them. The Christmas party this year will be extra special for all. Kitten, wake up, whispered Dean in Taylor's ear as he trailed kisses on her neck. Dean was spooning her, their legs intertwined. Leave me alone, I want to sleep, she mumbled. I see you're still not a morning person, he chuckled, kissing her back softly. Of course I'm not a morning person, especially after you kept me awake all night. It has been eight months, Tay. I missed making love to you, and given how loud you were, I know you liked me keeping you awake. Taylor blushed, remembering how passionate their lovemaking was. They missed each other. They had so much to say, and they poured out all the past month's anguish into the night. The sense of urgency and the yearning were so intense that they kept pleasuring each other all night. Dean, this is not the way to talk to your Luna, she reprimanded him playfully. You're right. Let's do less talking, he said as he flipped her on her back and he hovered over her. Dean, come on now, come on, H haven't you had enough? She blushed. Eight months, Tay, eight freaking months, he replied as he kissed her passionately, ravishing her mouth. A moan escaped her mouth, melting as he kissed every inch of her body. He comes back to her mouth as his hands caressed her body and lingered on her breasts. He pulled away, resting on his elbows. He looked at his beautiful mate, naked in his arms, and he smiled. She didn't get a chance to smile back as he grabbed her lips in another passionate kiss. He moved to her neck and then her collarbone, planting open-mouth kisses sending shivers of pleasure down Taylor's spine.
he ran his tongue over her nipple, and she dug her nails in his back, moaning loudly. He took her nipple in his teeth, slowly sucking on it, as she arched her back in pleasure. He took his time, arousing every inch of her body, before he gently spread her legs apart and thrust it in her, joining their bodies. She cried out, closing her eyes, savoring the moment. Dean pulled all the way out, before thrusting back in with force. He started thrusting hard and fast into her, her body jolting with his pounding. After a few minutes, he pulled her legs over his shoulders and drove deep and rough into her, their heavy breathing and moans filling the room. They drove each other into a passionate and long ride until the fireworks inside of them became unbearable and they came undone, hard. He rested his forehead against hers, their hearts still racing. I missed you, love, he whispered, crushing her mouth with another mind-boggling kiss. She moaned into his mouth, still trying to catch her breath. Thank you for not giving up on us she replied. He laid on his back and pulled her to him. No, love, thank you for giving me a second chance. You are my soulmate, Tay, my one and only. She rested her head on his chest as he hugged her. Dean, where the hell are you? Why was your mind link blocked? yelled Liam through the mind link. Still in bed. Seriously, haven't you had enough? What do you mean? The entire pack house heard you and Taylor last night. You can be quite loud, mocked Liam. What do you want, Liam? replied an annoyed Dean. Come to my office, now. We have intel on the rogues, instructed Liam. Love, Liam just mind-linked me. We have news on the rogues. Do you want to come with me to his office, or do you need to rest? No way! I'll get ready in ten minutes! Fifteen minutes later, Taylor and Dean entered Liam's office. Emma was there, the betas of both packs, Clive and the Rock. This must be serious, whispered Taylor in Dean's ear. He felt the tension in the room as well. They all had solemn faces. What information did you get, Liam? asked Dean. Our hackers managed to plant spywares in the smartphones of a few rogues, Thanks to a keylogger, we intercepted their communication. They're planning an attack, tonight, on River Moon. Shit, gasped Taylor. Did our people get more intel? inquired Dean. The more information he had, the better he can prepare his defenses. Yes, they will go through the river, and they're mobilizing 20 werewolves. The objective is to infiltrate your pack by coming through the water, to blast the offices and to assassinate Taylor and you. So they think they'll be able to circumvent the tight security on the border by coming through the river? But how do they plan on penetrating the mainland and evading the security there? asked Jeff. We didn't get more information than that. We just know it's going to be tonight, and the intrusion will be from the river stated Liam, visibly frustrated with the limited information at hand. It's a suicide mission, gasped Taylor. What do you mean? asked Clive, bewildered. They know they won't get out of River Moon alive. This is why they're only sending 20 people, a small team that will infiltrate our defenses, probably blast the offices first to get us out in the open, and then assassinate us, explained Taylor. This makes sense, nodded Liam. I think they'll try a diversion as well, like the first time, either in Silver Moon or both packs, probably on the east border, which is the farthest border from the river, she added. We did not get any insider information about a diversion, disagreed Jeff. You didn't bug the smartphones of all the rogues. We got the information about the Riverside intrusion because you hacked the rogues who will participate with this part of the incursion. Uh, think about it, guys. They use diversions every time they attacked. This is their M.O., explained Taylor. 
and I think we should use their tactics against them, she added. What do you mean? asked Emma. Their mission is clear, killing Dean and me, and they will wreak havoc on our pack until they find us. Even if we are prepared and they won't benefit from the element of surprise, this is a risk I'm not ready to take, stated Taylor assertively. Dean was beaming with pride. Not only did Taylor refer to River Moon as our pack, but she is also committed to defend their pack members at all cost. He pulled Taylor closer to him in a side hug and rested his hand on her waist. He wanted her close to him. Dean was distracted by how Taylor naturally adopted her role as Luna and didn't measure the implications of Taylor's speech. Something that Emma didn't miss. Do not even think about it, Tay, threatened Emma. This is the right thing to do, Em, replied Taylor calmly. Think about what? What right thing? asked Dean, confused. Your girlfriend here wants to be the bait, huffed Emma. What? Are you crazy, Tay? No way. You will not be anywhere near the battlefield, stated Dean, his hands grabbing Taylor's shoulders and looking at her sternly. Emma and Dean's reprimands irritated Taylor. Why not? Am I the Luna of River Moon or not? Yes, you are. And because you are the Luna, we need to protect you at all costs. Don't play dumb with me, Dean. Aluna is on the battlefield with her pack. When Silver Moon was under attack, Emma was next to Liam fighting. And if she weren't pregnant, she'd be by his side tonight as well, snapped Taylor. Tay, it's not the same, Emma tried to interject. Why isn't it the same thing? Emma ran her fingers through her hair, trying to find a way to explain the situation to Taylor. This was too tricky. She looked at Dean, who was uneasy as well. Taylor noticed the eye contact between her best friend and her boyfriend. Don't even think about mind-linking each other. You have something to say? You say it to my face, she spat. Tay, please, honey, it's too dangerous out there. I know, and I will be careful. Taylor, no means no. I can't have you on the battlefield growled Dean, visibly angry now. You don't get to decide unilaterally. I am your Luna, and the Pax Luna. If you are at the Riverside, I can be on the east border, and the rogues will never try to infiltrate the Pack because they have their sight on both of us. Tay, please listen to reason. If you're on the ground, everyone will be worried about protecting you and won't be able to concentrate on the fight. Emma clarified. Come on, Emma, you know, you all know that I don't need protection. Taylor, I just said no, just let it go. I can't risk having you injured. My decision is final. Do you really believe that this is how it's going to be? You decide and expect me to be docile and comply? We both know this is never going to happen, Dean, she glared at him defiantly. Sometimes you are so infuriating. This is a question of life and death. I won't let you participate in the battle, period, he growled angrily. I will participate, and, comma, you will never use this tone with me ever again. The guys were amused by the quarrel between Dean and Taylor, but Emma was not the least bit amused. She knew her friend very well. Taylor was too infuriated, now making her a ticking time bomb. Dean huffed and clenched his jaw. This was getting out of hand. He didn't know how to get it into the stubborn brain of hers that this is too dangerous. Taylor, I am sorry for my tone. It's a stressful situation. Please, just humor me and agree to stay in the bunker. Seriously? You want me to hide with the elders and the kids? Me? You've seen me fight, Dean. And I've seen you fall, Taylor. Please, I can't take the risk. Why are you being so stubborn, Dean? Why can't I fulfill my role as Luna and fight by your side? Why can't... Because you are not a werewolf, Taylor. Because you are a human, damn it, he yelled. 
Taylor's body went completely still. She was staring at him, eyes wide open, holding her breath. She could not believe what she just heard. Day, please calm down, whispered Emma. The hell with calm, muttered Taylor, as she punched Dean straight in the face. What the hell, Taylor? scolded Liam. I deserve that. Dean cut him off as he wiped the blood from his broken nose. He knew better. He just didn't find the right words. I told you, Dean, that sooner or later someone will throw the you-are-just-human insult into my face. I just didn't expect it to be you, said Taylor, disappointment in her eyes. You being a human is not an insult, Taylor. You are perfect just the way you are. You're perfect for me. What I meant is that on the battleground, being human is a risk because you can't transform into a wolf. You can't heal your wounds in seconds. You don't have advanced eyesight and hearing, Dean tried to explain. Taylor took a deep breath. She knew Dean didn't mean to insult her by saying she's human, but he must stop treating her like a porcelain doll. Emma as well. She understood their anxiety, especially after her kidnapping and torture. But she wanted to move on from this incident, and she needed them to move on, too, to remember that Taylor Smith is a fighter. This is how it's going to go. Either you start treating me like a normal Luna, or I pack and leave. For good this time. Suddenly, and despite the gravity of the situation, Jeff burst out laughing. She punched Alpha. She punched him, he kept repeating, between laughs. Luna Taylor, I am proud to call you my Luna, and it will be an honor to be on the battlefield with you, he added, looking at his alpha, indicating that continuing this argument would be futile. Dean raised his hands in the air in surrender. Great, my Beta and Luna are ignoring my requests. You lost your authority fast, brother. You've been whipped, teased Liam. Says the man who had to go to the city at midnight and search for strawberries for his pregnant Luna, replied Dean sarcastically. And just like that, the entire room was laughing and the tension dissipated in the air. Dean wrapped his hands around Taylor's waist and moved her closer to him. You know I didn't mean to, he whispered. I know, Dean, I know. Don't worry. Then why did you punch me? He mumbled in her ear. Setting an example, she teased him back as she rested her head on his chest, savoring the moment. Tonight, they'll have to fight yet another battle. But just for now, she wanted to enjoy the lighthearted ambiance with her friends, and she wanted to enjoy Dean's warmth. I love you, she whispered. I love you more he replied, kissing her temple. Jeff, how is the situation on the eastern border? Dean asked. No rogues in sight. Our drones and guards are scanning the border from end to end. Nothing yet. And Taylor? Acting as bait in the agreed-upon location. She's pretending to exercise with Charlotte. And don't worry, Dean. As decided, we have 15 werewolves on her tail, ready to jump and protect her including your brother. This was Dean's requirement to allow Taylor to be the decoy on the eastern border. Liam and Jeff both assured him that they will protect her with their lives. He wished he could mind-link Taylor. He took a mental note to research whether it would be possible to mark a human mate. But for now, he must focus on the battlefield. Tristan, what is the status on the riverside? The rogues went underwater and just past our border. We have 15 rogues, half of them in their wolf form. How far are they from my location? Two miles before they reach you and our counter-strike team. Given their pace, I will reach you in 20 minutes. Okay, did they detect you and the team down there? No, the scent suppressant is highly effective. They're not aware that we've been following them since they entered our border. Good. Keep me updated, Tristan, and remind me to double the Christmas bonus of Bella. This little invention of hers turned out to be particularly useful. What invention? It's a high-end perfume, huffed Clive. 
You are jealous because Silver Moon R&D team didn't get the same idea first, teased Tristan. Alpha, rogues are moving toward our eastern border. They're very close, and we counted 40 rogues. Shit, Taylor was right. They're planning a diversion, and a big one given the numbers. Jeff, pleaded Dean. Don't worry, Dean, we will protect her. Dean sighed. The rogues are planning to attack on the eastern border to distract our teams and allow the river commando to move deeper into our territory. Taylor is closer to danger than he thought. Alpha, we've got a problem, mind linked Tristan. What? Our drones just spotted two kids entering the river border as well. They're in human form and moving fast. And not furtive mode. Clearly not professionally trained. What the hell? They're using children as soldiers now? Mind linked Tommy, who was with Dean in the Counter-Strike River team. Keep an eye on them, Tristan. Minutes went by slowly. The Silver Moon and River Moon warriors had eyes on the rogues. They knew that over 60 rogues were hiding on the eastern border, probably waiting for the river team to reach their target location before they strike. We have an eye on the river commando. They reached our location, finally mind link Dean. What the fuck? Amber, Ariel, what are you doing here? Leave now, suddenly yelled one of the rogues as he turned around and scolded the two kids reported by Tristan earlier. Please abort this mission, Ash. Are you stupid? You might have sabotaged our mission. Did you see or smell any guards? No, we were careful. Dean and his team were listening attentively to this quarrel. Go back home, girls, said one of the rogues. Leave us alone, Rob. This is between us and our brother, replied Amber. Your alpha told you to leave, so leave, threatened Rob. Jeff, we have a situation on the riverside. Seems the sisters of the rogues leader are trying to persuade him to abort the mission. How do you know? inquired Liam. They are fighting right in front of us, and they're not even mind-linking. Rookie mistake after all the caution they displayed, uttered Tommy. Those girls must mean a lot to the rogues leader that destabilized him. This is good. It means if we get the girls, we can make him surrender, thought Dean. Stop yelling, Ash. Please, let's stop this madness and go home. Ariel, stop it. Leave now. You're putting all our lives in danger. What lives? This is a suicide mission. And don't dare deny it. I heard you talking to Anthony last night, sobbed Amber. The rogue's leader ran his hand through his hair and looked at the girls lovingly. He ruffled Ariel's hair and sighed. Ariel, Amber, you know that this must be done. Why, brother, why must you keep this cycle of vengeance? They killed our brother. Our father lost his mind because of them. They represent everything we despise and they must pay for the painful and horrible lives they forced on us. What are they talking about, Alpha Dean? asked Tommy through the mind link. Dean was staring at the dispute, trying to make some sense of what he heard. It seems the new rogue's leader is the brother of the previous leader, the one who kidnapped and tortured Taylor. He wants to avenge his brother's death. He mentions that we Pax drove his father crazy, but that's not clear to me. It is clear now that this Ash will give the signal for the attack. For now, stay alert. If the girls convince him and the rogues leave, we will not attack them. Otherwise, we attack as planned. Dean updated all the mobilized warriors through the mind link. He looked again at those girls, and he must admit that they have guts. Storming a battlefield and trying to bring some sense to their brother? Deep down, he was rooting for them. He didn't want any more bloodshed. Aaron was a psychopath, Ash, and you know it. He lost his mind, just like Dad. You're acting just like Dad, Ash. You promised you wouldn't go down the same road as him. Yet here you are, planning a suicide mission to kill innocent people, said Amber gruffly. What innocent people? 
the parents of this alpha are responsible for our father's downfall his parents ash his parents their son has nothing to do with the alpha's sentence his human girlfriend has nothing to do with that the collateral damages have nothing to do with that people will die today you will die today in the name of what ash in the name of what pleaded ariel as tears rolled down her cheek liam jeff we might be able to avoid the bloodshed this is a family feud we just need to know who their father is and try to find a solution in a diplomatic way and you believe the other rogues will follow we have to try okay dean i trust you if you believe your plan might work let's test it i'll open the mind link so that you can hear everything all the time keep an eye on taylor and on the eastern border rogues you are trespassing on the river moon territory roared dean as he moved from his hiding place and stood in front of the rogues who were still in the river dean's warriors stood next to him growling at the rogues and encircling them ash the rogues leader pushed his two sisters behind him he was confused to find the alpha and his warriors standing in front of him did they hear the dispute is this how they knew they had trespassed why couldn't he smell their scent alpha let the girls leave they're kids said ash i am keen to let everyone leave if you collaborate dean was scrutinizing ash and he noticed that he was mind linking his people probably trying to find a way out after a few seconds ash glared at dean straight in the eyes and smirked jeff be ready they'll probably attack and try to get taylor to have some leverage the sisters versus taylor they already attack dean we're fighting them as we speak no worries i have 15 warriors surrounding taylor no one will get to her are you sure you're in a situation to lead the negotiation dean he sneered i am rogue are you taunted dean doubt and fear appeared on ash's face he mind linked his team on the eastern border and his eyes went wide open after a few seconds yes we know about your plan and our warriors were waiting for you you used your own girlfriend as bait and you dare look down on us rogues yelled ash with an incredulous expression on his face of course not it was my luna's decision she insisted to be on the battlefield to protect her pack from your criminal plans replied dean with composure the fight was raging on the eastern border rogues kept on coming fighting anyone trying to block access to taylor but taylor was way out of reach charlotte liam and a dozen other warriors were surrounding her protecting her from all the attacks the best warriors were mobilized next to taylor in three circles three layers of protection the rogues knew they were fighting a lost cause they reached out to their leader to update him on the situation ash they were waiting for us we can't reach the girl she's guarded over by 15 warriors what is the situation on your side asked the rogue through mindlink they want to negotiate with amber and ariel here i can't risk their lives and fight back what do you want me to do i can try to infiltrate their defense lines and go to the pack house if i take five or ten warriors we can kidnap some of their people destroy some properties kill anthony no your mission was to stay on the east border i don't want you to risk your life either brother i can help you no anthony stay put try to get to taylor smith and keep me updated if we're losing too many of our warriors ash looked at his sisters clutched behind him damn it why did they follow me by now he would have ripped out this arrogant alpha's throat but with the girls here he couldn't put their lives in danger something that his father and even his older brother would have done deep down he knew that his sisters were right his father was lost in this vendetta and he took their brother in his madness are the girls right has this gone too far 
Rogue, time is ticking. If you want to negotiate, you'll have to tell your people on the eastern border to put down their weapons, commanded Dean. Ash glared at Dean, hatred dripping from his eyes. You killed my brother. Your brother kidnapped and tortured Taylor. Your brother led many attacks on my pack and on every pack in Idaho. Your brother had innocent people's blood on his hands. He got what he deserved. You bastard! How dare you talk like that about my brother! I took over to finish what my brother and my father started. I came to avenge our father, and I challenge you to a one-to-one -one fight to the death. Amber and Ariel gasped, hearing their brother. Ash, are you insane? Please, don't do that. Please, let's stop this madness. Ash didn't break eye contact with Dean. He was determined to avenge his family, and a duel seemed the best solution to save his sisters from this ambush while completing his mission. Dean was surprised by the animosity in this rogue's eyes. He had never met him before, and yet this rogue hated him as if it was a personal feud. He wanted to accept the duel. He was confident he would easily win and kill the rogue, but would that end the senseless war? How about the girls? He knew how it felt to lose family at a young age, and he could not fathom how those teens would survive such a tragedy. He ran his hand through his hair. He was challenged to a duel. He should accept it and get over it. But the desperation in those girls' eyes moved him, and he wanted a diplomatic solution to this never-ending war. First, tell your men on the East to step down. Then we'll talk about our options. I won't say it a third time. You stop the fight on the eastern border now, or else my warriors start the fight right here, right now, ordered Dean. A few minutes went by as the tension in the air reached its peak. Dean, they stopped fighting. They accepted the ceasefire, boasted Jeff through the mind link. What's the situation down there, Jeff? Rogue side, 15 to 20 down, either injured or dead. From our side, Eight injured, no other casualties. Dean let go a breath he wasn't even aware he was holding. No casualties. He looked at the rogue's leader. He was young, too young, probably 19 or 20 years old. He is not responsible for the crimes of his father and brother, the leaders that preceded him. He looked at the girls. Maybe there is a chance to end this and start over. Okay, now that the truce is accepted by all parties, help me understand, Rogue. It seems to me that the war unilaterally initiated by the Rogues has something to do with your father. Is that correct? My father did not start this war. The Pack started it when they unjustly banished him and made a Rogue out of an Alpha leader. Who is your father? What are you talking about? questioned Dean. The Council of Alphas banned my father, Alpha Alexander. They conspired against him and made him a rogue. From an Alpha to a rogue, he wanted revenge and gathered all the rogues into a pack, a pack of rogues who wanted revenge from the packs that banished them. When he died, our brother took over. Our father raised us to hate you all, and our brother continued what our father started, avenging our blood. What was your father's pack? The Black Moon Pack in northern Idaho. Dean, what is this all about? I'm not aware of anyone overthrowing the Alpha of the Black Moon Pack, mine linked Liam. Oh, shit. I think I read about their father's case when I was researching the Council of Alpha's trials and sentences. He was not to be overthrown. He was not the Alpha at the time, replied Dean. Rogue, I read about your father, Alpha Alexander's case, when I was researching the Council's trials. If my memory serves me correctly, your father was a criminal. He was a rapist. Your father was banished because he raped. His own father, the ruling Alpha of the Black Moon Pack, asked for his banishment. You are lying, yelled Ash. Everything is documented. 
He raped two women. One of them was his own mate. He never denied the accusations and charges against him. He said his mate belonged to him and existed to satisfy his needs. They even had circumstantial evidence that he raped humans. Is that the man you want to avenge? Challenged Dean. Ash, you don't seem far gone like your brother or your father. We need to stop this madness. People are dying for the wrong cause, he added. You are lying. I don't believe you. My father was not a rapist, shouted Ash, as his sisters were silently crying next to him, horrified to hear about their father's crimes. We can show you the court transcripts and all the evidence. Everything is archived online. Why would I believe you? This is just a trick to avoid the duel. Ash, if you did your research properly, you must know that I don't shy away from a fight. I know that I can defeat you, but would that end the war? Or would another brother of yours or even your sisters take over and continue this senseless war? I want to find a permanent solution. Ash was hesitant. He looked at his sisters. They were innocent and deserved a decent and peaceful life. Ash, your father was behind the murder of my parents. They were ambushed and murdered by the rogues when I was a kid. I wanted to avenge my parents, too. My brother and I have been searching for the culprit for over a decade. Your father is already dead, but still... I can kill you and your siblings right here and now in the name of revenge. But I am not like your father, Ash. I want justice, and I want a lasting peace. Let's sit down and discuss. If you're not convinced, you're free to leave the Pact Territory and continue with this war. If you are convinced, we sign a peace treaty. What do you want to do, Ash? Are you going to give peace a chance? All eyes were on Dean and Ash. The fate of all the werewolves in Idaho was in their hands. Dean tried to win the trust of the young rogue, hoping that he will make the right decision and accept his offer. Ash, the rogue leader, was torn between his loyalty to his father and the safety of his sisters. How can he negotiate with the packs who wronged his father? How can he sit down with the Carter brothers, the murderers of his brother? He looked at his sisters, hiding behind his back, tugging at his sleeves, their eyes filled with fear, but also hope. They wanted to see how the trial of their father went. He wanted to see what alleged proofs the Council of Alphas used to justify the banishment of his father, a future pack alpha himself. He gave his sisters a reassuring smile before glaring back at Dean. I accept your offer to sit down and go through your archives. However, if I have any doubt that your documents are falsified, I will walk away and there will be retaliation, declared Ash assertively. Fair enough, nodded Dean. Your fighters can leave our territory freely, he added. Jeff, you heard? Let the rogues retreat with their wounded and fallen. Make sure our wounded are taken care of as well. Yes, Alpha, replied Jeff through the mind link. Liam, meet me with Taylor and Emma in my office in five minutes. Dean stared again at the young rogue. He seemed to be mind linking his people as well. My brother is at the eastern border, and he would like to attend the meeting, stated Ash. Dean nodded and informed his team on the eastern frontier as he heard the rogue fighting with his sisters again. I said no, Amber, you will not attend the meeting. He was our father as well, Ash. We have the right to see what happened. It's too dangerous, girls. You will leave with the others, he replied sternly. Ash, you can't send us away. Amber, I had already told you to stay away from the battlefield, but you came anyway. Now there is no room for negotiation. You will leave. No, he is our father as much as yours, said both girls with watery eyes. Ash looked tenderly at his sisters, 
and sighed. He turned towards Dean, wariness in his eyes. I already gave you my word, Ash. You and your family will safely leave my pack after our meeting. My word might not mean a lot to you, but in my community, my word is my bond, and I always keep my word. Ash nodded, relieved that his sisters would be safe. He was not sure this meeting will lead to anything, but accepting the meeting was the only solution to protect his sisters. They all walked in silence to the pack house. The rogue siblings could not hide their amazement when they saw the River Moon facilities. They lived most of their lives believing that packs were a place where alphas ruled with an iron fist, exploiting their pack members. They saw a big and modern gated community, almost a small city with schools and parks and people living happily and freely. At such a late time at night, they saw people partying and socializing freely. Pack members that walked by them greeted them politely, even though they reek rogue scent. This was not the life they had. Being a rogue meant at first living in harsh conditions, being forced to move from one place to another to escape the persecution of the Idaho packs or to avoid criminal rogues. It meant rigorous training and complete obedience to the leader. It meant being raised on hating packs and pack members. When they reached Dean's office, everyone got inside, and Dean immediately grabbed Taylor by the waist, hugging her tight. Thank you, moon goddess. Are you okay, Taylor? He asked as he loosened his embrace and put both his hands on her head, resting his forehead on hers. Yes, of course, I am fine, Dean, she replied. He examined her head to toes and exhaled a breath of relief when he confirmed that she is okay. Dean, relax. I couldn't even throw a punch. They were smothering me, she complained lightly. Liam updated me on your plan. You have access to all the files from here, she asked. Yes, all the archives are available online. I just need to plug in the projector. While Dean was logging into the system and retrieving the archives, Ariel stood next to Taylor and asked her, You are the human, right? Yes. I am sorry for what my brother did. I wasn't aware. None of us were aware of his plans. My deceased brother was leading this crusade on his own, as instructed by our father. When he died, the rogues came to my brother Ash, asking him to take over. They all believed that by getting justice for my father, they'd be getting justice for themselves and their families as well. They were all exiled from their packs, wrongly banished. Taylor wasn't sure how to answer. According to Dean, no one was unfairly banished in the past decades. He went through all the archives and didn't see any indication of prejudicial trials. She nodded and gave the teenager a light smile. As they were waiting for Dean, she noticed one of the boys was still bleeding heavily from his arm. He came with them from the eastern border. He was a teenager. The four of them were too young to be fighting and launching wars. She got the first aid kit from the office restroom and headed to the boy to attend his wound. As soon as she touched his arm, a loud growl erupted. At first she thought the robes growled at her because she was touching their brother, but they all looked as surprised as she did. Move away from the rogue, Tay, said Dean grimly. Taylor was confused by Dean's attitude. Then it dawned on her. Seriously? Damn, it will be a nightmare to get used to this soulmate thing, muttered Taylor, still loud enough for the rogues to hear her. What do you mean, soulmate? Humans and werewolves can't be soulmates, asked a puzzled Amber. Taylor cleared her throat and handed the kit to Amber. I think it would be best if you attend to your brother's wound. Okay, I'm ready. Shall we look at the recording now? said Dean, as he projected on a white wall the recording of Alpha Alexander's trial. 
He seized Taylor by the waist and pulled her into a side hug as they listened to the trial. The video started with the Alphas' opening statement as they went through every single charge against him. The substantial evidence was damning and included heartbreaking testimonies from his mate, DNA evidence, surveillance camera recordings. Alpha Alexander recognized all the charges against him and justified every single crime with delusional excuses. He looked the Alphas straight in the eyes and justified the assault and rape of his mate, explaining that she is his mate and should be at his service. He justified violently hitting his mate and sending her four times to the emergency room by stating that she needed to be disciplined. He justified raping human women because, according to him, their supernatural laws consider them subspecies and open for grabs. During the trial, his father, the Alpha of the Black Moon Pack, presented his excuses to his son's mate and apologized for raising a sadist rapist. He disowned him and stripped him of the Alpha Air title. His father was dignified and pain was palpable in his voice. The recordings went on for two long and excruciating hours. When the video stopped, no one could say a word. Amber and Ariel were crying, horrified to discover that their father was an unapologetic rapist and a low-life criminal. His four children were stunned. They could not deny the authenticity of those recordings. This was their father speaking. They saw their father unremorseful and even smirking when justifying his appalling crimes. There is no room for denial. They saw their father with their own eyes, and they heard him admit to the charges against him. All those years, he brainwashed them into believing his conspiracy theory. He fed them lies, and they believed him. He raised them to hate those packs who allegedly unjustly banished him, whereas they should have hated their father for his crimes. How could he do that? Oh, my God! My father was a monster, whispered Amber between sobs. He lied to us. He lied. We believed him. We all believed him. We believed that he was overthrown by greedy alphas. He killed so many innocent people in the name of his crazy cause. He lied to us, his own children. He used us as a pawn in his sick lie. Anthony burst out in horror. Ash was disconcertingly silent. He was staring at the wall where they projected the recordings, and he seemed lost in his thoughts. His fisted hands, a clear indication that he was trying hard to hold back his anger. My mother, Ash murmured. What? asked his sister. His mate. His mate, my mother, he raped my mother, roared Ash. Ash, what are you talking about? This is not possible. Our father was banished 26 years ago. You're not even 21 years old, reasoned his brother Anthony. Anthony, you saw her in the video. Look at that picture, yelled Ash as he took his smartphone and scrolled his photo gallery. But Dad told you that your mother was raped and killed by an alpha, insisted Anthony. Those two photos are the only photos I have of my mother. They were in my father's wallet. I took them when he passed away, clarified Ash as he showed the photos to everyone in the room. They were all surprised by this revelation. The timeline didn't add up, yet the photos don't lie. In one photo, they saw a four-year-old boy in the arms of his mother who was looking lovingly at him. In the second photo, two boys were sitting next to their mother in a meadow. Taylor scrutinized the photo like everyone else in the room. The younger boy looks like you, she said, bewildered. And the older one, he looks like the rogue who kidnapped me, she shivered. 
And the woman looks like Alexander's mate, added Dean. Dean was perplexed. How could this have happened? This horrible man was already banished when Ash was born, unless... Moon goddess, could it be? he whispered. He looked at Liam, then at Ash. If he is right, this is even worse than what they just saw. He hesitated a few seconds before sitting down at his desk and assessing their law enforcement records. It took him a few minutes, but he unfortunately got the confirmation of his theory. How is he going to share this with those kids? How much more can they take? What is it, Alpha Dean? asked Ash. Are you sure you want to know? You won't like what I just found. This evening is a living nightmare, but I need to know the truth. Please, pleaded Ash. Dean sighed before projecting again on the white wall. I checked whether your father was involved in any other criminal activities after his banishment. He has a long list of offenses documented in our Idaho Werewolves criminal database. In many rogue attacks, he was clearly spotted in surveillance cameras or recognized by eyewitnesses. What does that have to do with my mother? Your father never stopped attacking and harassing your mother. Twenty-two years ago, he ambushed her in a visit to the city. He kidnapped her, and he raped her for one week until she managed to escape. Ariel and Amber gasped in shock. Oh, God, what kind of a monster is this man? exclaimed Taylor in shock. Unfortunately, he didn't stop there. Seventeen years ago, he attacked the Black Moon Pack to kidnap her and their kids. The warriors managed to rescue her immediately, but he got the two children, continued Dean, as he read the information displayed on the screen. He looked at Ash. The kid was fighting tears, but he nodded as he stared at Dean, silently asking him to carry on. Two years later, meaning 15 years ago, he reiterated his attempts and managed to kidnap her once again. He beat her and raped her for three days until a pack commando managed to infiltrate the rogue's base and rescue her. She was beaten so badly that she spent two months in the ICU. Ash smashed the wall on his left, startling his sisters and brother. Ash, said Anthony, as he tried to put his hand on his brother's shoulder. Don't, please, not now, Anthony, implored Ash. Following this last kidnapping, the Council of Alphas decided to put his, your mother, in a protective program, and she was sent to a distant pack outside of Idaho. Her location was maintained a secret. Only one Alpha knew her exact location. Suddenly, Dean froze, and looked at his brother before looking back at the screen. Our father was the Alpha to push for his decision, and he was the only Alpha to know her exact location, whispered Dean. What? growled Liam. This explains the attack against our parents, Liam. This filthy rogue was not happy that his mate was no longer under his reach, and he took his revenge against our father. Dean, I am so sorry, whispered Taylor as she ran to him and hugged him tight. I am so sorry for what your family had to go through, said Ash as he crashed on the couch holding his head in his hands. This was too much. Too much for him. Too much for his siblings. Too much for the Carter clan. His father destroyed so many lives. Everyone in this room is a direct or indirect victim of the deceptive man he called Dad. Is my mom... Is my mom still alive? asked Ash in a cracking voice. Dean pursed his lips and shook his head. Unfortunately, I don't have this information. We don't even know where she went. 
If our father was the only one to know her exact location, we won't be able to track her. There might be a way, ventured Liam, as he took his phone and called Alpha David. Alpha David was the oldest Alpha still alive, and he was in the Council of Alphas during that time. Alpha Liam, is everything okay? Did you contain the rogue's attack? Yes, everything is under control. I'm happy to hear that. From our side, we were not attacked. Good to know, Alpha David. Um, I'm calling you for another reason. Yes? Uh, tell me, how can I help you? Do you remember future Alpha Alexander from the Shadow Moon Pack? How can I forget? This man was a psychopath, a cold-blooded criminal. Why are you asking about him, Alpha Liam? We found one of the two children who were kidnapped. What? This is great news. After all this time, your father never doubted that the kids would come back. Yes, and we want to reunite the boy with his mother, but there is no record of her whereabouts since she is in the protection program. Yes, only your father knew about it. Damn it, said Dean, hearing this. But he shared the information with me eleven years ago. You see, we got intel that this bastard was going to target your father in retaliation for shielding his mate from him. So your father decided to share the information with me to make sure that we have at least two alphas aware of her hiding place. When your father was murdered, I shared the information with Alpha Jared to make sure that Again, we have two alphas with this information. This is fantastic news, Alpha David. Can you tell me where she is? Uh, no, Alpha Liam, this is not possible. As part of our protection program, we don't share such information. But I can reach out to her and inform her that we found her child. I can even facilitate a reunion in my pack or yours. Thank you, Alpha David. Yes, please, let her know that we found her youngest, and I will call you later to organize the reunion between the mother and her child. I think the best would be to organize it in Silver Moon. What is her name? murmured Ash. Sorry, did you say something, Alpha Liam? I couldn't hear you. Liam looked at Ash and asked Alpha David, What is the name of the mother, Alpha David? Do you remember? I can never forget her name or her face. She was a delicate soul, and this criminal broke her, growled Alpha David, remembering the tragedies this woman had to live through. Her name was Myla Hill, he added. Myla, murmured Ash tenderly, as a lone tear ran down his cheek. His sisters couldn't stay away any longer. They ran to him and hugged him tight, sobbing uncontrollably, sorry for their brother. Anthony joined them, and the four siblings were joined in a tight embrace, crying for Myla's sufferings, crying for their sham childhood, crying for their ruined future. Long and interminable minutes passed by as Dean, Liam, and Taylor watched the torments of the young kids standing before them. Alpha Liam, Alpha Dean, I owe you an apology for everything my family did to you and your pack, said Ash in a cracking voice. The crimes perpetrated by my family against your people are inexcusable. I am at your disposal to sign the peace treaty and commit that no attacks will be launched by any rogues against the packs in Idaho. Too many lives have been destroyed in the name of a fake cause, he added. Thank you, Ash. We can draft the peace treaty tomorrow and organize a video conference call with all the alphas of Idaho to get their approval, proclaimed Liam solemnly. Thank you. If you don't mind, I would like to go home with my brother and sisters. This has been a long night, and we need some rest. Not so fast, stated Taylor, raising her hand to stop them. Stopping the attacks is not enough. Justice must be served, 
she added. You are right, Luna Taylor. What my brother did to you was unforgivable, and you deserve justice. Just let my brother and sisters leave, and I'll stay under arrest in your pack and accept any sentence you deem fit, said Ash in a defeated... What you are describing is not justice, Ash. This is revenge, and I don't do revenge. You are not responsible for what your brother did to me, replied an irate Taylor. I don't understand. What do you mean, then, by justice must be served? Justice is not just signing a peace treaty where you commit to not launching attacks against us. Justice is making sure only the criminals are judged. Looking at the four of you, I have no doubt that you are victims, not just because your father brainwashed you and used you for the senseless war, but also because you were made rogues just because you are the sons and daughters of a rogue. Taylor, are you implying that our laws are unjust? scoffed Liam. Liam, I am not implying anything. You have the living proof in front of you. Those kids should have a fair chance in life. They should be able to access proper education, to live a stable life, to experience what pack life is. You, Emma, and Dean always tell me that living as part of a pack is essential for werewolves' well-being and stability. Yet the offspring of those criminals are automatically labeled rogues because of their parents and are automatically banished like their parents. This isn't fair. I agree with Taylor, said Dean. Liam was visibly annoyed. Signing a peace treaty to stop the attacks was a fast and easy task. Questioning and challenging their laws is a tedious road, even if most packs agree. Dean, Taylor, if we want to start changing our laws, we will not be able to sign the peace treaty tomorrow. This takes more time and requires intricate negotiations. If we don't include this in the current peace treaty, we would have failed all those kids, Liam. Taylor, this is not about emotions. Brother, if we don't add this condition to the peace treaty negotiation, this point will never get addressed. There's a sense of urgency right now to reach a peaceful situation. Everyone will be open to this amendment because it's nothing compared to stopping the war permanently. Liam glared at the two stubborn heads in front of him for a few seconds before declaring defeat and agreeing to add this item to the agenda of tomorrow's meeting. Thank you, Liam, said Taylor, winking. Now that this is solved, let me take you to the guest rooms, added Taylor, addressing the four siblings. What? asked Amber, who was holding her sleepy sister. You'll be spending the night here, and tomorrow you'll have breakfast with our pack before starting the peace treaty negotiation, decided Taylor. Dean stopped her in her tracks, hugging her and whispering in her ear, I am so proud of you, my Luna, as he kissed her. Taylor blushed and pulled away from his embrace as she ushered the siblings to their respective guest rooms. The following days were intense. As Liam predicted, the peace treaty talks took long hours of debates because of the clause Taylor suggested adding. Most alphas were wary of letting rogues join their packs. Ash was negotiating on behalf of the rogues, and he was accompanied by Carmen, a fierce 25-year-old rogue. Carmen was a lawyer in the city, and she was a tough negotiator. Alpha Dean, Luna Taylor, you can't expect us to welcome rogues into our packs with open arms. Those people lived their entire lives in the wild, they don't know what pack life means. They would never comply with the rigor and discipline required by pack members, complained Alpha Zane. Alpha Zane, of course we're aware that there'll be an adjustment phase, maybe even a cultural shock. But we can support the new joiners with orientation days to extensively explain the values of the pack, the rules adopted by the pack, and the expectations from each pack member reason Taylor. But how can we even trust them? They could be a Trojan horse trying to destroy us from the inside, added Alpha John. 
I thought that we already established and agreed that the rogue's children are collateral damage of this law and not criminals themselves, huffed Carmen, annoyed that every now and then the discussion goes back to this point. You are asking too much of us, Carmen. Some of those young rogues participated in the attacks against our packs and killed our people, explained Alpha Zane. How about we focus on our quick wins? Let's start with the teenagers. Most of them, if not all of them, never participated in any attacks. We start by opening our door to those rogue teenagers who want to be part of a pack and to build a stable future for themselves, proposed Taylor. The discussions dragged on for long days, but in the end, they managed to convince the Alphas of Idaho to open their doors to the rogue's offspring. They persuaded them to do so not only for the teenagers, but for any rogue's child if they can demonstrate goodwill and they commit in writing to upholding the pack's principles and values. For the rogue's children who had participated in previous attacks, their requests would be studied on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you, Luna Taylor. Thank you, Alpha Liam and Alpha Dean, for your support throughout these negotiations, said Ash and Carmen. I see that you thanked my mate before me, teased Dean. Ash blushed a bit and looked down, earning laughs from the group. They were sitting on the rooftop enjoying the sunset and celebrating the peace treaty agreement. We'll invite all packs to an official ceremony where we will all sign the peace treaty, explained Liam. You can invite rogues to this event as well, added Dean. Emma joined them a few minutes later and addressed Ash. Ash, we have a surprise for you, she said. He looked at her, confused, when she moved to the side, and we saw a petite, blonde, middle-aged woman standing beside her. Moon goddess, it is really you, Ash she said with a raspy voice. Mom, murmured Ash, as he lunged into her open arms. Everyone was watching this moving reunion with watery eyes. Those two have so much to catch up on, so many missed birthdays and milestones. Taylor wiped a tear from her cheek as she looked at them, saddened that Myla will have to learn very soon that her eldest was killed for the atrocities he committed. She couldn't help but wonder whether he would have turned into a cold-blooded criminal if he had been raised by his mother instead. This kid deserves a happy ending, whispered Carmen. Taylor nodded, unable to talk as she was overwhelmed by the raw emotions generated by this happy reunion. It's a miracle he didn't turn out like his nuthead father Actually, all of his children are good kids, even the eldest, Aaron. You know, the one who kidnapped you? He was a good kid. We were close friends, but unfortunately, he was the most affected by his father's brainwashing, and I couldn't bring sense to him, Carmen uttered with sadness and regret in her eyes. You're not a fan of Alexander? Of course not. He was a crazy sadist. I wasn't part of his rogues group. My parents and I lived in the city, but I was friends with the rogue's kids, and we used to hang out together in the city. A week passed by in a flash, as everyone was busy preparing for the peace treaty signing ceremony. Dean and Taylor hosted Alexander's children in their pack throughout the week, facilitating the reunion of Myla and Ash. Myla adopted Ash's half-siblings as if they were her own, and they all spent time together catching up and dreaming of a better future as a new blended family. On the peace treaty signing day, Myla stood in the crowd looking proudly at her son as he challenged his father's teaching and buried the hatchet ushering in a new era of peace in Idaho. Ash was standing next to all the alphas on the stage looking at the rogues and pack members in the audience. He would have never dreamt that such a day would be possible. He looked at his mother lovingly gazing at him, and he felt a sense of quiet contentment, happy to see his brother and sisters holding hands with his mother. 
Suddenly, he was intrigued by a new smell. A mixed smell of gardenia and vanilla filled his nostrils, an intoxicating smell. His wolf was howling in his head. Could it be? Has he found his mate? He looked at the compact crowd trying to find a sign, to find his mate. The smell was slowly fading away, and he was surprised. Does that mean that his mate saw him and left? How could she? He looked at the crowd again, trying to single out the women stepping away from the ceremony, but there was too much movement. It was then that he spotted her. Well, rather, he spotted the back of her head with her long red hair. His mate was running away from him. What the hell? He mind-linked his closest rogue friends in the crowd and asked them to find and follow any redhead that was leaving the ceremony location. He can't make a scene right now, but he will visit her later, in private, to understand why she preferred to run away from her newly found mate. Bella was frantic, trying to find a way out of the ceremony without raising too many eyebrows. She was sure that by now her mate must have sensed her, and even if he can't leave the stage, he can ask his friends to help track her. She hoped he hadn't seen her. He couldn't have, right? The moment she saw him and knew he was her mate, she immediately turned around and walked away. She tried to be as discreet as possible, but clearly she failed because someone grabbed her by the wrist and pulled her into a hug. Bella, you're finally back. How is your interview in the Innovation Hub in Santa Clara? Asked Taylor, who was hugging Bella. Taylor, um, it went great. They want me to start my internship soon. Uh, I have to go now. I'm a bit tired. Come on, Bella, you can't leave me hanging. I want to hear everything about your stay there. Also, I want your opinion on all the changes I'm planning in the pack library. What do you think of this furniture design? Babbled Taylor as she shared her phone with Bella. Bella was surprised by Taylor's perkiness. This is not the Taylor she knew. She looked at Taylor's phone, determined to give her quick advice and run away from the ceremony. Bella's body went completely still when she looked at the iPhone screen. It was not a picture, but a message written by Taylor. You are being followed. I noticed Rogue started scrutinizing and following a number of girls in the crowd, but they seem to focus on you. I don't know why, but I feel you know. Do not talk. Werewolf strong hearing. Um, this is a nice idea, Taylor, but why do you want to build the furniture yourself? There are good websites with great and unique furniture. Let me type some of the names I know. Tay, the rogue leader, Ash, he is my mate, but I cannot, I just cannot. Please, I want to run away. Help me, please, wrote Bella, pretending to type the names of furniture websites. It's as if you don't know me, Bella. I can't buy furniture, chuckled Taylor in an Oscar-worthy performance. Come with me to the office. You'll see the actual sketches, not just a small picture on a small screen. Mine link Emma as well, because she wanted to see them too. Taylor intertwined her fingers in Bella's and provided a reassuring squeeze as they walked hand in hand to her office. Taylor was determined to help Bella, her pack member, but she knew that she had to be smart about it and not raise any suspicion. They just signed a peace treaty, and it would be reckless on her part to throw all this in the air by helping Bella out in the open. She had a plan to exfiltrate Bella in secret, and she needed Emma's help as well as the help of many other girls present here today. When they told me I would find you here, I thought they were joking, teased Dean. Taylor was in the kitchen with Chef Pierre, Emma, and the two packs kids baking Christmas cookies. She recognized the husky voice coming from behind her. She turned around, her face covered in flour and sprinkles in her hair. Um, you look tasty, he whispered in her ear as he removed a few sprinkles from her hair. Then he leaned in to kiss her and was met with a loud, 
Ew! From the kids in the room. Alpha Dean is kissing Luna Taylor, shouted one kid. Kissing is so gross, pitched another one. Get a room, teased Emma, who was helping a few kids with the decorations. Dean and Taylor chuckled as he tucked loose hair behind her ear. So how did you end up here? Emma insisted that this is a tradition expected from the Lunas. Well, I am sorry to inform you that Emma tricked you. This is not a tradition in our packs. What? Emma, how could you? scolded Taylor. Well, now it's our tradition, Tay, and look at the kids. Look at how happy they are, and don't lie, you enjoyed it. Indeed, Taylor couldn't lie. She enjoyed this carefree afternoon with the kids and was happy she got to spend time with her best friend as well. Dean was still standing behind Taylor. He leaned into her neck and trailed butterfly kisses from her ear to her collarbone, making her shiver with desire. He liked the effect he had on his mate and couldn't keep his hands off of her. Love, can you explain to me why so many girls suddenly left the peace treaty signing ceremony, especially redheads? Dean, are you stalking redheads? replied Taylor, pretending to be offended. Love, those games don't work on me, whispered Dean, tickling her neck with his nose. He smirked as he could smell her arousal. I don't know what you're talking about, Dean. Tay, I had to deal with an angry Ash, desperate to find his mate. Let it go, Dean, muttered Taylor. The less he knew, the better. Otherwise, he would have to lie to Ash, and she wanted to avoid such awkward situations. I don't know whether I should be impressed or concerned. You're a good liar, love. Your heart did not skip a beat. Oh, honey, how can you even think that I could lie to you? She replied, turning around to cup his cheeks with her hands and give him a peck on the lips. The kids burst out in laughter, putting their little hands on their mouths, trying to hide their amusement at their alpha's expense. You put flour on my face, didn't you? asked Dean, glaring at Taylor. He gave her a passionate kiss before whispering, This is a preview of your punishment tonight. He teased her as he walked out to clean up and join his brother in the packhouse grand hall to supervise the final preparations. It was a tradition in their packs to celebrate Christmas all together in the Silver Moon packhouse. They put up a giant Christmas tree in the grand hall, sing Christmas carols, distribute Christmas gifts, and then host an extravagant banquet with fine food and dancing all night. But before joining his brother, Dean was determined on having a long overdue discussion with Taylor's father, who was in the lounge enjoying refreshments with his wife, Emma's parents, and Ciara's parents. Mr. Smith, may I have a few minutes of your time? He asked after greeting them. Robert Smith nodded and walked with Dean to a secluded place for a private discussion. Mr. Smith, I wanted to clear the air. I know you're not happy with my relationship with Taylor, but I need to let you know that I have never intentionally hurt your daughter. I never cheated on her. It was a big misunderstanding. Taylor is a strong and independent woman. She would never have forgiven me had I cheated on her, and she is too smart to be sweet-talked. If we are back together, it's because she knew, without any doubt, that I never betrayed her, and that I love her more than life itself, explained Dean, getting straight to the point. Dean, I trust my daughter. She is indeed a grown and independent woman. But for me, she will always be my baby girl, and my baby came to be broken because of you. It's hard for me as a father to forget his daughter's tears, uttered Robert after a few seconds, his voice almost breaking. I understand, Mr. Smith. I just want you to give me a chance to prove to you that I deserve your daughter and that no one else will treat her as good as I do. I will spend my lifetime spoiling her and protecting her and loving her. 
added Dean. Actions speak louder than words, Dean. I have seen you together, and I saw how you treasure her. I believe you are a good man, Dean, and you will take care of my baby. Plus, the Jacksons didn't stop praising you throughout our stay here. To be fully transparent, Mr. Smith, I intend to marry your daughter and grow old with her. If I had known that she wouldn't chop off my head, I would have already proposed to her. But she wants us to take it slow, and I respect her wishes. I see a proposal down the road, and I would much appreciate your blessing. You have my blessing, Dean, said Robert, as he supportively squeezed Dean's shoulder. And please call me Robert, added Taylor's father, genuinely happy for his daughter. Dean was relieved after his discussion with Robert. Taylor was very close to her parents, and he knew she was hurt when her parents did not approve of them getting back together. He was determined to win them over for Taylor. A few hours later, he was watching Taylor mingling with the pack members as the Christmas celebration was ongoing. She was a natural Luna, doting on the kids, chatting with the elders, laughing with the young generation. Everyone was under her spell. Amber and Ariel were beaming, glued to Taylor as if they were attached by the hip. Taylor insisted on inviting the four siblings and Myla, and Dean was happy that those kids finally had a normal Christmas celebration. When Taylor handed the last Christmas gifts to the pack children, she turned to Amber and Ariel and gave them each an envelope. Merry Christmas, girls! What is that? Your Christmas gift, silly, laughed Taylor. The girls were flabbergasted. They've known Taylor for only a week or so, and she's giving them Christmas gifts. They were mortified because they didn't bring her anything. Go ahead, open them, she encouraged. Luna Taylor, hey, we agreed. You'll call me Taylor. Yes, sorry, um, Taylor, we don't have anything for you muttered the girls, their heads bowed down in embarrassment. The tradition is that the Alpha and Luna hand out gifts, not the other way around, she reassured them. They opened their gifts, and they saw an invitation to a full spa day. I offered this gift to my closest friends in the River Moon and Silver Moon packs. We'll be going all together, and this would be a good opportunity for you to bond with the girls because... I would like to propose to you to join the River Moon Pack. What? Really? Oh, Moon Goddess Taylor, thank you so much. We wanted to ask you whether you would ask us to join, but didn't dare because of what our family did to you. They hugged her and thanked her a million times, squealing and jumping in happiness. Taylor hugged them back and looked at Emma. Emma, in addition to the spa day, I have another gift for you. You have spoiled us already, Tay. Keep this gift for another occasion. Nope. Go ahead and open the envelope. Emma opened the envelope and removed a card. She looked at the paper, then at Taylor, before going back to the paper in her hand. When tears started blurring her vision, Liam was immediately by her side concerned and confused about his mate's emotional state. Oh, Tay, this is the best gift ever. Look, Liam, Tay already designed our baby's nursery. Everything is personalized and carved by her hands, explained Emma in a cracking voice, moved by her friend's gift. Thank you, Taylor. The nursery is amazing, added Liam. Excuse me, but I miss my mate and I must steal her from you, uttered Dean as he pulled Taylor away. I missed you, love. You've been handing gifts out for hours. Now it's time for your gift, he said spiritedly as he handed her a luxurious box tied with a golden ribbon. Tay, you have made me the happiest man on earth when you agreed to give me a second chance. You are my soulmate, and I'm looking forward to our forever, ever after. 
Taylor kissed him, and when she opened the box, she was stunned with a unique gold necklace. It had the crest of the River Moon Pack, a crescent moon adorned by rare blue diamonds. There was an inscribed message on the back. She struggled, however, to read it, as it was written in a language unknown to her. Thank you so much, Dean. The necklace is amazing. I love it, exclaimed Taylor as he proceeded to put the necklace around her neck. What does the engraved message mean? I can't read it. It's written in our language, close to Celtic. It says, strong and eternal, like you, like our love. He leaned in and took her lips in a fervent kiss, pouring out all his emotions. Strong and eternal, she whispered as she rested her head on his chest, grateful that destiny got them back together after everything they went through. You know, love, I wanted to offer you a ring, an engagement ring. What? Are you crazy? Since we've met, we've been apart more than together. I knew this would be your reaction, and this is why I didn't give you such a ring. Yet, he chuckled. Oh, shoot, I didn't give you your gift, exclaimed Taylor as she jumped up and ran to get his wrapped Christmas gift. This is amazing. I see we had almost the same idea. He winked as he unpacked a wooden docking station crafted by Taylor herself and ran his fingers on the engraved crest of the River Moon Pack. She engraved it herself and included a valet tray, smartphone docking station, and watch holder. I even created a special reading glasses holder for when you get old and need them. You know, for the presbyopia you're going to have in a couple of years, if not before. She teased him, and she sprinted out of the grand hall, Dean chasing after her. He caught her swiftly, picked her up off the floor, and swung her around in his arms. They kissed under the doting gaze of the pack members and the displeased glares of Lucia and Sienna. When he put her down, Taylor cleared her throat and looked at Dean, uncertainty in her eyes. What, love? What do you want to say? I'm not sure if this is the right moment, but this thought has been tormenting me the past few days. What is it? asked Dean, suddenly worried. Now that the rogue problem is solved and Christmas break is over, I'll have to go back to Dallas. My team needs me there. I will, of course, fly back, maybe every two weeks, but I can't stay here with you all the time. Sure, no problem, love. I will come with you. Oh, sure, it's great that you would be spending the weekend with me there, but I didn't mean I would be spending weekends in Dallas. What do you mean? I am moving with you. What? Are you crazy? What about the pack here? Your business? I am not going to have a long-distance relationship with you, Tay. I will go with you. I can do most of my work remotely. But I can't take you away from the pack. I don't care. Tay, I choose you. You, first and always. No, no, this is what I was afraid of. I don't want to stand between you and your werewolf responsibilities. Tay, relax. You're not taking me away from my responsibilities. My pack members are used to seeing me go on business trips all the time. Plus, we can get organized to spend one week in Dallas and the following week in River Moon. What is the perk of having a private jet if we can't use it all the time? Who knows? Maybe you can open a branch here soon as well. Um, actually, when we first got together, I thought about opening a branch here. The bar I delivered for the diner had a lot of success, and I'm getting many requests from customers right here. You see, everything is going to be fine, honey. Together, forever, Dean whispered in her ear as he swept her off her feet, carrying her bridal style. Wow, why are you carrying me? Where are we going? gasped Taylor. Now is the time for your punishment. You didn't think I'd forget, did you? He teased, carrying her to his car, both of them laughing, blissfully 